Do you know that around 53% of website traffic comes from organic search, which makes search engine optimization a top priority for businesses online. The more you rank high in search engines, the more you have the possibility to gain traffic to your website, which indirectly results in conversions, thereby boosting your business. Moreover, the market is flooded with SEO jobs. A few of them includes SEO associates, SEO analysts, SEO executives, SEO managers, SEO experts with salaries going as high as $100,000, which makes it a lucrative career. So here we present you our SEO full course that will cover every aspects needed to get a job in this field. Before we move ahead, consider subscribing to our channel and hit the bell icon to never miss any updates from Simply Learn. In this SEO full course, we will be covering all the major and minor concepts related to SEO. We have smartly divided this course from beginners to advanced level so that anyone can become an SEO expert with this all-in-one course. We will start off with a small introduction to SEO and an understanding of what SEO exactly is. Moving ahead, we will understand the significance of SEO and why one should optimize a web content for SEO. We will understand the types of SEO covering on-page SEO and off-page SEO techniques. We will put detailed light on how keyword research is done as it is the most important part of any SEO technique followed by our pro tips to rank on Google and YouTube. By the end of this course, you will be able to gain expertise in various SEO tools like Google Search Console and Google Analytics and will be able to understand the market of SEO in terms of jobs and salaries. Finally, we will end this video with the top SEO interview questions that will help you to ace your interview and grab the job opportunity. So without any further ado, let's begin with this complete learning package for SEO. Rachel is a baker who runs her own bakery. To expand her business, she decided to create an online presence by first setting up a blog. She began posting on her blog regularly. However, even after regularly posting on the blog, there were barely any visitors showing up. Deciding not to give up, Rachel began searching for a solution on the internet. That's when she came across SEO, or search engine optimization, a term she's never heard before. So let's take a journey together and help her learn about SEO. Search engine optimization is a method that could improve the quality and quantity of the audience coming to Rachel's website from search engines. It could increase brand awareness, attract local customers, and build credibility and trust. And all of this is possible without having to spend a single penny. To bring visitors to her website, Rachel would have to take advantage of the two types of SEO, on-page and off-page SEO. Rachel first decides to tackle on-page SEO and get that sorted. On-page SEO involved Rachel optimizing her website, both in terms of content and the technical aspects, including the HTML source code, schema, meta tags, and more. She started off by using tools like Google AdWords, Allref, and SEMrush to identify popular search terms associated with the recipes she planned to publish on her blog. She began to look for search terms related to the broader area of baking, cooking, and related topics. Once she found these search terms, she began to incorporate them into her recipes. She started off by providing an introduction to the recipe. With this, she could provide an engaging beginning to her story, like how the dish reminded her of her childhood and enabled her to naturally include the search terms into the blog. She also included these keywords in the actual recipe as well. Additionally, she added pictures, videos, time lapses, and more to increase credibility and engagement for her content and subsequently persuading search engines to show her content to more people. After this, she moved to the website meta content that search engines display when her blog appears in search results. She optimized the meta tags, alt tags, header tags, and more. This completed the on-page aspect of SEO. Thanks to this, she saw a significant increase in the number of visitors coming to her page. Having done all she could on her web page, she now decides to explore what could be done off-page to improve her page's visibility on search engines. 
Off-page SEO involved Rachel doing things outside her site page to help increase its search engine rankings. Making optimizations outside the site would improve the site's popularity, relevance, trustworthiness, and authority. This is possible with the help of reputable websites vouching for your content with backlinks, social media marketing, guest blogging, linked, unlinked brand mentions, influencer marketing, and much more. Rachel also understood that for her content to reach people, she would have to promote it on social media platforms like Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, as well as niche platforms like Quora, Reddit, and Medium. These could help her achieve greater reach for her website by sending stronger social signals to search engines, leading to the page being shown as highly relevant for related searches and audiences. And even after understanding and implementing all of this, Rachel had just scratched the surface of what was possible with SEO. Before we find out what she did next, let's have a look at a quiz. Which of the following is the most effective way to improve off-page SEO? 1. Creating plenty of web pages of a content. 2. Getting backlinks from relevant and authoritative sites. 3. Acquiring backlinks through link buying. 4. None of the above. Let us know your answer in the comments section below for a chance to win an Amazon voucher. Now, let's go back to Rachel. Rachel decided to take up Simply Learn's digital marketing certification. With classes covering just about everything she needed to know about SEO, it was only a matter of time before Rachel began to implement her learnings on her website and see a massive uptick in the number of viewers coming to her website. In time, she could even earn money off the site by setting up an online shop. And with that, we've covered an introduction to the concepts of SEO and the possibilities it can open for you, either as a marketer or a business owner. So we're going to use a basic example, and let's just say you have a blog. You're a food blogger, you're passionate about food, and your niche is ice cream. And let's just say you have a lot of ice cream recipes. You want to get traffic to your blog, you want people to read your blog. And you're curious, why am I not ranking for my blog? Why when people type in ice cream recipes and say Google, my blog posts don't appear at the top of organic rankings? And there's a number of reasons why you wouldn't be ranked for your blog post or your ice cream recipes. And the main reason would be your competitors. So there could be somebody else out there who is also passionate about ice cream and has been blogging a longer, longer than you. And they have more content and more blog posts and more pages for Google to rank. So that's usually the number one reason. The other reason is improper usage of keywords. And we're going to talk a little bit or it's actually a lot more about, you know, keyword usage in your content. So what kind of keywords do you want to rank for? That's really what we're talking about when we talk about usage of keywords. What keywords do you want to rank for and how do we work those keywords into the content? Another reason is poor link building practices. And really that means are other blog posts or other websites linking to you? Also, are you linking to other pages on your website? And so it's all about link building. And with link building, it's internal linking. So are we linking from one blog post to another? And it's external linking. Are other websites of high quality linking to us? And so that's what we talk about when we talk about link building. And then another reason is web page load time. So you could be running your blog post on, say, WordPress, for example, and your blog post isn't loading fast enough. Well, if you look at it this way, think about it if you're Google. Would you really want to rank a website or blog post in this example, number one on Google rankings, if that particular page loaded very slow? No, you wouldn't because when somebody clicked on that link in organic search and went to your website, they're going to have a bad experience because the page is going to load slow. So Google doesn't want their users to have a bad experience. You don't want your users to have a bad experience. And so that's why web page load time is a critical factor for ranking. So we need to make sure that our web pages load fast. And then your user experience is not good enough. So Google, again, based on my example about the web page load time, Google wants people to have a good experience when they go from their search engine to your website. And there's a lot pl at play there, specifically web page load time, but also 
you know, Google doesn't want any spam content. Google doesn't want any pop-ups or overbearing ads on the web page. They want people who are searching for something in particular, let's just say ice cream recipes, and they want to find a relevant website that has ice cream recipes. They want to be able to click on that link and read some good content about ice cream recipes. It's that simple. And that's really what Google's trying to create in their environment. And that's you as an end user, as a website owner, you want your users to have a good experience. And then last but not least, your website is de-indexed by mistake. And really what we mean is de-indexed is Google needs to be able to index all the pages on your website. So if you have a blog with 100 recipes, you want Google to have access to all 100 recipes. So we're going to talk a little bit later about how to get your pages ranked or indexed on Google organic search. So let's move on to what is SEO. So sticking with our ice cream blog theme, really SEO, search engine optimization, really is the practice of increasing your pages that Google has indexed up the rankings. So the end result is we want all our pages to be ranked number one for particular keywords. So if you want to be ranked for ice cream recipes, well, there's certain things you need to do. So that's generally how it works. We need to apply search engine optimization to increase a page for keyword we want to be found for. So let me give you an example. So let's just say there's 100 students that participated in an essay competition. And so the competition in this particular case is evaluated on the basis of, is the content relevant? Are they using suitable titles for their essay? Do they have structure when they're participating in this essay or talking about the essay? And do they have a suitable synopsis? And is the content neat and readable? These seem all logical for an essay competition. Well, guess what? They seem logical for SEO because that's exactly how SEO works. It's exactly all those points I just mentioned about structure, logic, readability, organization, title. All those things are what's important in SEO. And so we need relevant content. We need titles for our pages. Google needs to be able to see structure. We need to have synopsis of what the page is about, and that's called the meta description. And then again, the, the content needs to be readable, and that's important. And so in order to be readable, again, we're going to talk more about site speed because site speed is important. Okay. And when we talk about responsive design, when I say responsive design, that means your site, your page needs to load both on desktop and also on mobile. And so all these things are important. Just like an essay competition, Google is the judge and they need to be able to determine what page is best to rank number one, number two, number three, et cetera, on Google search. And then link building. Remember I mentioned link building a moment ago? Well, link building internally and externally also plays a vital role. And so we're going to talk about that a little bit later in the class when we talk about off-page SEO. How does Google rank website? And basically, Google follows three basic steps to rank a website. They need to crawl your website. They need to take what they crawl back to their servers. And when they take it back to their servers, your, your web pages, they need to you have them available for indexing. So when somebody actually types in a keyword into google.com, it'll be available to be found on organic search. So that's what indexing is all about. And then Google's job when somebody does type in a search query is to basically rank the, those pages that they've indexed from number one to infinity, depending on how many pages are relevant to that search query. So really it's about crawling, indexing, and ranking. So crawling is simply a process done by which Google has bots. And what these bots do is they go to your web server and they're going to crawl every page that they can find. And how do they find these pages? Well, they basically follow links. You might have heard the term spidering, but that's what they call search engine spidering. So basically what Google's doing is they're building a web, so to speak, all the links that they're following. And so when they can follow all these links on your website, they're going to be able to crawl them. And when they crawl them, basically they're going to take that content and store it on their servers so it's available in their index. So based on this method, Google finds out which websites have relevant content and which ones don't based on certain keywords that are typed into Google. Because if they can't crawl your website, you're not going to be found. And if you can't be found, then you're not going to show up for relevant keywords. So we need to make sure your site's available to be crawled. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Okay, but let's show you an example. 
So let's just go to Google search. And if I type in the keyword simply learn, okay, I could see I have 1,010,000 results. Okay. And that's how many results are showing up for simply learn. Okay. Now they may not all be simply learn pages, but nonetheless, simply learned is ranked number one here organically. And there are 1,010,000 pages related to the keyword simply learn. Now, when it comes to organic search, uh, we don't want to get it confused with paid search. So anytime you see paid search, you're going to see something that says ad next to it. Okay, so we could see that there are paid ads here. But when it comes to organic search, those are generally below paid ads. And so that's where Google counts the 1,010,000 results. And so that's the whole idea behind crawling and indexing. Google's able to crawl Simply Learn's website and based on all the pages that they gather, they're going to make those pages available in organic search. So if you type in a keyword and your web page is not available for indexing, then you're never going to show up for that keyword. So that's why it's important to make sure your website is available for crawling and indexing. And so when a user types a query on search Google search, the most relevant websites that are in Google's index are going to appear in the search results. So in the example I gave uh, with Simply Learn, well, Simply Learn is the brand name of the company Simply Learn. So there's a lot of relevancy there. So that's why you see Simply Learn show up here organically number one. Like we mentioned about what is SEO and why SEO, we talked about that user experience. So there's a lot of factors that go into ranking, relevancy being one of them. So in the Simply Learn example, Simply Learn is relevant to a lot of the Simply Learn pages because that's who they are, Simply Learn. However, Simply Learn also needs to make sure that, you know, for their pages, the page load time is fast, meaning these pages load very fast for the end user. And Google also takes into account other factors, like how long someone is staying on a website, or are they bouncing, meaning are they going to one page that they land on and then leaving the website, okay? And so the user experience is very, very important. There are other factors also, like language and location. And so, for example, location, if you do a search, say, in India, the results are going to be a little bit different than, say, the results in the United States. Why? Because Google is indexing as many web pages as they can find. So if somebody's doing a search in India, their results may be a little bit different than the results show up in the U.S. because Google has different bots. And these bots are crawling different pages at different times. And so Google's index is updating continuously but it's not real-time syncing. So if you do a search in India, you may not see exactly the same thing because both search engines, the Google in India and the Google in the US, are, may not be exactly synced up. So an example would be, you know, if you're looking for cafe. So if you search a cafe in, say, San Francisco, you're going to see different results. Now, if you do a search for cafes in Mumbai, you're going to see different results. There's going to be local search here at the top. There may be some paid search, but again, you may see different results because one location, but two, Google search engines in India and United States, google.com, aren't exactly synced up exactly at the same exact time you do that search. So location is important. Language is important and relevancy is important along with user experience. So all those are important factors in how Google ranks websites. Okay, so we're gonna talk about the types of SEO now. So if we wanna rank for a particular keyword on Google, we're gonna to have to apply search engine optimization. And so there's two strategies to search engine optimization, on-page SEO and off-page SEO. So first we're gonna talk about on-page SEO. So on-page SEO is nothing more than optimizing your own website. And so when we say optimizing your own website, there's certain elements on your website and on your web pages that we need to take into account. And so some of those elements are headers, meta descriptions, title tags, linking. So all of those elements are something we can control as an end user who wants to rank our web page and our website on Google. And before we do anything with our website, the first thing we need to do is understand what keywords we want to rank for. 
In order to understand what keywords we want to rank for, we need to do keyword research. And if you do anything in SEO, keyword research is the most important activity. That's the most important thing you can do for SEO. And why do I say it's the most important? Because you need to understand if you choose a keyword that you want to rank for, you need to understand how much traffic you're going to get from that keyword if you're ranked organically, say number one on Google. So how much traffic will you get if you're ranked number one on Google? So you need to understand what the volume is. And then number two, we need to understand what the competition is for that keyword that you want to rank for. So if you choose a keyword and there's not much competition for it, then chances are you can rank for that keyword for a web page on your website quicker than say a keyword that has a lot of competition. So we need to understand those two basic factors volume and competition before we choose a keyword. And it's it's simply the practice of going through the motions of getting your volume and getting your competition data so you can choose the keywords you want. And then once you choose the keywords you want, then you can go and apply on page SEO. You can change the title tag, the meta descriptions, the headers. All those elements can be changed, but first you need to choose your keywords. And so again, the primary components we're looking for are how much traffic you can get or the search volume, how much competition there is for that keyword, and of course, relevancy. Okay, you need to be able to choose a keyword that's relevant to the web page you're trying to rank for. And so let me show you an example of how to go through this. So the first thing we want to do is we want to use a tool. And the tool I would recommend is Google Keyword Planner. And why do I choose Google Keyword Planner? Because if we're trying to rank on google.com or Google search engine, we want to be able to get the data right from the source. So Google's going to be able to give us information about how much volume a keyword has and how much competition it has. So let me show you an example. So if I want to use Google's keyword planner and I want to rank for the keyword how to become a digital marketing specialist, then I'm going to type that keyword into Google's keyword planner. And what Google's going to do is they're going to give me some trends about how much volume this particular keyword gets over the course of a year. And so for that particular keyword, I can see that there are trends that, that appear for both desktop and mobile. So mobile is important because people start their search process a lot of times on their mobile device. So we want to be able to get data from mobile as well as desktop. And so we could see a trend here that for each particular month, over the last 12 months, we can see how much volume this particular keyword, how to become a digital marketing specialist, gets per month. And so on average, on average, over the past 12 months, I could see how to become a digital marketing specialist is averages 30 searches a month. And this is on Google.com. And so Google gives us the volume. What they also give us is the competition. And so here I can see Google says for that particular keyword, the competition is medium. And so in the Google's keyword planner, what they also do is give me other relevant keywords that I might think about optimizing for. Because you don't want to optimize for just one keyword. So how to become a digital marketing specialist, they're going to also offer up other types of keywords that are relevant. So just digital marketing specialist, social media marketing specialist. So for those keywords, I can see the volume. So for example, digital marketing specialist, I can see the average volume is 1,000 per month. On average over the last 12 months, I can also see the competition is medium. But for some other keywords, I can see the search volume being high, like digital marketing course at 2,900 per month, but also the competition is high. And so what I would recommend as a best practice is to collect all your relevant keywords, okay? And put all your relevant keywords in a spreadsheet. And when you put all these relevant keywords in a spreadsheet, you wanna get the data on those keywords. And the data I'm referring to is the volume of competition. So in this case, we have volume from Google Planner, Google's Keyword Planner, and I have competition from Google's Keyword Planner. And so if I go into a spreadsheet and I put all that information in here, I'm gonna be able to see the volume and competition. And so that's important. However, one thing to note here is that Google's Keyword Planner, if I go back, just gives us low, medium, and high. And if I wanna compare numbers to numbers, Maybe I want to be able to get exactly the competition number for the, the keyword, how to become a digital marketing specialist. 
what I can do is go into Google and I can type in that keyword. So if I type in the keyword, how to become a digital marketing specialist, I can see there's 76 million results. So I could see 76 million results, 76.1 actually, and for the keyword, how to become a digital marketing specialist. Now that's a whole lot of results for this particular keyword, especially when the volume is only 30 uh, per month on average. And so what I wanna do is get a, a more clear picture of the competition. And so what you could actually do is type in the syntax all in title and then colon and then your keyword, how to become a digital marketing specialist. And when I do that, I get a different result. Here I can see only 136 listings for how to become a digital marketing specialist. But that's not just 136, that's 136 with that particular keyword that we wanna rank for in the title tag, okay? So the title tag is what you see when you type in a keyword or search query in Google search, and the title tag is what you see at the top of every search result. And so now I can see I typed in how to become a digital marketing specialist with the all in title syntax. And now I can see every listing, every one of these 136 results have that particular keyword in it. So I could see every one of them, how to become a digital marketing specialist. And why is that important? Because now that tells me I only need to climb over 136 listings to rank for that keyword, how to become a digital marketing specialist. And so the idea here is you wanna get your volume from Google's Keyword Planner, but you wanna get your competition from Google Search. And again, that's simply typing in the, the syntax, all in title, and then your keyword. In this example, how to become a digital marketing specialist. Once you get those two numbers, you're gonna plug them in to your spreadsheet. And then once you do that for a number of different keyword queries, and these keyword queries, again, have to be relevant. Once you do that, then you can go in and pick the keywords you wanna optimize for. And that's important because, again, if you're not sure about a keyword, then you wanna do the keyword research so you can be sure of how much traffic you can get and how much competition there is. Those are two important, three important factors in starting the process for on-page SEO. So again, okay, you want to create content for say a keyword like digital marketing, but digital marketing may seem a little bit broad. So you wanna probably stay away from broader keywords because broader keywords tend to have a lot of volume, which is great, but they may also tend to have a lot of competition. But that's the whole point of doing the keyword research. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe there's more volume than competition. That's what you need to find out when you do the keyword research. You need to find those keywords that are relevant to your content that have a lot of volume and low competition. And then once we identify those keywords, then we are free to go in and start optimizing our web pages for those keywords. And the first place we wanna start is the title tag. So if you remember my example, going back here to our search, how to become a digital marketing specialist, we saw that every one of these listings had that keyword in the title tag. And the title tag is important because that's what users who use Google search see first when they type in a query and get results. So they're gonna see the title tag. So the title tag is the most important element for on-page SEO. It's the most important factor because that's what people see. And so ideally when we choose our keyword, we wanna make sure that keyword is in the title tag because that's what shows up in Google search. And that's what makes that particular web page relevant for that keyword query. So the idea behind a title tag, it's between 50 and 60 characters. And so we wanna make sure we stay within that limit, no more than 60 characters, because what happens if it's beyond that, then Google will truncate the title tag. So if I go back to my search, you can see here on this particular title tag, Google truncated it, meaning they added the ellipses after the title tag because it exceeded the 60 character limit. So you wanna stay within those character counts. And so the title tag is the first place you should start when optimizing your website. Because when we have the right keyword in the title tag and somebody types in that keyword, then chances are it's gonna be relevant, they're gonna see it, and they're gonna click through to your website.
And that's the whole idea behind ranking. We want to get clicks. So that's how the title tag appears. So when you optimize it, you're going to update the title tag, and this is how it shows up. It's going to show up at the top of your listing, okay? And it's going to be bigger and bolder than anything else Google displays. So the second thing you want to optimize is the meta description. And the meta description is simply just a brief description up to 155, I would say about 155 to 60, 160 characters, but probably no more than that. And so the meta description is nothing more than a summary of the web page itself. So if I go back to my Google search results, I see my title tag and I see the page that this particular listing belongs to. And underneath that is where I can see my meta description. So in this particular keyword query, how to become a digital marketing specialist, I see the meta description, an ultimate guide on how to build a career in digital marketing and the skills required to become a digital marketing specialist. Note that it's a well-written meta description with 155 characters, and it includes the keyword digital marketing specialist. So we're trying to rank for how to become a digital marketing specialist. And here you can see become a digital marketing specialist. So there's a lot of relevancy between not only the title tag and the keyword, but the meta description in the keyword. So when you're optimizing a keyword, you want to start with the title tag, but you also want to update the meta description. Because if you don't update the meta description and you leave the meta description blank, then you're leaving it to Google to add in copy that they deem relevant. And so for on-page SEO, we want to take control of the copy and we want to optimize it for the keywords we want to be found for. So the meta description is a powerful tool at our disposal. It gives us more characters to work with. It gives us more to talk about. So for that particular page. And so if the title tag is only 60 characters maximum, it's not a lot of information to try and get somebody to click. So the meta description helps us and identifying what that page is about in order to get the click. So the two working in tandem will hopefully increase your click-through rates. So when you're found organically, we want to get the click. And then the third element that's important is the URL. And URL stands for Uniform Resource Locator. And why is the URL so important? Because that's what people see. So if I go back to my search result, how to become a digital marketing specialist, notice that the URL also includes how to become a digital marketing specialist article. Okay, so it's very relevant. The URL is very relevant. One, we can see it in the search results. But two, you know, it's relevant to the keyword query. And that's important for the end user and Google. Google wants to know, hey, is this the page that's relevant to the user's query? And if it is, then this user is likely going to have a good ex user experience after they click on the listing. So the URL is an element that helps not only with the click-through rate, but with ranking. And having a poor URL structure doesn't help at all because not only does Google not recognize the URL as being relevant, but the end user may not want to click on that page given the, the way the URL looks. So you want to try and avoid a poor URL structure. So the rule of thumb is this. If you don't understand what the URL is, then Google is likely not going to understand what the URL is. And so we want to try and keep our URL structures clean. And when I say clean, ideally you want to make sure that whatever keyword you're trying to optimize, that's the keyword that's included in the URL nothing included that is not understandable. So again, going back to our example, how to become a digital marketing specialist. It's very clean. The title tag is the keyword. The meta description is cleanly written, has the keyword. And then the URL is the other element that the end user can see. And that URL includes the keyword in it. So after we've done those three elements, the title tag, the meta description, and the URL, then we want to start optimizing the page itself. So ideally, when we say optimize the page itself, the page, remember, needs to be structured. And when we say structured, it needs to be structured in terms of you know headers and subheaders and organized in a manner in which the end user can read the article, read the content clearly and concisely without being confused. And so that's the job of headers. They Add, they add basically an organizational structure to the content. And with headers, there's a hierarchy. 
So you have anywhere from H1, which is the top of the hierarchy, to an H6. And so you're free to use any one of those headers when building out a page in order to organize the content. But ideally, you probably want to stick with an H1 or an H2 because those are at the top of the hierarchy. And what those do is they actually stress to Google that, hey, this header with this particular keyword in it is important. So if you use an H6 with the keyword in it, it's telling Google, hey, this is an H6, but it's not as important. So an H1 and an H2 tag show importance. And so let's look at an example of what that is. So here you can see an H1 is going to be at the top of the hierarchy. So that means it's going to be bigger and bolder. Then you have an H2, which is going to be bigger and bolder than an H3, but not as big and bold as an H2. So with headers, not only are you organizing the content accordingly, but you're also signaling to Google how important that particular header is. And of course, the header needs to include the keyword we're trying to rank for. So let's take a look again at that example. So if we go to how to become a digital marketing specialist, if I click on that page, I can look at the content and I can see that there are headers in here. So the headers are there to organize the content. And that's what we want. We want to be able to organize the content. And if you look at the other example I'm showing here, how to become a digital marketing specialist, uh, learning paths explored, you can see that's an H1, but below it's a subheader, the growing digital marketing job market. So that's an H2. And so we're not stressing to Google that that's more important than an H1, but nonetheless, we're stressing to Google that it's important nonetheless. So we want to be able to use headers. We want to be able to use keywords in our headers in order to stress to Google what's important, and also to organize the content because Google likes content organized. Okay, the next element we want to focus on is internal linking. And so internal linking, if you remember uh, earlier in the presentation, is basically links from one page on your website to another. And so here we can see on this particular article, how to become a digital marketing specialist. There's also links to other pages on Simply Learn's website. And so for this particular content, it also links to SEO specialist, PPC specialist, social media marketing specialist, and digital marketing specialist. So the whole idea behind internal linking is to link from one page to another where it's relevant. And in this case, it's relevant because we're talking about how to become a digital marketing specialist. That's what the whole content is about. And so what Simply Learn is doing here is offering up other pages on their website that are relevant to becoming a digital marketing specialist. And so this is a best practice when you're optimizing a web page. So you want to be able to have internal linking on your site. And the whole idea behind internal linking is it also allows users to navigate through the site naturally. So when I say naturally, they don't always have to refer back to the top navigation. They can naturally and seamlessly go from one relevant article or page to another. And so that's the whole idea behind link building and internal link building. It allows Google to identify you know, pages that they want to crawl and index because they're linked to one another. But it also helps the end user because it allows the end user to go from one page to another. And it's signaling to Google, hey, this particular page is linked to this page. So we're going to also index that page. And so that's the whole important part of internal linking. It's about the end user experience and it's about allowing Google to find the pages on your website so they can crawl them and index them so you can be ranked for them. And so also, in addition to internal linking, we want to be able to use natural language. And so what do I mean by natural language or natural language processing? So what Google does is, in terms of natural language processing, they're looking for the content and the keyword. It needs to be relevant. So when your website is about digital marketing, you don't necessarily want to rank or try to rank for the keyword digital marketing. One, it's too broad. Two, there might be some competition. But three, you're probably not going to write something as broad like digital marketing. So ideally, what you want to do is you want to choose other 
relevant, related keywords that's going to be more natural. And so that's what we mean by natural language processing. We want to choose keywords that are more natural to the content you're writing. So instead of the keyword digital marketing, maybe we want to talk about the types of digital marketing or digital marketing examples or what is a digital marketing strategy or how to become a digital marketing specialist. So those are all relevant keywords to digital marketing and more relevant to the content. Because if you try to rank for the keyword digital marketing, again, it's probably going to be a little bit broad, probably more competition, and not as relevant to your content. And as a result, probably not a good user experience. So think about some other keywords that you could optimize and rank for. And that goes back to the keyword research. That's why the keyword research is so important because it allows us to identify other keywords in the natural language process. What keywords are more relevant for the content? And then another element to on-page SEO is the sitemap. And so with the sitemap, it's basically a list of all the pages on your website. And the whole idea of listing all the pages on your website in one document is it helps both users and search engines understand the structure of your website. So there are two types of sitemaps. One's an HTML sitemap, and that's designed for humans. So if you have a website with a lot of content, at the footer or the bottom of your web page, you probably want to have a link to sitemap. So if somebody clicks on that sitemap, they're going to be able to see all the pages on your website structured in an organized manner. Well, an XML sitemap, and XML is just a different format, it's designed for crawlers. And so the whole idea, remember, is Google likes to crawl content. When they crawl content, they bring it back to their servers and index it. And so we want to be able to create a sitemap for Google or other search engine crawlers. And so XML is the format. So let me show you an example of how that looks. So if I go to simplylearn.com and simply type in, say, sitemap.xml, just as an example, I'm going to get this particular page. And this particular page displays two XML sitemaps. So these sitemaps are there for Google to go ahead and crawl and nothing more than a list of all the pages on your website. And so this is a quick and easy way for Google to get a hold of all those pages so that they can index them. And that's the whole idea behind SEO. You want to be able to have Google index all the content you want to be found for, for the keywords you want to be found for. So it all starts with the sitemap. So let's go from on-page SEO, which in recap is basically optimizing certain elements on your website so that you are relevant for a particular keyword. And that meant updating the title tag, the meta description, the URL, the headers, choosing the right keywords to put into the content, having internal linking, and also updating the sitemap. Well, those are elements that you can do on your website. So we're going to switch gears and talk about a different strategy, off-page SEO. Because without on-page or off-page, you can't have a page ranking. So the two work together. So you can do as much as you want on on-page, but you still need off-page SEO. And you could do all the off-page SEO you want, but you still need on-page. So both of these strategies have to be in full effect in order for you to rank. So let's now switch gears to off-page SEO. And so off-page SEO is simply the process of linking or promoting your website using link building. And so if you remember, I talked about this earlier on. There's two types of links, internal, and external linking. And so for on-page SEO, we used internal linking. For off-page SEO, we're gonna talk about external linking. And external linking allows us to improve our website's recognition or relevancy or credibility. And why do we want to improve our relevancy and credibility and trustworthiness and authority? Because we want Google to know that our web page is trustworthy. It is recognized by other websites and it is relevant for a particular keyword. And so if we can do that using off-page SEO methods, then Google's going to rank our web page for the keyword we want to be found for. So it's really off-page SEO is synonymous with link building. And there's plenty of opportunities to do link building. It just comes down to creating a strategy. So again, some of the benefits to off-page, well, we talked about 
you know, being credible and trustworthiness and relevant, we need to do that in order to rank. But there's some other benefits there. So if we have a link on another credible website, then it's likely going to increase the traffic to our own website. It also creates high domain authority. And so what I mean by high domain authority is if we have basically links to other web pages, pointing back to us, then basically our domain authority is going to improve. And when our domain authority improves, other websites are gonna to wanna to link to us. So the higher authoritative we are for our website, then other web pages are gonna to want to link to us. And so the more external linking we have, the higher the domain authority. So it all starts with linking to other high domain authority websites. So linking to a high domain authority website, for example, having a link on Wikipedia that points back to our web page creates high domain authority for us and it helps drive traffic. So some of the other benefits of off-page SEO are credibility. So if we're linking from Wikipedia to our web page, it does create credibility for us. It also helps us increase our page rank. So remember that external linking helps build domain authority, helps build credibility, trustworthiness, and it's going to in turn help us rank for that particular page. And then certainly not last, Having a good off-page SEO link building strategy increases our brand awareness because if we're on other high authority websites, Wikipedia, or say a social platform, it's going to increase our brand awareness and increasing our brand awareness increases our trustworthiness. And so if somebody is looking to say, become a digital marketing specialist, then likely instead of typing in digital marketing specialist on Google, they may type in our brand name, in this case, Simply Learn. And so these are all the benefits to off-page SEO. So it's nothing more than having links on other websites that are pointing back to ours. And again, there's lots of benefits. It drives, helps drive traffic and increases our authority. So those are things that we want to take advantage of when we want to rank. And the key behind off-page SEO or link building is always going to be content. So from an on-page SEO perspective, Having quality content allows that content to be optimized for a relevant keyword and ranked. But also from an off-page SEO strategy, having high quality content allows us to have other sites and it doesn't necessarily have to be a website. It could be a social platform or it can be another blogging platform or blogging website link back to ours. Why? Because the content is original, it's natural, it's well-structured, it reads well. And so that's the whole idea behind Offpage. You can't have links on other websites if you don't have quality content. So one of the ideas behind Offpage SEO is not only do you wanna create good content, but you probably want to spend a lot of time or a bit of time on others' websites. So remember the example I used earlier in this presentation about having an ice cream blog and ice cream recipes? Well, it probably wouldn't be a bad idea to say, spend some time on other blogs related to desserts related to cakes, related to food in general, related to vegetables or other items that people could link from. So the whole idea is understanding who else is out there, who has relevant content that you could share. So you could share your content with them, they can share their content with you. And generally that's how it works naturally anyway. In the web sphere, if somebody likes your content, they're gonna link to it. They don't necessarily have to wait for you to ask them. But it might not be a bad idea to understand who else is out there that has content similar to yours so that you can you know, get a link on that particular website or blog post. And so some other ideas behind having external links pointing back to your website is social media. So social media is not just Facebook or Twitter, but it expands beyond that. There's there's Quora, there's Medium, there's all sorts of content generated websites like Reddit. So the list goes on and on. You just need to find what's relevant for your content. If it's relevant for your content, then it's worth putting or trying to get the external link on that social media platform. And then again, going back to my ice cream blog recipes, blog post, yeah, if you find a particular blog that you want to have an external link on, there's nothing wrong with reaching out to that particular blogger. 
you know, in some cases very flattering, but in other cases, if the content is relevant, then why not? It's only going to help your end user experience. If you add somebody who has, a, say, a blog about cakes, having their link on your blog post. So there's nothing wrong with it because it also adds to the user experience. And if you're gonna ask somebody to put an external link on theirs, you might want to be open-minded and make sure that you are able and willing to put an external link on your blog post or website pointing to their content. That's how the web works, especially if the content's of quality, relevant, and of good nature. Okay, so let's move on and finish up with the do's and don'ts of SEO. So we talked a lot about you know, why SEO, what is SEO, you know, how do we rank for SEO, you know, what is on-page SEO, what is off-page SEO. And so let's just wrap up with some of the things you, again, want to do to rank your page for a particular keyword and some of the things you don't want to do. So the first thing on the list is optimize for white hat techniques. And what I mean for opting in for white hat techniques is basically everything I just mentioned today. You want to do keyword research. You want to choose a natural language processing form format so you could choose keywords that are going to be relevant natural to the content. And you don't want to opt for black hat techniques. And black hat techniques are probably not even worth going into detail. But one example is choosing a keyword arbitrarily like say digital marketing and just stuffing that keyword into the content. So that's probably not something you want to do because again, it's not going to be good for the end user. So stay away from black hat and focus on some of the techniques we talked about in today's presentation. The other do we want to do is get backlinks from relevant sites. So that's off page SEO. Again, it's what I mentioned earlier. It's about linking your quality content to another person's website that also has quality content. We don't want to have a backlink from an irrelevant site. Why? Because it's not going to be relevant and it's also going to hurt our authority because if it's on a site that's not of good quality, then Google's going to look at us and say, well, this site is linking to your site, but it's not relevant. So therefore, you know, we're not going to look at you in the same way as if you were on a quality website. We do want to use our keywords naturally because title tags are what people see first on organic search. But you don't want to use the same title tag on every page of your website. So we want to stay away from doing that. So you want to have a unique title tag for every web page on your website. And ideally, what does that mean? That means using our keyword research to choose one to two keywords for page and optimizing your web page for those one to two keywords. So you ideally, what you want to do is have one to two different keywords for every page on your website. We definitely, definitely, definitely want to write engaging content. So the content should be engaging. Remember, user experience. We want users to stay on our website. We want them to enjoy the content that they're reading. And we want them to go from one page to another naturally. We definitely don't want to leverage or plagiarize or just copy content from others' websites because it's not, one, probably going to be relevant to what you're writing about. Two, it's duplicate content and it's somebody else's. So that's a black cat technique we want to stay away from. I can't emphasize this enough. We need to do keyword research first before you do anything else. You need to find relevant keywords. And not only that, you need to understand the volume and the competition for each of those keywords. Okay, you don't want to choose a keyword that has low volume, high competition. You want to choose a keyword that has high volume, low competition. But above all, you want to choose keywords that are relevant to your content. We want to avoid keyword stuffing. So don't take a keyword and just stuff it everywhere on the page. It's not going to be natural and Google's going to be able to pick up on that. So we want to maintain some level of quality with our content and quality with the keywords that we choose. So reminder, when you have quality content, it's always going to link internally to another page on your website with quality content, but it's got to be natural. And don't just build site-wide backlinks, meaning don't just have an internal link to the homepage or don't have every page on your website linking to just one page. So internal linking should be natural, naturally linking from one page to another. Not only does it help Google understand and crawl all the web pages on your website, 
but it's good for the end user. It's good user experience. And certainly last, but something I didn't talk about, it does take time to rank your content. So remember the process. You're gonna write your content. You're going to choose keywords. You're going to change the elements on that page for those keywords. And all the while, you're gonna make sure Google can crawl that content. And when they crawl it, they're gonna index it. The process takes time, especially if you choose a keyword that's competitive. So just be patient. If you have quality content and you've optimized for on-page SEO and off-page SEO, then you will rank for that keyword. And then make sure your website's user-friendly and mobile-friendly. So we talked about responsive content earlier. So remember, most users today start the process of search on mobile. So we wanna make sure your websites are mobile-friendly. On-page optimization, as the name suggests, is the practice of optimizing web pages to rank higher and get relevant traffic from the search engine. On-page optimization includes both content and HTML source code optimization. Search engine optimization can be very complex. So when you're trying to understand it for the first time, I find it very easy just to break it up into general concepts that you might already have an understanding of. When you look at the hundreds of signals that go into SEO, they can be broken up into either relevancy or, because sometimes it's both, popularity. So relevancy and popularity. Out of all these signals, they fit into one of these two things. We're going to break all the signals we have into these two areas. In this section, we're going to talk about the on-page factors. That's because these are the factors that you have direct impact upon. And you can make a small tweak and have a big impact with organic traffic, with your on-page relevancy factors. The primary on-page relevancy factors that I'll cover in this lesson are title tags and meta descriptions, header tags, which are used for headlines and subheadings, website URLs and URL structure, image alt text, internal links, keyword usage, and sitemaps. Let's start with one of my favorites, and that is the title tag. This is also called a page title. The page title is not shown on the page. Now rather, it is displayed on the browser tab. And this is what makes it highly important, is that in addition to being displayed on the browser tab, it is also the title tag or the page title that is shown on the text in the Google search results as the link to the page. The page title influences both the click-through rates and people's first impressions of our website. Next up, we have the meta description. Now, the meta description can be a bit confusing. The meta description is in the code, and it does not influence rankings, but it does influence clicks. People will see your snippet or your page information in the search engine results. That gray text is the meta description. If you don't have a meta description, then it may pull information from the page. You can affect this and improve the chances of your meta description appearing if you write a short descriptive phrase of the content or the purpose of the page. And just because we edit these elements does not guarantee that they will show up. I often say that we affect the change, but we cannot control it. This is because the search engine may override your changes and show different content in these areas. Sometimes it may help and it might be a better description, but many times it's not. Now let's go to the next element, the header tags. These are also referred to as the heading and subheading. And this is how HTML was built when the web was first created. It enables a logical hierarchy of content. So starting with the headline, then displaying a subheading, and then subheadings after that. The idea here is that you're establishing a hierarchy of information. So you start with the H1. Like a newspaper, there's only one main headline per page. It describes the main purpose of the page. Then a subheading, the H2. This is how you break the subcontent into subcategories. Obviously, you'll want to use a keyword in there as well. You see, by describing the purpose of the page in the headline, and then again in a subheading, 
you're naturally going to use your primary and secondary keywords because you're going to associate them with the product or the purpose and the benefit. The key is to keep it short. You see, after the headline are the subcategories, the H2s, and then your H3 is typically used as a paragraph heading. Now, putting the keyword in these headings alone does not make your page optimized. Remember, the purpose is to provide a quick reference for people to find the content they need within seconds. So short, explanatory heading and subheadings, paragraph headings, are very effective. And naturally, you'll be using keywords to help people locate the information that is most important to them. Now, if we go back to the search engine results page, the SERP, there is another element in that listing. The page title is the large blue text. The meta description is the gray text. Now, the green text is the URL of the page that is listed. This is the address of the page. Just like the address for your home, the internet knows that the URL is the address for that page. This is extremely important for SEO for a variety of reasons. The most important, though, is your keyword usage. I like to make sure that I have at least one relevant word in the URL. Now, also, here, keep it short. One of the worst things you can do is have a URL full of keywords, or even worse, hyphenate them all. And remember, people use these URLs. They provide context for the page. People also copy and paste URLs into mobile messages, emails, and social links. So it is extremely important to keep these short, succinct, and I like to say readable. Now, I've just briefly touched about the importance of the URL. And now let's look at the URL structure. First, let's start with the primary core of the URL, the domain name. In the example with the URL I have here, example.com, that's the domain name. So this is the first thing that people see with your online business. Now, be on the internet, this is going to be what's in all of your ads, emails, brochures, business cards, and online, your social profiles, all of your marketing efforts are going to drive people to this domain. There's a lot of advice about buying or using domains that have your keywords in them. And unfortunately, domains have been being sold for decades, so there's less chance of finding a domain with the keywords you want. Now, the search engines don't make the keyword used in the domain a primary ranking signal, so that's good. However, the domain is your business. It needs to be memorable. If you have a very, I call it a spammy looking domain name, with multiple words and hyphens, or one that's hard to spell or confusing, people are going to make an initial impression off of that. So make sure you have something that's going to make a great first impression. Here's the rule for a domain name. Something that's easy to spell and easy to pronounce. Ideally, sure, it's something you can type and share. Something you're going to be able to put on a business card and be proud of. Not something that you bought primarily because you want it for SEO reasons and you think with that you're going to succeed. As an example, just think about Amazon. Their domain name says nothing about books and yet it grew to be one of the largest e-commerce companies in the world. The same with Alibaba or Google. Their domain names were not the keyword, but their marketing and branding built their company. Now, everything after the domain is a subdirectory. This is based on your website organization. As an example, if you have a website selling shoes, then the subdirectory can be called shoes. It's easy, right? The subdirectory is the folder that contains the relevant files or pages for that group. Think of a file folder with documents inside. The file folder is usually based on a major category of content or products. Now, inside the folder are individual documents or pages. These files or pages usually come after the subdirectory. In this example, you see the file.html. The next step in optimizing the URL is to name the page in a way that explains the content of the page. To use our e-commerce shoe website, a page name would usually be a specific product name. This way you would end up with domain name, forward slash shoes as the category, forward slash brand name running shoe. Insert that here. If you've ever looked at the HTML that make up the instructions of the page, you'll understand a bit more of how search engines get the information from the page. The text on the page and the markup, such as the headings, provide instructions as to where the text is located, the importance and prominence of the text, 
in addition to the arrangement of the overall page. HTML is a set of instructions for a browser to assemble the page, and the search engines use that as well. Now, the search engine's spiders cannot see images. As the internet developed, many attributes were added to provide for accessibility and additional features. Users that are sight impaired cannot see images. And the alternative text tag describes the image. Further, there are many times when our bandwidth isn't strong and not all of the images will load. In that case, we need the alt text description to provide the context of the image and its purpose. Search engines use this alt text description to gain additional context about the page, the content of the image, and its purpose. Now, we have an entire section on links, but at this point, I just want to cover internal links. An internal link is a link from one page on your website to another page of your own website. Now, this is important from a relevancy perspective. You'll see internal links in your main navigation. You'll likely have a link that says home, one that says contact us or about our company. What you're showing to search engines and to humans is that this section, if you click on this link, is about our company or this is where you find our contact information. You see, these links are not votes like external links. However, they provide relevance and context to the information on your own website. Let's dive in a little more on keywords. When a search engine crawls and processes your website, it doesn't simply look for the instances of specific keywords. It's a lot more complex than that. It's using a technology called natural language processing. Natural language processing uses algorithms to try to understand the meaning of text. You see, search engine processing is attempting to be human. This is the same way that people see and hear the words, and we're using the words to find the meaning expressed in the words. Similarly, when a search engine goes to your website, it may see keywords, but it's looking for the context of those words. You may say football, but just having the word football repeated throughout your website isn't going to help you rank specifically for football. What you need to do and what is more common in actual human conversation happens very naturally. When we talk about football, we use naturally additional words such as goal and referee and World Cup. You see, Google and the other search engines are going to take these into account. By usage of other synonyms and other common words, you present the context of a bigger, broader idea for your website. The next site signal that we have is sitemaps. Now, there are two kinds of sitemaps. There's the sitemap that is for humans, and there is the sitemap that are for search engine robots, crawlers, or spiders. The one that is for human is called an HTML sitemap. You've probably seen these before. The link is generally in the footer of a website. If you click on it, it shows you the major sections of the website, provides some search functionality, but looking at it as a human, it shows you the hierarchy of the website and where to find important information. It shows how everything fits together. Now there's something else that exists called an XML sitemap. It's not linked from any page of your website, but exists as an independent file on your server. Now, this is something you can see, but it is formatted for search engine spiders. Using a programming language called XML, it shows the hierarchy and the priority of each of the URLs of the website, every page, every document, every image. And it also shows the date that each page was last updated or changed. So at this point, we've covered a lot of things that are important and things that you should be doing when optimizing your on-page content. Now let's go a different direction and cover things that you should not be doing. Keyword stuffing, hidden text, repetitive anchor text, and cloaking. The first one is keyword stuffing. Now, back in the early days of search engine optimization, people used to increase the instances of words on the page. Now, this is well before natural language processing. At that time, search engines were looking for occurrences of specific words. Well, search engines, they're very smart about this. What may have worked 20 years ago or 10 years ago, keyword stuffing does not work. 
You're not going to rank better for any given phrase by including it a dozen or more times on the page. In fact, you might get an over-optimization penalty by constantly repeating the same word over and over. Focus on writing content that engages with your visitors and uses language naturally. Now, the next one is hidden text. Unfortunately, I still see this. This is when you write content that is solely for search engines and not for people. Now, typically it is attempted by writing a lot of repetitive keywords as text, coloring it white and placing it against a white background. You see, this was developed as another way to add more keyword stuff text without the user seeing the overuse of keywords. Now, it didn't work too well in the past and it definitely does not work today. This tactic backfires in two ways. First, search engines can tell when it's white text on a white background. It's easy to tell from a computer science point of view. Search engines read the HTML and in the HTML are the instructions for colors. When you hide text, modern search engines are smart enough to figure it out, probably better than a human. Now secondly, it's done to hide repetitive keyword stuff text, which is the second thing against you. These outdated, unprofessional tactics will most likely get a website penalized by the search engines. The next one is repetitive anchor text. You may have followed a link to a page when looking for a business or information, and instead of the information you want, you get a page that doesn't feel like it was written for people. Every sentence is redundant, repetitive, and almost every keyword is linked even when there doesn't need to be a link. It confuses the flow of the information on the page. Now, again, this used to be a tactic that sometimes would work, but it's no longer helpful. Search engines and their natural language processing algorithms have advanced significantly. They can tell when something's not readable. When something is probably intended for machines and rankings, but not for people, search engines will figure it out. Please don't waste time on redundant links trying to inflate the relevance of your links and pages. The last thing to cover here is cloaking. Cloaking is the idea of showing one thing to the search engines and something entirely different to humans. Now, this is related to the rest of the tactics I just covered. It's something that used to work, but it was expressly against the search engine guidelines. While it may have worked if the search engines discovered it on your website, you could have been penalized or dropped from the search engine results entirely. Now we've covered all of the most important on-page optimization factors. Let's take a look at what the theoretically perfectly optimized page would look like. In this example, we can see many of these elements being used together. You can also see that the base key phrase, digital camera, is being repeated, but always included with a specific context. First at the top of the page is the URL, which has digital cameras in the address. The page title follows using the context of the information and adding the word reviews. You can also see at the top of the page that the main navigation and secondary navigation, also called the breadcrumb navigation, provides context of the page's location within the entire website and natural keyword usage. The H1 headline is the key phrase, but also happens to simply be the best title for the content of the page. The subsequent subheadings provide additional information such as ratings, recommendations, and features. The links provide relevant ways to access additional content. The image utilizes alt text. There are also clear calls to action, which provide relevant offers to visitors. As you can see, the context of all of the content is very strong and sends a clear relevancy signal to both search engines and readers. To conclude this section, I'd like to cover the top influencing factors. Now, sometimes you may find these as lists, but I found it a bit more practical to separate them into categories. Typically, every year, you'll find these collections of lists from surveys, experts, or speculation. Some are from testing, but honestly, you can't ever truly test a search engine as they change a little bit with every algorithm. So the best thing is to take from these lists these factors that are the tried and true factors over the years that have worked consistently. Also, those tactics that not only make your website more effective with users, they tend to do well with search engines. So if a tactic serves that dual purpose, it's a good tactic. 
So these are not exclusive and have to lists for every situation, but guides and indicators for you to use. The top on-page factors from surveys, opinions, and data are these. A relevant page title, page headings, anchor text links, a keyword-based URL, a keyword or contextual file name, such as page name, image name, or PDF file name, alt text and images, and finally, what you do with the content on a page to make it more readable, lists, bullet points, and bolded text. The top factors for off-page linking tend to contain these items. The total number of domains linking to you. The number of highly influential domains linking to you. The number of unique domain IP addresses. The total backlinks without nofollow limits. The total relevant anchor text in links to you. And finally, the types and context of keywords in anchor text links. The domain also contributes factors to your overall rankings, such as the age of the domain, which would include ownership information, such as the length of time owned and operated by a company, the real business information tied to that domain, such as the business address being the same as the business registration address for the domain. In addition, the signals from social accounts driving visits to the domain. Functionally, the search engines also utilize some attribution based on the quality of programming of the website. For instance, taking care of the basic search engine protocols of the robots.txt file, XML sitemap, and HTTPS protocol. Websites that implement these features have shown that they are familiar with search engine guidelines and protocol. Now, one of the changes over the past few years has been the implementation of page speed as an increasing ranking factor. Slow loading pages with a lot of extraneous code that slow the delivery of the page will be penalized as they take away from the user experience. Optimizing the page code, speeding up the load time of the page can directly impact your rankings. And this is closely related to the mobile friendliness of your website. If your website is not mobile friendly, it will be limited in visibility as Google's primary index is focused on mobile devices and mobile delivery. Behavioral factors are the newest factors. And with the advent of artificial intelligence, it is making determining the intent and the, is making determining easier for a search engine to derive a judgment of relevancy based on interaction. While the extent of these signals is not fully known, it is suspected that they are minor but growing in importance. These include the amount of users that search for a brand name, business name, and go to that result, showing brand awareness. Also, the amount of direct visits, bypassing search, time on page, pages per session, which is also called the depth of visit. And lastly, the behavior of a searcher from the results page. How many results are clicked? How many times do they return to the results? This evaluation is looking to judge if the results presented were satisfactory or deficient for that query. So let's start with the why we would do keyword research. So Jesse is planning to publish a blog of pizza recipes. So she was doing pizza recipes step by step, pizza recipes with sausage, homemade pizza toppings, pizza dough recipes, thin crust pizzas. She's doing a lot of different topics on pizza recipes. Well, what Jesse needs to do is understand what's going to drive traffic to these blog posts if she's writing about you know different topics around pizza recipes. So she's unsure how these blogs are going to drive traffic. So she really needs to understand that, hey, you need to choose the right keywords to drive traffic. So the question is, if you're writing a blog post about recipes with sausages, is pizza recipes with sausages or recipes for free the best keywords to use? Maybe, maybe not. So you need to take uh, care in choosing the keywords to align with your content. So that's really the idea of why we would do keyword research because some of the issues 
issues with keywords that are poorly chosen are they could have low search volume. For example, you may choose a keyword that just a lot of people aren't using to search for, or they can be highly competitive. So if you choose a keyword that's very broad or popular, it could be very competitive and take you a long time to be found for that keyword. Or you could just make the mistake of choosing a keyword that isn't aligned with your content. Or you can choose keywords, but use them incorrectly with your content. So these are some of the issues that you can encounter if you just go about choosing keywords randomly without due diligence without the proper research. So low vo search volume will lead to less traffic, high competition, you may not even rank at all. Okay, if somebody finds you for a keyword that's not relevant to the topic, they're just going to leave the page. And if you're not using the right keywords and or if you are using the right keywords and not using them correctly in the content, then your pages may not even be found in organic search. So you really have to take care in choosing the keywords. To me, that's the most important step with SEO is keywords keyword research. So we're going to talk about the types of keyword research then. So we have short tail keywords and we have long tail keywords. So if you write a blog post about pizza recipes, well, what are you going to choose a short tail or long tail? So let's talk about short tail keywords first. So short tail keywords are keywords that are usually three keywords in a phrase or shorter. In some cases, it may be two keywords in a phrase or shorter. So short tail keywords usually have high search volume volume, which means likely means higher competition. But what it also means it could be lower conversions because short tail keywords like for example, pizza recipes could be considered a short tail keyword, but maybe somebody's looking for homemade pizza recipes or pizza recipes from their favorite Italian restaurant. So short tail keywords may not be as relevant. So if we compare it with long tail keywords, chances are you're going to have lower competition. That's one of the benefits, but you're also going to have lower search volume. But with longer tail keywords, the keyword is probably going to be more relevant with the content you're writing about. So therefore, the conversion rates likely going to be higher. So that's really the difference between short tail keywords and long tail keywords. If you want to look at simplistically, short tail keywords are broad in nature, it's going to capture a lot of eyeballs, but those eyeballs may look at your content as not relevant versus long tail keywords that may be very relevant, but not as many eyeballs on them. So short tail keywords, the characteristics, they're not as specific. Usually they're less than three words. They have high search volume and high competition. So if you just choose pizza recipes, could take you a while to rank for that keyword. But when you rank, you're going to get the traffic. But again, it may not convert because the keyword is broad in nature. So pizza recipes is a short tail keyword that may not be exactly what you're writing about in your blog post. So it may draw a lot of traffic, but the traffic may not do anything. So the longer tail keywords are very specific. They consist of more than three words in the search query. They have relatively low search volume and competition. So the chance of you ranking higher faster for that long tail keyword is probably going to be greater because not many other websites are trying to rank for that same keyword. And so the benefit of that is if you have, let's just say homemade pizza recipes with mushrooms, that's a long tail keyword. But if somebody's looking for that type of pizza recipe, then you know you're going to track the right traffic and chances are that traffic is going to engage or convert based on the type of conversion you have in place. So an example would be homemade pizza dough recipes. That'd be another example. More than three keywords in the phrase, very specific. We're talking about homemade pizza dough recipes. So we're not talking about just pizza recipes. So it's a little bit more uh, specific in nature, longer tail. So these keywords are used for targeted pages, including blog posts. If you're writing a blog post specifically about pizza recipes with homemade dough, then this is the keyword you likely would want to use versus just pizza recipes. So let's look at an example between a short tail keyword and a long tail keyword. And to accentuate the differences, we're going to use Google's keyword planner tool. So Google's keyword planner tool is located in Google ads. The 
Google Ads platform. And when you're in the Google Ads platform, you can simply click on Tools and then Keyword Planner. And so what Keyword Planner allows us to do is get a sense of the type of volume that a particular keyword has. So what Google's Keyword Planner does is they show you the average monthly searches. This is the average monthly search volume of a keyword over the past 12 months. And so in this example, we're gonna choose pizza recipes and homemade pizza dough recipes. So one short tail and one long tail. So we enter those keywords in, we're gonna click get results. And what Google's gonna do is it's going to show us the volume of those keywords. So for pizza recipe, we could see the average monthly search volume is 33,100 for pizza recipe. So note that pizza recipe and pizza recipes are closely related keywords. And so what Google does is they consider that a close variance. So meaning if somebody types in pizza recipe, then they're also in Google's eyes looking for pizza recipes. So it's a close variance. And so for the keyword pizza recipe, which is short tail, we could see on average over the past 12 months, this keyword received 33,100 queries. And so if we hover over the graph, we could see basically the volume, the average volume per month. So here I could see for this particular keyword here, the volume per month is 33,000. And then I could see the actual volume over the past 12 months. And then for the long tail keyword, I can see homemade pizza dough recipe. Again, close variance, homemade pizza dough recipes. I can see over the past 12 months what the search volume is for this. On average, it's 2,400. But I could see here in December, the volume went up to 3,600. But for example, in May, it was 1,900. So it's gonna fluctuate a bit over the past 12 months, but on average, it's about 2,400. So shorter tail, a lot of more volume. Longer tail, not as much volume, but nonetheless, there is volume here. And so, these are the differences between a short tail and a longer tail. And so what Google's Keyword Planner also does is allow us to get a sense of what the competition is. And so here I can see the competition is low for both of these keywords. Fair enough. So we now know that if we want to optimize or choose the keyword homemade pizza dough recipe for our blog post, we know for ranked on page one of Google, even in the top spot, we can expect about 2,400 search queries for that keyword. Now, whether you get all 2,400 clicks for that keyword remains to be seen. Chances are you're not gonna get all 2,400. You're gonna get a lion's share of those clicks, but you're going to at least get some volume on it. So even the longer tier keywords have a lot of promise because there is some search volume here for this keyword. How to do a proper keyword research. So we looked at Google's keyword planner tool in Google Ads and we typed in two keywords and we were able to get a sense of what the average volume is. So we definitely want to choose keywords based on the following factors. We want to choose it based on search volume. Search volume is a good indicator of the potential traffic we can obtain. So again, for the keyword homemade pizza dough recipe, we know that it averages 2,400 a month and search volume again we may not get all 2400 but we're gonna get a lion's share of that we also need to look at competition and so Google's keyword planner gives us a high medium or low in terms of the competition but if you're somebody who wants to get a, a better sense of what the competition is and you should because competition is a key component in choosing keywords and so what I want to do is get a sense of how many people are actually optimizing for that keyword so Google's keyword planner tool is going to give me a low, medium, high. Really what I want to do is get a better sense of that numerically. So what I can do is go into Google's search and I could type in pizza recipes and I could see there's about 1 billion results. That's a lot of results. However, that means that every potential web page out there on the internet that mentions pizza recipes is going to be included in this number here. And so I wanna get a better sense of who's optimizing for pizza recipes. So I'm gonna put in the all entitled syntax 
And so what that is going to ask Google to do is tell me all the websites that have pizza recipes, the keyword pizza recipes in the title tag. So if I do all in title, colon, space, then pizza recipes, my result drops down to 336,000. So what that tells me is that there are 336,000 results with the keyword pizza recipes in the title tag. Now, if I wanna focus in on my other keyword, if I choose uh, my other keyword was a longer tail keyword, homemade pizza dough recipe. So if I type that keyword in, the homemade pizza dough recipe or recipes, remember close variants, and I just click enter or type the keyword in and hit my enter key, I'm gonna get 35 million results. But again, is that really an indicator of the type of competition I have? No, because every listing that mentions homemade pizza dough recipes is going to be included in the search results. So I'm gonna type in my all in title, colon, space, and then I'm gonna get a better sense of how many websites have the keyword homemade pizza dough recipes in the title tag. And I get 2,160 different results. So here I can see the first result in the title tag, homemade pizza dough recipe. Second one, homemade pizza dough recipe. So these are sites or web pages that have that keyword in the title tag. So now I have a numerical number to work with. And so the thing you have to understand about SEO, specifically about keyword research, is you need to do research on a few different keywords, not just one or two. So what we want to do is have a spreadsheet. The spreadsheet is going to contain keywords that we can potentially want to optimize for, choose as keywords to optimize for SEO. And so my recommendation is you come up with a theme first. So the theme for us in this exercise is pizza recipes. And so that's our theme. So we chose the keyword pizza recipes. So the close variance here is pizza recipe. What was the volume? Well, we know the volume was 33,100 for pizza recipe. So what are we gonna do? We're gonna put that number in, in our volume column. What was the competition? Well, if we go back and type in pizza recipes, it was 683,000. So I'm gonna type in 683,000. What was our next keyword? Well, it was pizza or homemade pizza dough recipes. So if I go back for this particular keyword is 2400. So I'm gonna put 2400 in under my volume column. And then what was my competition? Well, my competition was, I type that keyword back in, 2160. So I'm gonna put 2160. So now I have an idea of what kind of volume and what kind of competition I have. Now, you wanna do this for a number of different keywords. And when you do it for a number of keywords, what you do want to do is obviously choose a relevant keyword that has high volume and low competition. So another way of saying it is the volume or ratio of volume to competition. And so basically what we could do is take volume divided by competition. If I make that a percentage, I could see it's 0.35% is the ratio between volume and competition. If I do the same for my longer tail keyword, 2400 divided by 2160, I can see that 111%. So this just kind of proves the point that, yeah, I'm still gonna get some volume, but I have a better chance of ranking for this longer tail keyword, homemade pizza dough recipes. So you wanna be able to do that for a number of keywords and examine the volume, the competition, and the ratio between volume and competition for your themed keywords. In this case, pizza recipes. So relevancy, you wanna choose keywords that are very relevant to the content that you're writing. And then again, commercial intent, what keywords are going to drive more conversions and revenue for the business? So when we talk about commercial intent, we're talking about, you know, are you choosing keywords that are going to get somebody to do what you want them to do? So we could say, you know, download pizza dough recipes. So if somebody's typing in the keyword, download pizza dough recipes, then chances are they're gonna find you, come to your site and take action by downloading that pizza dough recipe. So you wanna be able to also think about the intent of the keyword. Is it gonna help you drive conversions and revenue if you're an e-commerce site? So search volume is the average monthly search volume made for a particular keyword and phrase. So we can get that number using Google's keyword planner tool in the Google Ads platform. We wanna target keywords with high search volume that will help bring traffic to the website. We want volume, but we wanna take into account, see, 
seasonality as well. So that's where the Google's Keyword Planner tool comes in place because if we go back, again, we can just hover over and we can get a sense of any particular trend going on or seasonality. So for example, if I saw large growth in the winter months and not much volume growth in the summer months, then that might indicate to me that this keyword is more popular during the winter time. So pay attention to the graphs that you know the Keyword Planner tool gives you. Use them to your advantage to take into account seasonality. So a good example would be funny Halloween costumes. Well, we know that for Halloween, you're going to have a spike probably towards the end of September, all the way through October, and then it's going to drop after October 31st, which is Halloween. So that's an example. But in the case of pizza recipes, you know, you may find that more people are, are choosing Using to search for pizza recipes during maybe the summer months versus the winter months. So pay attention to seasonality. It will affect search volume. So competition, based on our example, it's one of the most important key metrics. You don't want to choose a keyword that's highly competitive because if it's competitive, then it's going to be harder to rank number one or even on page one of Google, depending on competitive it is. So high search volume, low competition. In other words, the ratio between the two is the ideal combination. So going back to the spreadsheet, recommend you have that spreadsheet handy. Put your theme in place, okay? Theme pizza recipes. We use Google's Keyword Planner tool to find the volume. We use the all in title syntax to find the competition. So we entered both of those numbers in and we get our ratio. And so when you have these numbers for a number of different keywords, you wanna be able to choose that ratio of high volume, low competition, but always, relevancy always trumps ratio. So always go with a keyword that is gonna be relevant to your content. Don't choose a keyword that's not relevant. If you choose a keyword that's not relevant, it's not going to bode well for user engagement. So the difficulty of a keyword Keyword ranges from zero to 100 in Google's keyword tool. So it's gonna be easy, it's gonna be medium, it's gonna be hard. But my recommendation is also to get the numerical factor and that's the all in title syntax. And again, relevancy is what drives the traffic to your website and keep the traffic there on your website. And also, not only will it keep the traffic on your website, but hopefully get that traffic to engage and convert. So that's the key about relevancy. You always wanna choose keywords that are relevant to your content, even if it's sacrificing volume. Relevancy, again, trumps volume and competition. So always choose relevant keywords first. So when you do that, you're always almost guaranteeing that at some point somebody's going to find your content because somebody out there might be looking for it. And if they do, you're going to get found and then the engagement's going to be better. So understand your business, find keywords that are relevant to your business, and then focus on those keywords. That'll help you with getting the right traffic to your site. Always keep in mind the commercial intent. So these these keywords are more specific and result in conversion rate. For example, buying is a good commercial intent keyword. So if you really want somebody to come to your website and buy, then focus on those types of keywords. In the case of the pizza recipes, maybe it's download could be our commercial intent keyword. Again, there may be low search volume, but those are the type of keywords you want to focus on because that's the type of traffic you want to drive to your site. So some other examples of commercial intent keywords are discount, deal, your coupon, shipping. You don't, don't be afraid to use some of these keywords as part of your longer tail keyword phrase. Again, the volume may not be high, but the traffic quality is probably gonna be better. So keyword research is the foundation for SEO. So if you have chosen your keywords properly, then if you do get ranked for those keywords, then it's going to lead to better engagement with some conversions. And so when we talk about keywords, we also wanna talk about our primary and secondary keywords. So every page should have at least a primary keyword and then a secondary keyword to work with. So primary keywords are really defining the nature of your content. The secondary keywords are relevant to the primary keyword. 
So why do we choose a primary and secondary keyword? Because you may choose a keyword as a primary keyword that is relevant to the content, but may not necessarily rank very high or have a lot of volume. That secondary keyword is also relevant to the primary keyword, but also relevant to the content. And you may rank for that secondary keyword. So you always want to go with two keywords versus just one keyword. You wanna give your, yourself a chance to rank for at least two different types of keywords of relevant nature. So for web page, there can be several secondary keywords, but only one primary keyword. So your primary keyword is always going to be relevant to the, your content. Secondary keywords can be relevant to the keyword, but, and you may have multiple secondary keywords, but it's also going to be related to the content and it gives you a better opportunity to be found between both the primary and secondary in search. Okay, so let's take a look at another example of how to use primary keywords and secondary keywords when choosing keywords. So if our primary keyword is healthy diet plan, remember healthy diet plan is directly related to the content. So that's what we're talking about. But these secondary keywords, are also related to content and play off the primary keyword. And so what we want to do is go to cool Google's Keyword Planner tool and get an idea of the volume for healthy diet plan and then also the volume and competition for some of these secondary keywords like healthy diet for weight loss, healthy diet food, low carb diet, healthy meal plans, and diet plan weight loss. So if I go in to Google's Keyword Planner and type those keywords in, I'm going to choose get results. And now here here I could see healthy diet plan keyword I'm focusing on as my primary keyword it has an average monthly search volume of 9,900. And then some of my secondary keywords, healthy diet foods, diet plan weight loss, low carb diet, you know, Google will give me a number of different keywords to work with. So I'm going to look at the search volume of those as well. And so ideally what I want to do is be able to then look at the volume and then look at the competition. So healthy diet plan, I go into my keyword analysis here. That's my theme. So that's my keyword. What's my volume for healthy diet plan? 9,900. What's my competition? So my competition is 74,700 and that's going to give me a ratio of volume to competition of 13%. So that's what my content's about. That's a considered a short tail keyword because it has a lot of competition. And so my ratio is 13%. And what I want to do is I want to be able to put these other secondary keywords in here as well maybe even go to a little longer tail because I want to be able to find two key, or at least two keywords. I want to be able to find my primary keyword that's relevant to my content. And then I want to be able to find my secondary keyword, which is again, related to the primary keyword, which is also related to the content. And so I want to be able to choose two keywords basically. And I want to choose two keywords that are relevant that have good ratio between volume and competition. So that's the whole idea again of how to do keyword research. You, you want to be able to find your keywords, use the tools available to you, and get a sense of what the volume is, what the competition is, look at the ratio between the volume and competition, and then based on the content, choose that primary keyword. And then again, based on the keyword you chose, choose some secondary keywords as well, because you want to be found for not just one keyword, but multiple keywords. Okay, let's look at some alternative suggestions to keyword research. So for doing keyword research, we want to take into account LSI keywords. We could take into account other platforms that host a lot of content like Quora or Reddit. We can use Google suggestions in the keyword search bar. We can use popular platforms like Wikipedia and we can use social media bookmarking like Reddit. So there are lots of suggestions that we can obtain from various sources. So let's start with LSI keywords and LSI stands for latent semantic insect indexing. And so basically what it is, it's just keywords that are linked to your primary keyword. And so when you're choosing keywords, you always want to choose that primary keyword and then secondary keywords that are similar to the primary keyword. And usually those are LSI 
or latent semantic indexing type keywords. So they're used to drive relevant traffic to your page. So if you're focusing on one keyword, we want to have other keywords that are similar to increase our visibility on the search engine result pages. So we could find latent semantic indexing right in search. So if we use the term healthy diet, if we go to Google search, for example, if I type in healthy diet in Google search, all I need to do is scroll to the bottom of the page and I can see searches related to healthy diet. So healthy diet menu, healthy diet essay, what does a healthy diet look like? Notice at the top, Google's also giving me some other suggestions here. So they're saying low fat diet, veganism, gluten free diet. So there's lots of different suggestions right in Google search bar. So all of these are LSI related keywords. So if you're optimizing a page for healthy diet, then you could choose low fat diet as a secondary keyword. You can use gluten free diet as a secondary keyword. It really depends on what the content is, but you always want to support your content with as much LSI keywords as possible. So you can be found for as many different keywords as possible in Google search. So it's important because if you have a blog that, you know, talks about Python. So how do the search engines know if the website Python is about the programming language or the snake? So Google, for example, uses LSI keywords to understand what the page is specifically focusing on. So if you're just focusing on Python and your content, you want to support that with LSI keywords. And so that will allow your web page to better communicate with Google also to have the visibility to show up on search. So they can certainly improve your search positioning and featured snippets as well. So if you have a keyword that answers a question, you can certainly be found for a featured snippet. For example, maybe, you know, healthy diet recipes. If I type that in, you can see here there's a featured snippet. So if I'm talking about recipes, that's a keyword I may want to use. And if I use that, then Google has an opportunity to see what my content's about and place my information at the top in this featured snippet. You can also, again, see what some of the questions are being asked, what meals are good for weight loss, what is a good healthy diet plan. All of these could be keyword phrases that you can use. So the answers are right here in Google. So Quora is a great platform because Quora is a platform that people go and ask questions in a community responds with answers or responses to that particular question or topic. And so the great thing about Quora is it's a good is a good place for you to go to get some ideas about a specific topic. So if we're talking about healthy dieting, so we can find keywords with high search volume right in Quora. So the whole idea is you can look at, you know, the top five questions for a specific topic like healthy dieting and find relevant keywords to healthy dieting. So if you just type in that particular keyword in Quora, you're going to probably get some responses to questions or responses to somebody else's question. And so if we take a look at Core, for example, so if I just type in healthy dieting, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get some responses to the, the topic healthy dieting. So what's the best diet for healthy living? What are the top five tips for a healthy diet habit? So all of these could be keyword phrases that you could take away with for your own content. And so the benefit here is you're getting kind of an idea of what's trending, what people are talking about, and if you use tips for a healthy diet habit, for example, and you optimize for that, well, again, that could turn around and bode well for you because you could be featured in Google as a featured snippet at the top here. You can also turn around and use LSI related keywords for healthy diet habits. And you can simply just look for those LSI keywords right in Google. Remember at the bottom or at the top, if I scroll down, I could see some related LSI keywords at the bottom. So right in Google is as well, you could see in the Google search bar that Google provides some LSI related keywords to your query. So if I go back here and type in healthy diet recipes, I could see here Google suggesting some other related keywords, healthy diet menu, healthy diet for men, healthy diet foods, healthy diet for women. So these are all LSI related keywords that you can use to support your primary keyword and the content you're writing about. So we've talked about LSI keywords words where to find them so they're found right here they could be found at the top of Google and they could be found
down at the bottom. You can also then go to Core as well and get some ideas for the types of questions that are being asked. So if you ask a question and use that as your keyword phrase, then again, you have an opportunity of showing up for a featured snippet in Google just by doing some additional research within Google itself or on Quora. So according to Google, the autocomplete predictions are automatically generated by Google's algorithm without any human intervention. It's based on a number of factors, but the primary factor is how often past users have searched for a term. So Google collects all the keyword queries that somebody types in, and they're suggesting some of the most popular terms that people have typed in. So if I go back to Google, again, if I start to type in recipes, I could see some of the other queries that somebody else has typed in or some of the most popular queries related to that topic. So if you enter the keyword healthy diet, Google's going to suggest multiple keyword suggestions that users have asked in the past. And you could certainly get the search volume of those keywords just by looking in Google itself. I could see for healthy diet recipes, billions of pages related to healthy diet recipes. I can also get the search volume by going into Google's keyword planner. So if I type in healthy diet, I'm going to be able to see what my search volume is for that keyword. And in addition, I can see the seasonality of that particular keyword. And in addition to that, Google is going to provide some other related keywords to my search query. So if I'm looking for healthy diet, Google is going to suggest, hey, maybe you should choose healthy food or healthy eating or how to lose weight. So those are all LSI related keywords that Google provides in the keyword plan which is built into the Google Ads platform. Another option for you is Wikipedia. So Wikipedia is a vast platform of content. So we could turn Wikipedia into our own asset and use it to our own advantage by finding relevant keywords in an easy fashion. So with Wikipedia, we can identify a list of keywords in the meta description itself. We could choose keywords from the first paragraph of Wikipedia that has many relevant keywords, or we could take a look at keywords from the Wikipedia content section. So we can also see additional pages like the see also section that gives relevant keywords that you're looking for. We can also look at the references section as they contain relevant keywords. So if we go to Wikipedia as an example and I type in healthy diet into Wikipedia. Here I can get it just in the first paragraph alone. I can see some additional keywords that I might choose to use like micronutrients. I never knew that micronutrients was related to healthy diet, but Wikipedia is providing some information about what micronutrients is. And maybe I can use that as a keyword, an LSI related keyword to my content. So if I scroll down, I get the see also section. So it might give me some information, food information to consumers, for example, dietary guidelines. I can look at categories like dietetics and diets. I can also look at the references section so I can also see what information was provided like health effects of overweight and obesity. I can look at diet and physical activity. So all of these are related to my main keyword healthy diet. So the answers are right in here on the platform. They're just all over the page. So Wikipedia has an abundance of information. You just need to know where to look. So again, with Wikipedia, you can look no further than the first paragraph. You can look no further than the see also section, the references section, category section. There's lots of information right on the page itself to help you get ideas for keywords. So if you Google your keyword with Wikipedia term in the search query and get relevant keywords from the title tags and the SERP. So you can also do that as well. So if I type in healthy diet Wikipedia in search, I can also get some information here as well. So people also search for healthy food advantages or healthy food habits essay or information about healthy food. All of these are related to my keyword healthy diet. So again, another bit of information for you to choose or look to choose some additional keywords for. So Reddit, it's a popular community where people post content and discuss a variety of topics. 
So that's what Reddit is. So with the help of subreddits, an individual can find relevant keywords with, with high search volume. So in Reddit, there's an easy way to find out keywords. They have a keyword tool called Keywordit. So Keywordit gives the average monthly searches for a particular keyword. So if we type a word in Keyreddit and choose keywords from the auto-generated list, this tool will extract the keywords and give us those relevant terms with search volume. So if we go to the Keywordit, and show an example of that. For example, healthy food, if I get keywords, I can see what keywords are relevant and the search volume of that keyword. So if I just type in healthy food, keyword it tool is going to tell me some relevant keywords and what the volume is. So if you don't have the keyword planner tool in Google Ads available to you, this is a good alternative solution to finding keywords. So it's free. You just need to go to keywordit.com, type in your keyword, click get keywords, and what it's going to do is give you some relevant keywords related to your primary keyword with the search volume. Let's talk about keyword clustering now. So the whole idea about keyword clustering is to really take advantage of the keywords that we're optimizing for to gain higher rank. So if we can cluster keywords together in a theme and that theme of keywords is relevant to a specific page of a website, then we have a better opportunity to rank. So in other words, why do we have to target just one keyword when we can target many? So keep in mind, you know, LSI keywords, we want to group a bunch of keywords together that are similar for content. So for example, after some keyword research you can thematically group keywords into a core topic so for example we can cluster these group of keywords together like for example what is SEO how does SEO work intro to SEO what are the basics of SEO all of those are related to the core theme what is SEO another cluster of keywords for example could be SEO techniques SEO best practices, tips and tricks, website optimization, on-page SEO techniques, etc. So those are clusters of keywords, okay, that we can group together in themes. And if we group keywords together in themes, we can apply that to a particular content on our website. So the whole idea behind clustering keywords, it's going to provide more diversity, more of an opportunity for us to be found. So and that's the whole idea behind clustering. So some ad additional steps. Remember, stay up to date on industry news. So brainstorm your ideas first and identify a list of keywords, i.e. a theme of keywords that you can cluster together. And then you could determine the keywords that your competitors are already ranking for. So for example, if we want to rank for the keyword SEO best practices, for example, we can use a tool called Keyword Moz. If I go to keyword, the Keyword Explorer tool in Moz and just type in SEO best practices, what it's going to do is it's going to give me some volume related to that particular keyword. But more importantly, what it's also going to do is it's going to show me what pages are already ranked for that particular keyword. So therefore I can get a sense of who is already ranking for that keyword. So here I can see Moz, Moz, Medium.com, Alexa.com. So I can get a sense of what web pages are ranked for a particular keyword or group of keywords I want to rank for myself. So if we look at tools for keyword research, look no further than Moz. That's the Moz of the tool I would just use, but you could also use Google's Keyword Planner, which we used in the example. So for example, if I go back to the Google Ads Keyword Planner, if you're in Google Ads, you click on Tools, you click on Keyword Planner. And what Keyword Planner does is it provides you, for a particular keyword, the average monthly search volume over the past 12 months. It provides you information on seasonality. So if I hover my mouse over a graph, I'm going to be able to see the volume per month over the last 12 months. What the Keyword Planner also does is it provides me some additional ideas is for my particular keyword. And in addition to that, it's gonna provide me some sense of how competitive that keyword is by telling me whether it's low, medium, or high in terms of competition. So there's SEMrush, there's also other additional keywords tools out there like WordStream or Href or the Reddit tool, Keyword It. And then Moz is, a, is another tool I particularly use. So if I go to Moz again, here I can just type in a keyword that I'm interested in. It's gonna give me the search volume of that keyword. It's gonna give me the level of difficulty. So 50 out of 100. 
So it's halfway between difficulty and easy. And then it's gonna give me some additional metrics. Like for example, what my expected organic click-through rate would be if I were to rank for this keyword. But more importantly, what I like about this is we could see exactly what other sites are linked to this particular keyword we're interested in. So here I can look at the top 10 list. So this is Moz's Keyword Explorer tool. So that's what this tool is and it's part of moz.com. So there's a lot of tools at your disposal. I particularly use Moz. I particularly use Google's Keyword Planner. And those are the tools I use, but there are lots of tools out there. So if we were to review everything we talked about with keyword research, we started with why keyword research. So we wanna always take a look at what keywords have a good ratio of volume and competition. So we always want high volume and low competition. We always want relevancy for our keyword. And we always wanna choose a primary keyword and secondary keywords. So that's things to look for when we talk about you know, doing keyword research. We wanna look for high volume, low competition, relevancy, and also commercial intent. Are we selling a product and do we want to use keywords like the word buy in our keyword phrase that's going to get somebody to purchase that product if they type in a similar keyword with buy in it as an example. So that's why and how to do keyword research. We talked about the types of different keywords that we can focus in on. We specifically talked about short tail keywords and long tail keywords. So short tail keywords are going to be three words or less in the keyword phrase. They're always going to have high volume, but most likely they're going to also have high competition. So it might take you longer to rank for that short tail keyword because there's a lot of other websites who also want to rank for that keyword. So my recommendation again is stay away from short tail keywords because it's going to take you longer to rank. Now, you can focus on longer tail keywords. Now, these keywords are more specific. They're more than three words in the keyword phrase. They're likely gonna have lower search volume, but it's gonna be more specific, and it's probably gonna bring more quality traffic to your site. So, an example of a long tail keyword would be homemade pizza dough recipes. That's what we looked at earlier. So, you can always pick keywords that are longer tail, but also relevant to your content. And again, the benefits, quality traffic, and probably higher engagement. Then we looked at alternative suggestions to doing keyword research. We talked about LSI keywords. So LSI keywords are latent semantic indexing. So we want to take a look at keywords that are relevant or related to your primary keyword. We looked at other platforms where you can go and find other relevant keywords. We talked about Quora. We talked about Google suggestions in terms of their search engine and their toolbar. Talked about Wikipedia, going to Wikipedia and using the categories or references section. We talked about Reddit with the keyword it tool that allows you to see you know, keywords in the search volume there. And again, that's a free tool to use. So you have lots of suggestions, lots of tools at your disposal like Moz, SEMrush. So there's no shortage of places you can go to to find keywords. The key takeaways really is find keywords that are relevant, stick with longer tail, you know, find supporting LSI related keywords, choose your keywords wisely in terms of commercial intent, and then stay away from keywords that are highly competitive. Because the more competition for a keyword, the longer it is going to take you to be found for that keyword. We then finished up with keyword clustering. So group your keywords together in a theme. So remember, if we cluster keywords together in a content theme, then likely it's going to be more relevant for the content. It's going to give us a better opportunity to be found for a variety of keywords. Definitely use the tools to your advantage. Some are free, some are not. My suggestion on using different tools is to try them out. See how the user interface works for you. See what kind of data that these different tools provide. Are they easy to use and does it provide all the different information you're looking for? Like competition or who else is ranking for a particular keyword or the volume and, and some of the other metrics that you may need to do your keyword research. So try your own tools out and see what you like. You don't necessarily have to get Go with our suggestions. But certainly the likes of Moz or SEMrush or Google's Keyword Planner are always popular amongst people who do SEO. In the section on on-page optimization, we talked about factors that centered on relevancy. In this section, we're going to go in a different direction and we're going to talk about the signals that focus on popularity. So what does popularity mean in this context? 
Well, it's actually quite simple. Popularity always relates to links, to hyperlinks on the web. So you have seen these when you see the typically blue text that is underlined. What this is, it is a um, tool, it's a href technically in HTML, that is pointing from one web document to a different one. Uh, this is a pretty simple concept. I imagine you already know this. So what does this mean from an SEO perspective? Well, it turns out that this gigantic group of signals, the ones related to hyperlinks, are and are and historically have been the lion's share of signals that the search engines process when trying to rank pages. Now, there's one big problem with these from an SEO perspective, um, is that they are historically and today very difficult to influence. Uh, this is because they do not take place on your website, they take place elsewhere. It's other people who are linking to you, generally speaking. Uh, and this makes them very, very difficult to have an influence on. So this is a good thing and a bad thing. It's a good thing because it it turns out to be a great metric for ranking web documents. It's a bad thing because it's hard for us to make an impact on day-to-day -day level. Hands down, the most time-consuming and difficult part of SEO is link building. Now, there's a lot of reasons for this, um, primarily because it's constantly changing and because of all the elements that are involved with this. But the, big, the bigger takeaway here is that there's no one-size-fits-all solution for link building. You have to take the context of your business or of your website, and you have to apply general principles to that. So in this video, we're going to cover these general principles so that you can figure out how to apply those to your business. These principles are, and I think these are the most clever and the most important ones, are creating link-worthy content, proactively participating in off-site engagement, and utilizing offline relationships. The tried and true method for building links is creating content that's optimized for humans. So let me explain what this means. The currency of the internet, if you will, is the content itself. That's why people go on. They want to read the newest article or they want to see the newest video. Whatever it may be, that is what has been true since the beginning and I have no doubt will be true going forward. So as an SEO or as an online marketer in general, you can use this to your advantage. Creating the content that people are going to want to share with their friends or that they're going to want to cite in any kind of paper or whatever they're working on, that is a tried and true way of gaining links. This is what we call the power of content. You can do all kinds of bells and whistles, you can go do these newest tactics, you can try all these different things out, but at the end of the day, what's really important is the content itself. So this is what I focus on. This is where 80% of my time goes on when I'm working on link building. It's on the content itself. Can I create something that is just truly, that is so truly great that someone essentially has to link to it? This is what I focus on trying to answer. And while there is no simple answer to that, going and asking that question always sets you in the right direction. The next strategy that I want to talk about is actually very counterintuitive. So if you're trying to build links to your own website, I found one of the most effective ways, and this is consistently true, is to engage off your own site. Uh, now, this doesn't make any sense, right? Why would you work on other people's websites if you're trying to promote your, yourself? Well, think about human beings. Human beings are much more likely to link and give back to people, to human beings that they know well. So a lot of the time I spend when I'm doing link building is spent off-site engaging with others. So sometimes this is through social media, so I'll use whatever the latest social network is, and I'll chat with people there who have similar interests or have similar interests to what I'm trying to promote, be it a different topic or be it a new industry altogether. I'll spend a lot of time promoting others and a lot of times chatting with other people, building up genuine, real relationships with human beings so that when it comes time for them to write an article or when, it's, when they're ready to link out to other people, I'm the first person they think to and they link back to my website. One of the reasons that link building is so hard is because the internet moves so fast. What worked yesterday might not work tomorrow. So one of the most clever and easy ways to avoid this problem is to just simply go offline. Utilize some of the relationships that you have off of the internet in order to benefit on the internet. This is something that I try to do all the time because it consistently works. By far, the easiest favors to cash in on are the ones that you're already owed. So these might be from your friends who you work with. These might be from friends who from childhood. These are people who you actually know in the real world who are much more likely to help you when you're trying to promote new content online. So when I'm trying to do link building, one of the things I focus on is people that I know in the real world. So this can be lots of things. This can be personal friends who happen to have websites and blogs. This can be friendly competition you have or friendly allies you have in your space. Just saying, hey, we're looking for these kind of things. Can you help us out? And maybe I'll help you out somewhere else. It's utilizing these relationships that exist elsewhere so that you can start gaining these links yourself. Uh, if that doesn't work, if maybe you don't have any friends in these arenas, you can always go to local businesses and uh, local agencies. So sometimes this is um, like government-owned things. Sometimes this is just third parties altogether. There's lots of things that they need help with that you as a business owner or you as uh, trying to promote some client may be able to help them with. And if you can help them offline, they're more, much more likely to help you online. When link building, it's very important to understand that not all links are, are created equally. 
a link coming from the homepage of CNN is going to provide a lot of what we call link equity. It's going to have a lot of popularity metrics tied to it, and so it's going to be more valuable to you and help you rank higher. Whereas a link also coming from the homepage, but let's say Joe Schmo's sp uh, spam blog, that is not going to be particularly helpful for you, and it actually in some cases could hurt you. So when you're going out and doing link building, make sure that you can stand behind the source of the link that is coming at you. This could be in a good example from like a government website where it's trusted, and a bad example this could be from a website that you would not normally go to even on your own. In addition to that, there's different kinds of links depending on the direction that they're going. So if a link is coming towards you, towards your website, that's called an inbound link. These are the ones that are very helpful for popularity metrics that we've talked about. There's also outbound links. These are links that you linking to other people. Now generally there's a big misconception about this that you would think you would not want to link out to other people, but if you just follow the natural chain of events and you look at people who are writing blogs without SEO in mind, you'll see that they are linking out naturally. And it's these natural patterns that the search engines are looking for. So there's absolutely no problem in linking out just as long as it's to sources that you actually do trust. So there's inbound links, there's outbound links, there's links that have a lot of popularity value, so like from an established government website or from something popular like CNN. There's also links that are inbound that are not going to have as much value for you that you probably don't want to spend your time building. Now, regardless of where your links are coming from, it's important to look out for one particular attribute. It's called rel nofollow. Rel nofollow was a tool that was originally developed to combat comment spam, like on blogs. You'd have lots of people who were leaving um, completely irrelevant comments so that they could link back to their own website and get credit for that. That does not work at all today. Uh, one of the primary reasons for that is the search engine introduced something called rel nofollow, where they said, here's a link that's going out from my website, but I do not stand behind it, and it does not pass any credit. A lot of times when you're doing link building, you'll get a link which you're very proud of coming from somewhere very popular, but then realize that it has this attribute attached to it, nofollow, uh, and which means you will not get any credit for it. So make sure that when you're doing your link building, the, the link coming at you that you've earned does not have this attribute associated with it, otherwise you will get no credit for it. Now that you understand what nofollow is, let's, let's talk about the biggest use case for this, social media. Most of the links that we see in social media are valueless. Uh, this is because they are either uh, hidden from search engines entirely, this mostly happens on Facebook, or they're visible to search engines, but they use this, ro this rel nofollow attribute, which means that they're useless. So while social media does have many, many benefits, uh, SEO, and particularly link value from SEO, is not one of the direct benefits of participating in social media. Now that we've covered some of the link building do's, let's talk about some of the link building don'ts. So these are things that you should not do uh, because you'll be wasting your time and possibly more importantly, your money. The first one is spam. So we have all seen this online when you go somewhere and you see just a bunch of spammy links, links that are clearly written only for uh, machines, only for search engines. A lot of times these will have the name of pharmaceutical drugs on them. A lot of times they'll have um, just can be completely irrelevant to the content. While these have worked in some instances, they are certainly not a best practice and they are certainly not a long-term strategy. So I never recommend trying to invest in spammy links this way because it's not going to ultimately help you. In fact, in many ways it'll probably hurt you. So do not go out of your way to try to get spammy links. The next one is buy-in links. This is, these are to closely tied together. Now, buying links is when you go out and try to buy sometimes relevant, sometimes irrelevant links. And again, this is something that had it worked eh, sometimes historically, not always. My biggest problem with this is not so much the ethical problem, although there is one there. Uh, the search engines have clearly said not to ever do this. Um, my biggest problem with it is that you could not calculate an accurate ROI on this. So if you spend a dollar on this, you don't know if you're going to make a dollar or two dollars back. You have no idea. There's no way to accurately measure this. So you have no idea if this, if this is valuable to you or not. Where, as opposed to, if you're creating valuable content, you can measure that, and you can directly tie it to sales. So your, your money, dollar for dollar, is spent much, much more effectively on content than it is on buying links. So I highly recommend do not spend your time or your money buying links. The last one is acquiring reciprocal links. So reciprocal links, as you can imagine, are links that go in a circle. You link to somebody and they link directly back to you. Now in the natural web, when no marketing is taking place into this, and there's no kind of manipulation trying to go on, that happens that happens all the time. So don't go out of your way and be afraid of this happening. So one news site will very regularly link to another news article and that article might link back to them somewhere else. That happens. So don't stress about this too much. But don't go out of your way to try to build all of your links in a reciprocal way. We're overthinking this by trying to link to somebody else who links to a third party. That third party links to you. Don't waste your time. This is just not a factor that you should worry about. Reciprocal links are not generally as good as one-way links, but it happens so often that it is not 
is not worthy of your time or any kind of investment trying to avoid this. The concept of linking is foundational to good rankings and understanding the internet at large. It starts with the premise that good content will be cited by others, recommending it to other people. How we cite and recommend information online is by linking to it. We link to information that we find valuable. Based on that, the search engines assess content by how websites link to one another. So we are going to cover the definition and purpose of links and the different functions that links serve. We'll also look at how links mirror human judgment. We'll look at how search engines evaluate links by mirroring human judgment and how that affects what's called block level analysis and how where the location of different links and how they are used will greatly affect their relevance. We're going to look at how visitors from different link sources will behave differently based on where they came from and also how you can measure the effectiveness of links and finally we're going to look at both good and bad linking practices. Now links serve a number of purposes. From a functional standpoint they usually are our primary means of navigation online. We click on links, we go to different pages, and from those pages we find links to other pages. Links are also a method of citing other content. When we quote somebody, when we use information that we have found somewhere else, we cite that information to give credit to the original author. Typically, online, we do that with a link, so that if someone wants to see the original source document, it's available to them. That also helps to provide credibility to you, credibility to the author of the original source, as well as assigning importance to the knowledge that came from that original source and the authority of the original source. Links also provide us with a clear structure of how our websites are built, how the pages relate to one another, and how organized the information can be. So let's break down the functional part of a link. This is important if you're going to be developing anchor text and linking to understand the structure. The ahref equals is the start of the link tag. What you are doing is developing the reference of where the document is contained. That's the href. Reference is what it is short for. What comes next within the quotes is the location of the document. Now this can be a full URL or you may just be linking to a document that's on the main root level of your server. This is the full location where you can access the document. And so you're putting the name of the document, the extension, so that it will be linked. The next part is what I have in caps. You'll notice off to the left I have something in all blue text and underlined, which most people will recognize as a link. You see, when it is in between the document location and the closing of the link tag, the text you have in there is what's called anchor text. You see, instead of publishing the document location and the full URL of the document, we can put the link within text and create anchor text. So all someone has to do is click on the link and the document loads for them. This anchor text is vitally important to understanding how we can add additional relevance to linking content. Then we see the closure of the link tag. This is what makes the internet. The internet is millions of pages connected together by links. So when we look at the functional side of links. And we look at this example here. As you can see, the title of this article is not the URL address of the article. It's a title, and the title is the link. That is the anchor text of the link. And so, from a search engine standpoint, search engines look to see what words are being used in the link and how relevant those words are to the document that is being linked. 
it also looks to see where is the link is it in the editorial information in the article is it part of the navigation is it in a sidebar or is it an ad and then also search engines are looking to see if this is a text link or an image link how long has that link been there what type of link is it does it go somewhere within your website does it go to another website or is it a reciprocal link which I will explain more later they also look to see the text in the link and the context to the page with the link directs you to we utilize links a little differently you see from a human standpoint whenever we refer information to another person when we provide reference material to another person or even if someone asks us for a recommendation we provide this information you see offline we mirror the same behavior as we do online when we link people ask us for information and we provide it we just mirror that online by making a link offline we recommend we refer we provide information to each other in much the same way the way I want you to think about it from a human standpoint is that if you asked another person for advice or directions or a referral are there certain people that you would trust more than others I'm sure the answer to that is yes and maybe you have some people in mind that you are thinking about you see we run across the same issue with search the search engines know that there are some websites that are much more trustworthy than others just like if you were to ask someone for information I'm sure you would ask the right person for the information you would ask the most knowledgeable trustworthy person you knew who had authority in that subject area the search engines are trying to do the same thing with the links that we publish on our websites they're trying to determine who is the most trustworthy and relevant based on the recommendations referrals and citations of other websites to other websites who are the websites that are trusted that are authorities the search engines are trying to do from a technical algorithmic standpoint what we do naturally from a human standpoint now from the human side as I had said before we need to think of links as information that we receive from other people word-of-mouth advice information directions recommendations this is where we need to think about links not from the standpoint of building false relevance for a search engine but being a helpful resource for our readers how can we help them how can we provide information and how can we be a credible source of information how can we develop our authority within the industry and so that people who have questions about this content will see our websites as authoritative and credible resources the best way to develop links as you'll see is good content when people like what they read when they like what they see when they are willing to recommend it to others it's because you have created something of value and they'll link to you when they feel that you are credible and that you are authoritative with this information only then will they share it with other people because you have earned that right for them to share it with others by providing content that is informative educational entertaining and you've provided that service only then will people then want to recommend it to others by linking to it now links serve a number of benefits when I look at some of the incoming links to my site one of the things I notice is that if I get a link in certain places that can drive a lot of brand exposure I can have thousands of people coming to the site looking to see an article and that provides a lot of exposure to a lot of people however also getting a link from a certain website especially if it's a high relevant authoritative website I can see my rankings increase because of that but then also a good link 
is going to drive people that will convert and drive sales or leads, those who become customers. So those are the three aspects of a good link. A good link will drive traffic to your site, a good link will assist your rankings, and a good link will bring in business. If you can get a link to do all three of those at the same time, that's what I call the golden link because it has all three benefits. Usually, however, you're going to find that different links will provide different types of benefits, one of these three or maybe two out of these three. One of the things I'm usually very focused on is the link that drives sales or generates leads. That's getting links in the right place that will benefit me tangibly rather than just getting thousands of people to see it. Why? It benefits me financially if I can get a link in the right place. So from here, let's break down the different types of links. We have navigational links. We see these in our navigation, our primary navigation, maybe the footer of our web pages where we have links to typical information such as about us or contact us. We also have sidebar links. This might be related information or offers or calls to action. And then also I would break it down into outbound or inbound type of navigation. Outbound are links going to other websites. Inbound links are links that come from other websites and that also I might send to other pages on my own site. Now I've used the term editorial. An editorial link is a link that is found within the content of the website. And by that I mean through an article. So if I am writing an article and I link to someone else and cite them or reference them, that is what's called an editorial link. It means that it's part of the content. A great example of this is that the navigation on your web pages is not part of the content. It serves a function as navigation, but it doesn't have anything to do with supporting information, with citing an authority. So information and links that you put within the content and presented content of your site are considered editorial. Now there's also call to action links where you're bringing someone to a landing page or a registration page or a sale page. Then also we have social links. Now these can provide a, a variety of means, but typically a social link will go to a profile. Maybe it's a username that takes you somewhere else or a comment or maybe just an image or something that goes to a social site or that you have placed on your own site as well. Either way, it's all contained within that social network. Even though the links are going on and off your site, they tend to be controlled in that social environment. Now I've used the term reciprocal link. Now this is something very specific. A reciprocal link is one where you would go to somebody else and you would make a trade, such as if you link to me, I'll link to you. And maybe you put those links on the home page, or maybe you create a page just for that link. You see, sometimes it just doesn't make sense. And so the search engines will see that you've linked to each other, but if there's no contextual relevance, if there's no contextual relevance, most likely you won't get any benefit because you've agreed to link to each other for the primary purpose of boosting rankings. Now this is not to say that two websites can't link to each other because there is some relevance. We'll look at some examples of that later on in this module. Also then, we have advertising links. These can be ads, banners, anything on the page that is an advertising link that if you were to click on it, you would go to that advertiser's page. Those links are typically through an ad server and they take place in an entirely different ecosystem. But they are links, and we need to know what kind of links are advertising and which kind of links are functional to our websites. Now, when I broke down the different types of links, so we have our navigation links, we have links in our sidebar and in our footer. What block level analysis does is that the search engines look at the code of the page. 
They break down the page because it's very easy to figure out which part of the code has to do with your navigation, which part of the code has to do with your sidebar and your footer, and which part of the code is calling ads from an ad server. What this leaves is the editorial content, your article, and the ability of search engines then to break down your page into these different elements. The reason why they do it is that the links contained in the editorial space are considered to be more relevant in terms of linking to other websites than any of the other types of links on your web page. Search engines don't consider all parts of the page to be equally relevant, which is okay because neither do humans. We look at the navigation as utilization, pure utility, because it's just helping me navigate among the different pages of your website. I'm not expecting to learn anything. I'm using it as a functional means of navigating your site. Now your sidebar might have some calls to action, it might have links to other pages, but it's not an article. It's what you've developed, and so it might be a little more important than your navigation, but it's not as important as what you may have written within content. Your footer navigation is basically the same. You control that, it's the same on every page, and so what the search engines are looking for are the unique content, the unique article or information that you've published. And if there is a link within that editorial content, that is highly relevant because it has to do with content. It has to do with information that you are sharing. And so the links there are going to be more highly relevant and are going to be more important for the search engines to see. You see, it's the same way with humans. We're not going to look at navigation to learn something. It's functional. The same thing with the footer. And as humans, we're reading the content that you have in your article. And if you link to another source, well, you've provided us with utility. But it's contextual utility because you're citing where you found information, or you're citing an additional source, or you are linking to an example. And it enables me as a human to see that, understand it, and if I need that additional information, I can click on it and go to it. So I'm going to look at the information on the page in that article very differently than I'm going to look at the headings, the navigation, the sidebars, or the footer. Because the article is what is informing me. And so the links in the article I'm going to look at very differently and hold them in a higher level of relevance. Now, over time, search engines have had to refine the algorithm about links. You see, in the early days of search engine algorithms, they used to simply count the amount of links. Then if one site had more links than another, that made it more credible. However, once people started to figure that out, people started accumulating links by really any means necessary. And they were just looking for the sheer volume of links. Because they knew if they got the most amount of links, it would affect their rankings. And so over the years, the search engines have had to change and adjust and add more relevance to their algorithm, refine it in order to look at different aspects of links in order to properly determine relevance. So over time, it wasn't just having a link. It was then also looking at how many people cite this site as an authority. So looking at the source of the link and the types of pages. Then also looking at the text of the link and matching it with the text of the page. Does it match? Is it contextual? And then looking at the type of link, doing the block level analysis. And then also the context, the relevancy of your site compared to the linking site, compared to the link, and the information that's being shared there. Also, some of the ways that they can look at it are the age of the link. How long has that link been there? Humans do the same thing when we look to see how long someone has been in business. We're looking at credibility. And then, of course, there are many, many other ongoing refinements that are going into the search engine's evaluations of links. Sometimes the age of the link isn't as relevant, especially when you're looking for something that has happened very recently. An old link could mean that it's old news or that something has changed since then. So search engines are in a constant battle to ensure that people are not gaming the system by falsely creating relevance through linking. The link relevancy 
and the algorithm is all about trying to determine who is the most relevant and credible within this area. And that is the focus of most search engine algorithm refinements over the past few years, and it will be into the future. Now, this is where I'm going to start bringing in some screenshots from a link management program. As a search engine optimizer, a link management program is probably going to be one of your best friends as you move along in this industry. In this example, this program, LinkDex, that I'm using will track the incoming links to my website. And it'll also provide a breakdown as to what type of website those links are coming from. So I can see how many links I have from blogs, how many links I have from news sites, how many links from wikis, how many links from directories, forums, social media, public relations sites, articles, or additional resources. Then I can also add my competitors and I can compare where I stand in terms of the amount of links from each source and where my competitors stand. In this way, I can be sure that we all have a similar link profile. You see, if my linking profile looks vastly different than all my competitors, the search engines are going to see that as well and know that something might be different with me, good or bad, and that's going to raise a red flag. So I want to look at the linking profile because every industry and almost every business's linking profile is going to be a little different. But especially among industries, we see that linking profiles, that is the amount of links from different sources, is going to be slightly different for every different type of industry or business. So this helps me understand where my links are coming from, which is vitally important because from a business standpoint, one thing that I've tracked consistently in analytics is that people will act differently and also I can predict which source is going to send me the best customers. You see, just because someone comes from a link doesn't mean they're going to buy or become a customer or really become a lead. Many times they're going to come look at your information and leave. And based on how they come to your site, whether it's through a blog, a directory, a forum, or a news site, has a lot to do with how they view your website. And it's all about the context. You see, this is what I've learned over the years, is that people will behave differently based on how they find the website. What I've found is that people from blogs, news sites, and articles, they tend to stay longer, do more, and have a higher chance of conversion. Of becoming a customer or a lead the main reason is because blogs and articles they have a lot of context it's an article someone has taken the time to write some information out and then link to my site which means there is a highly contextual reason for someone to click that link also what it means is that there's a lot less competition for that link when my link is in that article Compare that with social news or any type of social site. You see, when you're on a social site and you're looking at your social stream of information, there's a lot of different people competing for your attention, a lot of different things. And it's not just in one subject area. It's usually from multiple subject areas. And so the context is very low because there's a lot of different types of information and the competition for your attention is very high. Because of that, people from social sites or applications tend to visit more often, but they only tend to view one page and leave immediately because they're looking to see what was interesting and then they move on to the next subject. That's the difference between how people react based on where they come from. And so when I'm measuring links, I'm looking to see which links do I have, What's the source? And then how do those sources behave differently from one another? And why? You see, if I find that I'm getting links from sources that people are staying longer, doing more, and converting at a higher rate, then I'm going to continue to focus on building links in those areas because it directly affects how I monetize my website. So here's a strategy in building links. 
One of the things I'm looking at is the source of links. Like I said, if I can find a link source that's providing visitors that will stay, look at my content, engage with the content, and eventually convert, and convert at a higher rate than other sources of content or visitors, then I'm going to focus on that source. And so I'm going to look at some high authority websites, whether they're industry publications, news sites, education sites. Those are what are considered high authority blogs, articles, news sites. That's what I'm looking to do. I want to find the most authoritative website. And sometimes it happens naturally. If people that work at those websites or manage those sites, if they find you and they like your content, they'll link to it. And that way you can get more credibility, more relevancy. Certain people, certain organizations, certain websites have more authority and influence than others. It goes back to the question that I asked you early in this module, that how do you know if someone is more authoritative than somebody else? We also have mid-authority websites, which you can get some links on, and low-authority websites, which are very easy to get links. But here's what I've learned when it comes to link building. One link from one high quality website can be worth hundreds or thousands of mid to low quality links. Ultimately, it's about quality, not quantity. One of the things that I will do utilizing my link software is look at the context of the link. I want to see how relevant this is. So as I said, if I want to find a high relevant website, what I'm looking for in terms of this is I want to see the influence of the domain as well as the relevance of the domain. Those are two factors that we're going to look at when we're evaluating the quality of a domain. Now as I'm looking at this report here, what influence means is that it is a high quality website. That within the linking algorithm, these sites have a lot of authority. However, they may not be relevant. So for example, they may have a lot of sites attributing authority to them, but they may not be relevant to my industry, which is why we have the next column of keyword relevance. You see, when I'm evaluating my links, I'm looking for the sources that are both influential and relevant. That means that I've got a link from a site that fits the two standards of high authority. It's authoritative and relevant. Now it's good to have links from authoritative sites that might not be relevant. It's still authoritative. However, to get the full benefit, I want it to be influential and relevant. But not to say that I'm not looking for links from these other sources. This is just a means of measuring what you have as well as comparing it to your competitors and other websites. Now, here's some best practices. When I'm optimizing anchor text, I want to maintain contextual relevance. So I want to use text in the text link, and I want to explain to people what they're linking to, what they're going to find when they click on that link. If I use an image as a link, I'm going to use an alt attribute. Because if that image doesn't show up, that attribute is necessary to let people know where to go. But also, I do get a little tiny bit of benefit by using that alt attribute within the image link. I also want to look at the relevance of the source page that I'm linking to and make sure contextually the link, the link text, and the content of the page is contextually relevant to the destination page. I also want to be sure that I don't overuse the keywords, that I don't make multiple links to the same destination, that I don't use the same anchor text over and over. I can be downgraded or even penalized by the search engine algorithm if that is found on my pages. So as an example, instead of using click here for a how-to article, I might use the exact phrase of how to fix whatever it is and use that as the link to the page that has the content. 
That's a simple way of looking at anchor text. Am I directing someone to additional information? If I am, then how can I present it to them so they know exactly what they're going to find and link it appropriately? I look at it as developing the next step for your readers. Where do you want them to go? What do you want them to do? What resources do you have available to them? How can you structure them so that they're easily understood and you're explaining the final destination? Like I said, if you overuse anchor text, you can be downgraded or penalized by the search engines. So what I will tell you to do is number one, avoid overstuffing anchor content. That means needlessly repeating keywords in the anchor text. Don't do that. Avoid being redundant, meaning don't have four or five or six links with the same anchor text going to the same page. That's a clear way of letting search engines know that you're going overboard. Don't just randomly place links throughout your text just to get the link. Ask yourself, are you really helping the reader find the information they need and do it once? And then also avoid extremely overly promotional words within the link text, such as best, expert, cheap, number one, those types of things. So a couple examples, we can say for travel advice, click here, but I would say here is my travel advice and link travel advice. Rewrite it, be creative. If it were easy, everyone would be doing it. But this is where you can write things in a better way to get the attention of the reader and position it as a resource. Also, utilizing your URL as the link, or as the anchor text as well for the link in order to get that click. As I've got it here, I would not recommend that you use that. I would recommend that you avoid that. Also, the third line, the check out the best website for iPhones and iPhone accessories. Utilizing overly promotional words is one of those ways that you can easily get caught by the search engines. Now, for future considerations when it comes to links, realize that the majority of algorithm changes are link-based evaluation refinements because people are constantly attempting to fool the search engines and develop a false link profile. You should work to create high-quality links with high-quality content. I wouldn't chase after poor or low-quality links. Now, as I've mentioned before, there are a number of tools available for you to manage and measure your backlinks. Tools such as LinkDex, Moz, Raven, Advanced Link Manager, Majestic SEO, and then also you can use your Google Analytics as well. However, Google Analytics only shows you the visitors that have come from links and what they've done. The basic functions of link management software, and there are many other types other than what are listed here, but the first thing that it does is just provide a catalog of incoming links from other domains to your site and your competitor sites. They offer tools for comparison to see which domains are linking to you, what type of link it is, and on which pages those links are listed. They'll also report newly acquired links in the past 30, 60, 90 days, or something similar to that. The purpose of link management software is to help you assess high quality domains versus low quality domains in terms of importance and relevance. Like I said, the first job of a link management tool is to collect all of your backlinks. You add your domain and the tools will usually spider the domain. They'll go out into search engines and go out into many other formats in order to find and retrace who is linking to you what page that link is contained, sometimes what text is on that page and what text is being used in the link. They will catalog all of your incoming links, organize them, format them, and report back to you. Most of these link programs provide additional filters and management tools so that you can get more insights about who is linking to you, 
how they are linking to you, and the type of site. Personally, I use LinkDex in order to monitor and report on my backlinking. So the first report here that I'm showing out of LinkDex is that I see the total amount of incoming links to my domain. This says I have over 2,000 links, and those 2,000 links are on about 1,000 domains. On average, it looks like I have about two links from every domain that is linking to me. So this is one way that you start to look at your links. Number one, the total amount of domains that are linking to you, and then the total amount of links available. This way you can isolate domains that are linking to you consistently and also find those that may not be the best domains or that are sending a lot of links that are just not relevant. The next thing I do in analyzing my links is to look at the type of link, meaning the type of site that it's coming from. This report breaks down the amount of links coming from blogs, news sites, directories, forums, social sites, articles, or resources. Now, it doesn't usually get all of those links, but it does get enough to give you an idea of how well you're doing in each channel. One of the things that I do like about this report is it also has a timeline. So I can look and see when new links have been acquired and maybe when some links have been just disappeared. That's called churn, and it's normal. It's normal because many times a link is published on social media and it kind of just goes away or it's not tracked anymore by your link management software. It can't find it anymore. And so linking is always dynamic. You are always gaining new links and losing old links. There's going to be a normal amount of churn. The next report shows me all of the domains that are linking to me. It also shows me in the next column, how many of those domains are also linking to at least one competitor. And it will list as many competitors as I have listed in here if they list to multiple competitors. It will let me know the influence of that site or the authority that site is seen because of the amount of websites and credibility that authority has for that domain. It will also let me know the keyword relevance, how relevant that website is overall contextually to my domain and the content that I have. It will also let me know how many pages on that domain have links to my website. So I can also go through and I can filter this list by the type of site. I can filter by those domains that are using anchor text to see how much anchor text is being used and what type of anchor text. There are many different ways that you can filter through all of the domains that are linking to you in order to get an idea of what's happening on your domain, what are competitors doing, and also the relevance of those links to your site. Now, when I say that I can add competitors, this is another type of report, very similar to the one I showed earlier, where I look at my own standing in the different types of sources of links, such as blogs, directories, forums, and so on. I can also, when I add my competitors, look to see how they are performing in those different areas as well. And so I can compare my link profile to my competitors. Different industries are going to have different backlink profiles. They might be more heavily weighted towards blogs, or they might be more heavily weighted towards forums or social sites. In this way, I can look to see if my competitors are actively link building and how they're going about it. I can see where maybe they are excelling in one area that the rest of the competitors are not. So I can compare different strategies. I can also compare different timelines to see if I am acquiring links at a faster rate than my competitors. This is very important if you are a newer business or a newer website trying to compete. Now specifically what I can do is look at an individual domain in this case, this domain has three pages linking to me, and that domain also links to two of my competitors. I can look at the specific pages, and what I'm looking at here are snippets. This should be familiar to you because what it's showing is the URL of the page that's linking to my page. It shows me the page title of that page, and then in this report, 
It lets me know if there are any keywords being used in the link in the anchor text, as well as the number of links from that page. Now, what this tells me is that this is most likely a directory, something that is listing all the different places that where you can buy products, because it's most likely linking to the domain name, seeing that there are no keywords being used in anchor text, and also that there are 16 outbound links from that page. That means that it must be a list of some sort, and they are linking not only to me, but most likely to competitors as well. So I can track my links at the domain level and at the page level. I can look to see which pages might have more influence or relevance to my content. I can also see the link URL, the page title, if any keywords are being used in the anchor text, and also within the context of how many additional links are leaving from that page. If there are a high amount of outgoing links on that page, then a link from that page might not be as valuable since there are so many links. The less links there are coming out from that page, the more it will benefit my site because I'm getting more benefit from less links. Now also, what I'm going to do is compare the link reports to my analytics. I'm going to go to my analytics because linking software does not show traffic. It doesn't show how many people are clicking on the link. It only shows who's linking to you, but it does not show visitor activity. Analytics will show you visitor activity to see which domains are most effective in sending visitors to your site. If you go back to the primary benefits of linking, visitors, branding, and business. Analytics show me visitors and business. It shows me which domains are sending me visitors and which of those visitors are becoming customers. So what I can do is go to Google Analytics, look at all the domains that are referring traffic to my site. I can also click on the domain and see the destination page that they are linking to. I can see how many visitors are coming, either monthly or annually, how often they're coming back, whether they're new users or repeat users, how long they stay, how many pages they view, and how many conversions as a result of those visits. This is a great way to get a 360 degree view of your linking, because not only do you want links that will help you rank better, you also want links that will send business and customers to you as well. Building links can take many forms. Ideally, it is through networks, relationships, and marketing that other websites and users learn about you, like you, and recommend you to others. Unfortunately, there is a lot of bad, outdated, and untrustworthy advice to be found about building links to your website. In this section, I'll present the best practices as accepted by the OMCP standard. The objectives for this module, that you'll be able to develop a link building strategy, that you'll understand the value of different link types. Finally, you'll be able to find inbound link opportunities. The first step in building links is to evaluate what you have. Now there are many tools available that you can utilize to do this for you. There are automated tools that you can get that will catalog all of the incoming links to your website. Some of them are LinkDex, Moz, Raven, or Advanced Link Manager. There are many that can do that. You may also want to utilize your analytics as well in order to find websites that link to you. The first step is evaluating where you are right now. Your incoming links have a significant impact on your rankings and you can do a lot of on-page optimization and see some results. However, a lot of Google's algorithm takes into account links from other high-quality websites. Now when you evaluate what you have, in this example I'm showing you a screenshot from LinkDex. LinkDex catalogs the incoming links to my website and it groups them into different areas. The first way it groups them 
is by high value or high influence domains. Those are websites that link to me that have a lot of influence, not necessarily in my industry, but high influence based on the amount of people that link to them as an authority on many different subjects. The next way that it groups that is based on relevance. Now this is when it looks at the match of my content versus the content of the other website. In the first example, we can see the National Library of Medicine. It is a high influence website because it is a government website with a lot of information that is cited frequently. Because of the amount of other websites linking to that site, it has a high amount of influence. Now based on the website that I am measuring, there is a lot of keyword relevance, meaning that that National Library of Medicine site with the government has a lot of content that's very similar to my site. A lot of the same keywords are being used. So not only is this website of high influence, it also has a lot of relevance. And that's key when evaluating my backlinks. I want to look at which websites are also referring traffic. So while I may have a link from the National Library of Medicine, I want to look at my analytics and look to see is it also providing visitors? Are visitors following that link to my site? And I also want to look at the quality of traffic that it produces. Do these visitors stay longer than average? Do they convert more than average? I want to look at the quality of traffic based on the source. Next, I want to look at the incoming links from those other websites. Number one, I want to make sure that the incoming link from the other site is both accurate and relevant, meaning the text that is used in the link, is it accurate to the content that will appear on the page when the visitor clicks that link? Is the content relevant? This is especially relevant if I have updated my website, changed the content, or moved things around. I want to be sure that that incoming link sends visitors to the appropriate page and the appropriate information. I also want to ensure that that link is worded correctly, that it uses the right words, that is sending visitors and setting expectations of the content that they will see. I may need to contact the website manager or owner and maybe ask for a better link text or a more accurate page destination. Now this requires some interaction with the owner or manager of another website and you always want to be respectful of their time and not demanding that they make any changes. In some cases the organization may be so big you may never find the right person in order to optimize the text or the destination of that link. You always want to look for accuracy in cases where your company or website name is utilized in the link, but also if there is any contact information such as address, phone number, a description of your business, and any content. Make sure it's accurate and it all points to the right place. Another way to look for links is to simply go to a search engine and start doing searches. Search for your company, your business, your company name, and look for websites that may mention you but do not have a live link to your website. Many times your company will be mentioned or cited but there will not be a live link. You can only find these through doing searches and seeing which websites mention you without linking to you. Now this could be an opportunity to get an easy link especially if you can find some contact information and finding the right person that could add a link to your company information. Again you'll need to be polite, ask for their help, and it will help it if you can develop the link along with the link text and send that over giving them just a quick and easy edit to be able to add the information. So make it as easy as possible. As an example, I've provided a sample request format. 
again, you want to be polite, you want to be inviting and respectful of their time and their management. Sometimes, like I said, you may find the right person that can help you. However, the larger the company, the more difficult it will be to make this happen. This just requires your patience and, again, being polite and not expecting the company to do what you are asking. Many times, this is just a formality, and sometimes companies will act on it. So be sure to approach this with the right expectations. The next thing I want to look at are business listings. These are the easy ways to establish links and ensure that links are where they should be and also opportunities. Look for business directories, especially if your company has a local presence. You can utilize Chamber of Commerce lists, association lists, or local listings. If they are on websites, see if they offer links that can go to your website rather than just the list of businesses that are in the area. Even on a larger level, you can look for associations, directories, or listings where you can add your business or double check if your business is there and always ensure that your business name, address, phone number, and URL are correct, complete, and consistent with other listings. The next level will require some active marketing, and that's where you search for opportunities. You can go out and look for other resource lists within your industry or directories of businesses within your industry, and you can get a link many times through membership or submitting your business as a resource. However, you may want to step up your marketing. You can do that by interviewing your clients, seeing if they might be willing to provide a testimonial and a link to your website. You may also want to go out and find other communities online, maybe some social communities that are relevant to your industry. Get involved with those communities, fill out a profile, and get involved by contributing information. By sharing information, you'll find that people like getting information and they'll respond by linking to your site. Another option is to utilize the tool that you had for indexing your links from the first step. You can also add your competitors and you can look at their backlinks. You can look and see which websites and which domains are linking to your competitors, but you always need to go and see why. What are those other sites linking to? And what is the nature of that link? Sometimes it may exclude you from being able to approach competitors' backlinks and ask them for links. However, if they're being linked to by companies that are simply stating, here are vendors in this space and they are linking your competitors and you're not there, then it might make a lot of sense for you to approach and ask if you can be listed as well. However, be sure that the links to your competitors are not from a consumer or customer relationship. In that case, it might be out of line for you to ask for a link. Make sure if you approach anyone who's linking to a competitor and asking for a link to your site, make sure the context is right and that it makes sense for them. And that's the ultimate judge of value. Does it benefit somebody else to link to your site? We all know that it will benefit you, but when you present your link request, you need to offer value and a benefit for others to link to you. So be sure that you present it in a way that is beneficial and good for those people that will be adding the link. They're the ones that have to take the work to do it, and they're also the ones that are adding a recommendation for you and your business. So as always, you need to be considerate and patient. Now, the best way to build links is by creating something that people like and sharing it. You see, the best way to build links is by creating value through content or information or entertainment. You see, when people like things, 
they link to it. If they find a study or a white paper or research that you performed, they link to it. If you post an infographic that explains something and it's attractive, people link to it. You see, that's what's most amazing about linking. I find that when we put most of our effort into creating content that people like, that's what builds the most valuable and the most relevant links. And so what type of content? Well, you can create infographics, videos, top 10 lists, or articles. Articles with advice or analysis of market data or even research. That type of content, people love it. And so when you publish it out, you utilize social media to extend the reach and the visibility of that type of content. And when someone likes it, they'll link to it and recommend it to others. Now people also like, depending upon your industry or your business, they also like some personality, maybe some humor. People always like expert information. They like the cute. This is why pictures of cats tend to be liked and linked to more than almost anything else. And also the unexpected. If you can inject any of that into your content, that just makes it more valuable, more personable, and again, more shareable by other people. And every time someone shares it, it builds a link to your site. You see, the best linking is when people like something. When you create something that people like and share, you might be surprised at the many opportunities there are to get links based on your content. I've seen many, many blogs based on cooking, fashion, arts, sports, music, and when people specialize within a specific topic, they always find an audience. And so anything they publish builds links. Even on certain social media sites, such as Pinterest, people upload pictures on articles and infographics, especially about landscaping, flowers, food, cars, you name it, there is a special interest for anything. And you can develop links from those social sites to your site. And it can generate traffic. Even with a blog, developing articles that talk about upcoming events, new music, sports, whatever it is, when you create content that people like, it takes the longest amount of time to build content for building links. When you develop your own content, that's the biggest investment you'll make in time and research and writing and presentation. However, the result is that when you develop that content, you will receive the best and highest quality links and the most valuable links are going to be to that content. As I mentioned before, one high quality link can be worth more than hundreds or thousands of low quality links. So my best advice is to create content that people like, that they link to, and that will be high value links that you'll generate to your site. Focus in on. So let's talk then now about how the Google algorithms work. So we'll shift gears here and we'll talk about how these algorithms work on Google. So Google uses advanced concepts, retrieve data. So what they do is they're spidering, they're spidering, they're collecting web pages and they're taking all those web pages back to their server. And anytime somebody does a query, they're delivering those web pages within milliseconds. They're delivering results based on your query. So that's in general how it works. So it uses a combination of different algorithms to deliver the best results. They want the best results. And so some of the most popular algorithms below are Google Panda, Google Penguin, and Google Rank Brain. So these are all things that Google has done to make sure that they're constantly tweaking their search engines to deliver the best results. So let's talk about some of these, these popular algorithms. And uh, before we talk about these popular algorithms, uh, let's just make one thing clear that Google's always tweaking their algorithms on their search engine. And so if you want to get an idea how often they do it, well, they do it every day. 
they're t constantly tweaking it but they what they do is they release major changes to their algorithm a few times a year so if you want to get a sense of what those changes look like well you could go to uh, moz.com and you can go to google dash algorithm dash change and you could see here that hey google changes its search algorithm around 500 to 600 times while most of these are minor google again rolls out major changes like panda like penguin that affects search results in significant ways so you can go here and you can go all the way back to 2000 and see some of the algorithm changes that have occurred over the last few years and you can see here the last major one was done in august of 2018 that was the medic core update so they're constantly making changes to their search engine to deliver a more concise more better ecosystem for the end user so if it's a better search engine for the end user end users are going to come back so the whole idea is continuing to tweak the system that the algorithms to better show more accurate results and so let's take a look at some of the the major algorithm changes that, that they've done in the past so the first is we'll talk about google panda and panda was an algorithm that was released back in 2011. so here we are in 2019 is a few years ago but still significant in that really this algorithm emphasized high quality content because before panda there was a there's just a lot of content out there on the internet and there was a lot of spam content there's a lot of duplicate content and so really the idea behind panda is for google to really deliver in their search engine results pages high quality content so what it did was it removed web pages that had low quality or duplicate content so that was the whole idea behind you know the algorithm nicknamed panda it removed low quality and, and duplicate content and that kind of cleaned things up a bit where if you did a search query now you'd actually see better better results and one thing about panda is because there's so much quality because google's indexing so much there on the internet that it's constantly being updated it's updated regularly so the next one we're going to talk about is google penguin so penguin was released after panda and what that focused in on was low quality links so remember we talked about link building we talked about quality links over quantity so naturally you're going to have links naturally from all websites whether they be high quality or low quality the whole idea behind this algorithm is to sever the links that are low quality and so the idea behind that was they focused on two areas so they focused in on link schemes and keyword stuffing so that's what penguin focused on was link schemes were basically link almost link farming where you produced mass amounts of backlinks and not all of them were good quality they weren't natural links links should be natural from one high quality site or blog to another high quality site or blog and by creating link schemes you created an ecosystem where links just went to irrelevant low quality spam related pages and so google's penguins algorithm update focused in on that effort to remove or combat pages that had poor links from being indexed in their search engine results and then they also combated keyword stuffing keyword stuffing is nothing more than taking your targeted keyword and stuffing it into the content of your page or title tag your meta description so any sites that were caught up doing that basically suffer the consequences because what penguin did was take care of sites that basically were accused of keyword stuffing or had characteristics of keyword stuffing and they removed sites that had a lot of links pointing to it from poor quality sites and vice versa sites that really had a lot of external links pointing to other poor quality sites so that's what penguin did they took a look at those two areas and so if we talk about link schemes again penguins aim was to decrease the ranking of web pages that created artificially by using black hat techniques and basically what i mean by black hat techniques that artificially creating links that just didn't make sense just for the sake of getting the backlink just for the sake of passing link juice and so that's what a link scheme is or, or was and so google basically tweaked their algorithm to combat those poor link schemes and so 
Keyword stuffing, as I mentioned a minute ago, it's just repetitive usage of the same keyword. And that just basically suffers, the content is the thing that suffers here. And when the content suffers, the end user suffers. So Google is all about quality content. And when you have quality content and that quality content's indexed and users find what they're looking for, chances are they're gonna go back to the search engine to continue to find what they're looking for with the end result being presented with quality content. So keyword stuffing really dilutes the quality of the content. And then let's talk about the third algorithm, which is Rank Brain. So Rank Brain is a processing algorithm that uses machine learning. And what that does, that machine learning interprets search queries that users search on Google. So for example, if RankBrain sees a word or phrase it isn't familiar with, basically the machine can make a guess as to what words or phrases might have a similar meaning and filter the result accordingly. So basically take these search engine queries and present them in a way that's logical so that the end result can be something that's relevant to what you're looking for. And so for example, if you're searching for online marketing, you will get results related for digital marketing on search engine result pages. Why? Because Rank Brain will interpret that particular keyword. And they're trying to basically match based on all the data they collected what words or phrases might have a similar meaning. So online marketing, digital marketing have similar meanings. Have you ever wondered what will happen if the pages of your website are not visible in the search engines? Definitely, this can be the most scary thought you ever had. But due to lack of technical knowledge, this is happening in the real world with the newbies in the SEO industry. Well, for these beginners, this video is the opportunity and the solution to your problems. To get your pages search and appear in Google search results, it is important that these pages are indexed in Google and to get the web pages index Google search console or search console is the one-stop solution Google search console formerly known as Google webmaster tool is a web service provided by Google developers Google search console is mainly responsible for optimizing a website for its visibility indexing website, detecting crawl errors, etc. After understanding what is Google Search Console, now we need to focus on why Search Console is an important part of search engine optimization. A website's technicalities are directly or indirectly related to Search Console. Consider you have created a website for your business. But from past few weeks, your website is not visible in search result pages. Here, Search Console comes into action. There is a possibility that search engine crawlers are not able to crawl your website. Thus, it is not visible in the search result pages. To make crawlers crawl your website, you will need to optimize your website using Search Console. Some other technical aspects of Search Console includes fixing indexing problems, sending the updated content or pages for indexing, generating search traffic reports, generating alerts if there are any issues related to indexing or any other issue, Gets the list of sites linking to your website. Keep the track of mobile usability, AMP pages and more. So now it is the right time to understand how Search Console works. But before we begin this topic, have a look at the range of courses of digital marketing and search engine optimization from Skill Up by Simply Learn. You can get the link in the description box below. So now, I have a question for you. What will you do at first if your web page fails to appear in search result pages? Well, let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. Stay tuned with this video 
even though if you don't have the answer right now by the end of this video you will surely able to answer this question so let's get started by knowing how search console works to understand the working of search console it is necessary to have a detailed knowledge about how search engine works search engines mainly works in three steps crawling indexing and ranking let's have a look at each step one by one so first let's start with crawling search engines are hungry for content and so they send web spiders or web crawlers also known as robots or search engine bots to discover new content or any updated content content can be an image a web page a video or anything else present on the web this process is known as crawling now let's know about indexing as soon as the crawler discover the updated content or new content these web crawlers start storing the urls of the content into the search index or web index this process is known as indexing once the content is indexed it starts appearing in the search result pages when a user enters a search query the most relevant results are taken from the index and displayed in the form of most relevant to least relevant in the search result pages this process is known as ranking now that we have gained knowledge about how search engine works here i have a question for you choose the correct option with respect to working of search engines you need to choose the option for all the steps of how search engines work option a indexing crawling ranking option b ranking indexing crawling option c crawling indexing ranking and option d crawling ranking and indexing let us know your answer in the comment section below now let's get started by learning how search console actually works search console is a primary source of information that helps search engine bots to crawl index and rank the pages of your website thereby allowing the website owners to monitor the health of your website all you need to do is integrate search console with your website and get the ownership allow the search engine bots to crawl your website and index the pages also don't forget to submit your website's sitemap to search engines submitting sitemaps helps the crawler to discover more pages of your website thereby understanding your site's architecture we will know how it is done in the upcoming part of the video also you need to keep an eye on the errors suggested by search console and solve them else it may harm the ranking of your website now let me remind you that all the reports that are generated in search console are based on the activity of the web crawlers on your website now let's understand various parameters and terminologies from search console to get a complete understanding of this webmaster tool so without any further delay let's start understanding the basic terminologies of google search console and how they work and improve your website's health the first one we have is performance reports google search console provides two types of performance report search reports and discover reports let's first understand about search reports search reports help to analyze the search performance of your website search performance reports include metrics and dimensions so let's first focus on metrics here there are four types of metrics as you can see in this image the metrics include the total clicks or i must say clicks impressions average ctr and average position 
Impressions provides the data on how many times your website appears in the search results. As you can see here, the graph shows the number of times this website has appeared in the search results. The next metric we have is clicks. Clicks provide the data on the total number of times users clicked from the search results and reached your website. The graph below shows the number of times the users have clicked from search results and they have arrived on the, any page of my website. So suppose if here is a number 200, so we can definitely get an idea for very number of dates, number of dates provided on the x-axis which shows that how many times the user has clicked and arrived on the website and the number varies, in, uh, varies from between like 200, 200, uh, 250, 300 and in between 250 to 300. And the next metric we have is average CTR. Average CTR or click through rate is the percentage of impressions that results in clicks. In the same manner, the graph below shows uh, the average CTR for various different dates. The next metric we have is average position. The average position represents the data about the average position of the sites in the search results. Uh, it is possible that your website is ranking today at number one position, so it may rank tomorrow at three, some other day at four, some other day at nine or ten, and again it may rank to the one. So this data actually provides the detail about the average position uh, which your website uh, frequently uh, ranks at. So that is if it is ranking at one, two, and three in between one, two, and three positions, so the average position may be two. Now, understanding about the dimensions, dimensions are the data attribute that defines who did something on your site or from where. Here is the list of dimensions on which the dimension performance reports are generated. That is, the countries, pages, queries, devices, search appearance and dates. The dimension country suggests the country from which the search came. As you can see here from the uh, left column, you can get the list of number of countries. From the right side, you can get the idea about the clicks, impressions, CTR and position. That is all the metrics related to that query uh, uh, from which the search came from or from that location or whatever the activity has happened from that location. Next we have is the dimensions pages. Pages show the pages clicked by user or a page that is viewed on a search. So this, this actually you get the reports from the search console in the form of the links where you get the link which is the exact page that is viewed on the search. If there exists duplicate pages on the site, then only one canonical page or canonical link will be displayed by the search engines out of the number of duplicate pages. So basically canonical links are those links uh, like if there are suppose uh, there is a one original page and there are two three duplicate page of the same page. So what happens uh, uh, the original page gains the canonical link and uh, this page has more value than the uh, duplicate pages. So whenever the search engine will crawl your website all the duplicate pages may be ignored and all its uh, uh, link juice or link equity or anything will be uh, completely taken for uh, the original page. Uh, moving ahead to queries. Queries provide the query string that users search on the Google search console. So suppose there is a website. So suppose, uh, let's talk about the Simply Learn website. So suppose a user may uh, add as Java course and simply learn websites appears at second or third position so this query uh, say suppose user clicks on the website and reaches the website this query java course on simply learn or java course will add in the search console uh, showing that the user has reached to your website using this query java course 
and again all the list of the queries appears towards the left and all the metrics for that query like clicks impressions ctr and its average uh, position is appeared towards the right in the search console now talking about the search appearance search appearance helps in grouping the data as per the search result type or by the feature so you can get here the number of search appearance and again the same metrics uh, with respect to the search appearance criteria next let's move towards the dates dates groups the data as per the dates according to the public time zones now let's have a look over the discover performance report now here you must be thinking about how the search is different from discover yes search and discover follow different approaches users enter a query to find a required information with search whereas discover shows the content based on what result will be best match for your query as per the google's automated system now coming to the discover performance report as per google's guidelines discover performance reports are visible only if your website has a minimum threshold of impressions in discover now moving to another important parameter of search console which is url inspection url inspection is an interesting tool in the search console this tool allows you to inspect whether the url is indexable or not some main functions of this tool includes checking the current status of the url inspecting live urls requesting indexing for a url viewing pages rendered version viewing crawled pages viewing tested pages etc in order to check the index status of url open the url inspection tool and add the complete url for which we need to know its indexing status now to understand the results check the present status if it shows that url is on google as you can see in the screen this means that url qualifies google's criteria and is eligible to appear in search results if it shows url is not on google then the url does not qualify the google's criteria and is not eligible to appear in search results you can check more details like url discovery crawl and indexing information from the page availability tab click on the crawl page to see the information about the http request and response if you find that the link is disabled just hover over the page to check the reason now coming to the live url test it is helpful to test the live url and check if it is capable of being indexed it proves helpful when you update your page and want to compare it with its latest indexed version just to bring it to your notice a live test will only confirm whether the google crawler can access your page for indexing but it doesn't assure that your page will be included in the google index altogether with the help of index coverage report one can find the list of urls which includes the urls google has found on your website the urls that have been indexed and identify if any indexing problem have occurred next we move ahead to understand about the sitemaps a sitemap is the file that contains all the information of pages on your website this helps search engine crawlers to crawl your website and understand your website structure and helps them to index the pages more efficiently more the crawler indexes your pages higher the chances for the pages of your website to appear in the search results with the help of sitemaps you can provide information about various contents like pages videos images etc as you can understand a sitemap 
plays an important role in indexing process? You must be curious to know how we can create and submit a sitemap to search engines. Before we understand this process, make sure that all pages of your website are linked in an appropriate manner with each other, thereby maintaining a healthy site structure. A sitemap can be created in XML format, RSS format, or in text format. It can be auto generated or created manually as well. Most commonly used sitemap is XML. Following is an example of an XML sitemap. This is the simplest version of the sitemap that we are representing here. You can submit a sitemap through the sitemap reports in the search console. However, sitemaps can also be submitted through robots.txt file. Let's understand about robots.txt file. So let's understand the robots.txt file in short. Robots.txt file notifies the web crawlers about the URLs that they can access on the website. As there are lots of search engines, there exist different web crawlers. Thus, there is a possibility that some web crawlers may not obey the instructions from the robots.txt file. It is necessary to know how to use the proper syntax as different crawlers understand syntax differently. Thus, there are chances that some web crawlers might fail to understand the instructions from the robots.txt file. A page can be indexed even if it is disallowed from the robots.txt file if it is linked to other site. Next, let's know what enhancement reports are. All the rich result status reports are displayed under the enhancement tab. So, let's know more about rich results. These type of results are known as rich results in SERPs. So, basically, rich results can be any search results other than the traditional blue links, for example, image results, carousels, etc. You can check whether the pages from your website support rich results or not using the rich result test tool provided by Google developers. Now understanding the rich result status report, the enhancement tab contains separate reports for rich result type. Some rich result report types are listed below that are breadcrumbs, education Q&A, event, FAQ, fact check, guided recipe, how to, image license, job posting, learning video, review snippets, etc. Rich result status reports consist of summary page and details page. The summary page mainly consists of errors, useful items found on your website, warnings, etc. The details page consists of the information about the issues, when it was detected, item type, when was the page last scrolled, etc. Before we understand how to fix error in search console, it is important to understand the status of each page as reported by search console. Each page has any of the following status. Error, Warning, excluded, and valid. If the status of the page is valid, it means the page has successfully indexed. The status of the page appears to be excluded if one purposefully wants the page not to be indexed or a page is blocked by robots.txt file. For example, setting the meta tag to no index. Warnings majorly appears when the page of your website is indexed. But there are some issues with the page which need your attention and have to be resolved as soon as possible. If the page's status is error, then there is a need to pay a detailed attention over the issues in the page as these issues prevent the page 
from getting indexed. Let's discuss about the errors in detail and how we can fix them. Some popular errors from the search console are listed below. That is the redirect error, server error, submitted URLs blocked by robots.txt, URL marked as no index, submitted URL is a soft 404, 404 or page not found error. So let's first know about the redirect error. Some redirect error that search console shows up are the redirect chain that was too long, redirect group, redirect URL that exceeds maximum URL length and bad or empty URL in the redirect chain. So all these error means that the redirections are not working properly and so there is a need to fix them. So suppose for example you have added too many redirects from one page to another. So in this scenario search engine bots find it a waste of time to crawl again and again to the same redirections and at that time the search engine crawlers or search engine bots ignore those URLs or redirections. So in such cases you need to fix those redirection to a single URL. The next we have is server error. The server returns 5xx error when it fails to fulfill a valid request. This error mainly conveys that something is wrong with your website server. All you need to do is reach out to your hosting services and inform them about the issue and make sure it gets resolved as soon as possible. The next one we have is Submitted URL blocked by robots.txt. To resolve this issue, you need to remove the line of code from the robot.txt file that restricts Google from crawling the respective page. The next we have is URL marked as no index. When a URL is marked as no index, it sends the signal to crawlers that this page is not meant to be crawled or this page is not meant to be indexed. If you want this page to be indexed, check the metadata and remove the no index attribute to allow the crawlers to crawl the URL. Now let's understand about the error. Submitted URL is a soft 404 and 404 or page not found error. Whenever a web page load, server returns a 200 signal showing the success status code. Soft 404 is a condition in which server returns 200 success status code and the page not exist error simultaneously. This is considered to be a bad user experience. This error can be solved simply by redirecting this page to any relevant URL or the home page of the website. Talking about 404 or page not found error, this error mainly occurs when you delete the page from your website but the URL of the page still exists in the sitemap. This error can be solved by simply removing the URL or removing the 404 URL from the sitemap or redirecting the URL to a new page. This will help to avoid the further errors in near future. We will have a detailed look at other 4xx errors in the upcoming videos. Now that we are aware of the basics of search console, let's dive deeper to know some stats regarding the search console in the SEO industry. When you're thinking of adding a business online, your website should fulfill all the technical SEO needs which can be achieved by Google Search Console. Thus, there is a huge demand in SEO industry for the candidates having strong knowledge of Google Search Console. The average salary of an SEO expert with the Google Search Console skills in US is $53,000 to $78,000 per annum and that in India 
is 2,76,000 per annum. Some biggies in the SEO industry looking for this skill sets include Accenture, Amazon, People Group, Eaton, etc. So let me know your dream company to work as an SEO expert in the comment section below. The search engines have put massive resources into developing the visibility of local and regional businesses in the search results. In addition, the massive increase in prevalence of smartphones over the past few years have made location-based searches an expected everyday occurrence. People expect to find results based on where they are immediately. Here's the basic idea behind local. Now, for a long time in the past, search engines wanted to be able to provide results based on where you were in the world in a very precise way. They were able to use this somewhat by using the IP address, and they could approximate where you were, but it wasn't always that accurate. What they really wanted to know is where you exactly were within feet or meters. Now, this technology has evolved considerably and in a very short amount of time using location technology like GPS and Wi-Fi. In addition, the prevalence of searching on smartphones accounts for more than 60% of searches every day. These factors now enable search engines to know your location and provide incredibly accurate and thorough options for your search. So what's at the core of this? Well, it's the acronym NAP. It stands for name, address, and phone number. This is the most critical factor for any business, not just in local SEO. But for local, it is critically important. All you need to do is on your website specify one name for your business, one address, and one phone number. And then when you put that into different directories like Yelp or Yellow Pages or whatever you may be using, you need to make sure that you have exactly, letter for letter, the same name and the same address and the same phone number. Unfortunately, this gets convoluted. Because the search engine spiders index and classify information, business information can be classified separately, all because of the slightest variation in business name or address making it look like a separate business. Now, a human would easily be able to identify the difference and classify the variations as a single business. Search engines can't do that yet. Start on your own website. Specify one name for your business, one address format, and one phone number. And then use that same identical name and format when you set up your accounts at different websites and directories like Yelp or Yellow Pages. You need to make sure you have exactly letter for letter the same name the same address, and the same phone number. Unfortunately, this can be difficult. There are a lot of different formats for phone numbers, certainly for addresses and even for names. Any inconsistency will cause problems. Again, a human might be able to figure this out easily, but using the examples, a search engine would consider this two separate businesses at the same address. Or, because the address format is different, it may even be considered two different businesses at two different addresses. Do you see how that works? So, search engines do not usually know that they're the same business, and this causes all kinds of problems. So let's pretend that your address is 123 Happy Street, Suite 3. There's a lot of different ways you could write this. You could spell out suite. You could use just the abbreviation for it. And there's actually two abbreviations for suite. You could also use unit instead of suite. But suite numbers and abbreviations are where people lose their consistency. Even with road, street, parkway, or avenue, you need to pick just one version, spell it and format it exactly the same, and use it consistently. Then find all the instances of different variations you have online and go fix them. The last part of this is directories. So directories, for a while now, has been a bit of a bad word. It used to be a great way of doing SEO until it got abused. In fact, it got abused and overused. And abuse was that people would charge a lot of money so that you could be listed in a directory. And now, in modern days, directories are not like they used to be. 
and they're not that useful. Getting links that way and doing link building through directories is not going to be greatly helpful. However, the big exception to this is with local SEO. There are important IYPs, Internet Yellow Pages. There are also things like Yelp or Urban Spoon, where people go and submit their local businesses. Real human beings pick up their phone and they go to the Yelp app and look for businesses. And because real human beings are using these, unlike the directories of the past, this means that you want to have your business there. So in some ways, directories, at least in the local space, have returned. A great example of this are local or even national business associations. Chambers of Commerce, business associations, industry associations, and other directories can be good places. Now, after all that, let's move on to some other local signals. So the first most important signal is this acronym again, NAP, name, address, and phone number. The key here is that consistency. The next thing is keywords and titles. This is extremely convenient because it's something you should be doing for SEO anyway. This is particular for title tags, which is something we've covered in the other videos. The next one is domain authority. So if you have an important domain, an important business, Google is going to use this as a signal when they're doing a traditional local search. So when someone's on their mobile and they're looking for a good restaurant, if you are an important restaurant in the city, you're going to be more popular in both local search and traditional search. That's domain authority. The next one is inbound link signals. This again might sound familiar. The things that help you for traditional SEO do the same for local. The first one is anchor text. So this is one of the most important. If you're a great restaurant, hopefully you're going to have lots of bloggers, lots of magazines, and local online entities that are writing about you and linking to you. They're naturally going to use your name and the name of your business in the review about you. These are the kinds of things that Google is looking for because these are what is effective online. The last one is reviews and citations. But in this context, these have very specific definitions. It's not just reviews in general, like the ones I've talked about. It's reviews on specific local directories or business listings. And it's both the quality of them. Are you getting five stars? And the quantity of them. Do you have 100 reviews? Do 100 people care enough about your business to review you? Now, the next one is a bit more complex, as it does require some programming on your website. This is called schema microdata or structured data. Schema is an agreed upon programming standard by search engines, browsers, and device manufacturers that directs the markup and display of specific content. It's typically content that is repetitive by nature, and therefore, if it's displayed in a consistent manner for all devices, browsers, and operating systems to know the content, then they can display it properly. You'll find it in addresses, contact cards, dates, e-commerce products, reviews, people, places, creative works, and more. What we're most concerned with here is the address and phone number. By using schema, when you add your address or phone number to your website, it enables the visitor to use the click to call function on their phone when there's a phone number on the website. In addition, using the address schema can open up a map when someone clicks on it to show the location. Utilizing this schema provides clear data to the search engine that can be republished across a variety of channels. Now, specifically for Google's business listings, they give a very wide range of content for businesses to list. So fill out as many areas of the business listing as you can. Business hours, payment types accepted, phone numbers, descriptions, reviews from Google, and maybe even from your own website. You can link your social profiles and any events or promotions you have. One of the biggest signals that we've seen grow in importance are the amount of pictures that you load into your business listings. In fact, Google provides a report as to how many times the photos are viewed by searchers. Many times, businesses that have many photos will show up with more prominence than those that have little or no photos. So take advantage of the listing opportunities that Google provides.
Finally, the same behavioral signals that are used in search are also used in the local search results. And this is because the search engines, especially Google, can see how searchers interact with your local listing because it is in their system. The behavioral signals start with how many people search for your business. This is directly related to your local visibility and loyalty. So don't forget about your local offline marketing. Next, they measure how long someone views your listing. They count how many times the phone number is clicked for someone to call or when someone clicks to find directions. In addition, there's a button there for directions to be sent to a searcher's phone if they're using a PC or laptop. All of these engagement factors and buttons on a business listing are counted as engagement and task completion, which increases the behavioral signals for your business. As people save the listing, check in, or even visit, these all send important behavioral signals of popularity and loyalty which contributes to your business's visibility and local search. Before I tell you how to bring traffic to your website, let me tell you why this is so important. Okay, why do we wanna bring users to our website? I mean, it has to be on equal ground as web development and design. Is somebody who goes to your site and then does something when they get to your site. So you have users, and when those users get to your site, they're generating page views and traffic and you want to turn that traffic into engagement okay so each page's traffic is configured independently of all their pages so when you go when somebody goes to your website they look at a page that's a page view and certain pages on your website you want to turn that page view into a conversion okay whether that be you know looking at a video or purchasing something so think of these pages on your website as salespeople. they're trying to convert visitors who come to your website but first we need to get the visitors to your website. So when you get visitors to your website, again, you can generate sales, which means revenue, or you can increase brand awareness, or you can earn revenue through sponsored posts and advertisement. So if you have, for example, a lot of content on your website, you can turn that in to revenue by hosting ads on your website. So when somebody clicks on that ad, you're gonna earn a percentage of that click. Okay, what that click is worth. So having a website means a lot of good things for you, but first you gotta get the traffic there. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna tell you how to drive traffic to your website. So there's lots of different ways in which you can bring traffic to your website. Well, the first is paid advertising. So paying to advertise your products, services with ads is one of the easiest ways to drive traffic to your website. So some of the options available are search ads, social media ads, or display ads. So search ads are ads that are displayed in the search engine results. So when a user types in a keyword query, you want your ad to show up based on that keyword query. Okay, so an example is digital marketing course. Somebody types in digital marketing course and simply learn is the first ad that shows up. How do we know it's an ad? Because you can see the word ad next to the domain. So when somebody clicks on that link, simply learn is going to pay Google. So that's how search advertising works. Okay, the next is social. So social media marketing involves increasing traffic or engagement or brand awareness, or lots of different strategies. But you're, instead of doing this on search, you're doing it on a social media platform. Okay, so for example, you can advertise on any particular platform. And the way you advertise could be with an image, it could be with a video. So in this case, you could see Cobrio is doing a sponsored ad here, how to succeed with Google Ads. And then another form of advertising is display. So display means creating ads that are placed on specific websites. So with display, unlike search, you have a choice in the ad format. With search, you only have text ads. But with display, you have text ads, image ads, rich media ads, video ads. So you have lots of different options in which you can advertise on other websites. So the idea here is to get your ad in front of the right audience. When they could see your display banner, your banner ad, then it's gonna be more visual, more appealing, generate some brand interest, and hopefully you can get somebody to click on that ad and over to your website. So 
That's paid advertising. Again, through search, through social, through display, but you can also promote your site on social media. So once your content has gone live, you could take advantage of different social media platforms. I mean, it really depends on what you're trying to promote because what you're trying to promote needs to align with the appropriate social media platform. So Facebook is best suited for industries like food and beverages and news and media and if you're selling a product. So you fall under one of those categories and Facebook could be the right platform for you. If you're involved in, again, beauty or food and beverage or e-commerce, then you can also leverage Instagram, which is part of Facebook's ecosystem. So if you advertise on Facebook, you can also advertise on Instagram and or Instagram. So it doesn't have to be and Facebook and Instagram. It could be Facebook or Instagram. You also have LinkedIn as a platform. LinkedIn is great for B2B. So if you're trying to promote industry news or, or tips and best practices or job postings, then LinkedIn is the place for you. It's a B2B platform. It's great for targeting specific industries, targeting specific job levels or job descriptions. Okay, so LinkedIn is great if you're into B2B, focusing on the business side of it. So you also have YouTube. Now YouTube is part of Google's ecosystem. YouTube is a video platform. Okay, so it's great if you're trying to promote gaming or entertainment, or if you're a vlogger. Okay, so YouTube's a great way to promote your site uh, by getting your product out there in the form of a video. Okay. Then you have Twitter. Twitter, to me, encompasses a lot of different industries, beauty and fitness, news and media, entertainment. Okay, you have limited number of characters, but a lot of people are active on Twitter. And it's a great way to generate some awareness and get some clicks over to your website. So these are just some of the most popular social media platforms. Of course, there are plenty more out there. The third way in which you can drive traffic to your site is guest post, put blogging. So most of you already know what blogging is all about. Well, if you're blogging for your own site, you can jump on somebody else's site and blog on their behalf. So having the opportunity to guest post on another website can be very helpful because one, that other blog could have lots of traffic and have a, a well-known brand. So if you're blogging on another blog, it's going to build your brand awareness and potentially increase traffic to your blog or website. So it exposes to you to targeted traffic. So if you're going to guest blog, guest blog on a site that's very relevant to your business or industry. That way you're targeting the right audience. Okay. You can expand your personal network. So getting yourself out there, getting your brand out there in front of a different audience. And then obviously for SERPs, because it generates a backlink. So SERPs, search engine ranking pages, means that, hey, if you want to rank organically, you're gonna to have to generate some backlinks. So guest blogging is an, a, a way to generate some backlinks to your site and in effect, that's gonna help you get your pages ranked higher because Google's gonna recognize the relationship from one blog to your blog and build up your relevancy. So some other benefits here to guest blogging is you can grow your social media plot following because you can then promote that on social media, that you're guest blogging. Okay, again, you can improve your online authority, okay, because when you're guest blogging and you have recognition on that guest blog, if it's a popular blog, then that's going to help your domain and page authority for SEO. And then the end result is going to improve your backlink score. So there are a lot of benefits to guest blogging. To me, at the end of the day, it's just about reaching out to your audience, using another platform to do that in the form of a blog. And the results of that is going to mean more brand awareness for you and turning that traffic from that other blog into qualified leads. So you can also interview industry thought leaders. So that's another way, an interesting way to generate traffic to your site. So reaching out to thought leaders for interviews, okay, could generate some credibility for you and the other person. So it's reciprocal. So it means that you're active in the industry that you're in and it allows you to engage with other leaders in the industry and the indirect net result of that could be increased traffic because if you do the interview and you record it or if it's via video then you can obviously post it on other platforms and that could in turn drive traffic to your website 
Obviously, just like guest blogging, it's going to increase your reach. So getting yourself out there. If nobody knows who your brand is and they know who the thought leaders are and they see you interviewing the thought leaders, then that's going to put you in front of these people. And so it's going to increase your reach. Another way to drive traffic to your website is just to make sure your website's responsive. And what do we mean by responsive? Well, we mean, does it work on multiple devices? specifically mobile. So depending on the device, your website hides, shows, shrinks, enlarges, or moves content so that it conforms to the browser that that person's looking at on your web for your website. So if somebody's looking on mobile at your website, you want to make sure that your website adjusts accordingly. So you want to be able to, you know, test to make sure it's responsive. And so is content arranged based on importance. Okay, does it work across different browsers on different devices? And do the images, text, and everything else align just like it does on desktop? So there are plenty of tools out there on the web. All you need to do is just do a search for, you know, check my website for responsiveness. You know, so you, you can use plenty of tools to check to see if your website is responsive towards multiple devices. Why is that important? Because if somebody goes to your website via mobile, and your site doesn't align properly or the content's all stretched out and somebody has to maneuver their browser just to see your website, then chances are they're not going to come back. Chances are they're not even going to convert. Okay. So you want to be able to revise your device browser combinations. You want to make sure that everything works accordingly. You want to be able to test those fonts, make sure they look good. And then you also want to make sure that people can navigate. So if they're on mobile, are they going to navigate just as easy as they can on desktop? And if you have any pop-ups, you want to probably make sure they're removed. So that way, when somebody's looking at your website, they're not getting interfered with on mobile. And then, of course, you want to make sure that these pages load. Okay, so they load just as quick on desktop as they should on mobile and vice versa. So this should not take a long time to load. So. Moving on from responsiveness on mobile to building a brand community. So brand community refers to a group of people who identify your brand and use your brand as a platform to exchange ideas and contribute content. Some advantages of having a brand community are promoting brand evangelism and loyalty. It can be a source of feedback, loyalty, and ideas. So build a community, build a brand community who you know, identify with you. Okay. So continue to, you know, treat these people as loyal customers. Okay. Maybe give them an, a promotion uh, to use specifically just for them that they can use on your website or talk directly to them because you know that they're followers, they're repeat customers. They purchase for you multiple times. So talk to them differently as well. You know who these people are and that's what building a brand's all about. It's about identifying your brand with other people, okay? And identify people who identify with your brand and messaging and talking to them as if they're part of your own community, your own family. So you can use user-generated content that provides future marketing strategies. So the feedback you get from your own community could be in turn used to promote or used in future marketing strategies i.e. advertising, i.e. post on social. Okay, it can also provide PR opportunities. So it's a chance for you to, you know, put out press releases based on the community that you built. So any brand, regardless of who it is, should be able to identify with your audience, their target audience, and that target audience eventually going to become part of a community. These are a group of people who identify with you, what you're trying to sell, what your cause is, what your mission statement is, what your service is, they identify with you. So leverage them and reciprocate. Identify them, talk to them separately, give them the what they deserve, the respect and loyalty that they deserve as well because they're communicating and they're following you as a brand. So the next thing you could do to drive traffic is be active in the comment section. So engage in relevant and thought provoking conversations on other blogs and sites. It doesn't necessarily have to be another blog per se. It could be other sites like Reddit or Quora or Medium. Sites that have a lot of content 
that are broken out by industry that allow you to engage in conversation, that allow you to either upvote or share or respond. Okay, so be active because when you're active, people are going to see that, hey, you're a leader in the industry. You know what you're talking about. You have some some brand equity. You have some thought and some knowledge on the specific topic and subject. So it just puts you in a better light when you can respond and be active on these different platforms. Okay, let's turn our attention to search engine optimization, also known as SEO or organic search. So in order to drive traffic to your site, you're going to have to implement an SEO strategy. Why do you want to implement an SEO strategy? Because it can help you improve your overall searchability and visibility on search engines. And obviously that comes with advantages. One of those advantages is obviously more traffic to the site. Search is still king in terms of volumes of people using search on a daily basis. So you have a great opportunity to be found. It also builds trust and credibility because still a majority of the people who do a search click on an organic search listing. And so if you're found organically and you're ranked number one, then chances are somebody's going to click on your listing. And it provides increased engagement and traffic. And so what that means is more traffic, more engagement. And engagement is something you define. It could be, again, a download of a document or the clicking on the play button of a video or, or submitting a form or signing up for a newsletter or calling. These are all forms of engagement. So the, the amount of traffic you drive from organic search to your website is only going to improve engagement. Okay, so you can also provide an improved user experience. And what do we mean by that? Well, if you're getting lots of traffic from organic search, you have a really good opportunity to do A-B testing. And when you do A-B testing, you can improve user experience, meaning you're showing one variation against the other from people coming from organic search. And so this is helpful and that you know if you're running an a b test the variation has a chance to improve or outperform the original and if it outperforms the original you're improving user experience and then it helps target quality traffic so seo to me or all search is the only medium in which you're meeting somebody halfway you're you're addressing what they're looking for so if somebody's looking for a pair of red women's nike shoes the 2019 model and you have that particular product to offer well you have a chance of showing up via organic search somebody types in you know women's red Nike shoes size whatever at the year 2019 model then of course they're gonna probably likely click on your listing because you have what they're looking for and, and that goes with any keyword any industry any business any segment any type of product you're selling. So again, you have a chance to really be visible for what people are looking for. And so that's the beauty of search engine optimization. You have a really good opportunity here to meet people halfway, to drive quality traffic, to get them to enjoy a good user experience, all the while generating engagement. And along with SEO, we want to be able to build backlinks. So SEO is a two-pronged approach, meaning you have two strategies in one on page and off page and so off page involves backlinking so backlinks are just links that direct users from other websites to your own website so with that inherently it's going to drive traffic qualified traffic to your website because if somebody's on a relevant website that's linking to yours and they click on that link and go to your website it's likely going to be qualified meaning they're going to be relevant and so Backlinking, because it's an off-page strategy. Why is it an off-page SEO strategy? Because if Google crawls that other site that has a link to you, then that's going to give you credit because Google will say, hey, this site's getting some links from some relevant sites. We must think they're relevant and therefore we're going to trust this site. So by Google trusting your site, it's going to improve your organic ranking. And with the organic rankings being improved, meaning it's going to mean faster indexing. So what does that mean? So you want to be indexed by the search engines. And so the quicker Google can find your pages, even if it's on somebody else's site, then that means they're going to follow that link, go to that page on your site, 
and take that page back to their servers to be indexed. Okay, so the quicker you can get indexed, the quicker you can get found. And then it helps with referral traffic. So again, we noticed that our efforts are on SEO, organic search, but if you're getting traffic from another website, hey, that still counts. That's referral traffic. Okay, so that's a side advantage to having backlinks is good traffic from other sites. Okay, so those those are inherently the some of the reasons to do backlinking. Okay, never hurts. I mean, there's brand awareness reasons to being on other sites as well. There's industry leadership, meaning if you 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 post content on Reddit. Okay, you're coming across as an industry leader, but yet generating a backlink, which helps with SEO and referral traffic. So there's a lot of benefits to building backlinks. And the opposite of backlinks are internal links. So you want to do internal linking, and that just means connecting one page on your site to another. And why is that beneficial? Because it can help direct visitors to other pages they wouldn't normally otherwise find via your navigation. So if you're active on a blog, don't be afraid to include multiple internal links. You want to move people through your site. You want the flow of traffic to go from one page to another to another. And so when you do internal linking, just like with backlinks, it's going to improve the indexing of your website. Google's going to follow those links and index those pages. And Google does give credit from an SEO perspective from an internal linking perspective. So if one page is linked to another and that page has really good relevance in the eyes of Google, then the other page is probably gonna benefit from that. The other reason you wanna do internal linking, again, you wanna move people from your one page of your site to the other. And when you do that, it's gonna reduce bounce rates. So bounce rate is simply the rate at which people land on a page and then leave. So if I have 100 people land on my homepage and only one person went to another page and the other 99 left the site, then that's a 99% bounce rate. So by putting internal links in place, you're helping people move from one page to the other and thus reducing the bounce rate. And that's what you want. You want to keep people on your site. You want to be greedy. It also drives traffic to older posts. So again, when we say older posts, we're really referring to blog posts. So if you have a relevant blog post and you're writing a new blog post, then link the two together. If it's relevant, link it. I don't, you know, regardless of how old it is, you know, you want to show Google that these older blog posts, just because they were written a year ago, doesn't mean they're outdated and old fashioned, okay, or useless. You want to keep them alive by linking to them. So to me, that's a good strategy for internal linking link to older blog posts, you know, show people you're an industry expert. You've been doing this for a while and then you have lots of content to share. Okay. So the longer you can keep somebody on your website, the more likely it is they're going to engage and convert. And some other inherent benefits improves page rank. So what we mean by page rank is simply just a rank that Google gives pages. So the more internal linking you have, the better off you are. And then it helps spread link juice across websites. And what we mean by link juice again, just like backlinking, it builds relevancy. So just keep all these inherent benefits in mind to internal linking. The end result is keeping the flow of traffic on your site and all these other benefits will fall into place. Okay. So Another way in which you can really hone in on traffic to your website is long tail keywords. And long tail keywords to me are more than just one or two keyword phrases. Okay, so they're usually three or longer keywords in a phrase. Okay, so long tail keywords really nowadays account for most web searches. People really take the time to even post questions as a search query. They so likely somebody, it's unlikely somebody's going to go into search and just type in the word shoes. They might type in red shoes, but that's unlikely. What they're probably going to type in is, you know, red Nike running shoes 2019 or some variation of that. Okay. That's a long tail keyword. And some of the advantages of using long tail keywords to be found for are less competition. So if you're using broad keywords like red shoes, then who doesn't want to be found for red shoes? Well, you don't necessarily, you don't want to be found for red shoes because it's too broad. You don't know what type of shoes somebody's looking for. You just know they're looking for red shoes. It could be running shoes. It could be work shoes. It could be, you know, boots. It could be slippers. Okay. It's too broad. So long tail keywords help narrow it in. And the more narrow and focused a keyword is, the less competition is going to have. 
And when something's not competitive in the form of a keyword, then that means your chances of ranking for that keyword are going to be greater and the chances of you ranking faster are going to be greater. And then of course, if somebody's looking for exactly what you have to offer, then you have a higher chance to convert that person. So if you have exactly those 2019 red Nike women's running shoes and somebody does a search for that and that's a long tail keyword and they click on your organic listing, if you have the right price, then they're probably going to convert. So you have a really good chance of converting somebody using long tail keywords. So my point here is if you're looking for keywords to use, focus on longer tail. Don't focus on one or two keyword phrases. What it also does is brings targeted traffic. So even if somebody doesn't convert, hey, they could be back because it's exactly what they're looking for. And if you're focusing on longer tail keywords, like I just mentioned, stay away from the shorter ones. It's just easier to optimize your page for SEO. So remember, SEO is a two pronged approach on page and off page. We talked about off page with internal linking and backlinks on page is all about making sure those keywords you choose are integrated in with the page you want to be found for. And so if you're using a long tail keyword, it's just easier to work that keyword in. So it enables easier on-page optimization. Okay, let's switch away from SEO to email marketing. So let's focus on email marketing as a form or method of driving traffic to your website. So email marketing has been around a long time in terms of digital marketing. Why? Because it provides an effective way to convert leads into sales. Why? Because you can send personalized emails to a target audience. So when you send an email to somebody on a regular basis, you know who that person is. So what are you doing in the email? You're writing a specific message to that person. Well, email marketing is the same thing, except you're just sending an email to a larger group of people. And when you send an email to a larger group of people, you're still going to personalize the message, right? You're not going to send a generic email to 1000 people. Okay. Nobody's going to do that. So make sure your email is targeted. And if it's targeted, it can be cost effective. Why? Because sending large amounts of emails or let's just say an email to a large amount of people or a large group of people is going to be cost effective. It's not cost per click. You know, it's not cost per open. Okay. So email usually depending on the, the email provider you're using really is a flat fee. So it just really depends on how many emails you're sending or how, how many people you're sending the email to as well. So, but email generally tends to be more cost effective than other forms of marketing. So look at the email content provider you're using and just get a sense of what they charge. But if you look at it and do a comparison, email generally is cheaper than say doing pay-per-click because with pay-per-click you're paying for each click. Okay. So that could be expensive depending on the keywords. So email marketing is also time saving. Okay. Meaning it's a one time thing and done. So once you send the email, it's just a matter of, you know, watching and looking at the metrics and learning what's going on. So you don't make the same mistakes again, but it is time conducive, meaning you send out one email and that's it. With pay per click, you're constantly measuring and managing the campaigns and it provides real time marketing. So when you do send the email, more than likely a majority of the people on day one or the day you send the email are going to be able to view it, open it click on some of the links and convert. So that's normally what happens in email. Majority of the people open it on day one and it kind of tails off from there. So think about it as real time. So when you send that email and if you have a thousand people on your email recipient list, break it up, send the first 500 first with a different subject line. And then you can see the data come in. And if you don't see the good results from the subject line or the body of the email or, you know, the page you're going to, then make adjustments before you send the other email to the next 500. So that's a great thing about emails. You can break up the email into two groups, the first group and then the second group with different subject lines. And you can probably send them a little bit of time apart. That way you can learn from the first email because with email, you are generally going to get results right away. Okay, within the first 24 hours. So that's a great thing about email. Okay, so the other thing about email, it's less intrusive. So normally people who are going to get the email are the ones who sign up for the email. So they're almost expecting your email. So when they get your email, 
Again, as long as you're not sending an email on a daily basis, normally most companies send it monthly or bi-weekly, it's not gonna be as intrusive. Okay, and then it also helps build credibility, increase visibility and brand awareness, meaning you're going to build your brand in that email. You're going to put content in that email that's going to show off your credibility, meaning you could put some testimonials in the email, you could put some good affiliations, you can put a good article to an industry article you just wrote. So email is going to inherently continue to build brand awareness for you. Okay, and it's an easy way to track ROI. So if you're e-commerce, e it's pretty clear. You send the email, somebody opens it, clicks on it, checks out and purchases something, it's easily trackable because you could track it right from that email. So one thing I wanna say there is just if you do send an email, make sure you're tracking that campaign. And you wanna be able to use an analytics program like Google Analytics. If you use Google Analytics, you're gonna be able to track when you send the email, who clicks on it, and who converts. So you wanna be able to measure an ROI for these emails, and you can, and that's the beauty of email marketing. Okay, let's move away from email marketing to webinars. So webinars, great method for effective social media promotion. It's a great way to bring traffic to your website. So why do we recommend webinars? Well, because it provides direct contact, contact within your target group. What do we mean by contact with your target group? Well, you're gonna host a webinar and you're gonna invite this targeted group of people who are interested in your product or service. So if you have a Facebook community, you could do a Facebook Live event, or you could do a YouTube, or you, know, you can even set up a webinar on another platform, but promote it on social media. And if you're promoting something on social media, you're probably promoting it to people who are already following you or like you. And so that's what we mean by direct contact with your target group. So you're, you're gonna be able to create a webinar and talk directly to that group. And that's gonna help build brand awareness and credibility. And the great thing about webinars is you don't need some fancy software. I mean, I'm talking to you on a webinar right now. And so webinars are free. All you need is a video camera and a recorder, that's all. And that's all built in with software. So there's plenty of software out there that allows you just to do a webinar really quick and easy. There's lots of opportunities in software. So, and a lot of them are very cost effective. So if you wanna build, uh, create a webinar, you can do that by spending very little money. And webinars, again, allow you to talk to your, your targeted group, your community, maybe prospective clients. It helps build credibility and in effect drive traffic to your website. And when somebody does attend a webinar, they're likely gonna be highly engaged because you're inviting them, they're gonna opt into the webinar. And the great thing about webinars is even if they don't attend the webinar the day you have it, it's gonna be recorded. So they can always go back and watch it. So whoever watches the webinar is going to be engaged because it's gonna be a topic they're interested in. And then users are likely to become prospective customers. So having a webinar, talking about something inherently interesting to maybe a larger group of people, you can promote that on social media and potentially get prospective customers to sign up and watch the webinar. And if you do, they're going to be engaged and then take the next step. Oh, I like what this guy, this person has to say. They seem to be credible. I like their personality. I like their brand. I like their product. I'm gonna go check their web out their website, okay? So webinars allow you to kind of pull in more people as well as just your community because you can promote the webinar and you can promote it in advance and you can leverage social media for that. Okay, so something related to webinars, incorporating video content. So videos have been proven to be a really good way to attract new visitors. And it just, it makes your website very engaging when you have videos on your website as well. So if you create video, you have an opportunity to post it on various video platforms like YouTube or Vimeo. Okay, there's plenty of video platforms out there or just embedded in a blog post or embedded in a Facebook post or a tweet. Okay, so you can do a lot with video and having video on your site is going to increase engagement. Okay, when you increase engagement, good things happen. That's going to lead to increased conversions and sales or, or ROI or just like we mentioned the webinar can help build trust with your audience. So even that webinar you could post on your website. So you want people to engage 
by watching this video. If they watch the video, they're going to gain trust in you because you're talking directly to that person, that user, that audience, that visitor to your website. And when you get built trust, it's going to increase engagement. And that's the beauty of video. Unlike text or imagery, videos really do engage with the audience. And so the more video you can do, the better off you are because again, you can leverage social to draw attention to your brand and product and service. And then you can have that video on your website to increase engagement, which in turn increases conversions and sales and improves ROI. So always think video, there's plenty of video software out there that you can leverage. And the great thing about video too is, hey, most people are using mobile phones these days, smartphones. And so video works just as well on mobile as it does on desktop. So keep that in mind, you know, video is going to be engaging regardless of what device somebody uses. And then of course, if they're watching the video on Facebook or YouTube, then it chances are they're going to share that particular video, which is going to bode well for your brand and traffic. Okay, so video, if somebody likes a video, it's very easy to share video, especially from a mobile phone. So YouTube just makes it so easy to share or like or subscribe to a channel. It just, it becomes that much easier. Things can go viral and chances of them going viral with video are gonna be greater. Okay, so other ways to drive traffic to your website is submit your content to content aggregators. So what's a content aggregator? Well, a content aggregator is like Reddit that provides a great platform for you to post your content. So that's what a content aggregator is, really a site like Reddit or Medium or Quora, where you could post content to a large number of people, okay? So with Reddit, people are either going to upvote it or downvote it. So the more upvotes you get or thumbs up or likes or people who encourage that content, the more of a chance it has to be found. And so first thing out of the gate, if you do provide content to a content aggregator like Reddit, make sure it's good quality content that's interesting. And that should be a case, the case across the board, whether it's a, a social post or a blog post, make sure the content's unique, professional and interesting. And then if you do say put something on Medium or you do put something on Quora and it is professional and interesting and thought provoking, then people are gonna to react to it. And then that, again, could lead to traffic, but even if it doesn't lead to traffic, it helps build brand awareness. So if you have content, just like videos, leverage it. Put the content out there. Okay? And when you put content out there, it's only gonna, especially if it's good content, put, it's gonna put you in a good light. So don't be afraid to share your content on the likes of Reddit or Medium or Core or some of these other content aggregator websites, because good things are only gonna happen. And again, referral traffic, SEO, brand awareness, conversions. So all these are inherent benefits of just sharing your content. Okay, and then finally, we wanna learn from analytics. Okay, so what do I mean learning from analytics? So there are plenty of analytics platforms out there. One of the most popular is Google Analytics. So you wanna make sure you're tracking traffic on your site with Google Analytics. So all you have to do is just go to Google Analytics via search, sign up, add the analytics code to your website and voila, they're doing all the heavy lifting. They're going to track traffic coming to your website. And not only are they gonna track traffic, but they're gonna tell you how that traffic engaged. And so the benefits of it, Google Analytics is, hey, you could figure out where users are coming from. Are they coming from that email campaign that I sent out to a thousand people? Are they coming from YouTube based on that video I posted? Or are they coming from Reddit based on the content I just posted there? Or are they coming from organic search? It, so Google Analytics can help us understand how much traffic we're getting from organic search. So it'll help us measure our SEO efforts. And then with Google Analytics, you could segment. So we could segment by mobile, we can segment by desktop, returning user, new user, by campaign, by page, by language, by city, by region. I mean, there's so many ways in which to segment your audience. And segmenting simply is breaking up the entire group of people who come to your website into different segments based on what you want to see. So if you wanna look at you know, females between the ages of 18 to 24 who come from mobile via organic search, that's a segment and you can look at that information in analytics. If that's your target audience, then you could see how they're performing. 
Okay, so anal there are a lot of benefits to Google Analytics. Definitely want to take advantage of segmenting in Google Analytics. You could look at your competition. So there's a benchmarking report. The great thing about Google Analytics, you can also look at content and how your content's performing once somebody lands on your website. Are they what page are they spending time on? What page are they engaging on the most? Okay, what pages have the highest bounce rate or the lowest time on page? So you can really determine what pages work best. And then of course the end result in analyzing all this data is you want to be able to fine tune your website. So take advantage of the data that Google Analytics or any other analytics platform is giving you by learning. Once you learn what's going on with your website, you can make adjustments to your website to improve user experience. Okay. So we went over a lot of different ways to drive traffic. Okay. You can incorporate all this to your website immediately. Let's talk about that keyword research for a website with shoes. And, and it doesn't really matter what particular product you have. If you need to rank number one on Google, it all starts with the keywords, as I mentioned before. And so in this example, if you have a website where you sell shoes for kids, you're going to want to be found for certain keywords. So the obvious keyword here would be shoes for kids. Well, every keyword that you target has search volume associated with it. So that means when we talk about search volume, we're talking about how many people on average type in that keyword or related keyword on google.com or Google search. And there's always an average number of searches associated with every keyword. And we call that search volume, how much search volume. So obviously if we're going to target a keyword, we want to have as much volume as possible. However, there's always going to be competition for those keywords, meaning there's always going to be other websites who want to rank number one on Google for the same keywords. And we call that competition or difficulty. So for every keyword, you're going to have volume and you're going to have competition or difficulty. And the difficulty ranges as well, depending on the tool you use. And we'll get into that in a minute, but search volume is how much on average people are typing in that keyword or close variants of that keyword. And the difficulty is measured in terms of how many other websites are trying to rank for the same keyword. And so ideally, when it comes to keyword research, we want to find that nice balance. We want high volume and we want low competition. But at the same time, we want to focus on keywords that are highly relevant to our business. So if we're selling shoes for kids and shoes for kids is highly relevant, has high volume and low competition, then that's a keyword we want to target. So we always want to focus in on those three areas. So there's always a trade off with keywords. So shoes for kids might have high volume, but also might have high competition or difficulty. If we look for another keyword that's just as relevant, for example, shoes for children, it may still have high search volume, but the competition or the difficulty may be lower. And if that's the case, then that may be a better keyword for us to target. Instead of something highly competitive like shoes for kids, we can focus on another relevant keyword like shoes for children with just as much volume and lower competition. And the reason why we want lower competition is because we want to be able to rank for that keyword. So the higher the competition, the harder it is for us to rank number one on Google for that keyword. And so the whole idea beyond keyword research is analyzing and choosing the best keywords. So we want to identify a list of keywords that are always relevant. We want to choose the keyword that your competitors are ranking for. And we want to use third party tools to choose keywords to identify which keywords have low competition and what keywords have high search volume. So one thing to take into consideration when you're doing keyword research is that the longer the keyword phrase, or in other words, long tail keywords or keywords with three keywords in the phrase or more, you're going to always have less competition, but there's always a trade off with long tail keywords, meaning the longer the keyword phrase, there's going to be less volume, but the trade off is less competition. And so what we want to do is we want to brainstorm some ideas and find those relevant keywords. So let's look at an example here. 
So if we go to Google Ads, so Google Ads has a tool called Keyword Planner. And let's just say I have a, a website where I'm selling dried figs. And if I'm selling dried figs, I want people to buy these dried figs. However, in order to attract them, I want to be able to show them that, hey, we have a, a bunch of recipes. And if I show you a bunch of recipes where you can use dried figs, maybe you'll buy these dried figs to use in these recipes. And so we're going to look for keywords related to bread recipes because if we can optimize for our recipes page for bread then that will attract an audience who wants to make bread and use dried figs with those bread recipes so that's the example i'm going to give here and so if i look at the keyword planner in google ads if i just type in bread recipes what google is going to do is they're going to give me an average monthly search volume so i can see the average monthly search volume here here is 60,500 and so in order to do keyword research what I would recommend is keep a spreadsheet and so the idea behind the spreadsheet is to document the volume and the competition you're getting for certain keywords so if I go into a spreadsheet here my theme of keywords is bread recipes my keyword is bread recipes and my volume therefore is going to be 60,500 however if I go back into Google Google's keyword planner Google's telling me the competition is low so that's great I want high volume I want low competition but how low is low so we want to be careful so if we're going to put in numbers into a spreadsheet we want to figure out what that competition really is for the keyword bread recipes so if I go to Google and just type in bread recipes I'm gonna be able to see 771 billion results for the keyword bread recipes now, is 771 billion our real competition? Maybe, maybe not. What we want to do is put in a syntax, and we want to put in the syntax all in title, and then colon, space, and then our keyword. And the reason why we do that in search is because we want to be able to identify the true competitive number, or the true number of websites who are trying to rank for bread recipes. And if we put in the syntax all in title, colon, and then our keyword bread recipes, we'll be able to see that there are 998,000 results. That's a lot lower than 771 billion. So that means that 998,000 sites or listings have the keyword bread recipes in the title tag. And the title tag is what shows up in the search engine results. And so if I look down and scroll down here, I can see bread recipes are in every one of these title tags. So title tag is an important element to rank number one on Google. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes. But if we understand that there are 998,000 results with bread recipes in the title tag, then this tells us that those are the websites who are trying to rank number one on Google for that keyword. And therefore, those are the websites we need to jump over in order for our website to rank number one on Google. And so therefore, I'm gonna put in 998,000 in my spreadsheet as the competitive number. And so now I could see for the keyword bread recipes I have 60,500 and if my comp competition is 998,000 then my KEI or keyword effectiveness index or in other words the ratio of volume to competition is 6% so that's nothing more than volume divided by competition so that tells me that my KEI or my ratio between volume and competition is 6% so remember we want more more volume than we want competition so anytime you do a keyword research you're going to find a number of different relevant keywords so if I go back into Google's keyword planner if I typed in bread recipes you could see that Google is going to give me a number of different keywords related to bread recipes let's just say I have another keyword that I want to think about optimizing for being ranked on Google for and that's banana bread recipe very similar keyword as bread recipes except it's a little longer tail now if I type in banana bread recipe in Google's keyword planner now I can see the average monthly search volume has actually gone up it's 368,000 I can also see the competition is low so those are good signs 
So now I can see 368,000. I'm gonna go ahead and put that in my spreadsheet. Now I'm gonna go into Google. I'm gonna put in my syntax all in title. I'm gonna put in banana bread recipe. I'm gonna hit enter. And now I can see I have 233,000 results with the keyword banana bread recipe in the title tag. So if I look at the title tags, I can see banana bread recipe, banana bread recipe, banana bread recipe on all the listings in the Google search results. So that tells me I have 233,000 results that I have to jump over in order to rank number one on Google. So I'm gonna put 233,000 in my spreadsheet. Now I can see my KEI or my volume to competition ratio is 157, 158%. And so to me, that's a lot better number to work with, or in other words, that's a lot better keyword because it's just as relevant and it has a higher ratio of volume to competition. So therefore, banana bread recipe is going to be a better keyword to optimize for in order to rank number one on Google. So that's the whole idea behind keyword research. You wanna brainstorm ideas. There are plenty of tools out there. So the tool I recommend is Google Ads Keyword Planner. Google's gonna give you how much search volume. They're gonna tell you the competition, but then you're gonna go into Google search. You're gonna use the syntax all in title to get a more accurate read on the actual competitive number. And so to find out how keywords that your competitors are ranking for, you can use those keyword tools that I mentioned. Another tool that I use is Moz. So Moz, if you go to moz.com, they have a tool called Keyword Explorer. So if we just type in the keyword, for example, bread recipes, it's gonna be able to tell us how much volume and the difficulty. So you can use other tools at your disposal, figure out the volume and the difficulty. There are plenty of tools out there. But the one thing I would just make sure is you use everything at your disposal. So you can use social media to find the most shared article for a particular topic or keyword like bread recipes. You could check other platforms that have a lot of shared content like Reddit and Quora, where you can ask people about certain topics using keywords to figure out how much competition or volume there might be. You could stay up to date on industry news to get an idea of what types of keywords are trending. But when it comes to keywords and keyword research, remember for every web page, we want to be able to pick two keywords. We want a primary and secondary keyword. Word. So when we do keyword research and we enter all our keywords into our spreadsheet, we want to be able to have a number of different keywords. In this case, we're focusing on the theme bread recipes. We want to have different keywords because we want to be able to choose a primary keyword and a secondary keyword because we want to be able to focus on multiple keywords for each page because we don't want to put necessarily all our eggs in one basket, meaning we won't want to put all our emphasis just on one keyword to rank for. We want multiple keywords to try and rank for. So the primary keyword can define the nature of our business. The secondary keyword could be just highly relevant to our keyword. At the end of the day, we want to choose multiple keywords to try and rank on Google for that page. So for example, we have a blog and we're using ice cream recipes and we're blogging about ice cream recipes, we can have a primary keyword that is about ice cream recipes or homemade ice cream recipes. We're gonna always wanna find out what the volume and the competition is. Our secondary keyword could be built around other similar keywords like low-fat ice cream recipes or fat-free ice cream recipes or low-fat homemade ice cream recipes. Those are complementary keywords, just like our bread recipes and banana bread recipe. So one thing we wanna do when we do keyword research is we wanna be able to target one keyword per content when you can target many. We wanna be able to target multiple keywords, not necessarily target one keyword. And so we wanna be able to cluster keywords. So we don't wanna target just one, we wanna target multiple keywords per page. And when we talk about clustering, if we go back to 
our keyword research, what we're doing is we're clustering a bunch of keywords under the theme bread recipes. And so by looking at the volume, looking at the competition, looking at the KEI, we can choose different keywords for our page. And that's what we mean by clustering. We wanna cluster keywords into a content theme. So why target only one keyword per content when we can target many? because we don't want to put all our eggs in one basket. We don't want to target just one keyword. We want to target many. And so that means clustering your keywords into a theme and choosing multiple keywords for that particular page. And when we do that, we have a better opportunity to rank high on Google search. And the whole idea behind ranking high on Google search is we can get the volume. So if we know we're ranked number one on Google search for bread recipes or banana bread recipe, we know we stand a chance of getting a majority of the volume associated with that keyword. And if we can get the volume and get the traffic, then we can get the conversions. So let's move on to high quality content and talk about the impact content has on your ability to get your website ranked number one on Google. So let's just say you have content on your website and the content is ranking on you know, page four of Google and it's that blog with ice cream recipes. And if it's just content for the sake of content, it's not really informative, then it's not necessarily gonna get good engagement. In the eyes of Google, you know, they wanna rank content that's very informative, it's very fresh, it's exciting to read, it's interesting, it's going to have good engagement. So if it's a recipe or an article about any topic, if it's the content is just not informative, then you're not gonna get good engagement. And when you don't get good engagement, if people don't stay on the site, to engage in the content and they just leave the website after landing on the page causing a bounce then the content is just going to continue to fall down the rankings and we want to prevent that we want to move up the rankings we want to be number one on google we don't necessarily want to fall in the rankings for our content so content is a key driver in being able to rank number one on google so if the content is on page nine what can we do well, we want to be able to, you know, take that content and do something with it. We feel like we did write engaging content, so let's go ahead and share it on social media. And to me, social media is a good platform to share your content because on social media platforms like Facebook, for example, you're building a community on that platform. That community is already interested in your content. So if you're sharing an ice cream recipe, especially in the summertime, and you're engaging with your community on that platform, then the likelihood of that community on that platform is going to increase engagement. Increased engagement will send social signals to the search engine that says, hey, this content is good quality. Likewise, for any other platform, most social media platforms have engagement metrics and those engagement metrics pass signals. Is it good, is it not good? Do we like this content? Are we giving it a thumbs up? Are we gonna wanna follow it? Are we gonna wanna share it? And so if you share content that you feel is engaging on social platforms, then it's gonna be engaging and it's likely going to cause an increase in engagement, for example, a decrease in bounces. And once you share that quality content, then the likelihood of it moving up the rankings, even as far as number one on Google, is gonna be greater. So you always want to start out writing good quality content. So let's talk about good quality content because Google does take content seriously. They do take into account what other people think of that content. So high quality content is an important factor. So how to create good content? That's always the question. So let's talk about some best practices here. Remember, in the last segment, we talked about keyword research. So we want to perform good keyword research. Why? Because we want to choose keywords. Remember, we're choosing multiple keywords per page. One keyword could be related to our brand. One keyword could be related to the content, but another keyword could be related to a user's intent, like recipes. If you recall, 
the example we use with bread recipes. Maybe somebody's looking to type in a keyword that says, how do I make, you know, a bread? Or how do I make a specific type of bread? Or how do I make banana bread? Or what's the best recipe for banana bread? They're question related. And we want to be able to answer those questions. So that's where choosing those right keywords that's going to respond to a user's intent. So starts with choosing the right keywords. So remember we talked about a number of different tools when we talked about keyword research. So there's a research tool that you can use called phrase.io and that will help you do quick research on you know keywords and trends and whatnot. So if you know a better research tool that you use for keyword research, then drop us a comment below. I'd be interested in getting your comments about keyword research and what research tools are out there. So if you know something better than phrase.io, drop a comment below and we'd be interested in getting your perspective. So keyword research is key, but creating content that fulfills users' requirements. So answering those questions. If it's a recipe, we want to answer that question. If it's directions, we want to answer that question. If they don't know how to do something, we want to answer that question. And that's the whole idea behind content. Content is not just to fill a page, it's to really fulfill users' requirements. That's when you get good engagement. So if somebody's typing in something on Google and they're looking for an answer, your content should answer that question. But we also want to make the content readable. So in other words, you know, write for your audience. Don't impress anybody with very high vocabulary type words that somebody doesn't necessarily know the meaning of. Don't use jargon. Don't use a street language, for example. Use everyday common language that's just easily digestible when your audience is reading. And then we want to keep that content organized. And so when we mean organized, we want to use headers and subheaders you know, break your content into paragraphs, keep the flow organized. If we can keep the flow organized, then it's gonna be easier for somebody to read. And then it's okay to add resources, especially resources from credible sites. So if you can incorporate those resources in there, then it's just gonna add the credibility to your content and let the audience know that, hey, I've done my research on this topic and this is what this person has to say about it. This person who seems to be credible. Okay, so it only adds value to your content. So these are all tips to remember when creating content. And then the one important tip here is we want to use white hat techniques. And when we say white hat techniques, that means, you know, if we've chosen keywords that are going to answer somebody's question, we don't want to stuff those keywords into the content. We want the content to be naturally written. So when we say opt for white hat uh, techniques, that's what we mean. Write the content naturally. Keep it organized, keep it readable, include third party sources, and make sure it answers a question. So there are different types of content. So there's content where you just write words, it's all text-based. You could also use an infographic. An infographic is simply just a graphic that visualizes exactly what you're trying to explain. For example, if we want to write an article about how to write good engaging content, we don't necessarily have to write all that out as a text, we can create an infographic. So for example, here's an infographic on 20 effective ways to basically not bore your readers, but write engaging content. So you could see this is an infographic. It's all graphically laid out. So infographics tend to be easier to understand because they're visual. They're easy for the end user to comprehend because there's generally no jargon. It's usually images that are portraying the point of what you're trying to get across. And so it tends to break it up, the monotony of just text. It's more visually appealing and it's laid out and organized. So you can see this infographic has 20 different steps or rules and they lay those out all here in this infographic. And the great thing I like about infographics is you could, you could share them on social media, you can re-engage them as a post, you could save them on really any social platform. So infographics tend to tell a better story versus say just writing text. You can use video and images. So you don't necessarily have to lay it all out in an infographic. You can certainly insert a video or an image into your content, especially if it's a blog post. If it's a blog post, then sometimes video and images on its own tell the story. 
you don't necessarily need text to go ahead and tell your story. A video or an image, as they say, tells a thousand words. And so images and videos are great to use in a blog post. So using different forms of content, you know, you always want to review your content. When a user dwells on your web page for a longer time, Google will tend to think, okay, this person's engaged, so we're going to rank that favorably. So if you're using infographics, videos, and images, then the chances of somebody being more engaged are going to increase versus just text that's not well organized and written out in a way that somebody doesn't necessarily understand. So be creative in the types of content you use. So longer engaging content tends to bode well with search engines. So this is according to HubSpot. So the more word count you use, the more words you use, the chances of you ranking higher are gonna be better. Just take into account best practices. You wanna maybe break up the content with an image, organize it, make it engaging, use headers. So it's not necessarily just words, it's the words and how those words are written, how they're structured, the types of keywords you're using, how you're engaging with your audience. There's a lot of factors, again, those best practices we just went over. But the key is, you know, if you have longer, more engaging content, then it's gonna bode better for you on search engines. So a couple of steps to create high quality content. So you wanna begin with a comprehensive introduction. So always introduce your content. Remember the content should be relevant to the keywords. So if you're choosing keywords in your keyword research, think about answering that question. If somebody's typing in bread recipes, maybe they're looking for banana bread recipes. How to make the best banana bread or how to make banana bread using dried figs. We want to be able to align our content with that keyword naturally. You want to create a title that's worthy, that's click worthy. So remember, if you're in Google search and you're doing search for something simple like bread recipes, we want to make something that's going to be you know, engaging for somebody to click on, like easy, perfect yeast bread or easy crusty french bread or something that's going to be engaging you know the best bread recipes or how to make the best homemade bread you know something that's going to draw somebody's attention to the title of that blog post so we want to include lsi keywords so what i mean by lsi keywords in your content we mean you know long tail keywords make it natural headings and subheadings should consist of keywords and variants so if you're writing headers and subheaders, include the keyword in there. And that way, the, the content always stays relevant to the audience. Okay, shorten your sentences and paragraphs so don't write long paragraphs. Remember, we wanna break this up. We wanna make it easy for the end user to read. And we want to always put internal links on our blog post. Why? Because if we have internal links, then if we have a link from one blog post to another blog post or say our blog post to an internal page on our website, we want to make sure that it's relevant content. That way, if somebody is reading something and you have an internal link, let's just say from a bread recipes page to a banana bread recipes page, then they may find it interesting, click on that link and go to the banana bread recipes page. So it's keeping somebody engaged on your website. So putting in internal linking will help keep the, the end user engaged because you're offering up links that's relevant to the content. You always want to break up that content with images. Okay, we want to use alt tags, meaning we want to pen the image with text so that way if the image doesn't load then at least the alt text will load so we can incorporate call out boxes and more importantly we want to update our content regularly so we always want to get the best recipe out there if it's banana bread or different ways to create banana bread or always just coming up with ways to update the content so we want to keep our content our blog post fresh and then we want to include a CTA a call to action. If we include a call to action, then that's going to keep somebody engaged and have them act on your content. So these are steps to creating high quality content. 
And so let's look at an example here. And this is a three month old post on BuzzFeed. And it, it's 21 pictures that restore your faith in humanity. So it has a lot of likes, a lot of tweaks, and that means it's engaged. People are engaged when reading that. And so if we go and look at it as an example, we could see it on BuzzFeed here, 21 pictures that will restore your faith in humanity. So this was written back in 2012. Again, a lot of engagement. But if we look at it, we can see immediately that it's taking into account third party sources. It's got some content, it's got images, it's being broken up by images. We could see there's call to actions on there in the form of social so people can go ahead and go ahead and share it if they like it, okay? It includes videos, it includes images, third party sources. So it's a good post because listen, you know, it's engaging content. It's probably answering somebody's question about humanity. And we could see clearly that look, you know, there's a lot of different examples here from a lot of different sources and we could take action on this content. So not just video, not just images, but text as well. And so it's very engaging, answers questions, takes into account the different types of content available. So this is a good post in that regard. So content's updated regularly, it's engaging, and it includes sources from high authority websites. Some do's and don'ts on the content. So take into account the best practices I mentioned about creating high quality content. Okay. Answer those questions that the end user wants to hear, you know, because that likely is going to be their search. And so you want to be able to respond to the end user. That's part of creating high quality content. Different types of content, i.e. in the form of infographics or videos or text or images. You can add images from public domain sites. You can be relatable and use examples to clarify points, just like the BuzzFeed article. Simplify complex words. Don't use sophisticated language. Talk to your audience as if you they were standing right in front of you. And use bullet points to exemplify your examples, your points. So some do's, the don'ts, obviously don't lift content. We don't want to lift content from another website. So that's plagiarism. So we want to have our own unique content. We also don't want to take images from other websites. And so if you do happen to find an image that works for your post and it's on somebody else's website, ideally that's not a good situation. But if you do happen to do that, then always give credit to the website. Okay, so if you took it from xyz.com, credit xyz.com for the image and even put a link back. But ideally, you don't want to take images from other websites. Just as much as you don't want to take copy, you don't want to take images. Use your own imagery and content. But if you don't have imagery, then you can always go to stock photography. There are plenty of websites out there where you can sign up for a subscription like uh, Adobe Stock Images. As an example, you can sign up for an account and in some cases you can sign up for a free account and use stock imagery. Okay, don't give less information to your audience. Give your audience what they deserve, which is the information they're looking for. If they're looking for the best banana bread recipes. Give them the best banana bread recipes. Incorporate your own images. Break it up with titles. Give them a good quality piece of content that they're going to be able to engage with. And so if you put long paragraphs in your content, then it's going to be less engaging. So try to avoid those long paragraphs. Remember, shorten up the paragraphs, keep the language simple, add in images, answer those questions, use third party credible sources, but write it in your own words and you should be on your way to creating good quality content. Okay, so now that we've talked about high quality content in order to get your pages ranked high on Google search, let's turn our attention to optimizing on page elements and discuss some website level factors that are both going to help you rank high on Google search. So let's just do an overview of what we're talking about when we talk about on page elements and website level factors so optimizing on page elements include a number of different things but primarily we're going to focus in on meta tags also known as meta description tags header tags also known as title tags 
and URLs. So those are just some of the on-page elements we want to be able to optimize using relevant keywords in order to rank high on Google search. We also want to take a look at some website factors that will affect our ranking on Google search. They include website architecture, having a secure website, having a sitemap, and taking a look at page speed. So all of those are some of the website factors we need to take into account in order to rank high on Google search. So title tag and meta description together are considered meta tags. So both play an important role in ranking high on Google. So we want to be able to write unique title and descriptions for each page on our website. When I say unique, that means the title and the meta description need to be different for every page on the website. And so if you're not quite sure what a title tag and a meta description tag is, if you go to search and just type in any particular search query, the title tag is what's going to show up here in bold. And then the description is going to show up below it, below the URL, and that's going to describe the page. So both of these meta tags are important because it describes what your page is all about, and that's what Google uses in the search results pages. So we want to be able to pay attention to the length of our meta tags. So if we go back to our search results pages, met title tags are generally 60, 65 characters. Meta description tags are generally 160 characters. So anything really longer than that, then what's going to happen is the meta description tag or the title tag will get truncated. And so if we look here, for example, we could see all of the title tags here fit the 65 character limit. But if you run over the character count on meta description, then Google is going to truncate the copy. So you want to stay within your parameters in order to avoid getting your content truncated. And so the other thing when we're writing title meta description tags, we want to minimize keyword repetition. So if we're optimizing for keyword, we don't want to necessarily just plug that keyword into the title tag and meta description multiple times. We want to make sure our title tags and meta descriptions are naturally written. So if somebody's typing for banana bread recipe with dried figs, you know, we want to have a nice title tag and a description that is going to get somebody to respond uh, based on their need. And so we definitely want to avoid keyword repetition, but we want to be able to use that keyword in the title tag. Because if you remember from the earlier segment, when we did the all in title syntax to find out exactly how many competitors were using that particular keyword, well, we obviously want to use that keyword in the title tag because again, the title tag is an important factor when it comes to search engine results. So we want to use the keyword, but we want to avoid stuffing or using it repetitively in our title tag and our meta description. We want the title tag and the meta description to describe the page, sound natural, but also be engaging because the point is we want people to click on our link and go to our website from search engines. So title tags with numbers tend to result in higher click-through rates. This is according to mods. So for example, if you just put in a title tag that says learn digital marketing, well, that may work, but if you put a number in there, like five easy ways to learn digital marketing, that might get somebody to click on your link and go to your website. So having questions in your meta tags can also increase your click-through rate. For example, if you just put learn the importance of first page rankings, not too bad, but again, generic. But if you put it into the form of a question, how to rank number one on Google, it's more action oriented. It's gonna get somebody to resonate with the question that they have. And that may be their query, how to rank number one on Google. And so these techniques will help you get higher click-through rates. And so according to Backlinko, title tag with a keyword can improve site ranking. So remember, we wanna include that keyword in the title tag, even though we only have 65 characters, we wanna include that keyword, but we wanna avoid stuffing the keyword in there. We wanna again, make the title tag action oriented, maybe with a number, maybe as a question, with the keyword in there once, naturally. Not easy to do, 
but that's the beauty of SEO. If you can follow these best practices and write a good title tag, then the chances of you improving in your search results are gonna be greater. So having only one H1 tag in your post is going to be good. So remember, when somebody clicks on a link, so let's just say they do find a title tag engaging, and they click on this, this link here, and they go to that website, you know, you want to start out with having that particular H1 tag. Because the H1 tag, especially with the keyword in it, is going to signal to Google, hey, we're organizing our page, and because it's an H1 tag, it's important. We're structuring the page according to best practices. So having only one H1 tag in your post is definitely helpful. Having multiple tags, H tags in your post help organize the page a lot better. So we wanna add that targeted keyword in that tag, and your header tags should be relevant to the content. So if we go back to our example of the using dried figs with banana breads, well, the title says California Fig Banana Bread. And remember the last segment when we we're talking about high quality content? Well, look no further than including a video into our content. So not only will this video help keep the engagement high, but it breaks up the monotony of the page. And it's from a third party source, so it adds credibility to the page. So adding a video based on the last segment of high quality content definitely helps with ranking high on Google search. So following hierarchical structure, that means putting those H tags in there. H2 tags help break up the content. And we want to avoid repetition of H1 tags on your different web pages of your site, meaning don't just put the same H1 tag with the same keyword in it and keeping it blase. We want to make those H1 tags exciting to read, but also used appropriately to break up the content. So remember, all white hat techniques. We want to avoid hidden tags. We want to avoid stuffing keywords. We want things to be natural. We don't want things to be forced. And your H1 tag should be 20 to 70 characters. Don't make long H1 tags. So if we go back to our page example, a short, sweet tag here, California fig banana bread. It's relevant to the content. It's short, sweet, and breaks up the monotony of the content. And more importantly, and again, any content you have on the page should always answer the user's intent. Remember, people are using search to answer questions, find information. Our content should be able to answer that for them. So according to John Muller, Senior Webmaster Trends Analyst at Google, header tags would definitely help Google for rankings and the search results. So we want to use header tags. So when it comes to URLs, we want to use hyphens and avoid underscores. So if we look at this URL here, this uses hyphens, fig and banana bread. So it's all broken up with hyphens. That's a best practice. Remember, canonical URLs. A canonical URL signals to Google this is the original content. So we want to use original content. And if you have multiple sources of content out there on, say, different websites, we want Want to use a canonical tag to signal to Google this is the original content please index this content and that doesn't hurt to use a favicon in URL meaning a small icon it helps to break up the monotony and help your URL stand out we can add targeted keywords in the URL so again looking at the URL here I could see we're using targeted keyword as part of the URL structure fig and banana bread and notice the h1 tag is fake banana bread so it's all consistent and it flows naturally urls that are no longer existing then we want to be able to set up a redirect for those urls meaning a 301 redirect is a server response for google that says hey google this page is no longer available but it, we permanently redirected it to this page which is now available so that's what a 301 redirect does. It helps signal to Google and all the other search engines that if the page is no longer there, that's fine. You're just gonna go to this page. This is the page that's permanently there now. And 
Another thing we want to do here is if you have mobile URLs, you want to include those in the sitemap. And we're going to hit on that in just a minute. But all URLs should be mobile friendly as well as desktop friendly. Meaning take into account this best practices. Keep your URLs short, use hyphens, put the keyword in that URL and make it easy to understand. Want to avoid capital letters in the URLs. The URLs are case sensitive. So go lowercase. You should always go lowercase on the URL. Readable URLs, again, the rule of thumb here is if you understand what the URL is, then Google's gonna understand what the URL is. So the shorter the URL, the easier it is to read, the easier it is to read, the better chance you have to rank high on Google search. So according to Backlink2, URLs that are shorter definitely, definitely help you rank. So we want to be able to shorten those URLs. Keep them short and sweet. Don't make them long and unreadable. So those are some on optimized ways or on-page elements that help you optimize. Now we wanna look at some website level factors that will help you optimize and rank high on Google search. So good site structure provides better crawling for search engine bots. And what do we mean by that? Well, we mean having your site organized in a fashion that Google's gonna be able to find all the pages. So what do we mean by that? Create a logical hierarchy structure. So if you're selling shoes, you know, you're gonna have a home page, break the structure up into men's shoes, women's shoes, children's shoes. Then under men's shoes, you could have it by brand. It could be Nike, Puma, Adidas. On the women's side, it could be Nike, Puma, Adidas. On the child side, it could be Nike, Puma, Adidas. And so you wanna keep the structure flow in a hierarchy. So we wanna balance the amount of subcategories within each category. So the men's, if it has Nike, Puma, Adidas, the women should have Nike, Puma, Adidas. And so you want to code your site navigation in CSS or HTML, meaning we want to be able to use something that Google is going to be able to index. So most sites are built in HTML and that's what Google likes to index. They like to index something that they could take back to their servers. And then more importantly, build a comprehensive structure for internal linking. So internal links mean that if you're on a site, you should have natural links pointing to other pages on your website. So to keep the flow going. And we don't want to have unnatural inbound links. You always want to have natural internal links to keep the flow of the user going from one page to the other. So here I could see, as an example, all the ingredients in this recipe. Well, this has an internal link to an Another page on our site and this happens to link to a page where somebody can buy the ingredient so it's a natural internal link so John Doherty of Credo has claimed that one of the biggest changes that he can make in fixing the Credo website is architecture so for example in Credo John Doherty has increased the organic sessions by 74% and pages by per session by 41% just by changing the site architecture so you'd be surprised by changing the site architecture what that will do to engagement and so let's our, turn our attention to secure versus non-secure so what we mean by that is securing your site we want to make it sure that compliant with certain protocols and so if we go back here we can see that this particular site is compliant it is secure HTTPS means it has a secure license meaning the site is secure so Google likes secure versus non-secure. So non-secure would be HTTP. So we want HTTPS as our protocol. And what that means is just enabling SSL certificates. And that means when you enable an SSL certificate, that means your domain or your protocol is gonna be turned to HTTPS. So Google prefers sites that are secure versus non-secure. So if you use HSTS as a protocol, that adds an extra layer of security over the HTTPS. And HSTS prevents cookie hijacking. So adding multiple layers of security always helps. In my opinion, if you have an HTTP website, a non-secure website, you should look into buying an SSL certificate, getting your sites flipped over to HTTPS, because what's gonna happen is your URL structure is gonna change. When your URL structure changes, Google's gonna recognize that because they're gonna index your site. 
And when they index your site, they're going to see those secure URLs. And that's going to work favorably in your favor and help you rank higher on Google search. So websites using secure or HTTPS have a higher chance of ranking higher. So HTTPS is a ranking signal because Google indexes those pages. So let's also talk about sitemaps. So sitemap is one of the most important ways to improve your website ranking. Why? Well, because sitemaps are a way to organize all your URLs into one file. So we're basically going to uh, prioritize all our web pages in a sitemap. So if you go to any particular website and you type in sitemap XML, you're likely going to see all the pages on your website. So usually the sitemap is located in the root directory. So if I type in sitemap.xml, I'm going to be able to see all the pages in my root directory. And I can also prioritize them. I can also alert Google as to how often they change. And every page is going to have a date stamp associated with it. So Google can actually see how often it changes. So remember, we want our content to be updated frequently. So if content's not updated frequently or it's not fresh, then Google's going to see that site, that, that date stamp, that last modification date. So we want to be able to make sure our content's updated frequently. We want to let Google know that we change it frequently. And we want to be able to prioritize our pages, let Google know, hey, these pages are important to us. So all that can be set up in a sitemap. We want to be able to add canonical versions of URLs in the sitemap. So we want to be able to add all our original URLs in our sitemap. And so we always want to build dynamic URLs sitemaps for larger websites. And what do I mean by dynamic URLs? That means that if I look at this sitemap and we're always adding content, let's just say in the form of a blog, well, guess what? We want those pages to be added to the sitemap as they're published. So as we add pages to the blog or to the site, then they should automatically be added to the sitemap. And so in effect, what's going to happen is we're going to be able to see the sitemap grow with more URLs. When the sitemap grows with more URLs, then that means then Google's going to index more pages. They're going to index more fresh pages. So they're going to be able to get those pages that are just published quicker. So that's the whole idea behind dynamic sitemaps is we want to be able to capture all the URLs just as they're published. And we want to be able to maintain our sitemaps. And so I would always recommend a dynamic sitemap, but you can always create your own sitemap just by going to a tool called XML sitemap. So if I just type in XML sitemaps into Google search, here I could see XML sitemaps generator, and I can be able, if I have a small website, just create a free and simple sitemap on my own. When XML sitemaps creates it, or your platform creates a dynamic sitemap, either way, the sitemap's going to sit in the root directory, and then what we want to do in turn is let Google know where that sitemap is. So in Search Console, we want to be able to submit the sitemap. So you're going to add the sitemap. You're going to let Google know where it is. It should be in the root directory, and it should be called sitemap.xml. And when you do that, Google's going to be able to take those URLs and index them. So we could see we submitted 528 URLs. Google indexed 521. So one thing about URLs here is when we create a sitemap, we're putting all our URLs in there. We do not add no index URLs in your sitemap. And what that means is that any URL we don't want Google to index, we're just going to exclude from the sitemap. Okay, so we want Google to take all the URLs we want indexed and put them in the sitemap. So according to Edgy, using sitemaps for SEO can increase your website's visibility and help you get indexed. Why? Because what you're in effect doing is taking all your URLs that you want indexed, you're telling Google how often they're modified, you're telling Google which ones are important, and you're submitting that to Google. And so Google's going to be able to take all these URLs quicker, index them quicker, and when they're indexed quicker, you can get ranked quicker. And when you get ranked quicker, you can get traffic quicker. So that's the whole idea behind sitemaps. So let's turn our attention to page speed now. So one of the last factors for our website, besides architecture, making it secure, and adding sitemaps, is we want to take a look at how quick our pages load. 
here are some tips in order to optimize page speed because ideally the quicker a page loads the more engaged the user is going to be if it takes a longer time for the page to load all the elements of that page then what's going to happen is the user is going to get impatient maybe leave the website all together or go to another page and so we want to be able to optimize images so any image that's of large size in terms of megabytes we want to be able to optimize that can compress the image so that's one way to speed up page speed we want to use a simple website design you know HTML with CSS or cascading style sheets just a simple design with simple a hierarchy and website navigation structure so nothing fancy nothing complex just a simple website design with optimized images we want to leverage browser caching and we want to upgrade the server response time meaning all your files are sitting on the server so when somebody goes to a web page the server is serving up all of those files the images the text etc and so we want the server to respond as quick as possible. So when it comes to page speed, we can look at the factors affecting page speed in Google Analytics. So if I go to Google Analytics and I go under behavior and I go under site speed and I go to overview, I'm going to be able to see what my average load time is for my site. And ideally, we want our pages to load as quick as possible. So that means anything under four seconds, anything four seconds or higher, and it's likely the end user is going to leave the page. There's a correlation be between page load time and bounce rate. And so what Google actually does is give you speed suggestions. So if we do have a page that loads slow, we can just go to speed suggestions in Google Analytics. And we go to speed suggestions, then Google's gonna be able to tell us, hey, this particular page load fast, this particular page loads slow. And if it loaded slow, why is it loading slow? So here we could see the home page as an example is loading on average of seven seconds. Well, if we look here, they're gonna give us some suggestions. So if I click on this page speed suggestions, it's going to load a report and a tool called PageSpeed Insights. And basically what it's then going to do after it's done running is it's going to tell me all the ways in which I can optimize my pages, not only for desktop, but also for mobile. So here I can see for desktop or for mobile, I can look at some ways in which I can optimize it to increase page speed. For example, sizing my images properly, server response time, reducing my server response time, avoiding multiple page redirects. So there's a lot of opportunities that we can do to speed up page load time. And all that's found in Page Speed Insights and all that's found within Google Analytics. So remember, optimizing code, minimizing redirects, optimizing your images, upgrading your server response, and all of those are factors. And so again, you can go into Analytics, Page Speed Insights, and you can see exactly what Google is recognizing as what's lowering or slowing down your page load time. So Google takes site speed as one of the most important ranking factors. Why? Because they're going to rank pages not only with high quality content, that are relevant to the keyword queries, but they want those pages to have a good user experience. So if somebody clicks on the page, then the user should be able to see that content fairly quickly. And so that's why it's such an important factor. So the quicker your pages load, the chances of you ranking higher are gonna be better. So according to Web Performance Today, Walmart, as an example, experienced a decline in conversions. So what they did was looked at their page speed. And when they looked at their page speed, you'd be surprised what that did. Just increasing it from one to four seconds or decreasing it basically increased conversion. So there's always going to be a correlation between how quick a page loads and how engaged the user is. Because if it's users engaged, they're going to stay on the site. And if they stay on the site, then their chances of converting are going to be higher. So just even one to two seconds increase in page load, load time will make a world of difference in terms of engagement and conversions. Let's turn our attention to off-site engagement. So previously we talked about on-page elements and website factors that affect our rankings for search results, but we also need to turn our attention away from our website, meaning what we do on our website, and turn our attention what we can do for our website off our website and onto other websites. So that's off-site engagement. 
And so let's look at an example. So that ice cream recipes blog. So we did everything we possibly could. We updated the meta tags, the title tag, the meta description. We added H1 tags. We've made sure the site architecture was sound. We submitted a site map. We, we made sure the page load was good and fast. So we did all the things we we're supposed to do on our web page, but we're still not ranking. Well, what do we need to do? Well, we need to turn our attention away from our website into other websites. We call this off site or off page SEO. And we need to basically generate links from high quality sites back to our site. So if we've done everything we can on our own website and we're still not ranking where we want to be, well, then we need to turn our attention to other websites. And so if we turn our attention to other websites and other websites that are relevant, other websites that are of quality, other websites that have high domain authority, then we're going to see an increase in rankings. So it's just a matter of getting quality links from quality websites that are relevant. That's what's going to move the needle on search after we've taken care of all the on-page elements. So more backlinks from high domain authority results in higher rankings. SEO is a combination between what we do on our website, meaning optimizing the page and making sure our website has good site architecture and follows the best practices in terms of site maps and page load. Then we need to turn our attention to the backlinking to improve our domain authority. So according to Backlinko, analysis off-site engagement is one of the most important elements for ranking number one in Google. So you, you can't just focus your attention on updating the title tag and making sure the pages load fast. You have to turn your attention as well to getting back links from high quality sites. That's off-site engagement. And so gaining links, back links from multiple domains is vital. It's vital because they bring referring traffic to your site. They bring credibility to your site. But more importantly, Google's gonna recognize the relationship between these sites and your website. And if these sites that have backlinks or links pointing to your site, and if they're of high quality, then we call that passing link juice. So it's going to bring quality to you in terms of organic search. So if we look at an example, if I do a search for banana bread recipe, there are 241 billion results for banana bread recipe. Why did this particular page from Simply Recipes rank number one? Well, we can turn our attention to Moz and Moz has a report called Link Explorer. And so Moz Link Explorer report helps us identify our own page authority, our own domain authority, and how many links we have from other quality websites. So if I put that particular URL into Link Explorer. And notice the URL here is short. Even though it uses an underscore when it should use a hyphen, it's still ranked number one. And why? Because off-page elements help this page rank number one. Why? Their page authority out of 100 is 58. Their domain authority out of 100 is 82. And what does that mean? Well, that means that they have a lot of good links from other domains of high quality. They have 824 linking domains to this one domain. They have 3,600 inbound links and they're ranking for a lot of different keywords. So if we scroll down, we're gonna be able to see kind of a breakout, the quality of websites that are linking to them. So they have 19 domains with a domain authority of 91 to 100 linking to them. They have 15 domains between the range of 81 and 90. So what does that tell me between 15 and 19? That's 34 particular domains that are very high quality linking to them. And so we could see the breakout of the linking domains. We could see the top file links to the site and we could see the page authority. So the Link Explorer report gives us an overview of what pages are linking to ours. And it also gives us an idea of what our own page authority and domain authority are. Because domain authority and page authority both need to be high in order for us to rank on Google search. And in order for it to get high, we need links from high quality sites. So that's the whole idea behind off-site engagement.
So some of the offsite engagements are influencer marketing, meaning is there somebody out there on social who has a huge following? But not only do they have a huge following, but are they relevant to our product? For example, Usain Bolt, who's a famous sprinter. If we're selling shoes and we're selling Nike shoes, maybe Usain Bolt can reference us on Twitter or Facebook. That's influencer marketing, getting people to, influencing people to buy our product. We can engage with audiences on multiple social media platforms like Facebook and Twitter. Meaning if we're running a promotion on those running shoes, then we can promote that on Facebook. Okay. We can promote that on Twitter. We can also bookmark our webpage on popular bookmarking sites like StumbleUpon. We can also put our content on discussion forums like Reddit. We can join high PR quality Q and A sites, excuse me, and post answers to questions related to our business like Quora.com. So we can engage in sharing our content and answering questions. So there's lots of ways to get links to your website. If you have a blog post, as an example, you can make sure that maybe that content is shared on a similar blog post. So if you have an ice cream recipe blog post, well, maybe you can look at a dessert blog post and share your content on that particular blog post and have a backlink pointing from that blog post to yours as an example. And you can reciprocate. So the whole idea of content is sharing the content, but at the same time of sharing it, you're producing backlinks and backlinks help domain authority. So not only do they help domain authority, but they improve the search rankings. So in Google's eyes, the higher your domain authority, higher the page authority. In Google's eyes, that means your page is important, it's credible, and we're going to improve it in the search engine rankings. It increases brand visibility. If we have our content on a highly engageable website, a highly popular website or a blog, it's, not, it's going to lift our brand visibility. If we have Usain Bolt, who's a very famous sprinter, do some influence in marketing for us, then that's going to increase our brand visibility. So anytime we can associate with something that has some influence or some clout or high domain authority, then it's only going to increase our brand awareness and visibility. So again, it's going to increase our domain authority because of the association of passing link juice from one domain to another. It's going to then, as a result, increase referral traffic. Because if we're on a high quality website that gets a lot of traffic, then the chances of some of that traffic going to our site is going to be great. And again, it improves the credibility and trust of our website. And that's what we want. We want Google to trust us. And the way to build trust is by associating our website with other websites of high, equal or higher quality. So when we talk about offsite engagement, we want to do some guest posts on relevant websites. So if you have that ice cream blog, Go to another blog like the, the dessert blog and do a guest post. So not only that will that improve your brand awareness, but it'll generate a backlink and maybe drive some referral traffic. You can participate in forums and blog discussions like core.com or Reddit. Get your content out there. Start a discussion about a specific topic to engage users, build brand awareness and generate that backlink. You can always you know, put your, your site on a directory like Yelp, for example, or Yahoo directory. You could prefer testimonial link building, meaning if you serve products or offer up a service, well, somebody could provide a testimony on their website. Or you could just earn backlinks from relevant authoritative web pages, like we mentioned Quora or Wikipedia, or there's plenty out there. So the idea is to associate yourself with high quality websites, but do it naturally. You don't want to force anything. So if, if you're selling a specific service or you're selling a specific product, look for like mining services or products that complement what you do. And that'll create the natural environment, natural ecosystem that will eventually give you the benefits that you need to rank higher in the search results pages. So we don't want to purchase any links. We don't want to cloak content. We don't want to just inject links on sites that aren't relevant. We don't want to just have site wide links all over the place pointing to the same page. And we certainly don't want to be on low quality websites or directories. It's all about quality, not quantity with offsite engagement. So having offsite engagement complements what you do on your website for onsite. 
together, both of those efforts will get you higher search engine results. Let's talk about how to measure your SEO performance. So all that hard work you've done with on-page SEO in, coupled with all the work you've done with off-page SEO are eventually gonna net results and positive results. And we wanna be able to measure that as you're actually doing the work, as you're putting forth the effort on on-page and off-page. And so we wanna be able to measure that. And so you wanna be able to understand what to measure and where to measure it. And so when we talk about SEO, we really wanna hone in on three high-level core metrics, and that's ranking, traffic, and conversion. So when we talk about ranking, traffic, and conversion, we can break that down into this list here. What kind of traffic are we getting from organic search? What kind of traffic are we getting from mobile devices? Remember, mobile is very important because as we talked about with on-page SEO, as we talked about with local SEO, a lot of searches start with mobile devices. We wanna look at keyword ranking. Remember, keyword research is the first step in the SEO process, even before we do any work with on-page and off-page. You know, we want to look at the local visibility if we have local SEO results. We want to look at engagement metrics. So all that traffic we're driving from organic search, we want to be able to measure how they're performing and behaving on our website. We also want to measure some form of progress on off-page SEO and that's in the form of backlinks. So all of these are different metrics we can measure using different tools. So let's talk about how to go about looking at these metrics and where to go look at them and measure them. And so really monitoring all this behavior will help us understand how we're performing, how SEO is performing. And so really what we wanna do is start with organic traffic. And so we can look at that on a month-to-month -month basis. We can look at it from a geographic perspective. We can look at it in terms of how many new visitors we're driving versus returning. And then again, more importantly, conversion rate. And so to me, the best place to start to look at that traffic from organic search is Google Analytics. And Google Analytics is a free tool. It's simply there to measure website performance. So if you go into Google Analytics, we can actually go in and we can look at all sorts of data based on website behavior. And so if I'm in Google Analytics and I go under acquisition and then I go under all traffic channels over a given period of time, let's just say the last seven days for a particular website, I can see what traffic is coming from organic search. And then I could see the amount of new users that are coming from organic search. I can also see engagement metrics, bounce rate, for example. So I wanna be able to see if somebody's typing in a query, clicking on our link in the organic search results, and then coming to our website, are they actually engaging with our website or are they leaving the website after only visiting the page they landed on? So that's all in, these are all important metrics to measure and I can measure all that right here in Google Analytics. If I wanted to, I can even take it a step further and break that down by country. So if I type in country as a secondary dimension, now I can see what country is driving traffic from organic search. So a lot of your organic traffic information is gonna be centrally located in Google Analytics. So we also talked about mobile traffic. A majority of searches take place on mobile phones versus desktop. So Google basically is reporting that nearly 60% of searches now appear from mobile devices. And so if we go back to Google Analytics, we can also look at a mobile report. So if I go in Google Analytics under audience, under mobile overview, I can see a breakdown of the amount of traffic coming from desktop versus tablet versus mobile. And so you'll find as time goes on that your mobile device is likely going to drive a majority of the traffic from organic search. And so you can compare device information with channel. So if I just type in channel in Google Analytics as a secondary dimension and look at the default channel groupings versus device category, I could see that 
you know, mobile from organic search, driven traffic over the last seven days. This is something you want to keep an eye on because a lot of people tend to begin their searches on mobile devices. So mobile ranking is different than desktop ranking because with mobile ranking, it's based on a responsive website. And with that responsive website, basically responsive being that the website's going to adapt to the mobile device. So it's going to respond to the device that somebody's on. And so therefore the metrics or the engagement metrics are going to be different. But if I look back to Google Analytics, I can see again, bounce rate. I can see pages per session, average session duration. So if I look at line three, I could see all the different engagement metrics compared to those metrics from other devices and other channels. Okay. So you want to be able to do a comparison because if, behavior is not up to par, engagement is not up to par on mobile, then you want to do something about that. So you want to hone in on mobile traffic specifically from organic search because the behavior is going to be different. You know, people start their searches on mobile, the site's going to be different. And so therefore it's a different experience altogether. So make sure you track the behavior and more importantly, make sure you track that page speed. So earlier we talked about on page SEO when we hone in on page speed so just as a reminder if I'm back in analytics and I go back under behavior then if I go to site speed then if I go to overview I'll be able to see the average page load time on my website I can also look at specific page timings and I should be able to see that by device so if I type in device category I'll be able to see how each page loads per device and so this allow me to understand which pages are loading fast, which pages are not loading as fast and address those pages accordingly to improve engagement metrics. So we want to keep an eye on page speed as well as overall user behavior from mobile devices. You can also use other tools that are out there like agency analytics. There are plenty of tools out there. I tend to use Google Analytics because primarily it's free and Google Analytics is a Google product so it works with other Google platforms like Google Search Console. We want to keep an eye on ranking. So remember when we do our keyword research, we're choosing keywords that have high relevancy, high volume and low competition. So we want to be able to track keywords that we choose that have high relevancy, high volume and low competition. And so the tool we use, or at least I recommend using is Moz. So I mentioned Moz earlier with on page and off page SEO. So if we go into Moz and we know what keywords we're trying to rank for, we can go ahead and add them to Moz. And what Moz does, is they actually track where these keywords rank. And so if I go into Moz and I click on rankings, I'll be able to see on a weekly basis or a monthly basis, how our keywords are ranking and for what pages they're ranking. So for whatever keyword I choose to, to optimize for, I want to make sure I put those keywords in Moz because when I put them in Moz, Moz is going to on a weekly basis, tell me where these keywords rank and for what URL they're ranked for. So that way I can keep an eye on ranking over time because in theory, the higher you rank, the more traffic you're going to get. And so we want to be able to see the trend in which keywords rank. Okay. So if I click on a particular keyword in Moz, it's going to give me over a period of time where that keywords ranked. Be able to see improvement in ranking for a particular keyword. The whole idea behind SEO is to choose keywords that are relevant, optimize for those keywords so that you can be ranked for those keywords in order to get the traffic and conversions. So Moz is a good platform that helps us monitor rankings for particular keywords. Now, if you don't want to use Moz as an alternative, you can turn your attention to Google Search Console. And so remember, we talked about Google Search Console earlier when we talked about sitemaps. We also talked about mobile usability with Search Console. We also talked about links to your site with Google Search Console. So Google Search Console is a good tool to help you understand how you're performing with organic search. And so there's one tool in particular, which is performance, that helps us understand what keyword queries people are actually typing into Google search. And so here I can see the actual query. And so with this particular website, valleyfig.com, I can see that dried fig recipes over the course of the last three months 
had 5,414 impressions. That means that one of my pages, either one or multiple pages, appeared in Google search engine results. 5,414 times. And over the course of those 5,414 impressions, I received 1,100 clicks. So Google Search Console is gonna be able to tell me not only you know how many impressions I received for a particular keyword, but they also are gonna tell me how many clicks. And if I wanted to add more metrics to that, I can add them, like the average ranking position for a keyword, the click-through rate, so I can add multiple metrics to this report to give me an understanding of, hey, are any of my targeted keywords being used or queried? And if they are, where am I ranking? And I am I showing up? And am I getting clicks? So Search Console serves as a good alternative, if not primary tool or platform for you to measure how your organic search results are showing. So for local visibility, this metric is important for you know, maintaining local SEO. So remember on the local SEO, we talked about uh, Google My Business. So if I go back to Google My Business, I can go into my account. And so Google My Business is going to be able to show me some metrics. So if I go into Google My Business and I click on Insights, I'm gonna be able to see a number of different metrics. Over the course of a month, I can see exactly, you know, what queries were used by how many users and when I appeared. So I'll be able to see how many views I received, not only on search results, but on maps. Then I can also see what actions people took when they saw my results in maps or in search. Did they visit my website? Did they request directions? Did they call? So I can actually see engagement metrics right in Google My Business. I could see a breakout by zip code. I could see phone calls by day of the week. I could see how many people even viewed my photos. So there's a lot of insights into local SEO on Google My Business. So that gives you an idea of how you're performing organically on local search. And remember, you want to be able to use Google My Business to hone in on your specific audience. So all these metrics help you align with whether you're getting in front of the right audience and whether that audience is actually behaving the way you want them to. Meaning, you know, are they actually contacting you? Are they going to your website? Are they calling you? So local visibility and understanding the metrics involved with local SEO is very important. So Google My Business is where you want to turn your Attention. So overall engagement metrics are important. They play an important role in determining rankings. For example, we talked about bounce rate. So bounce rate is the rate at which people go from organic search to your website and then leave after uh, seeing one page and not going any further. So if they land on a page and then leave the website after landing on that page, it's considered a bounce. And so bounce or bounce rate is a good indication of how people are receiving our website or the content that they're reading on our website. There are other metrics involved, like average session duration or pages per visit. All of these are engagement metrics. And let's not forget about page speed. So page speed is also a good engagement metric. All of these metrics affect or determine rankings. So we want to be able to make sure that if we're in Google Analytics and we're looking at engagement metrics, that our metrics are good. Because if somebody comes to our website from organic search and there's a high bounce rate, then what does that tell us? That there's a disconnect between what that person's querying and then the content that they're reading. And so we want to be able to address those engagement metrics so that we can continue to not only drive quality traffic, but keep the traffic engaged and then in turn drive up conversions. Last metric we want to look at is backlinks. So content having more backlinks from good domains will effectively improve your SEO performance. We talk about backlinks with off-page SEO and remember quality over quantity. And so we can measure backlinks going back into Moz. We can use Moz's Link Explorer tool. So remember, if I type in a domain, Valley Fig, I can get some metrics related to off-page SEO, including my domain authority. But more importantly, I can see what links are pointing to 
my site, in this case, valleyfig.com. So I can see there are 575 link domains. I can see there are 7,900 inbound links. And so just by clicking on that, I can get an idea of the types of websites that are linking to my site and their domain authority and, and their spam score. Google Search Console. So if you go back into Search Console, you can also just click on links and we should be able to get an idea of you know what websites are linking to our site and more importantly we want to be able to see not only what sites but what pages they're linked to remember we want our backlinks pointing to interior pages not necessarily the home page so here i can see the top link page for valleyfig.com is slash recipes so we want links pointing to our interior pages, not necessarily the home page. That's what's going to help your performance, your rankings for all your pages, not just your home page. So having quality back links pointing to interior pages help boost the domain authority and the page authority for that particular page. So again, using Moz link explorer tool or using the links report in search console are good sources for you to identify backlinks so when we look at these these reports we want to look at the domain authority of these sites that are linking ours the number of outbound links to the site or specific pages on our site we want to be able to look at the ratio of link distribution you know we want to be able to look at how many follows and no follows so most of this if not all of these metrics are in Moz so if I go back to Moz I can actually see you know which ones pointing which ones are followed the total quality of the link that's pointing to our site again bam so Moz link explorer report tends to give us all the information we need in order to measure and get a sense of our backlinks that help us with off-page SEO so there are other tools out there there's hrefs again search console there's other seo platforms out there that'll help you measure backlinks let's get started with keyword research so basically what we want to do is center our keywords just like our website we want to center our keywords around or our content around good keywords so the videos on youtube are no different than the web pages on our website so if we have somebody who states youtube is the world's second most well well-known engine well it is because it's right behind google it's not a search engine per se it's a video platform but if it was a search engine it'd probably be second right behind google so youtube is pretty popular majority of people use youtube search every day to watch videos on a number of different topics so they can find these videos in google but because youtube's so powerful and so popular people go directly right into youtube for their searches and so the whole idea behind youtube being the second most well-known search engine is centered around keywords so if you have the right keywords for your video then the chances of you ranking higher increases on youtube so we're gonna share with you a few easy ways to do keyword research this is the most important step in getting your videos to rank on youtube just like for those of you who watched any of the seo videos we produced at, at simply learn you know that keyword research is so essential to getting your web pages to rank on google well it's no different keyword research and choosing the right keywords is just as important for your videos as it is for your web pages so we're going to go into a few things to do here to find the right keywords so we have the search suggestion you can look at your competitors we have different tools we can use some other factors involved in Google itself so let's start talking about some of these ways to really hone in and do some good research on your keywords to align them with your videos so first thing is search suggest so YouTube has a feature called autocomplete so if you've done any searches on Google it's very similar if you're typing something in to YouTube search then YouTube is going to suggest other related popular keywords. So let's take a look at that. If we go back to YouTube for a second and I just type in machine learning, 
YouTube is going to populate on the autocomplete in the search bar some other popular keywords that we can potentially use. Or in this case, if I choose, you know, machine learning tutorial, I'm going to see a video about machine learning tutorial. So here you can see Simply Learn's ranked number one for machine learning tutorial. But there are other videos that show up in my search result. So we want to be able to use the search suggestion box in the search box field. So when we're typing in something, you know, YouTube, just like on Google, is going to give us those suggestions. So if we're focusing a video on machine learning, then, you know, we have some ideas of some other keywords that we could center around because these are our popular keywords. These are keywords that people are using to search on YouTube. So that's one suggestion. Looking at competitors is another suggestion. So we could search for keywords used by our competitors in their video and title and description. So let me talk a little bit about that. What you want to do is you want to go to that particular channel of your competitor. So when you go to your particular competitor's YouTube channel, you want to be able to click on the videos tab. When you click on the videos tab, then you're going to sort by most popular. And then what you could do is see a list of videos. And then when you look at a list of videos, you're going to choose a video. And then what you're going to do then is take a look at the keywords used in the title and description. And then once you do that, you're going to have a list of keywords that you can use yourself for that video. So for example, Let's go back to YouTube. So if I go to type in Simply Learn, here's their channel page. Just by clicking on Simply Learn, I click on videos. Ever wonder if there's so now I can see all the videos. Ever wonder if there's an easier way? Go back. So here I can see all the videos. Sort by most popular. Once I do that, then I can choose a video. This is the most popular video right now for Simply Learn. If I click on that video, it's automatically going to start playing. But what I could do is simply just look at you know the content and description. So just by clicking Show More, I can see all the content that align with this video. That's one way to do it is simply by looking at your competitors. Now what you could also do is look at the tags associated with the particular video and so what you want to do is you want to look at the HTML and so that means looking at the page source so just like web pages what YouTube does is they look at meta tags so if you call from SEO in order to get your pages to rank you need to have a title tag and a meta tag description so videos are no different what we're doing uh, for YouTube is aligning certain keywords with the video so if you take a look and do a search for for keywords by viewing the page source, you're going to see all the keywords associated with a particular video. So for example, if I go back to YouTube and I look at the page source of a video, let's just say this video here, Facebook's ad tutorial, I'm going to pull up the page source. And all I need to do is control F and type in keywords. And now for that Facebook video, I can see all the keywords associated with the video. So you can see there's a lot of different keywords we're aligning with this video. And so why do we want to do that? Because we want, you know, our video to show up for keywords that people may type in. And so if you use that YouTube autocomplete, it's going to give you those ideas, those most popular keywords. So if they're related, align those keywords with the video. So here you can see Facebook marketing, Facebook ad strategy, Facebook ads for beginners, so forth and so on. So there's a lot of keywords we've aligned here with that particular video. And again, all you need to do is look at the page source. So right clicking, view page source. Do a control F for keywords and you'll be able to see the keywords aligned. So you could do that for your competitors videos as well. So you could see what keywords your competitors using for a video that's most popular for their channel and is also ranking on YouTube and on Google. So using the autocomplete gives you those keyword ideas. Looking at your competitors videos also gives you some other ideas for keywords that you can align with a video that's relevant that you want to rank for. So let's look at uh, some other ideas here. So you can install plugins and there are plenty of plugins available on the Chrome browser that will help you see the video tags associated with a particular video. So a couple of examples are vidIQ and TubeBuddy. Those are extensions that work in Chrome and what they do is they give you the exact tags that a particular video is using. So for example, if I go back here 
and I look at a video on YouTube, let's just say the machine learning basics video, I have vidIQ installed on my Chrome browser. So just by clicking on that, vidIQ is going to give me a lot of information about that video. They're just going to give me an overview of their particular metrics. They're going to give me some other information associated with Facebook, some engagement metrics. Really what I'm interested in is those keywords. So if I scroll down a bit, here I can see the video tags associated with the machine learning basics video. So vidIQ is telling me is these keywords are associated with this video and not only does it show me what keywords are associated I can also see where they rank so for machine learning basics this particular video ranks number one if I go down I could see what is machine learning and how does it work I could see it's ranked number two here I could see machine learning algorithms it's ranked number nine so I can get some ideas of the types of keywords that are being used as tags for that video further down I can also see some channels tags but really this is the video tags or the idea place I want to be able to look to get an idea of the types of keywords that are associated with the video that are also ranking or not ranking so that's another way for you to really get an understanding of what keywords to use at the particular video so autocomplete you can look at the page source of a competitor's video or you can use a Chrome extension in this case I'm using vidIQ to give me some information about the video tags for a particular video. So according to an industry study, using keywords and video tags will help you rank well on YouTube. So you have to use keywords and video tags if you want your video to rank. There's been a lot of studies. YouTube is so popular and videos are so prominent in today's world where if you have videos and you're going to upload them to YouTube, then associate the right keywords with those videos. So so some important factors when we look at keywords what we want to do is look at search volume we want to look at competition we want to look at relevancy we want to look at the primary and secondary keywords that we want to use so well chosen keywords will help you rank so we just gave you some ideas on how to do some keyword research again those ideas were really to use the autocomplete on YouTube or Google they're gonna give you some popular keywords you can look what your competitors are doing by looking at the page source and just looking at the keywords that are aligned with that video or you can use a third-party extension in Chrome in my example I use vidIQ that gave me the keywords associated with that video so you have ways to get the keywords so what we want to do is we want to make sure we choose keywords with high search volume they're going to drive more traffic to your video however we want to balance it out with keywords that have low difficulty or and are easier to rank for. So you don't want to choose something very broad that's just going to be very difficult to rank for. And of course, we always want to go with relevancy. So if we're talking about machine learning basics, then we want to choose keywords associated with that. And that's where that autocomplete comes in handy because what Google's going to do and YouTube's going to do is give us keywords that are very closely related to the video that we're trying to optimize for. And so we have a number of different keywords at our disposal that are relevant relevant that we can look to see if they have good volume and low competition and so the whole idea is we want to choose a keyword that defines the nature of the content and then what we want to do is support that with secondary keywords so we want keywords that are highly relevant to the primary keyword so that's the way to go about aligning your keywords you want keywords that are high volume low competition or relevant and you want to choose that one keyword that is really what the content's about and then those secondary keywords that support the primary so if you have a machine learning video you could choose your primary keyword as in this case the machine learning basics video so well chosen keywords help you rank well on YouTube just like the machine learning basics so if I go back to our video our machine learning basics video if I just type in machine learning basics I'll be able to pull it up and so here it is if I click on it I'm gonna to go to YouTube YouTube. And so here I can see this keyword. We know humans learn from their is well aligned because 
it's in the title, it's in the copy, and it's aligned as a keyword tag with the video. So we know that that keyword has good volume, low competition is relevant because that's what the video is about, the basics of machine learning. It's an introduction to machine learning. So instead of honing in on just introduction to machine learning, primary keyword is machine learning basics. And then we supported that video with those secondary keywords. What is machine learning? Because somebody who doesn't know what machine learning is probably going to type in that keyword. And then introduction to machine learning is a good secondary keyword because it's explaining the basics of what machine learning is all about. So primary keyword, machine learning basic, secondary keywords, what is machine learning, and introduction to machine learning. So that's the whole idea behind choosing keywords. You want that keyword that really is going to define the content and then support that with those secondary keywords. So remember, when you're performing your keyword research, choose keywords for your videos that Google shows on the video results page. So what I mean by that is your video can get more views if you rank on Google as well. Wow. So the whole idea is not necessarily to be found on YouTube, it's also to be found on Google. So if I go back to Google and I just type in data science for beginners and I type in videos, then you could see we're ranked number one. So even if you're not looking at the videos, clicking on the videos link on Google search, you can always just, when you do a search, what Google's going to do is also put in the videos here on par as part of the search results. So what they're going to show you is the top videos that are ranking for that particular keyword. And so we may not rank overall for data science for beginners, but we're ranked number one in the videos category. And so if somebody's looking for a video, that's important. And you can see here that these first two are ads. So what Google is doing is they're saying, hey, this is so relevant, this particular video for the keyword query data science for beginners that we're gonna show it above the organic listings, even though it's a video. So the whole idea is to be found on YouTube and Google because you're increasing your visibility. You're increasing your chances of getting found on both search platforms. So according to Backlinko, Google ranks videos with keywords like how to, tutorials so you know a lot of the videos that you find on YouTube are going to be instructional based and so what Google's doing is they're saying hey if somebody types in how to or tutorial or an introduction to anything that's going to signal to Google that it's instructional it's going to help you rank so when you search for machine learning tutorial or how to become a machine learning engineer you're gonna get results related to that because if you look at these examples we have machine learning tutorial in our title or how to become a machine learning engineer so keep that in mind if you're creating a video and it's educational in nature you know use those key terms like how to and tutorials in the video title because that will help you rank so let's move over now to video title so we want to use our target keyword in the title of the video and again we want to make sure if it's educational educational to include that keyword tutorial or how to so for every video title YouTube has a limit of a hundred characters so we really have to pick and choose a really wisely so if we look at the video that we were focusing on a couple of minutes ago so machine learning basics here we could see under 100 characters we have machine learning basics what is machine learning introduction to machine learning and then the brand name so that is the title of this particular video so it takes into account the primary keyword the secondary keywords and the title and it also includes that really that key term that really Google and YouTube like and that's what is machine learning so it's helping us rank by having our keywords in the title with that key phrase what is Okay, so that's a, a good tidbit on creating a good video title is to align it with the right keywords, your primary and your secondary. And so we want to use those catchy words and numbers to gain high click through rates, just like you would on the title tag of your web page. We want to do the same with our video title because the video title is what's going to show up in search. So if I go back to, you know, search here, we could see, you know, data science tutorial 
data science for beginners. So we want to make sure in this case, you can see data science in five minutes. So that was purposely done so that, hey, I don't have time to watch a video. I only have a couple minutes. Data science in five minutes. Okay, great. I'm going to click on the video. And now I have an opportunity to watch something and learn something under five minutes. So choosing the right words in your video title is going to help you get that click through rate up. Remember, click through rate is clicks divided by impressions. And an impression is how many times your video shows up in the search results on YouTube or Google. So we want to keep our click through rate high. And in order to do that, we want to be able to write some really good title tags for our video. So use catchy words like a number or how to or what is, because that's going to resonate with people when they're searching. Now for the description, what we want to do is we want to use the target word at the beginning of the description, the title, and the tags itself. So if I go back to my video here, Machine Learning Basics, we know it's in the video title. And right off the bat, if I look at the description of the video here, I can see this Machine Learning Basics video will help you understand what is machine learning. So our primary keyword is in the first sentence, right in the introductory of the description. And so that's going to bode well for optimizing our video. The description length is 5,000 characters. So we have a lot of characters to work with. So if I go back to my video, I click show more. We have a lot of characters to really describe what the video is about. Okay. There's no shortage, no shortage of including keywords into the content. So you have 5,000 characters. Go ahead and see if you can work in naturally your keywords. But one of the key tips here is just make sure that first sentence starts out with that keyword. That's a good tip. Of course, you always want to make it sound natural as possible. You don't want to stuff it with keywords. At the same time, work them in naturally. Work in your keywords naturally. And then include hashtags in your description to help the audience find your video is easily. So if I go back here, you know, we want to be able to include hashtags. So hashtags, it's like anything else you would use on social media. It just signals to the end user, hey, this is what the video is all about. And if I go ahead and type in that keyword, then it's our video has a better chance because it's aligned with that hashtag. And then there's target keywords and LSI keywords, latent semantic indexing keywords. We want to be able to use those keywords as target keywords with our video. So if you recall the example I gave a few minutes ago, we used the Facebook ads tutorial as our example. Here I could see all the target keywords associated with that particular video. So don't be afraid to use those LSI related keywords, meaning keywords that are related to the content. Use them as target keywords with the video. So between your LSI keywords, target keywords, and then using our primary and secondary keyword in the title tag, using our primary and secondary keyword in the description, and then using hashtags in the description. The combination of all of that, if we chose the right keyword, then we should find that our video will eventually rank on YouTube. So just doing these small tidbits with our keywords really help get our video to rank. So at the end of the day, we want to be able to to use the tools available to us, YouTube itself by looking at our competitors, those extensions like vidIQ, the autocomplete to really find our good keywords and then incorporating those keywords into you know, the title tag, the description as target keywords, hashtags. We should really be off and running with our video on YouTube. So at Simply Learn, if I go to YouTube and I just type in machine learning, you could see we're right here is the first organic video on YouTube for machine learning. If I jump over to Google and I type in machine learning basics, you can see we're number, we're number one for machine learning basics under videos. If I click on all, we're also ranked here as well under the video section on organic search results. Another example, data science for beginners. 
we ranked number one for that. If I look at another keyword, data science interview questions, okay, we're ranked number two for that. So we're ranking for a lot of videos and why are we ranking for a lot of different content and videos on Google search and on YouTube? Well, we put a lot of work in behind the scenes of creating the video and that's what we wanna show you. So part of that has a lot to do with you know, how our audience engages and sees our video. So for example, we're looking at uh, the machine learning basics video here. And we can see that it has over 221,000 subscribers for this video, 234,000 views. We've had over 2,000 people like the video. And we have had over 270 plus comment on the video. So when we get our videos to rank, then we can see there's a lot of engagement. And so that's the whole idea is when you do a video and you want it to show up on YouTube, you want people to enjoy it, you want people to share it, you want people to like it, you want people to comment on it. And that's part of the whole ecosystem of YouTube. It's, you know, we're gonna show you behind the scenes of what it takes to get your videos to rank. And then we're gonna show you some of the metrics involved with some of these videos to help you stay ranking. So without further ado, let's go into how to get your videos to rank on YouTube. So we're gonna talk about keyword research for YouTube. We're gonna talk about some ways to create high quality videos. So the importance of user engagement, just as I showed you with the machine learning basics video, all the shares, all the commenting, all the views and subscriptions. Then we're gonna get into how to promote your content. And then we're gonna just review a little checklist for you and sum it all up. So let's get started with keyword research. So basically what we wanna do is center our keywords, just like our website, we wanna center our keywords around or our content around good keywords. So so the videos on YouTube are no different than the web pages on our website. So if we have somebody who states YouTube is the world's second most well-known well engine, well, it is because it's right behind Google. It's not a search engine per se. It's a video platform, but if it was a search engine, it'd probably be second right behind Google. So YouTube is pretty popular. Majority of people use YouTube search every day to watch videos on a number of different topics. So they can find these videos in Google, but because YouTube's so powerful and so popular, people go directly right into YouTube for their searches. And so the whole idea behind YouTube being the second most well-known search engine is centered around keywords. So if you have the right keywords for your video, then the chances of you ranking higher increases on YouTube. So we're gonna share with you a few easy ways to do keyword research. This is the most important step in getting your videos to rank on YouTube. Just like for those of you who watched any of the SEO videos we produced at, at Simply Learn, you know that keyword research is so essential to getting your web pages to rank on Google. Well, it's no different. Keyword research and choosing the right keywords is just as important for your videos as it is for your web pages. So we're gonna go into a few things to do here to find the right keywords. So we have the search suggestion. You can look at your competitors. We have different tools we can use, some other factors involved in Google itself. So let's start talking about some of these ways to really hone in and do some good research on your keywords to align them with your videos. So first thing is search suggest. So YouTube has a feature called autocomplete. So if you've done any searches on Google, it's very similar. If you're typing something in to YouTube search, then YouTube is going to suggest other related popular keywords. So let's take a look at that. If we go back to YouTube for a second, and I just type in machine learning, YouTube is going to populate on the autocomplete in the search bar some other popular keywords that we can potentially use. Or in this case, if I choose you know, machine learning tutorial, I'm gonna see a video about machine learning tutorial. So here you can see Simply Learn's ranked number one for machine learning tutorial. But there are other videos that show up in my search result. So we wanna be able to use the search suggestion box in the search box field. So when we're typing in something, you know, YouTube, just like on Google, is going to give us those suggestions. So if we're focusing uh, a video on machine learning, then, you know, we have some ideas 
of some other keywords that we could center around because these are our popular keywords. These are keywords that people are using to search on YouTube. So that's one suggestion. Looking at competitors is another suggestion. So we could search for keywords used by our competitors in their video and title and description. So let me talk a little bit about that. What you want to do is you want to go to that particular channel of your competitor. So when you go to your particular competitor's YouTube channel, you want to be able to click on the videos tab. When you click on the videos tab, then you're going to sort by most popular and then what you could do is see a list of videos and then when you look at a list of videos you're going to choose a video and then what you're going to do then is take a look at the keywords used in the title and description and then once you do that you're going to have a list of keywords that you can use yourself for that video so for example let's go back to youtube so if i go to type in simply learn here's our channel page just by clicking on simply learn i click on videos ever wonder if there's so now I can see all the videos. Ever wonder if there's an easier way? Go back. So here I can see all the videos. Sort by most popular. Once you do that, then I could choose a video. This is the most popular video right now for Simply Learn. If I click on that video, it's automatically going to start playing. But what I could do is simply just look at you know the content description. So just by clicking Show More, I can see all the content that align with this video. That's one way to do it is simply by looking at your competitors. Now what you could also do is look at the tags associated with the particular video and so what you want to do is you want to look at the HTML and so that means looking at the page source so just like web pages what YouTube does is they look at meta tags so if you call from SEO in order to get your pages to rank you need to have a title tag and a meta tag description so videos are no different what we're doing uh, for YouTube is aligning certain keywords with the video so if you take a look and do a search for keywords by viewing the page source, you're going to see all the keywords associated with a particular video. So for example, if I go back to YouTube and I look at the page source of a video, let's just say this video here, Facebook's ad tutorial, I'm going to pull up the page source. And all I need to do is control F and type in keywords. And now for that Facebook video, I can see all the keywords associated with the video. So you can see there's a lot of different keywords we're aligning with this video. And so why do we want to do that? Because we want, you know, our video to show up for keywords that people may type in. And so if you use that YouTube autocomplete, it's going to give you those ideas, those most popular keywords. So if they're related, align those keywords with the video. So here you can see Facebook marketing, Facebook ad strategy, Facebook ads for beginners, so forth and so on. So there's a lot of keywords we've aligned here with that particular video. And again, all you need to do is look at the page source. So right clicking, view page source. Do a control F for keywords and you'll be able to see the keywords aligned. So you could do that for your competitors videos as well. So you could see what keywords your competitors using for a video that's most popular for their channel and is also ranking on YouTube and on Google. So using the autocomplete gives you those keyword ideas. Looking at your competitors videos also gives you some other ideas for keywords that you can align with a video that's relevant that you want to rank for. So let's look at uh, some other ideas here. So you can install plugins and there are plenty of plugins available on the Chrome browser that will help you see the video tags associated with a particular video. So a couple of examples are vidIQ and TubeBuddy. Those are extensions that work in Chrome and what they do is they give you the exact tags that a particular video is using. So for example, if I go back here, and I look at a video on YouTube, let's just say the machine learning basics video, I have vidIQ installed on my Chrome browser. So just by clicking on that, vidIQ is going to give me a lot of information about that video. They're just gonna give me an overview of their particular metrics. They're gonna give me some other information associated with Facebook, some engagement metrics. Really what I'm interested in is those keywords. So if I scroll down a bit, here I can see the video tags associated with the machine learning basics video. So vidIQ is telling me is these keywords 
keywords are associated with this video. And not only does it show me what keywords are associated, I can also see where they rank. So for machine learning basics, this particular video ranks number one. If I go down, I could see what is machine learning and how does it work? I could see it's ranked number two. Here I could see machine learning algorithms, it's ranked number nine. So I can get some ideas of the types of keywords that are being used as tags for that video. Further down, I can also see some channel tags, but really this is the video tags or the idea place I wanna be able to look to get an idea of the types of keywords that are associated with the video that are also ranking or not ranking. So that's another way for you to really get an understanding of what keywords to use of the particular video. So autocomplete, you can look at the page source of a competitor's video, or you can use a Chrome extension. In this case, I'm using vidIQ to give me some information about the video tags for a particular video. So according to an industry study, using keywords and video tags will help you rank well on YouTube. So you have to use keywords and video tags if you want your video to rank. There's been a a lot of studies YouTube is so popular and videos are so prominent in today's world where if you have videos and you're going to upload them to YouTube then associate the right keywords with those videos so some important factors when we look at keywords what we want to do is look at search volume we want to look at competition we want to look at relevancy we want to look at the primary and secondary keywords that we want to use so well-chosen keywords will help you rank. So we just gave you some ideas on how to do some keyword research. Again, those ideas were really to use the autocomplete on YouTube or Google. They're going to give you some popular keywords. You can look what your competitors are doing by looking at the page source and just looking at the keywords that are aligned with that video. Or you can use a third party extension in Chrome. In my example, I use vidIQ that gave me the keywords associated with that video. So you have ways to get the keywords. So what we want to do is we want to make sure we choose keywords with high search volume. They're going to drive more traffic to your video. However, we want to balance it out with keywords that have low difficulty or and are easier to rank for. So you don't want to choose something very broad that's just going to be very difficult to rank for. And of course, we always want to go with relevancy. So if we're talking about machine learning basics, then we want to choose keywords associated with that. And that's where that autocomplete comes in handy because what Google's going to do and YouTube's going to do is give us keywords that are very closely related to the video that we're trying to optimize for. And so we have a number of different keywords at our disposal that are relevant that we can look to see if they have good volume and low competition. And so the whole idea is we want to choose a keyword that defines the nature of the content. And then what we want to do is support that with secondary keywords. So we want keywords that are highly relevant to the primary keyword. So that's the way to go about aligning your keywords. You want keywords that are high volume, low competition, are relevant, and you want to choose that one keyword that is really what the content's about, and then those secondary keywords that support the primary. So if you have a machine learning video, you could choose your primary keyword as, in this case, the machine learning basics video. So well-chosen keywords help you rank well on YouTube, just like the machine learning basics. So if I go back to our video, our machine learning basics video, if I just type in machine learning basics, I'll be able to pull it up. And so here it is. If I click on it, I'm gonna go to YouTube. And so here I can see this keyword we know humans learn from their body is well aligned because it's in the title, it's in the copy, and it's aligned as a keyword tagged with the video. So we know that that keyword has good volume, low competition is relevant because that's what the video is about, the basics of machine learning. It's an introduction to machine learning. So instead of honing in on just introduction to machine learning, primary keyword is machine learning basics. And then we supported that video with those secondary keywords. What is machine learning? Because somebody who doesn't know what machine learning is, probably going to type in that keyword. And then introduction to machine learning is a good secondary keyword because it's explaining the basics of what machine learning is all about. 
So primary keyword, machine learning basic. Secondary keywords, what is machine learning and introduction to machine learning. So that's the whole idea behind choosing keywords. You want that keyword that really is going to define the content and then support that with those secondary keywords. So remember when you're performing your keyword research, choose keywords for your videos that Google shows on the video results page. So what I mean by that is your video can get more views if you rank on Google as well. So the whole idea is not necessarily to be found on YouTube, it's also to be found on Google. So if I go back to Google and I just type in data science for beginners and I type in videos, then you could see we're ranked number one. So even if you're not looking at the videos, clicking on the videos link on Google search, you can always just, when you do a search, what Google's gonna do is also put in the videos here on par as part of the search results. So what they're gonna show you is the top videos that are ranking for that particular keyword. And so we may not rank overall, for data science for beginners, but we're ranked number one in the videos category. And so if somebody's looking for a video, that's important. And you can see here that these first two are ads. So what Google is doing is they're saying, hey, this is so relevant, this particular video for the keyword query data science for beginners that we're gonna show it above the organic listings, even though it's a video. So the whole idea is to be found on YouTube and Google because you're increasing your visibility. You're increasing your chances of getting found on both search platforms. So according to Backlinko, Google ranks videos with keywords like how to, tutorials. So, you know, a lot of the videos that you find on YouTube are going to be instructional based. And so what Google's doing is they're saying, hey, if somebody types in how to or tutorial or an introduction to anything that's going to signal to Google that it's instructional, it's going to help you rank. So when you search for machine learning tutorial or how to become a machine learning engineer, you're going to get results related to that. Because if you look at these examples, we have machine learning tutorial in our title or how to become a machine learning engineer. So keep that in mind. If you're creating a video and it's educational in nature, you know, use those key terms like how to and tutorials in the video title because that will help you rank. So let's move over now to video title. So we want to use our target keyword in the title of the video. And again, we want to make sure if it's educational to include that keyword tutorial or how to. So for every video title, YouTube has a limit of 100 characters. So we really have to pick and choose really wisely. So if we look at the video that we were focusing on a couple of minutes ago, so machine learning basics, here we could see under 100 characters, we have machine learning basics, what is machine learning, introduction to machine learning, and then the brand name. So that is the title of this particular video. So it takes into account the primary keyword, the secondary keywords, and the title. And it also includes that really that key term that really Google and YouTube like, and that's what is machine learning. So it's helping us rank by having our keywords in the title with that key phrase, what is. Okay, so that's a, a good tidbit on creating a good video title is to align it with the right keywords, your primary and your secondary. And so we wanna use those catchy words and numbers to gain high click-through rates. Just like you would on the title tag of your webpage, we wanna do the same with our video title because the video title is what's going to show up in search. So if I go back to you know search, here we could see you know data science tutorial, data science for beginners. So we want to make sure in this case, you can see data science in five minutes. So that was purposely done so that, hey, I don't have time to watch a video. I only have a couple minutes, data science in five minutes. Okay, great. I'm going to click on the video and now I have an opportunity to watch something and learn something under five minutes. So choosing the right words in your video title is going to help you get that click through rate up. Remember click through rate is clicks divided by impressions and an impression is how how many times your video shows up in the search results on YouTube or Google. So we want to keep our click-through rate high. And in order to do that, we want to be able to write some really good title tags for our video. So use catchy words like a number or how to or what is, because that's going to resonate with people when they're searching.
Now for the description, what we want to do is we want to use the target word at the beginning of the description, the title, and the tags itself. So if I go back to my video here, Machine Learning Basics, we know it's in the video title. And right off the bat, if I look at the description of the video here, I can see this Machine Learning Basics video will help you understand what is machine learning. So our primary keyword is in the first sentence, right in the introductory of the description. And so that's going to bode well for optimizing our video. The description length is 5,000 characters. So we have a lot of characters to work with. So if I go back to my video, I click show more. We have a lot of characters to really describe what the video is about. Okay, there's no shortage, no shortage of including keywords into the content. So you have 5,000 characters. Go ahead and see if you can work in naturally your keywords. But one of the key tips here is just make sure that first sentence starts out with that keyword. That's a good tip. Of course, you always want to make it sound natural as possible. You don't want to stuff it with keywords. At the same time, work them in naturally. Work in your keywords naturally. And then include hashtags in your description to help the audience find your video as easily. So if I go back here, you know, we want to be able to include hashtags. So hashtags, it's like anything else you would use on social media. It just signals to the end user, hey, this is what the video is all about. And if I go ahead and type in that keyword, then it's our video has a better chance because it's aligned with that hashtag. And then there's target keywords and LSI keywords, latent semantic indexing keywords. We want to be able to use those keywords as target keywords with our video. So if you recall the example I gave a few minutes ago, we used the Facebook ads tutorial as our example. Here I could see all the target keywords associated with that particular video. So don't be afraid to use those LSI related keywords, meaning keywords that are related to the content. Use them as target keywords with the video. So between your LSI keywords, target keywords, and then using our primary and secondary keyword in the title tag, using our primary and secondary keyword in the description, and then using hashtags in the description, the combination of all of that, if we chose the right keyword, then we should find that our video will eventually rank on YouTube. So just doing these small tidbits with our keywords really help get our video to rank. So at the end of the day, we want to be able to use the tools available to us, YouTube itself by looking at our competitors, those extensions like vidIQ, the autocomplete to really find our good keywords and then incorporating those keywords into you know the title tag, the description as target keywords, hashtags. We should really be off and running with our video on YouTube. Let's turn our attention to creating high quality videos and some of the best practices around that. So along with everything we mentioned about choosing the right keywords, we always need to keep in mind that the videos we create need to be of high quality. So the content itself, in addition to the keywords, is, is a primary factor in ranking. So in order to have keywords, we need to have content. And in order to rank, we need to have you know, good content. So let's talk a little bit about creating content and what's involved with that and what we really mean by high quality videos. So if you have a video content that is not informative or irrelevant to the topic, it won't rank. So that's just common sense. So you need to create content that's aligned with the topic, obviously, and then that way you have keywords that are aligned with the content. So, but if you have content really isn't aligned with the topic, then you're not going to rank no matter how much you've optimized that video. So just keep that in mind. So there's a couple of things we want to look at here. So high quality content is determined by really two metrics. So if we're not sure about how good our content is and how good of high quality video we created, we want to look at audience retention and user engagement. So Audience retention is simply the percentage length of your video that the audience has watched. It's the percentage your audience has watched. So focusing on audience retention is important for people who want their videos to rank high. So if you want to rank, you need to optimize for the keywords, but got to keep in mind content. So content is related to audience retention 
and user engagement. So audience retention, percentage length, your video of your video that the audience has watched. And for example, it can be both absolute in minutes or percentages. So audience retention can be the average view duration or percentage of the audience that watched. Then we have user engagement. So user engagement are viewers who are engaged with your content. And so that means they're either sharing it, subscribing, commenting, or liking. So those are all forms of engagement. So the percentage of users who watched or how long they watched versus engagement or in combination with engagement are two factors for ranking. So let's talk about some tips for creating high quality videos. So we wanna publish longer videos. And so what do we mean behind longer videos? So what's the reason for longer videos? Let's just suppose we have two videos, one shorter in length and one longer in length. First video is 15 minutes long. The second video is seven minutes long. So on average, if viewers watch about 40% of both videos, then video X, which is 15 minutes long, will have more than twice the watch time of the video that's seven minutes long. So remember, duration. We want you know people to watch our videos longer. So if the video is longer in length, if it's 40%, then it's gonna have a longer audience engagement, audience retention. So that's one of the reasons, you know, from a metric standpoint. So even when viewers watch, you know, both videos, the time is going to differ. So we want to take into account longer videos for primarily that reason is because, you know, it gives an, an end user an opportunity to watch the video longer and then it's going to help us rank our videos longer. So when we talk about watch time, so if one video has higher watch time than the other, watch time is just the number of views times the average view duration. So another tip is we want to plan our video script. So we want to keep the content organized. My recommendation is, you know, create an outline first. And once you create an outline of how the video is going to flow, then start populating with content. And so to me, that's how you can keep the flow organized, okay, is, is really with an outline, starting out with an outline. There's no, videos are no different than say a presentation. If you've done a PowerPoint presentation, you always wanna start out doing an outline. And then we wanna upload high resolution videos. High resolution, we don't wanna create videos that, you know, are small resolution, like say, you know, 400 by 400 resolution or something, you know, something really small. We wanna create something in very high res. So according to the back or link oaks more than 50 percent of videos on the first page of youtube are high definition so high definition videos of higher quality are going to be shown on the first page of youtube more often than not so high resolution videos organizing the content publishing longer videos are examples of creating high quality video we also want to make sure that content is relevant to the title so if we're talking about machine learning basics, you know, obviously the content is going to be about, you know, intro to machine learning or what is machine learning, and then the title should reflect that content. So aligning the title sets the expectation for the end user. So when they see a title, what is machine learning? Then when they watch the video, they're expecting to learn about machine learning and what it is. So if it meets expectations, then the chances are that person who's watching the video is going to watch it longer. And that means it's going to fulfill the viewer's requirements. And when you align everything accordingly, keywords, titles, content, then at the end of the day, the view user is going to watch it. And the more they watch it, the higher the engagement, the higher the engagement, the better chance you have to rank. Some other tips that you could use to create high quality videos. So we want to be able to, you know, use examples to clarify our content. So, you know, don't be afraid to go into another screen like I am. If I want to, I'm talking about videos, jump into the machine learning basics video, which I've done throughout this session. I can simply do that by keeping the user engaged here. This video is about machine learning basics. Well, the titles align with the video. We made sure that we have a nice description about what the video is about. 
and we're aligning the expectations. So not only that, I'm showing you example within the video itself. So we want to use examples throughout your video to keep the user engaged. It will also help clarify what you're trying to express in the video itself. So we want to make it visually appealing. So visually appealing means imagery or examples in the video. And then when we talk about imagery, you know, you want to use good images in your video. So use public domain sites that are available to you like Shutterstock or Flat Icon. I mean, there are plenty of those sites out there. So feel free to use any one of those sites to use high quality images in your video. Give more information to your audience. Okay, giving maximum relevant information can help gain more views. And so when we talk about more information, again, it goes back to, you know, the examples you use. There no, should be no shortage of examples. Here, description. Use all 5,000 characters at your disposal. Imagery. We want to build up as much information as you can in the video itself to keep the end user, the viewer, engaged. We also want to create original content. So always create original content. You could certainly get ideas from YouTube. If you want to create a video about machine learning, see what else has already been done. Do searches on YouTube itself. But, you know, when you want to create a video, yeah, you can create another video about what is machine learning, but just make sure it has your own take on it. You're the subject matter expert when creating the video. Create it with your own original content. Have high audio quality and video effects. So just like you see here on this video, we have effects in it and the audio is of high quality, meaning no background noise, no distortion. And we want to be able to speak clearly in the video. So you want to speak clearly, loudly, concise, just as I'm trying to do now so that you can understand what I'm trying to say or what the viewer is trying to, to understand when they're watching the video. So watching and listening are two of the components and you want to make sure both of our high quality. Avoid distractions. We don't want to pause. You don't want to ramble on a particular point too long. We want to keep users engaged. So you always want to move from one point to the other. Intermix it with examples. Those are ways to keep the users engaged. We want to include transcripts or subtitles for your video. So transcripts is just more content that's aligned with the video and the search engines will be able to pick up that content and help your video rank. So to me, that's a key component to creating a good video is having the necessary content to go along with the video. That outline I referenced earlier in terms of organization, you always want to have a content outline. So what topics are you going to cover in the video? That's why you need the outline to point that out, confirm that before you actually start creating the video. Okay, focus on the initial 15 seconds. So that's key. You know, somebody's going to click the play button of your video, and if you don't catch them in the first 15 seconds, then they're likely going to pause the video or just go ahead and close it out altogether. So you want to be able to capture somebody's attention right off the bat. And even before they click on that play button, you want to make sure, again, you're exceeding expectations. That title is aligned with the content. So in your first 15 seconds, it basically needs to be catchy, but also setting the expectation of what the user is expecting. So in this example here, we want to pay close attention to the first 15 seconds. That's when viewers are most likely to drop off. So we can look at audience retention in YouTube. So use the options above the graph to view absolute audience retention or relative audience retention. So audience retention is basically how many views a video received and the percentage of the total number of video views. And that includes every moment of the video as a percentage. So we'll show you an example of what that looks like. So here, if we go to the machine learning basics video, we can look at the audience retention report. And this is since it's been uploaded, the lifetime audience retention. So here we can see a nice graph, the percentage of people who viewed it and how long they viewed it. So in percentage. So here, for example, I can see, you know, 43, 44% watched the video for at least two minutes. Here I can see 28.6% watched it for six minutes plus. So that's the audience retention. It gives us an idea in terms of percentage, how many people 
or a percentage of people watch the video at what length. So that's audience retention. So we want to keep that number high at the very initial stage of the video. And we want to keep it high throughout. And that's why you always want to create high quality content using those examples, using imagery, making it organized content, not pausing, you know, going from one point to the other. Those are all best practices to keep the viewer engaged. And then we want to add resources from well-known sites. So throughout this video, we've used Backlinko. There are other sources we've used. So if you have a source, go ahead and put it in your video to add credibility. And then we want to use cards to your video. So this cards is basically a feature that recommends relevant videos to your audience. So in addition to machine learning basics, there could be other videos about machine learning that we can recommend or YouTube can recommend to the audience. To set up end screens, you wanna make sure that with end screens, you can use relevant videos to your audience towards the end of your video. So you can recommend relevant videos towards the end of your video. You can also create playlist. So this is a feature that keeps your audience engaged with relevant content by auto playing the next video. So if you enable this feature, it's going to go from one video to another. Pattern interrupts keep the audience engaged. So Basically, it allows your audience to stay within one video without having any interruptions involved. And so going back to the did you know, audience retention report helps you analyze how well your videos are engaging to the audience. So what do we mean by that? Well, if I go back again to my audience retention report, how engaging was it? Well, I could see 42%, 43% watched it on average of three minutes and 21 seconds. So to me, that's pretty good. Of course, we always want 100% of the video. The video is seven minutes long. If almost half of our audience saw over half of the video, then I would say that's pretty good. People were engaged. So audience retention just is a good report to start looking at to help you understand how engaging is my video. And if your video is not engaging, you know, you can always go back and edit it or fix it or tweak it. So remember the average view duration for all videos and top performing videos listed by all time. We can look at that information as well. In addition, we can look at demographics so we can get an overview of the age, gender, and location. Okay, we can look at playback locations report and what the playback locations report does is it helps us determine the platforms where our videos are being streamed from within YouTube. Look at the traffic sources. Where did the viewers come from? Devices, did they look on mobile or tablet? And so if there's any doubts, you know, if you have any questions, please drop a comment below, but especially if you have any doubts on the metrics. So if we go back into YouTube, we can look at analytics. And if we're looking at analytics, we can see more. And then this is gonna show us everything we need to see from device type. So if I click on more, I can see my playback location. So this will show me where the video was watched. It was on a watch page or a channel page. I could see the traffic sources. I could see the gender and age. So if I click on the viewer age report, I can see the percentage of views by age. So I can get a lot of information about my video and how it's performed, who's watched it, what they've done with it, uh, where they come from, all the information they need to know. Okay, so it's all within YouTube Analytics. So again, if you have any questions about that, you know, just drop a comment below. Especially if you're new to YouTube, you may have some questions, but just know that every video you publish to YouTube, high quality, aligned with your keywords, you're gonna be able to view the metrics by looking at YouTube Analytics. So let's talk about the importance of user engagement. So engagement is, as we mentioned, important because basically we can't rank without engagement. Our videos won't rank unless we have engagement. So that's why it's important. So engagement is somebody liking the video, commenting, sharing it, or subscribing. Each one of these is important to ranking. So yes, you need to line keywords. Yes, you need to have high quality content. So when you do both of those, and you upload your video, then it's up to the viewer. And so the hard work that you put out for the video is hopefully gonna pay dividends with engagement. So you want people to do one of these four. Okay, so let's talk about what that means. So how do I get engagement? So we already talked about creating engaging content. So there are a lot of tips to creating engaging content. 
And so according to WordStream, if your content is entertaining, then over three quarters of the users are gonna share it. So that's part of keeping uh, uh, users engaged, is keeping them entertaining, is part of getting a high quality video. So remember on that high quality video, when we say entertaining, the audio portion has a lot to do with it, examples has a lot to do with it, quality of the video itself has a lot to do with it. So there's a lot of components. So all those components on a high quality video are going to lead to engagement. So parts of what you could do in your videos is conduct a quiz. So meaning the quiz itself is a way to keep people engaged in your video. So that also help you get some more comments. So according to Backlinku, video comments help in ranking your video higher. So just as I mentioned in the last segment about YouTube analytics and all the different reports available on YouTube. Hey, if you have questions on those, just go ahead and add a comment. So that's a way to entice your users or your viewers to add comments is if they have questions. Because, you know, with videos, you're not going to be able to cover every detail or every minute detail about a particular topic. You can only cover, in some cases, the topic at a high level. So users are going to have comments or questions naturally. And so the comment section is a good way to remind viewers, hey, if you have a question or comment, go ahead and put it in the comment section because that will lend to engagement as well. So we want to add sources from high quality websites. That'll help with engagement. Okay, use humor in your video. We want to be able to basically, you know, make it human based. We don't want to be robots. So we want to be able to sound like, you know, we know what we're talking about, but at the same time, talk to the viewer, not necessarily at the viewer or looking the other way and just going through the motions. So adding humor, adding personality never hurts. At the end of the day, we are all human. Adding that clear call to action at the end of the video will also lead to engagement. So if we win the video with, hey, leave your comments on this video, or hey, feel free to share this video with colleagues who are interested, then that's a call to action that's likely going to lead to more engagement. Reply to your comments as well. So if you have comments, we always want to reply to them. Likely those comments are going to be questions because again, as I mentioned, even in this video about how to rank your videos on YouTube, okay, there's a lot of information and a lot of information sometimes doesn't get covered in its entirety. And so we want to make sure that if we miss something, because we're only human, that we're able to respond in the form of an answer to a question that somebody leaves in the comment section. So more comments also lead to higher rankings because it's engagement. So when you're getting high engagement and your video starts to rank well, you know, you're gonna start feeling really good. And what is that gonna do? Okay, that feel good's gonna lead to confidence, which in turn is gonna probably lead to more videos. And that's exactly what we do at Simply Learn. I mean, we're in the education business, but we're in it to not only educate, but making sure that our videos are shown to as many people as possible so that we can educate as many people as possible. So it's all, it's contagious. So getting ranked feels good. And then once you get ranked, then you know you probably have good engagement. Okay, let's talk about how to promote your content. So once you've done all the hard work, getting your video done, high quality content, optimized with keywords, and then publish to YouTube, we want to let everybody in the world know about it, right? So we want to promote it. We've done all the work. We want to promote it now. So is it necessary to promote it? I would say yes, because once your video is published, you want to reach out. You want to reach out to your audience, not necessarily on YouTube, but on different platforms. So if you're active on Facebook or Twitter, that's an opportunity for you to post or tweet something about the new video. So when we say different platforms, I am talking about, you know, social media platforms. So it depends on what you're active on. So if you're active on Facebook, yeah, go ahead and post something. If you're active on Twitter, go ahead and tweet something. It could be, you know, on LinkedIn group. If you're part of a LinkedIn group about, you know, machine learning, then go ahead and post something to that group to promote the video. 
video. So that's going to help drive traffic to the video and then help with engagement. So we want to engage with our audience on those social media sites. So it really depends on what you're active on. So if you have a large following on Twitter, then go ahead and you know share that YouTube video link on Twitter with the tweet that's going to drive traffic from Twitter to YouTube. Remember, you know, you're going to be able to see audience engagement or retention by getting people to watch the video. So you're going to be able to see right away by promoting the video and driving traffic to the video, how engaging it is. Remember, the more people you have watched the video, the more engaging it becomes, the better it's going to rank. So it's an ecosystem and promoting your content is part of that ecosystem. So it all starts with social media. If you're active on whatever platform that is, go ahead and promote it. So you can also look at you know content-based social media sites or social media content-based platforms like Reddit or Flickr, for example. So you can participate in a forum discussion on Reddit. So in this example here, it's about machine learning. So we want to be able to post something about machine learning with the link to our video. So we can also go to content based sites that are Q&A uh, related like Quora for example. Quora is a really good site where you know if you go there post information about machine learning or the basics of machine learning with the link back to the video it's going to help because not only is it going to drive traffic but it's going to signal to Google hey you get a lot of traffic coming from Quora this is going to bode well for this video in terms of ranking. So here's an example you know if you find a question that you can post on Quora, then you're gonna get people to click on your video and respond accordingly on Quora. Or you can act as the person responding to a question that's already there. So if somebody already asked a question about what is machine learning, you can respond with your video as the answer. So you can just simply embed your video URL as part of your answer. That'll help drive traffic. So you can also create your own blog and embed your video. So in the case of machine learning, here we have an example, machine learning, what is it and why it matters so this goes nicely with the video so here you can see the person the author of this blog went ahead and embedded the relevant video in the blog post so they play off one another nicely you can also opt in for influencer marketing meaning hey you can reach out to somebody in this example here you know Katie Nuggets posted information about machine learning so in this case, why choose machine learning as a career? Well, they got information and then what did they do? They went ahead and embedded the video about machine learning basics. And so working with you know influencers in a particular category or topic will help drive traffic to the video. You can also create a YouTube playlist. So playlists tend to rank high in YouTube searches. So if you find yourself doing a lot of videos, well, go ahead and you know go to your channel and simply in your channel you can go ahead and create playlists so when you create playlists basically what you're doing is you're organizing the content into different playlists no different than say the music you have set up on your you know your iPhone or iPod or or iPod whatever it is you're using so you're just creating different videos in a particular category and it YouTube likes it it's organized it's gonna help you get your videos found quicker and easier on YouTube itself by putting your videos in a playlist. So here you could see we have entire playlist on machine learning, trending technologies, cloud computing, big data, digital marketing, project management, so a lot of different playlists. Very organized. If somebody goes to the channel, they're going to be able to go to the playlist that's interesting to them and see all the videos there. So it allows not only the end user to find what they're looking for, but it's good for YouTube because YouTube likes those playlists. So we want to engage our audience by posting your video link on a community page. So you can do that within YouTube and you can prefer to link your YouTube channel in your email. So you can also do that. So for example, if I go back to YouTube and I'm looking at a, a YouTube video, you know, I can always click share 
So here I'm gonna get a particular URL that's associated with the video and I can just embed that. So I can embed the whole thing in my email. I can embed it on a web page or a blog post. So just by clicking share, I can also immediately share it onto the social media platforms that we mentioned, Facebook, LinkedIn, Reddit, okay, Tumblr. So there's a lot of ways to embed the video, not just on a blog post or influencer blog post, but in our email and on social media as well. So here's an example of what we can do with a YouTube discussion. So we can also bookmark the video on a popular bookmarking site, you know, like stumbled upon or Reddit or, you know, there's lots of other ones out there. So there's plenty of sites that you'll be able to go to and bookmark that content so that people can find it. And you can always opt for backlinks. So that means that, hey, if there's a blogger out there that blogs about machine learning, you can always you know, ask that blogger to create a link back to the video and you could reciprocate, do the same thing. So that helps increase the authority of the video. So there's a lot of things you could do to promote your video. So let's do a, a quick review on everything we talked about in terms of ranking your video on YouTube. It all starts with the keywords. So we wanna identify a list of keywords that are relevant to the video. So we can use tools to choose our keywords, but remember, we wanna choose keywords that have high volume and low competition. And so where can we go to choose those keywords? Well, we can use the autocomplete, on YouTube, we could check out our own competitors' videos, or you know, we could use vidIQ or TubeBuddy or any of these extensions in Chrome to help us look at the keywords that are tagged with a particular video. So remember, we wanna have a primary keyword that's aligned with the content, then we wanna choose LSI keywords as our secondary keyword, or keywords that are related to the primary keyword. So we wanna create high retention videos, meaning that first 15 seconds of the most important, but throughout the video, we wanna use examples. We wanna keep it interacting by adding quizzes, imagery, good audio, good video quality. So we wanna focus on the user experience. And we also wanna optimize our video content. What does that mean? Well, those keywords that we chose, we wanna use them in the title. We wanna use them in the description. We wanna use them as hashtags. We wanna use them and tag them with the video themselves. So we can add keywords to our meta tag. Okay, we don't wanna overdo it, but we wanna add a handful of keywords that is, are associated with the video. So we wanna be able to write eye-catchy video titles and descriptions. So remember, use some of those key phrases like a number, or a question like what is machine learning? So we wanna use relevant meta tags for the videos and we wanna use popular YouTube tags. So we wanna be able to tag our videos appropriately. So watch the length of your meta tags. So there are lengths involved. Remember keywords at the beginning of the title, target keywords in the title description and tags. We wanna use interesting thumbnails to increase our click-through rate, ensure that thumbnails are relevant, meaning when I say thumbnails, I mean the actual title tag itself or the meta description. We want to use high-res videos. We wanna create you know, videos with good, high audio quality. Don't be afraid to put in video effects, like some animation. Don't be afraid to use examples. And then, you know, obviously look at the draft of the video before you publish it. So does your video follow an outline? Is it organized? So these are all the things to take into account. And there's there's plenty more you can do. You know, you remember, once you create and optimize that video, you wanna promote it. You wanna make sure that you're sharing it on social media, you create a complimentary blog, you know, generate backlinks from say other blog posts, so there are lots of things you can do to promote your video. So before you promote it, you wanna organize the content, create good quality content, align it with keywords. Once you publish it, you know, keep organizing it by creating those playlists and then reach out on social, reach out on different communities related to the topic. And all those things combined will help you to get your YouTube video ranked. So again, some key takeaways here, use the keyword research available to you on YouTube. You wanna basically you know, watch your descriptions. You wanna be able to align your keywords with your title and meta tag description. You wanna be able to promote your content on social media. 
on social bookmarking though. And I can't stress enough, create high quality video. First 15 seconds are important, but you're gonna know if you have good quality video because every video has analytics associated with it. So we wanna keep in mind the engagement. So just by looking at the video itself, so here I can see this blockchain in seven minutes. It was just posted just yesterday, the 27th. So basically already 42 likes, 33 comments, 378 views. So these are all engagement related metrics. So you'll be able to just look at the front of any video and see how well it's performing from an engagement standpoint. So the better the engagement, the better you of a chance you have to rank. Now, when we're talking about the trends, there are significant shifts happening in organic search. The first of which is machine learning. Uh, that is more artificial intelligence analyzing search queries and developing new algorithms within the machine learning to serve up results, determine intent, which is the primary goal of machine learning, and to return not only the results, but the information you need, as well as predicting information you might need in the near future. Uh, the second is voice search. More and more voice assistants are becoming popular through your smartphone, through your laptop, through home assistants, and people are asking for information, and so it is completely happening at an auditory level, not in visual level. And so how that is happening and how that affects SEO reporting is really going to be a factor moving forward. And then also, as I'm sure if you've been doing any search engine optimization for any length of time, you are familiar with the struggle uh, that has happened ever since Google decided to strip keyword data out of any analytics reporting. Uh, that took away really the number one way that you were able to measure the effectiveness of gaining keywords in the search engines. Now to hit each one of these, just to explain them a little bit more so that you know exactly what's happening and what it looks like as it affects your current level of SEO work as well as reporting. Uh, as an example of machine learning, uh, if you go into Google AdWords right now and you were to set up a campaign looking at maybe like auto body or auto work or something like that, if you typed in a few keywords into Google, what's happening is Google is only reporting one phrase that might cover two or three or four phrases based on, for example, auto body being, is it one word or is it two words? Google here is providing it as two words. So even if I type in auto body as a single word, this is where the machine learning is coming in, realizing that these are the same queries. And so rather than treat them as individual queries, what is happening is through machine learning is they are trying to figure out what is the intent of the search and then grouping the intent into single categories or single searches and then all the variations would be included in that. Now if I do keyword research at a third party such as word tracker or something like that, now what I'm going to find are multiple different ways that people search. Uh, they're going to put in locations, they're going to put in details, they're going to you know use one word, two words and so in a third party keyword research format we're going to see a lot more variations because those are tracking what people are actually typing in. What Google is doing from the machine learning standpoint is condensing everything and trying to group it into, as I said, similar forms of intent. Now, what's happening here? It means that phrases or words that are plurals, acronyms, typical variants, uh, such as words that may mean the same thing, uh, but then they're different words, so they're going to group them together. Uh, and then also, as you saw there, words with spaces or without spaces, uh, conjunction words, as, as well as hyphens and apostrophes. A lot of these are going to fall out of what you're able to bid on, uh, also in the paid search side, and it will all go into a particular group of words 
under a primary heading. So that's where voice search is taking us, is really a, a condensing of the language into intent, what are people searching for, and how do we give that their in, how do we give their information back to them? Now, obviously, this isn't perfect. Uh, I've worked with a number of clients where they may offer a service, and because of that service, Google is trying to then associate them with another service, uh, and it's not relevant. And so, because of that machine learning, sometimes uh, what we're seeing is a difficulty in trying to get unique businesses, new ideas, or something that just isn't a part of that overall big picture. Uh, they're trying to force it into neat little boxes, but as we know, business is not full of neat little boxes. Uh, it's messy, it's fuzzy, it, it's, it, it's all kinds of different types of businesses, suppliers, industries that are going to have some level of uniqueness about them. So hopefully this can continue to improve, uh, but it does at this point still need some human intervention. The second aspect is voice search, and maybe some of you have uh, maybe the Google Home or the Alexa appliance in your home, and you've been playing around with it and seeing what it can do, uh, but also everyone's phone. Uh, and then also Cortana is on uh, any Microsoft operating system desktop. And so being able to search from your phone simply by a voice command. Uh, now, this is affecting our ability to report because this does not show up uh, as a search. Now, if you're using Google now and you are searching on Google or a Google app, it will show up as a search referral. However, if you're using Cortana, if you're using uh, Siri, it's going to use the search engine of the operating system. And so in that case, and I'm gonna address this a little bit later, it shows up as a direct visit rather than uh, a search initiated visit. And so this is affecting the reporting of SEO metrics, uh, but at the same time, it is also changing the search landscape entirely. Uh, right now, uh, Amazon is probably Google's biggest competitor. Uh, for most searches, especially for electronics, uh, especially for uh, what you would consider things for home uh, and garden, uh, Amazon right now has taken about 40% of the market share away from Google in terms of electronics and uh, home products uh, because people are going to Amazon first and they're using Alexa to do this. Uh, so how voice search, it really is going to be uh, a volatile industry to follow over the next five years. And then, as I mentioned before, probably the biggest frustration of anyone doing search engine optimization or wanting to measure the effectiveness of optimization or where they stand in the marketplace is the keyword not provided. Uh, now, there's a number of reasons why Google has gone about this. The first reason that they gave was for privacy reasons, uh, that they wanted people's searches to be private. But at the same time, uh, if you are doing paid search, you have full access to keywords. Uh, and also, if you are advertising through Google, you can target people based on their search terms. So we know the privacy thing uh, was really kind of a smokescreen. I think what's going on here is that this was really the first step to getting people away from thinking of individual keywords or key phrases and focusing on one or two phrases that, they're, that would describe their business. By taking away the vast majority of keywords that you're gonna see in your analytics, it will force you to look at other words. It will force you to think bigger picture rather than those one or two words that most people believe, that's what my business needs, this is where I'm gonna focus my attention. And in, in, so in some ways this has been good by making people, forcing people to think beyond a single word or a single phrase about their business and looking into the bigger picture. This also plays into the machine learning because as I showed you before, machine learning is condensing all of these keyword phrases, trying to determine intent. 
And what better way to really assist that than to start taking away keyword data in the search engines. However, when you take that away, you have then taken away the number one reporting factor uh, of SEO, and that is what keywords am I ranking for? What keywords are bringing in not only visitors, but business? And so by taking away the number one factor, we're forced to look at a number of different methods that we can use then to develop better campaign metrics. Now, one of the first things about uh, metrics is the expectations. Whenever I work with a company, I want to know specifically, what are your expectations for the campaign? What are you trying to get out of it? What do you expect? Uh, I'll, I'll never forget, I was uh, consulting with an agency about how they are developing their SEO campaigns and how they were reporting them to their clients. Uh, and I went with them oops, to one of their client meetings. And uh, after some of the agency people left, um, I asked if I could talk with the client for a bit after the meeting. And, because the main reason was on this whiteboard in the corner of their office, uh, they had visits this month and visits last month. And the client asked me about the agency, um, you know, what I was doing for them and what they what the agency was trying to do uh, and then they said that they had concerns and the reason why they had concerns is that the visits last month uh, were higher than the visits this month and that over the past few months the number of visits had been going down and because of that they were having a lack of confidence in their agency now this was really kind of surprising because this goes right to the heart of client expectations. Uh, now, what I had asked that client then after that, you know, towards the end of the conversation is, how how is your business? How are leads? How are your key performance indicators? How are the conversions on the site? Basically asking them, how's business? Uh, and the response to that was, well, business is great. Business has been improving over the past few months. However, the primary metrics they were looking at was visits rather than the business-oriented metrics. And so this is where establishing expectations of what campaign metrics we're going to follow and what those campaign metrics mean to a business. This is a conversation that must take place rather than just reporting basic information, the same charts and graphs every month or every quarter that really might not communicate the information that everyone needs. And so a conversation between agencies and clients about what are the expectations of this SEO campaign? What do we want out of that and what constitutes success? That conversation needs to take place and then that will determine how the campaign metrics are then developed and presented and the discussion that will happen around them. Now, one thing that I think has been, uh, you know, I would say both a struggle as well as what needs to happen. The, the first thing about SEO metrics is the myth of the number one ranking. Once in a while, I'll still run into this where someone will hinge the entire success of a campaign by seeing the number one ranking. They want a single word or a two word phrase to rank number one in Google and that is their only standard of success. Uh, unfortunately, I, you know, anymore I will not even work with that kind of a client because it's an unrealistic expectation and it also shows a complete ignorance of how search works and what it, the power of what it can bring to your business. That this is much bigger than a number one ranking, and if that's all you want, then give me a budget and we'll pay for it. Uh, but I would say for the most part, we've moved beyond a number one ranking. Uh, and now what we have to educate people on is that rankings are really a personal metric that you, the rankings you see are probably going to be slightly different 
than everybody else. And I'm going to walk through why that happens. And so you can help educate people within your own organization uh, of why ranking is a personal metric now rather than a universal metric. And then, of course, as I mentioned before, it's all in the expectations. Campaign metrics need to focus on the business objectives, not just on the external factors of rankings and, and somewhat invisibility. Uh, we want to look at the visibility of a company, but ultimately what we need to look at is how is your search campaign delivering on your business objectives? Because that's the point of it all, is what are we, what are we trying to accomplish and how is it being accomplished? See, it's when I see charts like this that still make me a little queasy and still make me roll my eyes. This was done uh, about two years ago asking people, what are you measuring? And uh, unfortunately, there hasn't been much change since this initial survey that the vast majority of people are measuring the number of visits to the website. Uh, and then they're measuring social sharing, time on site, and less than half are still measuring SEO rankings. Um, now that still boggles my mind because that's what I'm going to walk through here is why we can't measure SEO rankings. It is a completely undependable metric. And so what, what really surprises me, shocks me, is that 35% of people are measuring subscriber growth and 27% a little more than a fourth of businesses surveyed here are measuring sales leads. This is what is so shocking and surprising, especially when we come to campaign metrics and expectations of a client. And that is, what are the business objectives? What is it that you want to grow? Because the last column here, sales leads, is what makes business grow. That is a direct contributor to revenue and subscriber growth well that builds my list and marketing to my list is a direct contributor to revenue and so as I said this is just so mind-boggling because the two things that directly contribute that have a direct impact on revenue are the least measured in this survey the four things that have an indirect impact uh, meaning that you can have, is, as I mentioned before, an incredible number of website visits, but absolutely no revenue coming in as a result of that. These are all key performance indicators, visits, sharing, time on site. Those are key performance indicators. They're not business objectives. And so part of the expectations of developing campaign metrics is understanding the difference between a key performance indicator and a business objective. Because it's easy to get sidetracked, especially with search metrics, especially with these types of things of you know visits, time on site, uh, page views, rankings, but they're all indirect, which is why they are under the key performance indicator uh, grouping, whereas we want to look at the business objectives of subscribers sales leads, downloads, getting information into people's hands, engaging with them and moving along the customer journey. When we can develop metrics that focus on the experience of a prospect or a customer, then and tie that to our SEO performance, now we're developing how our campaign will directly impact the business and the customer. Now, I want to just go off to the side for a little bit here and talk about rankings. And this is the whole concept of rankings are personal, not universal. Now, you'll notice on this, this is, the, this is a, uh, a rankings report from 2008 and compared to 2006. I had to go back really far to find this screenshot. And this is of, uh, if you were doing a search for the keyword latest news, this would show you who ranked number one uh, and the change in the rankings over the past two years. And it also, we're looking at it in Google and MSN. For some of you, this may look really familiar. 
because what this did is you put in the domains that you are tracking, the keywords, and you would get a report about who ranks where for what keyword. Now, this is back in the day, and even around 2008, uh, we were still seeing some, or we were starting to see fluctuations in rankings based on where you are searching from, as well as some history coming in, but we weren't seeing it to the extent that we see it today. You see, now today, your rankings that you see are largely based on your search history. It's based on past searches. It's based on content preferences, uh, what types of content you tend to search on, click on, or visit, uh, what business or industry you tend to uh, search on as well as any behaviors such as your uh, predilection to click on ads, paid ads, display ads, or anything like that. And, and so what's happening here is this has been actually going on for the past 10 years, is that more and more of your rankings are going to be personalized to your unique history and the words, the sites that you visit, the words you use, uh, the types of queries that you make, all of this is being developed in order to provide you the most relevant personal results. Ultimately, it's also being done in order to focus the paid search ads specifically to you and your behavior and the industry that you're in because that's how the search engines monetize. So the better they understand you and what you're looking for, and again, it all comes down to intent. If they can figure out your intent and provide you results that are relevant, both paid and organic, then that's the goal. That's what they're trying to do. And so simply based on your history, we're seeing that rankings are going to vary from person to person and maybe even from computer to computer to smartphone, depending upon how you use them. The second thing is regional results. Uh, if you search for specific things in one region, it's going to show up differently in other regions. If I search for right now, if I go to Google and type in Ford dealership, I'm going to see the one that's near me. And I'm not going to see one that's out in a, another state or another region because based on the localization that search engines are providing, it's going to look at that query as a localized result and serve it to me specifically. So based on location, now sometimes we will see things, brands are more global. However, if I'm looking for something that is specific to my region, uh, that can be based on my IP address, my country, my city, my state, even into a zip code. Uh, local results, targeted results can be limited to a small area to only show to people who are within that area or searching in that area. And so more and more based on localization, we're seeing that affect the results. And that has been uh, highly impactful, especially over the past two to three years as local search has just gotten miles better uh, in all of the search engines. And it's only going to increase as well. Uh, but then also based on the different types of media, based on language, based on the type of search, uh, the intent of search or what words you might use, uh, as well as here we have the machine learning come in. Uh, what you'll notice here is simply if I do a search for something in Spanish as compared to English, I get different results. I get a completely different results page. Uh, there's more videos on the Spanish results uh, from the Spanish search than the English. Uh, also, the makeup of the page is completely different. So the words you use, how you structure the query, the language, those are all going to affect the type of results that you see. Uh, and then also, what you can see here is that the organic results, you know, we're seeing videos uh, taking over results, how-tos, uh, actual, uh, you know, multiple things happening in the search engine results page. And so it's no longer just a list of 10 links and running a ranking report to see where you rank. 
because what's happening here is we're seeing multiple videos being served prior to even seeing any what you would call a traditional link uh, or traditional website snippet here showing up in the search engine results page. So as you can see, all of these things are just completely transforming a individual's rankings. And so if you are to measure rankings, what you're measuring is unreality. Uh, you're, you're measuring something that doesn't exist. Uh, and, and as I like to say, it, it's, a, it's extinct before it's even run uh, because no person will ever see a ranking report. They will see that reflected in their results. It's going to be personalized and unique. Something also to throw into the mix that even based on your device, you are going to see different results. Primary reason is because if you're using a smartphone, it knows your location. And so you're going to have location results mixed in. Also, based on contracts with different search providers, uh, with different, uh, you know, licensing from Google, licensing from YouTube, uh, the results will be different based on the phone you use, based on the provider that you have, uh, and based on uh, simply just being mobile as opposed to desktop. So results are different based on the device. Uh, so hopefully, if anyone uh, was hoping to run a simple ranking report as an SEO campaign metric, uh, just this little sidelight here has shown it's really a, a non-starter anymore. The traditional ranking report is extinct, and we have to move beyond that. So how do we move beyond that? Because there's also, now that I just shared the, the difficulties of a traditional ranking report, we also have a couple other obstacles thrown at us that are specifically uh, both from a search engine standpoint and from a user standpoint. The first obstacle that we're running into is from a search engine standpoint. And this is what Google is doing. If I do a search for top car reviews in 2017, at the very top of the results, I get a snippet of information uh, pooled from consumer reports. Now, what's happening here, and you may have seen this as well, if you type a question or something like that, that Google is not only displaying websites, but they're displaying the answers. And they are pooling the content from these websites. Now, when they do that, that does not show up as a visit, and it doesn't show up as a ranking to Consumer Reports. Consumer Reports has no method of tracking this visibility, and it's incredible visibility. So at one point, Google is providing information to the searcher, but the owner of this result is having its content displayed by Google without any knowledge that it's happening unless someone has gotten in in order to see that. So this is a significant amount of visibility that right now goes unreported because there's no way to integrate this into any metric calculation uh, other than a visual inspection to see what's happening with this. We're going to see more and more of this. Uh, Google is presenting more and more answers through the search engine results page rather than just the website. The main reason is Google has seen the more they do this, the more they deliver the answer in the search engine results page rather than having people click through to go to a website, they find that people are more likely to come back and use Google again. And what's happening here is that Google essentially is eliminating the click-through. They're trying to keep people on the search engine results page as long as possible. Think about some of the searches you've done recently. If you search for weather information, if you search for flight information, if you search for sports scores on Google, uh, those types of things, you're going to get your answer in the search results page. You don't even have to click anywhere else to get the information. It's right there. This is going to not only grow under Google, but this is really the big question mark as to 
what is the whole purpose of Google and what are they doing and how does it benefit me as a website being in these results when I can't track this and when Google is trying to keep people on their site, on their property as long as possible. This is the big question mark moving forward for SEO metrics. The other side of this is from a consumer standpoint and this is what we call dark search. Dark search are searches that originate from a non-traditional search engine. For example, if you do a search from your computer, for example, Cortana, uh, or if you do a search from uh, your operating system. In, uh, in Apple, you can do a search uh, almost on the, uh, the desktop through the spotlight search, and it will bring up search results. If you go through that, uh, it's using basically the search engine capability built into the operating system, but it doesn't get reported as a search engine referral. Instead, what's happening is it's sending you to that site as a direct traffic. So anything that's from an operating system, uh, a search that comes through an app. Now, if you're using the Google app, this is kind of a, kind of a, a gray area, um, but it, it, it does happen. Uh, so you basically have to install the Google search app or use something in the browser. Uh, but if you're in an app with a search function and that app is not a search engine app, it will show up as direct traffic. Uh, your voice-based searches, that's using the operating system. Uh, now you can use a voice-based search in the Google search app and that will show up as a search referral. I know this might get a little confusing, uh, but this also is, you know, this is sort of the dark search of what's going on. Uh, and then also Amazon, like I said, is stealing a lot of business away from Google, uh, but there's no way to really know what your Amazon ranking is for a specific product or query. Uh, so in that way, you're kind of losing some of whatever Amazon is taking, we're also losing some of that data. So those are some of the obstacles that we're running into in terms of getting a big picture of campaign metrics. So like I said, we need to start with a business goal. When we start developing campaign metrics, this is where the expectations need to be very, very clear. Uh, and I kind of like the acronym of CLEAR here, that we need to clearly state what is the business purpose? What are we trying to ultimately accomplish? And how will search help to accomplish that? Based on that, we create a set of goals. We lay out the goals of the campaign. What do we want people to do? And then carry that over into how does that accomplish the purpose? We then explain how and define success. Explain how success is accomplished. As people meet those goals, how does that fit into the customer journey? Where is that in the customer journey? How does it move them from one stage to the next? How do we measure that? And how do we define that as success? Then we align metrics to that strategy. We don't just start with the metrics. We start with the purpose, the goal, defining success, and then aligning metrics as we have our strategy. And then the final stage is the ideal customer experience. How do we relate that through these metrics? How do we explain that our customer has seen this and then they did this, or they looked for this information and it was a successful visit? Now what will they need? This is where we look at the overall customer journey and how search is a part of that journey. Now, getting into some very specific metrics that will assist this. One of the things that I like to look at, and this can be a part of the reporting, if I'm looking at just the cold hard facts of, of SEO campaign metrics, one of the first things I'm going to look at is that audience overview, and I'm going to look specifically at my organic traffic. Now, one of the things I need to caution is making sure, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm surprised I still have to say this, is comparing like timeframes. You can compare year over year, 
if you're comparing the entire year, quarter to quarter. Example is I'm looking at first quarter 2017 compared to first quarter 2016. I want to compare like time frames. I am amazed at how many businesses still look at month to month to month to month. And there is such a drastic difference between month to month. Uh, you have to compare this quarter to the same quarter last year. This month, this year, to last, you have to compare the like time frames. Going month to month is, is, a, is chasing your tail. So from here, I wanna specifically just look at my organic coverage. At this point, what I'm looking at here is with the audience overview, I'm looking at my total number of sessions this year compared to last year. And I can see that it's higher. Uh, and in some areas, I've seen some dips, uh, but then when I want to go look at specifically in Google, this year or this first quarter compared to first quarter last year, where am I at in terms of sessions, new users, bounce rate, conversion rate, and transactions? That's what's going to help me as far as getting the first step in my SEO metrics. The next is looking at total organic visits. This is anything that comes through search. Now, again, this is part of the conversation. This is everything we can track uh, because there are things that are completely outside of this. Uh, this might be a good time to say this. I was talking to an analytics provider a couple of years ago and in comparing different analytics systems, and I asked them, what makes your analytics more accurate than your competitors? It was very interesting because this is the lead engineer, and he sort of shushed me. This was on the trade show floor. And he says, in analytics, we don't talk about accuracy. He says, what I like to say is that our analytics are less inaccurate than our, than our competitors. And that is really the case when it comes to analytics. If you've ever compared analytics from two different systems and looking at the same metrics, they never agree. I'm always amazed at how many people try to make their Google Analytics line up with their Omniture Analytics, and it will never happen. Or they'll look at multiple different packages, or they'll tell me my agency is reporting these numbers, but these numbers are what I'm seeing, and they're using two different systems. That's because analytics, it's tracking what it can track and what is unclear, an algorithm tries to organize it. Or an algorithm tries to assign things that are unclear to different areas. So each analytics program kind of has its own methodology of organizing the information and interpreting it. Based on that, that's where you come up with the we're less inaccurate than our competitors. So when we're measuring organic coverage, we're measuring what we can based on this system. It may not agree with another system. Uh, don't try to make it agree because it just simply won't. Now, here I'm looking at my total organic search visits, and I can see compared to the, the year prior, this quarter is up 18% in visits. I can look at total conversions, and I can see that it's up 30%. Uh, and then also what I want to do is look at landing pages and my keyword concepts. Now, this is a sense because the search engines don't provide us any keyword data, what we can do is look at our landing pages and the amount of visits those landing pages are generating then it doesn't take much to kind of look at those landing pages and see what what are they basically about what are those keyword concepts now you can go to uh, google search console you can go to bing webmaster tools and you can see which keywords uh, are driving traffic to your business through those webmaster portals and you can get the concept of what keywords uh, are driving traffic now one thing I do like about Bing webmaster tools is that Bing webmaster tools will not only show me which keywords I'm ranking for and which ones are sending traffic to my website but they will also show me which pages 
are the recipients of those keywords. So they are able to tie together the keywords and the landing pages. And so I'll do that in Bing. Uh, and, and also Google Search Console will do that to an extent. Uh, but to some degree, this is still a manual process of looking at my landing pages and comparing them to the keyword concepts. As I said, Google's trying to push everything together into intent. And so evaluate your landing pages in terms of intent. What would someone be searching on in order to get to this page and utilize Google Search Console and Bing Webmaster Tools, maybe some of your analytics in order to figure that out. Also, what I like to look at are comparative metrics. Uh, when I'm looking at the success of an SEO campaign as tied to other types of campaigns, I also want to show the value of search engine optimization and what it's providing. And so in looking at a source medium, I'm using Google Analytics here, uh, what I can do here is for this time frame, look at the overall numbers of sessions generated through each channel. As you can see there, Google on its own is about 67% of all visits. Yahoo is providing about 1.28% uh, of visits. Uh, and then we can see uh, a little less than 20% are direct visits. So comparatively, I can see where my search engine optimization is contributing in comparison to all the other channels. And I can get a sense there in terms of, I can run a revenue report by source, uh, where I can see where my search is responsible for the greatest amount of revenue, for the greatest amount of orders. Uh, and also, when I look at uh, one interesting thing here, I can also do a value per session breakdown. And what this shows me is, uh, the email campaigns, those by far have the highest value per session. Visitors coming through the blog uh, are next in value per session. Uh, and then we can see our search visitors showing up there as a significantly high value per session. Um, and one thing that might uh, jump out to you there is you can see that Bing has a four pound 27 value per session compared to Google with a one pound 77. That's normal. I, over the past 15 years, it has been a really interesting phenomenon that visitors from Bing or MSN have a higher value, even though I will get uh, just sheer numbers and higher revenue from Google, uh, but they are a higher value visitor uh, than Google visitors. Uh, that's just a phenomenon that uh, we've just observed for more than about 15 years and really kind of interesting there. Uh, so from a, a metric standpoint, I like doing comparative metrics to see here's how search compares to your other channels. Here's what it's driving compared to your other channels in terms of visitors, in terms of engagement, in terms of revenue and revenue per user. Uh, and again, I, I kind of mentioned this associative metrics using Google Search Console. Uh, to see some of the keywords that Google is driving. Uh, Google My Business, I'm gonna show that uh, as we get into here before we wrap up. Bing Webmaster Tools, as I said, they will show you the keywords as well as the associated landing pages. Analytics, uh, getting into analytics and looking at your organic traffic, I showed you a few reports there, uh, but that is where people need to live in order to understand what's going on with their search traffic. And more and more, um, alongside analytics, I'm seeing a CRM integration with analytics really becoming a, a different standard because within the CRM integration, I can then look at the entire customer journey. I can track the initial touch point of a consumer. I can then see how that spreads into different searches. So maybe they'll find me first from a paid ad, but then how does, a subsequent organic searches contribute to different touch points. And then maybe there is a retargeting touch point. Uh, and so I really like what I'm seeing with modern CRM systems in tracking more of the customer journey and how search is a part of it. And that really then gets to the point of looking at that customer journey, that ideal customer experience, 
and it immediately puts it in the context of the purpose of the campaign uh, and the goals of the campaign focused around the user experience. When I'm talking with a client, laying out expectations, really my first question is what makes you money? Because that's what we want to track. There's our purpose. We want to look at sales and leads. And so I want to look at these prioritized outcomes. This gets back to what is the purpose of the overall campaign? Then we need to look at what are performance goals. Now, not all of these goals carry the same amount of weight. What I mean by that are inquiries, support, uh, people viewing videos, online chat, subscribes, downloads. Those are all a different level of engagement than a typical like or retweet or a pin. Um, that's what I call, you know, it, it. these are much more active if someone makes an inquiry. That's a lead. If they contact support. If they're viewing videos about new cars, that's a performance goal. That means I'm engaging somebody and I'm answering their questions. Uh, we can look at people subscribing and asking for more information, downloading brochures, downloading information. This is where we'll attach different value to different actions because some actions will contribute much more in terms of value in the customer experience than others. And so we want to look at the performance goals and establish a level of value around them. And then explain clearly the difference between a performance goal and a performance indicator. Performance indicators, visibility, visits, time on site, pages viewed, bounce rate, these are all good performance indicators, but they are removed from a direct impact on the business goals. It's an indirect factor. In fact, they can even be misleading if that's what you're using because you could see that business goals are excelling while these numbers might go down, or they might go up and business goals go down because it's what are you doing with the information and how are you focusing your efforts. I want to focus uh, real quickly before I wrap up here on uh, Google My Business. And this is something that uh, Google has done more and more of. I'm using actually a local landscaper that I've been helping out simply because I love the numbers that are showing up on this. Um, and it's really cool because you just put your business in and then you set the service area. So it can be a zip code, it can be a radius, uh, and then you can view the insights. This is just on the left side is the login panel and it will show you how many searches your business has shown up for in the past month. As we can see here, we're over, we're almost at about six and a half thousand searches where people searched for uh, their business. We, we can see about 8.3 thousand views of their local listing and about uh, 16,000 actions. Uh, so we can see here, this, now, this probably right here is probably going to be, I think, the future of SEO metrics. The main reason is, this is what happens when you do a search for a local business and the business box shows up in the results. And that business box has a picture of the business, a description, hours, uh, pictures, and phone number. And what can happen here, just like with the information where Google is showing all the information and you don't even have to click through it, this is tracking that type of visibility. This is showing you how many times simply your business information showed in the search results. And so now from here, we can look specifically on uh, what customers, how they viewed your business. And we can see how many times the business showed up in search and how many times it showed up on maps in the top graph. In the lower graph, and this is where I think this is, I, I think this where reporting is really going to be moving, is from that business box in the search results, we're now showing in the past month how many total actions people have taken. And that is how many people visited the website from the, the in bo information box, how many people requested directions, and how many people called from that business listing. And the far right graph shows you how many people 
Uh, the dark green, so maybe a, a little over a fourth of people were looking for the specific business name. A little more than, or a little less than three quarters of people were looking for related keywords. And because of that, saw the business information. So from a visibility metric standpoint within Google search results, I love what Google My Business is doing because it's providing me a view of how many people are seeing my listing without even clicking on it. But then because of the interactions available through smartphone searches, local searches, uh, map-based searches, I can track a lot of this local activity and how people are then integrating uh, or engaging with my local search result on google.com. Uh, so reporting has changed and it will continue to do so. That is the only, uh, that is the only hard and fast rule here. Uh, and so metrics need to focus on uh, emphasizing conversion rates, optimizing landing pages, and it requires analytics expertise much more than ever. And ultimately, what we want to get to is a measurement of the user experience. Like I said, that big picture of the user experience, did they find what they wanted? Uh, doing task-based user testing where they have to find a specific bit of information uh, from the search to the site. Uh, and from that, you can gather an understanding of how quickly they're able to find it, how they can navigate there, both in a desktop and a mobile. Um, and this gets to the, the micro moment assessment. When people are searching for things such as, can I afford it? Uh, show me the new cars. Uh, where can I get financed? Those types of micro moment questions that people type into the search box or speak into their phone. Okay, and we're gonna start out with how to set up a Google Analytics account. And so we're gonna talk about everything that entails, including creating your Google Analytics account. We're gonna talk about setting up a property in your account and what a property is. We're gonna talk about setting up a reporting view in your property. And we're gonna talk about installing the tracking code. So those are the series of steps we're gonna go through today in terms of setting up a Google Analytics account. So let's get right to it. And so really the Bruin prerequisite here when it comes to setting up a Google Analytics account is to have a Google login and ID. So when you actually go to Google Analytics, you need to be able to sign up or sign in. And so once you actually sign in, then you're gonna go walk through a series of steps. But really, that's really all you need to get the account going is a Google ID and login. So if you have a Gmail account or an other email account that you use for other Google products, then you're good to go. That's all you need to do. So when you actually go to sign up for Google Analytics, you're gonna be asked to set up a new account. And these are the series of steps you're gonna walk through or go through to set up a new Google Analytics account. So you're gonna choose an account name and then you're gonna choose a property name. Okay, so the account name can be anything you want it to be, the name of your company, your name, whatever you wanna name it. The property name is really the website name. So what website are we talking about? So here I'm gonna set up a fictitious website name for now. It's called Demo Simply Learn. So the URL for this website, Demo Simply Learn, is gonna be demo.simplylearn.com. So that's the property. When we talk about properties in analytics, we're really talking about what websites we wanna measure. And then you're gonna be asked to choose an industry category. And so for Simply Learn, we're in jobs and education. But you have a number of different industries that you could choose from. This is important, go ahead and choose the most most relevant industry that your particular business is associated with. Okay, and I'm gonna talk about why that's important here in a minute. And then you're gonna choose your time zone, and the time zone's also important because 
that's when the day starts in analytics and the day ends based on that time zone. So the data that Google Analytics collects starts and ends with that time zone. So very important to choose the time zone your business is located in. Okay, and then you have some additional options here. Okay, so you have some settings. And so the first setting is to allow Google products and services. So if you opt into this, then basically what Google's going to do is share some products and services with you via email. I would go ahead and opt into that. That's of course recommended by Google. It doesn't hurt to hear from Google on related products and services that may enhance your business. The second is benchmarking. So benchmarking to me is something you should opt into. So going back to that industry and category, we chose jobs and education. So by opting into benchmarking, basically what Google is going to do is share your data that it collects on your website. In this case, demo.simplylearn.com. It's going to share that data anonymously with others in the industry in this case jobs and education and because you've opted in it's going to do the same exact thing for you it's going to share anonymous data on other websites in the same industry and the benefit of that is we get to see what other websites or how other websites are performing compared to ours what's the benchmark in our industry and so the benchmarking to me is important and I'm gonna go over that in a few minutes when we go over the different reports but to me I would always opt into benchmarking because this is the only report Google provides in analytics about how others in your industry is performing versus your website okay so it's a way to compare your website performance against others in the same industry the other options here technical support and account specialist I would also recommend you opt into those because then it allows you to basically Google allow Google access to your account and they'll be able to help you if you occur or run into any issues so these are the options in setting up a Google Analytics account. It's very simple, very easy to do. You're just entering in a few fields. Note that we talking about a website right now, so I'm talking about demo.simplylearn.com, but just know that if you want to track a mobile app, Google Analytics will allow you to do that as well. You just choose the option mobile app. So we're tracking a website. We want to know how users behave when they get to my website and that's what Google Analytics is going to allow us to measure and look at we just need to do a couple more steps in the process so once we fill out these fields here we're gonna click get tracking ID now I'm going to accept the terms of service I'm going to accept another terms of service in relation to data protection I'm gonna click accept once I accept I'm gonna be able to get some tracking code the tracking ID is the ID associated with your account and so this number is going to be associated with your account so your account ID starts with UA and it's gonna be this number here now the dash one is the property you set up so in this case I set up demo.simplylearn.com if I wanted to track multiple websites under that same account then I can certainly set up multiple properties just know that every property I set up in that account is going to have a dash one dash two dash three dash four etc depending on how many properties I set up so by default I set up one property so my first property ID is dash one if I set up a second property the same account number it's just gonna have a dash two and that's important because that ID that account and property ID is going to be associated with that particular property or website so again once you finish setting up the account settings then you're going to be asked to add some tracking code to your site and that tracking code is going to be related to the account and the property so notice my tracking ID up here notice the tracking ID in the snippet of code now this snippet of code needs to go on every page of your website that you want to track and you don't have to put it on every page but if you want to track website behavior on every page of your website then it needs to go on every page of your website so if you're using a you know platform like 
Drupal or Joomla or even more popular platform like WordPress. Adding the tracking code site-wide is as easy as maybe adding a Google Analytics plugin to WordPress, for example, and then just simply plugging in the ID. Now, there's an alternative to adding the Google Analytics tracking code to your site, and that's Google Tag Manager. So Google Tag Manager is the way I would recommend going. So if you're not familiar with Google Tag Manager, I would recommend watching the YouTube video we have on Google Tag Manager. You can just go to YouTube, type in Simply Learn Google Tag Manager, and this will give you a nice overview of you know, what Google Tag Manager is and how it works. But basically, this is the way I would go, and I would recommend that in addition to having Google Analytics, you set up a Google Tag Manager account. And then that way, you can put the tracking code in Google Tag Manager. So if I go to Google Tag Manager, and I just go into an account on Tag Manager, I can just simply put in the Google Analytics ID right into Tag Manager. And so if I have it in Tag Manager, then Tag Manager is going to be the place that holds the code and fires page view when somebody comes to my website. So that way I don't have to add the tracking code to my website if I do it in Tag Manager. So that's the recommended method for me is to add the Google Analytics ID associated with Tag Manager. If you can associate it with Tag Manager, then that's the easier route to go versus putting code on your website. Okay, so again, take a look at the video we have on YouTube for Google Tag Manager. That's the route I would go. Now, once you do get the tracking code on your website, whether that be through Google Tag Manager or through a plugin or you know just simply adding the script to your site, to pages on your site, then what's gonna happen is you're gonna start collecting data. So that's ideally the way it works. You need to add this code to your website. Now, if you're not ready to do that and you simply want to basically understand how Google Analytics works, then I would recommend getting access to Google Analytics demo account. And so if you just type in and search Google Analytics demo account, Basically, what you're gonna do, you're gonna choose the first listing there and you're gonna go to demo account. So if you have a Google Analytics or Google login, then all you need to do is click on access demo account. And so what Google's gonna do is put this demo account into your account. And so it's gonna look something like this. So if I click on demo account here, it's going to add to my Google Analytics account. So I'm gonna have then access to the demo account from Google in Google Analytics. So I would recommend going this route here if you're not familiar, you're not sure what you're getting yourself into. So think of the demo account as kind of a test drive. You're test driving Google Analytics before you even add any code to your website. So again, all you need is a Google account. And if you have a Google account, and you add the demo account to your Google Analytics account, you're gonna be able to see how analytics works. Okay, and so that's what I would also recommend. So if you're not ready to start adding code to your website, then what you can do is just simply add the demo account. And then once you add the demo account, you're free to peruse around Google Analytics to see the different types of reports it has to offer. Now, when you do actually set up a Google Analytics account, you're gonna have some settings that you're gonna to want to pay attention to. So when you set up the account, you have the account name and then you have a property. So under each property you have by default, you're gonna have one view. And so here you can see this view here. So if we look at the account we set up, we set up a demo simply learn account. Property is demo simply learn. So that's associated with the website we're gonna track. And then again, by default, under each property, you're gonna have a view. And so by default, the name of the view is gonna be called all website data. And so in that view is where all your analytics data is going to be stored. So you can see my screen here. There's a lot of different settings you have. You have settings under the account, you have settings under the property, and you have settings under the view. So we're gonna talk more about these settings in future webinars for advanced Google Analytics users. But for now, know that there's a bunch of settings that you have 
that you can play around with when it comes to Google Analytics. Anything from adding users to your Google Analytics account, your Google Analytics property or view. You can actually set up goals. You can set up filters. You can set up segments. You can link up Google ads. You can, you know, set up remarketing list. There's a lot you can do in terms of the settings as it relates to Google Analytics. But so know those settings are there. They're located right down here in this little sprocket icon. That's the admin icon. So if you need to get to these settings at any time, you could simply just click on the sprocket or the admin icon, and then you'll be prompted to choose any one of these settings here that you want to edit or alter. So now let's take a look at some Google Analytics reports. So once you've actually set up your account, you have a number of different reports that you have available to you in Google Analytics. So we're going to take a look at, you know, customized reports. We're going to look at real time audience reports, acquisition, behavior and conversion. So these are all the different reporting buckets, if you will, that you have available to you in Google Analytics. So if I'm an admin and I'm looking at the Google demo account, Let's start out by looking at real time. So if I click on the real time report and I just click on overview. So basically what this is going to do is show me at this point in time, how many users I actually have active on the website. Okay. So that's why they call it real time reporting because it allows you to see the behavior of users who are currently on your website. And so this is the overview report under real time. And you can see here, I can see that 79% of my users are coming from desktop, 18%, 20% are coming from mobile, and then approximately 3% are coming from tablet. Here I can see how they actually came to the website. So this is the referring source. If they came from say search or social, I can see the source there and I can see what pages they're active on. And then here I can see what locations where they're located. And so if I want to see a breakdown of everything in the overview, I can certainly do that. If I go to locations under real time, I could see a majority of my users are coming from the United States. Okay. Where are they coming from? I'll just click on traffic sources and here. I could see the different sources and mediums. Medium is the means in which the traffic was driven. So if it's Google, it's either paid search or organic search. So I could see here it's organic. Then I can actually see what content they're looking at on my website. So I could see currently I have three active users on the home page, two active users on the Google's women's white tea page, so forth and so on. Now, most importantly, if you have event tracking set up, so if you have taken a look at our Google tag manager webinar, you know that you could set up event tracking in Google Analytics to measure engagement on your website, whether that be a form submission or somebody clicking on the play button of a video. So if I click on events, I'll be able to see what events are firing. So here I can see we have event tracking set up and I can see how many different events are firing on my website in real time. So here I can see e-commerce, somebody clicking on the quick view, click some, a you know, couple of users clicking on add to cart, a couple of users clicking on the promotion click. And as these events are fired, you're going to be able to see them highlighted. So if something gets fired, it's going to get highlighted and I could see that these are the current events that I have currently firing on the website. And that's what's currently fired now. If I want to look at the events that have happened in the last 30 minutes, I could just click on this link here last 30 minutes and it's going to give me an overview of the events that have happened over the past 30 minutes. Okay. So that's event tracking. And then more importantly, we can also look at what conversions are happening in real time just by clicking on conversions. And so now I could see I had one active user who entered the checkout. So that's goal number four. So in analytics, you can have up to 20 goals. And so here I can see we have goal number four has already had one active user. And so if I look at the last 30 minutes, I can see I still have only one goal over the last 30 minutes and that was somebody who entered the checkout. So that's real time reporting. In summary, it just gives you an idea of what's currently happening on your website. 
And so for me, ideally, if I'm launching a campaign or let's just say you do a new website redesign and you want to see how users performing and behaving, then real time is a good option for you. So you could see how things are happening in real time. Now let's jump down to audience reporting. So if I click on audience, which is just right underneath real time, I'm going to see a number of different reports available to me under audience. And so let's click on the audience overview report. So audience reporting basically allows us to get a sense of who is coming to our website. When I say who is coming to our website, it doesn't necessarily have to be a specific person. In fact, Google doesn't allow personally identifiable information in Google Analytics. Personal identifiable information such as a specific name, a social security number, credit card information, etc. However, we could still paint a nice picture on who is coming to our website, meaning what country, city, or state did they come from, what language, what device did they get to our website from, how old were they, okay, were they male or female or other, what interest did they have, what browser did they use. So we can paint a nice picture based on all this information that Google Analytics is providing us under audience. So if I go to audience overview, here I can see I have all these different options available to me to get a basic understanding of who is coming to our website. So for example, I could see a majority of the people coming to our website speak English and are from the United States. Okay, in fact, that represents 61% of the users. And so Google Analytics does a great job of giving me an overall percentage. So if I have 100% of the users, I could see 61% of those users represented English speaking users from the United States. 7% represented English speaking users from Great Britain. And so when it comes to analytics, we have users and users are broken down into two categories. They're either returning or they're new. So when you add the Google Analytics tracking script to your website, what's gonna happen is if a user or when a user goes to your website, they're gonna get cookied. And if it's the first time they've been to your website, what Google Analytics is going to do is store a cookie in the browser. So when that same user comes back another day in the same browser, Analytics is going to recognize that that cookie is in the browser. And so then Analytics is going to categorize that user as a returning user. Okay, so that's how Analytics is able to differentiate new versus returning. So if that user doesn't have a cookie in the browser, then Analytics is going to recognize that, store the cookie, and then count that user as a new user. And so when you're looking in Analytics, you're going to be able to see a breakdown of new versus returning. So here I can see over three quarters of my traffic over the past week, here I can see April 6th through April 12th, three, over three quarters are new users to the website. Here I could see about 23, 24% are returning users. Okay, so I can get a good breakdown of what type of users are coming. Am I driving new traffic? Am I driving traffic that's been to my website before? What language are they speaking? Okay, I can also paint a bigger picture. How old are they? Are they, what gender are they? Do they come from mobile? So let's take a look at some of these different reports under audience. And so if I skip down now to demographics, I can click on overview. And when that report loads, I can see now under demographics overview, I can see the breakout of age ranges. And so here I can see the majority of the traffic coming to my site again over the past week. Now, if I want to change this date range, I could simply do that. I can change the date range just by clicking on the date range and then maybe going, say, the last 30 days. And I can even compare it to the previous period or the previous year. I'm going to choose the last 30 days. I'm going to click apply. Now I'm looking at data over the last 30 days. And again, you can change the date range to any range you want. You can only go back as far as when you actually created the Google Analytics account. You can't go prior to that. So here I'm looking at the last 30 days and I can see almost 47% of my users were in their age range of 25 to 34. Now, when it comes to gender, I can see 66% represent males. 
So I can get a breakout of gender and age as well as interest. I can click on interest and look at the overview there and see what the interest is of the users who are coming to my site based on in-market segments or affinity. I can also choose language and location. So if I wanna know exactly where my users are located when they're coming to my website, I can click on location. And here I can get a breakout 43% of the users of the last 30 days were from the United States. More importantly, I can align my audience with goals. And we'll talk about goals here in a minute, but here I can see if I have an e-commerce website, I can see of those 43%, 0.29% of those converted or purchased something. And that equates to 94 transactions. So I can get a good sense of not only how many users are coming from a specific country, but are those users converting? If I click on mobile, and mobile to me is one of those reports I tend to spend a bit of time on, because I want to know what devices users are coming to my website. And so for my website here, or this is the Google demo website, I can see mobile represents approximately 27% of the traffic. So desktop still represents a majority of the traffic. So for you, you want to keep an eye on mobile because mobile is definitely a majority of what people use nowadays. That's how people start their day. That's how they transact via mobile, whether that's purchasing something, communicating, or searching. It all starts with mobile. So you wanna keep an eye on mobile, and more importantly, you wanna keep an eye on behavior. So Google Analytics is telling me that, yes, I have approximately 27% of my traffic of the last 30 days came from mobile. How are they interacting with my website? So if I look across this report, I'm gonna be able to see different metrics. So if I'm measuring specific metrics against my dimension, in this case, the dimension is what we're measuring. And in this example, we're measuring mobile. I can see that the bounce rate is approximately 48%. And bounce rate means that if a user, in this case from mobile, landed on a page, they left the site without going any further. So they consider it a bounce. If they don't go to another page, if they leave the site from the page they landed on and they don't go any further, that's considered a bounce. So a bounce rate is the percentage of people who come to the site and leave the site without going any further. So in this case, we have 48% bounce rate. That's almost half of our users who come from mobile leave the website from the page they landed on. So is that good? Is that bad? Well, it's open to interpretation. It's definitely subjective, but you want to keep the bounce rate as low as possible. You want to keep people on your site, especially if you have an e-commerce website. You want people who come to your website to purchase. And so here we can see 48% mobile and desktop. It's a little bit lower at 41%. Now, if I look a little bit further at engagement, I can see how many pages on average do mobile users look at. So versus desktop, it's a little bit lower. You can see 3.86 on desktop, it's 4.5. Now, if I look a little bit further in engagement, I wanna be able to measure how long somebody from mobile stays on the website. If they're bouncing at 48%, but they're also looking at 3.8 pages, 3.9, almost four pages per session, then that means in this report, analytics is telling me they're spending about two minutes on the site. And interestingly enough, I can see that mobile over the last 30 days had more transactions. So 51 transactions versus 34 transactions from desktop. And interestingly enough, the e-commerce conversion rate is at 0.29%. That's higher than desktop at 0.07. It's lower than tablet, but it's higher than desktop. And mobile has the most transactions. And since they have the most transactions, they have the most revenue at 2,380. So Yes, the engagement isn't exactly as great as it is as desktop, but we can see that people are still purchasing with their mobile devices. So it's something to keep an eye on, and mobile is something I definitely look at. In fact, since it's such an important report, 
One thing you can do in analytics is if you actually like a report and you think you're going to look at that report multiple times, then you can simply just go ahead and click save at the top here. So if I click save, I'm going to enter a name for this report. I'm just going to call it mobile report and click OK. And then what's going to happen is it's going to be located under save reports and save reports is located under customization. Customization is located above real time. OK, so if I close that up, you can see audience real time customization. If I click on customization, if I click on save reports, I should be able to see my save report here and I do. So here I can see mobile report. If I click on it, I can simply go to the report I was looking at before I saved it. So save reports to me is a good feature in analytics because it allows you to quickly access a report that you've saved in the past. So let's take a look at one more report under audience. And let's go to benchmarking. So remember when we were setting up our analytics account, we had the option to opt into benchmarking and I recommended you do so. And so if you did actually opt into benchmarking, then you're gonna be able to see how your site compares to others in the same industry. So if I click on benchmarking and then click on channels, what I'm actually able to do now is compare my website with others in the same industry. So if I go back to say jobs and education and I choose education, all education as my industry vertical, I should be able to see websites that are in the same particular industry and how I compare with those websites. So I'm choosing all countries. I can narrow that down if I wanted to. I can just search for the United States. I can choose a specific state and then I can choose a particular site size. So here I'm choosing sites by daily session. So these are sites that have an average of 5,000 to almost 10,000 sessions a day. And so in this vertical education in the United States, sites that have 5,000 to 9,999 sessions per day, that means that there are approximately 310 web properties contributing to this report, okay, based on this criteria I chose. Now, if my site is similar, meaning if I'm in the United States, if I'm in education, and I'm receiving 5,000 to 9,999 sessions per day, then I'm able to compare my site against 310 other websites. Now, Google's sharing this data anonymously from the other websites, and they're doing the same with your website to those particular websites, benchmarking reports. Okay, so it's a shared data anonymously in particular industries and verticals. And so now I'm looking at a channel report. So if I want to see how I compare to others in my industry, then I can go ahead and see by channel, for example, am I driving as much traffic as others in my industry? And you can see I'm not. In fact, I'm 76, 77% worse in terms of the amount of traffic being driven from organic search. So anything in red is going to show as a negative result, a negative comparison, whereas something in green is a positive comparison. So if I look at engagement, I can see that I might not be driving as much traffic, but I can see that the pages per session are better than the site average or the industry average. I can see if I go over again, looking just at organic search, I can see the bounce rate is better than the industry average. So the channel report under benchmarking allows you to measure how you compare to others in your industry. And you could do so by looking at location and devices. So if you opted into benchmarking when you set up your account, then you'll be able to compare your website against others in your industry, in your country, region, and based on the size of your website in terms of how many visitors or sessions you're getting per day. So let's go from audience to acquisition. So if audience is who is coming to your website, acquisition allows us to see how the traffic was driven to your website. So how did these users get to our website? And so under acquisition, if we click on overview, we'll be able to see an overview of how users, whether they're returning or new, came to our website. 
And so what analytics does by default is they have a number of default channels. And when we say channels, we mean analytics is grouping different channels based on how users got to your website. Meaning how did users get to our website? Did they come via organic search? Meaning did they type something into Google and find you in the organic listing? Analytics also groups users based on whether they came to your site directly, meaning did they type in the URL directly into the browser or did they bookmark your website and come back via the bookmark? So they're grouping users under direct. They also group users under referral, meaning did they come from another website? They group users by social. Do they come from a social media platform like Twitter or Facebook? If you're running paid search, Meaning if you're running paid search on say Google, then do they come from paid search ads? Now, if you're running display ads on say Google's network, Google's display network, that's a default channel. So analytics will group users there. So if they don't recognize a channel, then they're gonna group it as others. So by default, Google Analytics groups users on how they came to your website via these default channels. And so I could see how many users came to the site from each channel. Now, if I wanna drill down on this report, I can click on all traffic. And then if I click on all traffic, I can go to channels. I can look specifically at the channels report. And so now I can see organic search, again, over the last 30 days, is the number one channel driving traffic. And they represent approximately, again, you can see this number here in parentheses next to the raw number of users. I can see that number is about 56%. So 56% of my traffic over the last 30 days came from organic search. And so those are the number of users. Again, as a metric, you're also going to have sessions. And you'll see sessions a lot as a metric. So users are broken down between new and returning. So every time a new or returning user comes to the website, basically what they're doing is initiating a session. So you can have a user who can come back multiple times. Every time they come back to the website, it's a session. So session is simply the start of somebody coming to your website and the session ends when they leave the website. And so just like we looked at with the audience reports when it came to mobile, we can also look at engagement by channel. So just like mobile, we looked at bounce rate, pages per session, average session duration. We can do the same thing here with our channel report. More importantly, in addition to behavior, we can see conversions. And since we're running an e-commerce platform, we could see what the conversion rate is by channel. So organic search did drive the most traffic and they did have the most transactions over the last 30 days. And the conversion rate in this case is 0.17. Okay, so how Google determines the conversion rate, they basically take the number of transactions and divide that by sessions. So that means that over the last 30 days, organic search drove 38,123 sessions. And of those 38,123, 64 actually turned into a transaction, which equates to 0.17, which also equates to 3,000 in revenue. So I'm able to determine not only how users are getting to my website, by looking at the channel report, I can actually see if they're engaging and if they are converting. And notice when you look at a report in analytics, you can look at it by channel, you'll also get a summary. So here I can see a summary or a total based on my date range. So I can see over the last 30 days, I've had 54,000 users, 49,000 of them were new. Okay, that meant that out of those 54,000 users, I had 70,000 sessions. I could see my average bounce rate was 43%. The pages per session were just over four. And the average session duration, how long did somebody stay on my website on average? About two minutes and 55 seconds. The average conversion rate was 0.14 and I had a total of 97 transactions totaling $5,500. Okay, and that's all over the last 30 days. So any report you look at in analytics is gonna have a summary. And note that any report you look at in analytics is gonna allow you to save it. 
So if it's a report you think you're going to go back and look at at a future date, then you simply just have to click on the save button. Conversely, if you don't want to save it, you can simply just export it. So you can export it as a PDF. If I click on PDF, it's going to allow me to export that as a PDF. Now you have other options available to you as well. You can do a Google Sheet, you can export it as an Excel, or you can export it as a common delimited file. So here you can see I can save it as a PDF if I want to. And if I click OK, it's going to save to my desktop or location of my choosing. And then I can go back and look at it in that format at a later time. So that's the export feature available to you in analytics again if you you could save it as well or you can export it okay some other reports under acquisition if you're running google ads note that you can connect google ads to analytics and this is key because now i can see how many people are coming from google ads to my website and are they converting now this is important because with Google Ads I'm actually paying for the click so you can see here I'm running a report based on campaign data so I could see what campaigns are driving traffic how much I'm paying per click and you could see on average I'm paying 34 cents per click and then more importantly I want to be able to see if they're converting so you can see I've spent $810 over the last 30 days and received $858 in revenue. So you want to make sure that you link up your Google Ads account to your Google Analytics account. For this very reason, you want to be able to see how your Google Ads campaigns perform once the users get to your website. And so I want to see if they're engaging and I want to see if they're converting. So there are all sorts of reports under Google Ads. So you can look at it by keywords, by search queries, by hour of the day. If you're running display campaigns, you can look at display targeting. So there's all sorts of reports under Google Ads. You just have to link it up and you link it up under the admin. Now there are other reports that you can look at. So if I go to campaigns, I can look at all campaigns so if you're running all sorts of different types of campaigns whether that be on Facebook whether that be email whether that be you know other types of advertising let's just say Twitter or Instagram you're gonna be able to see those campaigns here and that's under all campaigns and again you'll be able to see the campaign name and you'll be able to see metrics associated with those campaigns and more importantly you'll be able to see your e-commerce if you're running an e-commerce platform or if you have goals set up so you'll be able to look at how your campaigns are not one not only driving traffic but two are they converting let's go from acquisition reporting to behavior so behavior reports are going to actually show you how users behaved once they got to your website once they landed on a page on your website how did they behave so when we looked at audience we got a sense of who is coming with acquisition we get a sense of how the traffic got to our website did they come from organic direct social etc the behavior reports allow us to actually measure how that traffic behaved once they landed on a page on our website and so if i go to overview under behavior now i'm looking at this graph here it's showing me how many page views I've had and a page view is simply once a page is viewed it's counted as a page view so if a user comes to my site they're initiating a session and if they look at a page then that page is going to have a page view okay so a user can look at a page multiple times in a session and every time they look at that page it's going to count as a page view so here I can see in this graph how many page views I've had again over the last 30 days. And if I look further at my overview report, I can see the specific pages and how many page views they've had. And I can also look at some other metrics. Okay, the average bounce rate, the average time on page. I can look at the exit rate, which means how many people actually exited or the percentage of people who exited from that page. So I can dig deeper into my behavior reporting. So if I click on site content, 
and I click on all pages. Then I'm going to look at a report by page. This is my dimension. This is what I'm measuring, my page. And now I can see how many page views each page had over the last 30 days. Now note you also have something called unique page views. So unique page views is equivalent to one per session. In other words, if a user came to my site and looked at the home page, then the home page is gonna have one unique page view and one page view. Now, if the user in that same session looks at other pages, then every page that user looks at is gonna have one unique page view. However, if the user goes back to, a, to the same page in the same session, then it's still going to be one unique page view. But in this case, the home page, if they look at the home page a second time, then the home page is going to have two page views. If they look at the home page five times in one session, then the home page is going to have five total page views and one unique page view. Okay, so that's why unique pages is equivalent to one per session, where page views is an accumulation of how many times the page was viewed in the same session. So in other words, you're always going to have more page views than unique page views. Okay, so this gives me a sense of how my page is performed. So again, I can look at total page views and then engagement. So ideally what you wanna do with a report like this is if a user is not engaging on the page, then that should tell you something about the page itself. If they're not engaging, if the bounce rate's high, if the time on page is low, if the exit percentage of exit rate is high, then you probably want to do something with that page. Now, these are all pages, but if I jump down to landing pages, my landing page report is showing me how many people actually landed on that page. And so here I can see under my landing page report, I can see the home page had 36,017 sessions in the last 30 days. That's how many people landed on the home page. So here I can see 71% were new sessions, meaning that I had a lot of new users who landed on the home page. In fact, 25,000 or 52 percent of the people who landed on the home page were new. I could see the bounce rates about 42 percent, but of those who didn't bounce, they went on to look at about 4.5 pages per session and spent about three minutes on the site. And the one thing I like about the landing page report is I can also see whether that particular page, in this case, the home page, did it help contribute to a goal or conversion? And in this case, I can see of those 36,000 sessions, I had 22 transactions, totaling 1,200 in revenue, and that's an e-commerce conversion rate of 0.06%. So the home page over the last 30 days contributed to 0.06% of the revenue. So this gives you an idea of when somebody lands on your website and they land on a page, is that page helping to move that person along? Meaning, are they not bouncing? And is that page helping to move people towards converting? And so that's what the landing page in effect allows us to measure is the engagement. And in this case, we're measuring transactions. Okay, so analytics also gives us some other reports under behavior, including site speed. So site speed to me is an important report to look at, just like the mobile report. To me, site speed's important because what Google Analytics does is they take a sampling of pages. And in this case, you can see over the last 30 days, they sampled 2,835 page views. And of that sample, they came back and said, the average page load time is about four seconds. Now, ideally you wanna keep it as quick as possible. I would say even under three seconds. Okay, now there are other factors involved with page load time. The browser you're using, the country that you're actually browsing that page from might not have the best infrastructure. You may not even be on the best internet network, meaning you're on a cell network or the Wi-Fi is not that great. Or you can be on a page that just has a lot of images or a lot of code that may slow it down. So there are other factors involved. And so, what Google Analytics does is show you what those factors are. So here I can see by browser what the average load time is. If I wanna look at country, I could see what country is contributing to the load time. Now, the great thing about the site speed report 
is if I go to speed suggestions, okay, what speed suggestions is going to do is it's going to show me the page load time by page. And then it's actually going to provide a link where I can actually click on to get suggestions on increasing the page load time. So for example, I can look at this particular page here, this Google redesign shop by brand slash YouTube page, line number five. If I look at line number five, I can see the average load time of this page is eight seconds, almost nine seconds, okay? That's an eternity to some people. Now, notice this link next to it. So Google's recommending seven total suggestions. So if I click on seven total, what it's actually gonna do, it's gonna open up a new window and it's going to open up another Google report called PageSpeed Insights. And PageSpeed Insights is gonna give me some information about what I can do to create correct, correct the page load of that particular page. So look at the site speed report. It's important because there is a correlation between site speed or page load time and user behavior of that page. And there's also a correlation between page load time and a page ranking organically on search. So page load time is very important. It's so important that I'm even gonna save it. So I'm gonna click save and click on speed site speed suggestions as my name and click okay. And now that report is gonna be saved under customization under save reports. Let's jump from behavior to conversions. Now conversion reporting is arguably really the most important section in, in Google Analytics because what the conversions reporting allows us to do is see how people are converting or if they're not converting on our website and so in Google Analytics we have the opportunity to set up goals now you have the opportunity to set up 20 goals in your Google Analytics view and so to set up a goal, okay, so you're gonna click on admin and under the view, you're gonna see goals. And so if you don't even have goals, the first step is to create goals. And so you have four different goal types in analytics. So you have pages per session. So how many pages per session is, so if your goal is set to say three or two, if somebody actually looked at two or three pages per session, it's gonna count as a goal. Okay, so if I look here, I could see I have pages per session set at 10. So that means that if a user came to the site, looked at more than 10 pages per session, then it's going to count as a goal. Another goal type is destination. So destination means that if somebody actually went to a specific page, then it's going to count as a goal. And in this case, I can see here that the goal is set to this particular page here. And so when somebody actually lands on that page, it's gonna count as a goal. Now there are two other goal types we can look at. One is duration. So just like pages per session, in our previous example, if somebody looked at 10 pages per session, it's gonna count as a goal. With duration, it's based on time. So in this particular case, if you set up a duration goal, and the duration is set to say one minute and 30 seconds, then that means if a user comes to my website and they spend at least one minute and 30 seconds, then it's going to count as a goal. Okay, and then the fourth type of goal in Google Analytics is an event-based goal. So when you set up event tracking, you could turn that event into a goal. So if somebody clicks on, say, the submit button of a form, you can turn that event into a goal. So here you could see the category equals contact form. So you can always verify if a goal works just by clicking on verify this goal. And in this case, this event is turned into a goal. So anytime somebody fires this event, it's gonna count as a goal. So you have four different goal types in Google Analytics. You have pages per session, destination, event, and duration. And so once you've set up a goal, then you can measure goals under conversions. So now if I look at goals overview, I can be able to see how many total goal completions I've had. So if I wanna look at it by goal, I can just choose the goal option here. So if I wanna look at, for example, goal two, engaged users, this was the pages per session, I can see that I had a conversion rate of 10%, meaning that I had 7,000 of all the users who came to the website, 7,000 goal completions, meaning 
7,106 users looked at 10 pages or more on my website. And so that's how you want to be able to measure whether users, where they're ever they're coming from, whoever they are, whatever pages they look at, you want to be able to look at the conversion reports to see if they're actually converting based on the goals you've set up, whether that's pages per session, duration, destination, or event, Goal conversion tracking reports can help you measure who is actually converting. And then the great thing about Google Analytics here is that I can actually see by segment. So the default segment and a segment is just looking at a specific user set. So the default segment is always all users. However, I can choose a different segment. So if I want to choose instead of all users, if I want to choose mobile traffic, I can select mobile traffic, hit apply. So I'm actually now looking at a subset of data. I'm looking at mobile traffic. So of all the mobile users who've come to my site, I can see 1400 engaged or looked at 10 pages or more. Okay. And that's a 7% conversion rate. So the great thing about Google Analytics is you have the opportunity to set up four different goal types. Okay, based on those goal types, you can go to goals overview and look at the conversion rate of each goal, but you can also change the segment of that particular goal to see who exactly converted. Okay, another report I like under conversions is the multi-channel funnel report. So if I click on multi-channel funnel, basically what this allows me to do is see how different channels work together to convert. So remember the channel reporting we looked at under acquisition. Here I can see now how different channels work together to drive the conversion. So if I look at three channels, direct, organic, and referral, I can see all three together drive 2% of the conversions. If I look at direct and referral, 12.5%. If I look at direct and organic, 12.24%. So I can see how different channels work together. And so if I look at top conversion paths as an example, I can actually see what channels, how channels work together to drive the conversion. So in this example, I can see over the last 30 days that my top channel grouping was direct times two, meaning that somebody came to the website directly, meaning they typed in the URL in the browser or they bookmarked it and came to the site. Okay, they came the first time but didn't convert. But then they came back a second time via direct and then converted. So that combination is my top conversion combination of the last 30 days. My second best conversion grouping is organic search and direct, meaning that a user came to the website via organic search first, did not convert, and then came back via direct the second time and converted. So basically what analytics does is give credit to the last referral, meaning if you came to the website via referral, a referring website and converted, then the referring website's gonna get the credit for the conversion. But analytics does a good job of showing you how different channels work together. So a channel may drive a lot of traffic like organic search, but that traffic may not convert the first time around for a number of different reasons, whether it could be brand recognition, price shopping, reading content, whatever the case, analytics is able to measure if that channel actually did contribute at a later point. And in this case, we could see organic search drove traffic that didn't convert, but that traffic came back a second time via direct and did convert. So that's our second best channel grouping. And so the multi-channel funneling report, top conversion pass, to me is a good report to look at. So you can actually see not only how channels work together, but you can see sources and mediums and campaigns and how all that, all those different campaigns and different sources work together to convert. So that's just a good report to look at. There are so many different reports available in analytics. There's so many that we haven't even gotten to yet. So my advice, if you look at the demo report, you can get a feel for each of these reports under each section, whether that be audience, acquisition, behavior, or conversions. Take a look at these reports, see what makes sense to you, see what you can use to improve your website performance. So if I go to Google Analytics and I log in, okay, what I want to do 
is go down to admin click on admin here and admin will take you to basically a screen that looks like this where you have a account column you have your property column and then you have your view column now the view column is where you're going to go to set up goals okay so every view in every property has up to 20 goals okay so by default in analytics you're going to have at least one view for your property so if i have a property i'm gonna have at least one view but if i happen to set up multiple views like you see here then i know for every view i set up i have 20 goals to work with so where are those goals so under the view i'm going to click on goals and now i can see i have 20 at my disposal now you can see here by clicking on the recording column i can see i have in this particular property this particular view i have five goals that are active so you can use up to 20 but you don't have to have 20 active okay you can have one active two active my recommendation is at least have one goal again when you set up a goal you're going to measure everything in analytics against that goal okay so in this case we have five particular goals we're measuring so we have five active out of 20 total so if i don't no, no longer want to use a goal i can simply just turn it off if I want to continue using it, just turn it on. Okay, it's that simple. You could turn on and off goals. So here I already have five set up. So if you want to set up a new goal, the one thing you need to know in Google Analytics is in order to set up a new goal, okay, you need to have edit access, at least the view level, I would say at the property level. So you want to make sure whoever's in charge of Google Analytics for your organization, or if you're in charge, okay, you simply just want to go to user management and user management. You want to make sure the email address you're using to log into Google Analytics has at least edit permissions. So you're going to need edit permissions to add new goals. So I have edit permissions. I'm going to go to goals and I want to set up a new goal. But before we jump in and set up a new goal, what is it that we want to achieve? That's really the question we want to ask ourselves. What is the goal of the website? Well, if it's somebody downloading something, okay, are you measuring that download via an event? Okay, are they filling out a form submission before they download? So if they submit that form submission, is that the goal? Do you have an e-commerce site? Is somebody purchasing something? So these are things you want to ask yourself before you actually set up the goal. What is it that I'm trying to measure? Now, when you actually do go to set up a goal, you're going to click on the red CTA button that says new goal. So analytics actually has some templates set up for you. Okay, you can see them here. Okay, if you're somebody's registering online or creating an account or reading review, downloading something, sharing something, you could choose all of these options here. What I normally do is choose custom. 99% of the time, I'm just going to choose custom. It doesn't really matter if you use the template or not. It's just a template is basically some free pre-filled configurations. But my recommendation is always just go with custom. You want total control over how to set up your goal. So we already have in mind what type of goal we want to set up. So for example, if somebody goes to fill out a form submission and they go to a thank you page after that, well, what's the URL of that thank you page? We want to be able to track how many people go to that page because we know if somebody does type in or fill in a form submission and goes to that page, we know that they filled out the form. And so for example, if I go to continue, I'm going to name my goal first. So I'm going to say thank you page. As an example, notice analytics is assigning an ID. So notice this is goal ID 15. That means that that's the next available goal. There are 20 goals available in analytics. And so what analytics does is they group goals together. So 1 through 5, 6 through 10, 11 through 15, 16 through 20 into goal sets. So for example, goal 16 through 20 is part of goal set 4. And why does Google Analytics 
combine these goals into different goal sets? Well, because it's easier to ma measure and look at data by goal sets. So for example, if I jump into any report here, if I go to all traffic channels and I want to measure how many goals by channel, I can look at it by goal set. So if I have goal set one selected, then I know any goal I have active in there between goal ID one through goal ID five, I'm going to be able to see those goals in goal set one. And now I'm going to be able to measure every goal I have active in goal set one against the channel. So if I choose goal set two, whatever goals are active there, goal set three, etc. Notice I don't have any goals 16 through 20 active that are in goal set four. Therefore, I don't have that option available to me. So back to admin, the bottom left navigation, again, goals. Okay, we want to measure somebody going to the thank you page. We have edit access. We're going to choose custom as our goal setup. We're going to type in a goal name. I'm just going to say thank you. Okay, this is goal 15. Now, this is the important part. Google Analytics has four different goal types, destination, duration, pages per session, or screens per session. So screens per session is related to mobile because Google Analytics measures mobile app activity. And then you have an event. So we're gonna cover all four of these, but for the sake of this simple example, I'm gonna choose destination. Why? Because if somebody goes to that thank you page, we're going to go ahead and put in the thank you page as the goal, the goal URL. So for example, destination is my choice. I'm going to click continue. Now this is where I'm going to put the URL. So if my URL is just simply thank you.html, I can just go ahead and put thank you.html. Or if it's just thank you, then I can just do thank you. Depends on the website, depends on the URI structure. So whatever that URL is, that's what you're going to put in. And when you're done, you can verify it. So what Google Analytics does is actually will verify over the last seven days if anybody's actually gone to that particular page. So if we click verify, we can see 0% conversion rate. So that tells us that if this is the correct URL, then we've had 0% people go to that page. This is just an example. However, if you didn't see a conversion, then you might want to make sure you check the URL here that you put in. And if you do see a conversion rate, then you know it's working. So Google Analytics actually has options. So we're saying thank you is equal to. So the destination URL is equal to thank you or thank you.html or thank you.esp or whatever that thank you page is. Okay, you do have options. So if you have a long URL, you could say begins with, and you could say begins with say thank you. So this is the logic. We're going to say, hey, if anybody goes to a URL that begins with thank you, then count it as a goal. Or you could say equals to. So if anybody goes to a URL that equals to thank you, then count it as a goal. You have one more option here, regular expression. So Google Analytics understands the language of regular expressions. So regular expressions are just special characters used to communicate with Google Analytics in order to hone in on exactly what you're trying to track. So we can always say, you know, starts with or ends with. So we can, you know, use characters like the dollar sign ends with or begins with. So we can always do that. So you can use regular expressions as well if you're familiar with regular expressions. If you're not, then you don't have to use them, but there are special characters where that you can insert in that are used as regular expression. So if you're not familiar with regular expression, don't choose that option. You could choose the other option of equals to or begins with. Now note that on all three of these options, I didn't put the domain. So if my domain is ama-foundation.org slash and then thank you, I don't need to put the domain because analytics is already, already knows what domain we're tracking. So you don't have to put in the domain here when you're entering in, in this case, the goal URL. So you can omit the domain. So when you put in that URL, you know that you have three options to work with. 
and then you always, always want to verify that goal URL. You always want to verify it because if you see 0% conversion, and in this case of the last seven days, then that should tell you something. Either your goal is not set up correctly or you just don't have any conversion. Either way, you want to double check that. Now, when it comes to the destination URL goal, you do have an option here for funnel. So if I turn on funnel, then that means I have the ability to track how people went through my funnel. So if I have a cart and I want to be able to check how many people go in and out of the cart, then I have the option of adding specific pages as part of the cart. So we could say, you know, step one, which is basically cart. We could say step two is billing information. That could be slash billing. We could say step three is shipping information slash shipping. And then step four could be, you know, confirm. And that could be slash confirmation. So whatever your URL structure is for your cart, and it doesn't necessarily have to be a cart. Basically, all I'm doing is putting in a series of steps with URLs as each step. And why do I want to do that? Because I can then track how many people go through my funnel that I've created. Okay, so here I could see this is my funnel that I've created for this particular goal. Okay, and the funnel is only available for the destination URL. So the funnel is available if you want to see traffic through the goal. Okay, and how it, people go through the funnel and where they drop off. Now you have an option here to make the first step required. So if you make that first step required, then that means you're measuring the funnel through the first step only. Now, if I turn that off, then I'm measuring the funnel through each step, meaning that I can measure people as they drop in and out of the funnel. Where if it's required the first step, then I'm only measuring traffic as it enters in the top of the funnel. So you have that option available to you, the funnel. And then for all goals, you do have a value. So if somebody did actually convert, okay, Google Analytics is going to count it as a conversion and you can assign a value. So if you're not an e-commerce website, then you may want to think about assigning value. If you are an e-commerce website, then analytics has the ability to track e-commerce revenue for your website. So you don't need to add a value. But in this case, let's just say you're a nonprofit organization and you're collecting donations. And on average, over the past year, every donation that somebody contributed was equal to $5. Well, you can just go ahead and put $5 in there as the value for that goal. So that means that if somebody did go to, in this example, slash thank you and convert, Analytics is going to count it as a goal and then assign $5 value alongside that goal. So if you're non-e-commerce, if you're say a nonprofit like this organization or you're B2B and you want to track some value, then you have that option there. So with the destination URL goal, you have the option of adding a funnel. With all goal types, you have the option of adding a value. All goal types, and we're going to go through the rest of them, you have the option of verifying that goal. So that's the structure of setting up a goal. Destination URL is just one goal type. We're going to talk about the other three goal types because in Google Analytics, there are four goal types. Again, destination is one of them. With destination, as you do have the option with all goal types, is you have to be able to choose your logic here. So we're going to cover that with the other three, but just know when you set up a destination URL goal, you have the option of adding a funnel. Now, when you actually do set up a funnel, What's going to happen is analytics is going to measure traffic as it goes through the funnel. So where do you look for that funnel information? Well, you want to get out of admin. You want to go to the left side navigation. You want to click on conversions, then goals, then funnel visualization. So based on the funnel you set up, you're going to be able to see traffic as it goes through the funnel. So notice on this particular funnel, we don't have the first step required. Why? Because I could see traffic as it goes in and out of each step of the funnel. So let's go through this funnel and see how people react. So here I could see the first step is the storefront page. 
So over this particular period of time, I had 84 sessions enter the storefront page. So out of those 84, I can see 21 left the storefront page. 63 went on to the next step in the funnel, which is the cart page. I can then see 24 people went on to the cart page directly and five exited the site altogether. Okay, so that gave me 87 total. And from 87, I saw that 82 went on to the next page with the next step. What analytics does is they give you a percentage. So in the first step, we had 63 move on to the cart page. Out of 84, that's 75%. So from the cart page to the create your account page, we had 94% move on. So we didn't have anybody enter in the create your account page. We didn't have anybody leave the create your account page. So we have 82%, 82, create your account, and then we have 82, move on to the payment page. So that's 100%. Okay, we have one exit, so we have 81 that proceeded to be on the payment page, which was purchase. So 81 of 82 is 98%. And we started with 84, so that gave us, plus the 24 that we accumulated along the way, so that gave us a 75% funnel conversion rate. So 75% of the people who entered in the funnel went on to purchase okay so don't be confused with the overall e-commerce conversion rate so 75 percent is the funnel conversion rate the overall conversion rate for this particular goal is 18.45 percent over this particular period of time why because that takes into account all sessions that have won to the website so 18 percent of all traffic went on to convert but those that did go into the funnel 75% converted. So that's a look at the funnel. So if you set up a funnel, that's what it's going to look like. You have the option to measure everything from step one and beyond or measure as traffic goes in and out of the funnel. So the purpose of this is we're going to be able to see where traffic drops off, how effective our funnel is, what pages we need to address in that funnel. Okay, so that's the whole point of the funnel, and the funnel is available with the destination URL goal. So if I go back to admin, if I go back to goals under the view, I can actually see what that funnel looks like. So here we chose regular expression. So this is what the URL is. Okay, you can see our funnel in each of the steps we have set up. Notice we're using regular expressions here. And then if we verify this goal, we could see over the past seven days, 19% conversion rate. So that tells me something's working in this particular, with this particular goal, because we do have a conversion rate. Okay. So that's the destination URL goals. Let's now talk about the other three types of goals. So the next goal type we're going to talk about is pages per session. So if you're not sure what type of goal to set up, for your website at the very least you should try and set up either duration related goal or pages per session related goal so let's talk about the pages per session so basically what this goal is going to allow us to measure is for example if we set the goal to three pages per session then we're going to be able to measure if how many people went to the site and looked at three pages per session. So let's take a look at that goal. So if I open up the goal here, I can see three pages per session is what we're naming it. So basically what we're asking analytics to do is anything greater than two pages, which would be three and beyond count as a goal. So if anybody comes to the site, looks at more than two pages, three pages or more, then it's going to count as a goal. And so here we can verify it. So if we verify it over the last seven days, we could see a 4.12% conversion rate. And that tells me that 4% of my traffic over the last seven days looked at at least three pages or more. So you're probably asking yourself, well, what number should I put in for the actual variable? So in this case, we see two. Well, what you wanna do is you wanna look at 
on average, let's just say year to day, you want to make sure you have statistical significance. So you want to look at a period of time. So if you go to analytics, go to audience, okay? And then if you go to overview, and if I change my date range to year to date, I could see on average right now, I have 1.21 pages per session. So that's on average. So we don't want to make our goal one page. We don't want to make our goal two pages. We want to make it three. So we want to be able to basically measure at a higher rate. Okay, why do we want to measure at a higher rate? Because if 1.21 is the average, then two pages per session really isn't moving the needle. So what we really want to do is get people to stay on the site longer, look at pages more uh, during their session. So look at more pages. And so we want to be able to see what segment of the audience is looking at more pages, what channels driving traffic that's looking at more pages, what pages are contributing to more pages per session. So the whole idea is you want to hone in on what your goal is and see what's working and then see what's not working so you can make adjustments. The whole idea behind Google Analytics is to improve website performance. And so if our average is 1.2, then if we change it to just two, it may not be good enough. So in this case, you know, we want to up the bar a little bit. So we're going to choose three. Now you can choose four or five. That's perfectly fine. Just know if your average is 1.2, I wouldn't choose one page per session as my goal. And I probably wouldn't choose two. So I'd set the bar a little bit higher. Now, the third goal type available in Google Analytics is also engagement related, and that's duration. So just like pages per session, we can measure how long somebody stays on the website, and we could set up a goal for that. So in this case, I have a goal set for 1 minute 30 seconds. So my goal type is duration. So if I click continue, then basically I'm asking analytics, in this case, Anybody who stays more than one minute and 30 seconds on the website count it as a goal. And so before you actually put in the number of hours, minutes and seconds, you want to look at that average. So if you go back to audience overview here, I could see a minute and seven. So do we want a minute and 30? Maybe we could do that. Maybe we can go with two minutes. So again, the whole point is you want to set the bar a little bit higher than what the average is. And so here I can see over the last seven days, if I verify this particular goal, I can see 8% of my traffic over the last seven days stayed on the site at least one minute and 31 seconds. Okay, they stayed greater than one minute and 30. And so the whole point is you can hone in because this is a goal. I can go in, this is goal, okay, this is a goal here. And so I could see that this is goal 13. So now I can go to acquisition as an example. I can go to channels as an example. Since this is a goal, this is goal 13. So that would be in goal set three. So I can actually see what channel is basically driving that goal. Okay. In other words, what channel is driving traffic that is staying on the site at least one minute and 30 seconds. And so that's the whole idea behind goals. So likewise for pages per session, we can go into channels and here I can see we've have a th over this period of time, year to date, pages per session, we have 3% conversion rate. And here I could see, for example, organic search has a 13% conversion rate. Here I could see social media has a 10%. So I could see that or people coming from organic search are staying on the site longer or they're looking at more pages than any other channel. So just like duration or destination or any goal you set up, you can measure that goal against any dimension. Just because it's engagement doesn't mean you can't, you absolutely can. And so the whole point of engagement related goals is to figure out what's driving traffic to the site, but what traffic is engaging. So you want to be able to pinpoint that so you can improve website performance. Now, the fourth goal type available in Google Analytics is an event. So if you click on new goal, you click custom, click continue, you have the option 
to choose an event. So an event is something that you can measure on your website that analytics can't measure by default. So if you want to measure PDF downloads or clicks on buttons or clicks on play buttons on a video or click on a submit button or click on an external link, I mean, you can measure pretty much anything with an event, then you want to be able to turn that event into a goal. So let's quickly summarize what an event is. So again, we want to be able to measure a particular event that happens on the website. So in order to do so, we need to identify that event. So if I go to, for example, this particular website here, and I want to measure how many times somebody clicks on the donate now button. Well, if I met, I can measure that as an event. So when you set up an event in analytics, you have to actually assign a category and an action for that event. So that's the first thing you need to do when you identify an event related goal. First, you need to set up the event. And in order to set up the event, you need to assign a category and action. Okay, so once you identify what you want to track as an event on your website, you're actually going to go in a tag manager or have your webmaster go in a tag manager and set up a tag. And in that tag, they're going to assign that particular category and action. And so here you can see we have this set up. Our category is named donate now and our action is click. And that's what we want to do. We want to measure how many people click on that donate now button. So anytime somebody does that, then the category donate now is going to appear in analytics with the action click. So when you actually do set up an event, you can go into analytics and you could test that event. So if I go to the website and I click donate now, okay, the reason why I have this as an event is because I'm taking to a third party website to handle the donations. So here I can go into analytics and now I can see a category is being fired for header donate with the action click. So that's my category and that's my action. So that category and action is what is firing after somebody clicks on the donate now button. So if I want to turn this event into a goal, I can easily do that. Now that I've set up the event, now that I've identified the category in action, I want to go back to admin and set up the event with these parameters in place. So it just turns out we already have the goal set up. So let's go through how this goal was set up. So first we chose custom, we chose event, we gave it a name. So as a best practice, when you actually set up a goal as an event, or turn an event into a goal, I would add the prefix event colon to it. And then that way, when you're identifying goals and you're reporting, you know it's an event. So I'm gonna click continue. And now that I've actually have set up the event already in Google Tag Manager, I've given it a category, I've given it an action. Okay, see so here you can see we have a regular expression set up. So anything with the header donate or donate is going to fire this goal. So over the last seven days, I have a 0.81% conversion rate. Okay, I could have easily put in equals to and put in whatever the action what or the category which is donate now or i could have put action equals click i could have done that as well so let me show you another example here so if i do this custom continue event donate now here's my goal id it's going to be an event so all i need to do is put in the category and action so donate now and then click so that's all I have to do, and that's my goal. So I can verify it, okay, to see if anybody's fired it, and basically that's what I need to do to turn that event into a goal, okay? So you need to set up for an event. First, you need to identify the event, set it up in Google Tag Manager, which is another platform, and once you've done that, then you have your category in action. Once you have your category in action, you're again going to go into analytics and then simply put in that category and action into the appropriate fields to set up your event related goal. Now, all events don't have to be turned into a goal. If you actually do set up an event, 
and you're not worthy of a goal, meaning it's not a KPI or doesn't align with your business goals, well, don't fret. You can always just go to behavior. Okay. You can always go to events. You can always go to overview and measure your events that way. So here you could see all of our events that are fired. Now we do have this one turn into a goal. So if it's important for our business, then we want to make sure we convert that particular event into a goal. Okay. If it's not important, for example, somebody's just clicking on a social button, then you don't necessarily have to turn that event into a goal if you don't want to. Know that it's sitting here under events, under behavior. So the point I'm trying to make here, if it's important to your business and you're already tracking it as an event via Google Tag Manager, then feel free to turn it into a goal. All you need is that category. All you need is that action. And so, so one final note on that event related goal, just like any other goal, you can add a value. Okay. So if I have an event set up, I can choose to add a value here or in Google Tag Manager, if I've assigned a value to that event. So if I go back to the actual event in Google Tag Manager, you could see I have a value set up for $1. Then I could just go into analytics and say, you know what? I already have the value added. So go ahead and use the value added in Google Tag Manager. Okay. So I'm going to choose yes. Now, if I choose no, I have the option to add the value here, just like I would with any other goal. So just keep that in mind. You can add a value to any goal type with an event related goal. You can add the value right into the tag in Google Tag Manager, just as I've done here. So remember when you actually set up your goals, whether it's a destination, pages per session, duration, or an event, you can just go ahead and choose that goal set that it's in and measure any dimension against that particular goal. So here I can see e-newsletter signups by channel. I can go into another goal set here. I can see contact form submissions. Okay. I can see what particular channels driving contact form submissions. Okay. So just know that you can align a goal against any dimension. So if you have e-commerce, you don't have to set up for goal for that. That's separate. But if you want to take a look at your goals and analytics on its own, you can just go to conversions, goals, overview. Here, I can actually get a good sense of how my goals are performing over a period of time. So again, if I choose, for example, year to date, now I can see based on the goals I've set up, how many total goal completions, value, which takes into account the value we've added into these goals. Okay, the total conversion rate. And here I can see it broken down by the goal I actually have set up. And I can see it by page or I can see it by source of medium. So I could see Google Organic is driving the most goal completions, then Google CPC direct, and then I could see some others in here as well contributing to goals. Now, I do want to point your attention to another report in Google Analytics that does take into account goals and that's multi-channel funneling. So again, under conversion goals, multi-channel funnels. If I go to assisted conversions, I can actually see what channel in this example is assisting with the conversions I've set up. And so what do we mean by assisted conversions? Well, that means that if a channel, let's just say organic search drove traffic to the website and that traffic didn't convert when it arrived at the website and left, but it came back a week later via another channel, let's just say email. And when they came back via email, they did convert during that session. Well, what analytics does is they give an assist to organic search because they help drive the traffic to the website. So it's similar to the game of basketball. If I have the ball and I pass it to my colleague and my colleagues, the one who scores because they had the ball last, well, they get the credit for the point, i.e. the conversion, but I get an assist. And so analytics works the same way. They're always going to give credit to the last click or direct conversion, but they will give credits to the channel in this case that assisted with the conversion. So that's under assisted conversion. 
and that's based on the goals you have set up. You can highlight any particular goal here. If I want to hone in on, say, the donate clicks only, then I'm going to be able to see what contributed to that particular goal. So there's another report in here, top conversion pass, that I think is important. So after you set up your goals, you can actually see what channels in this particular example help to drive conversions. Again, this is year to date. So I can see all the different combinations of channels that work together to contribute to a conversion. So again, I can choose a specific goal or I can choose all my goals. So those two reports are under multi-channel funneling. There's also another report that I think is good and that's time lag, meaning how long did it actually take somebody to convert? So here you can see most of our conversions, 265 year to date, happen on the day somebody arrived on the website. But I could see I did get some conversions a day later, two days later, etc. So you have time lag, top conversion pass, assisted conversions. They're all under multi-channel funneling and they're all available after you set up at least one goal. And so if you're not sure what goal to set up, Okay, don't fret. You can always at least set up an engagement related goal. So that's available to you. Duration, pages per session. You also have destination and event tracking. And they're all available to you. You have 20 available per view. Now, if you're not quite sure exactly what type of goal to set up, there is an option available in analytics and that's the gallery. So you can always import a goal from the gallery. So in other words, we could take a look at what other people have set up in terms of goals. So you just have to click on the button import from gallery and it'll take you to the gallery and you'll be able to see what are the goals others have set up. So many of you out there have a website similar to the one I'm looking at now. This is a nonprofit that I work with, Ama Foundation, and like this website and probably like your website, you probably have some interactivity on there that needs to be tracked. For example, buttons. Uh, if you have buttons like this one that says donate or newsletter sign up or there's a PDF download or a video that needs to be you know tracked based on the amount of people who click on the play button so I mean all sorts of interactivity on a website have you ever wondered how to track that well there is a way to track that because by default Google Analytics can't track interactivity and engagement on your website like you probably want to have your website tracked so if you have buttons and videos and things of that nature that you want to have tracked well you're going to need event tracking and if you're in analytics and you're always wandering around the data and you happen to find yourself under events well if you want events on your website and you want data to populate under behavior top events, you're going to need to set up event tracking. So event tracking is a two part process. And we're gonna talk about that two part process. The first part of that is to identify what you wanna track. Okay, so if we go back to our example website here, I'm a foundation. Again, we noted there's a lot to track here. We got a donate now button, we got a newsletter sign up, we have some social icons. Okay, we got a donate now button here. We got a play button here. We got all sorts of interactivity. You know, we got a button here that says, you know, purchase tickets for an upcoming event. I can go throughout the website and find different buttons and things to, to, to track. Let me just say this. There's no shortage of what you can track on your website with event tracking. So event tracking is just basically in layman's terms, tracking engagement on your site. Because Google Analytics by default is only gonna track page view data, meaning how somebody got to your website, what page they looked at, how long they stayed on that page, what page they left from. More or less their timing, how long somebody stays on the website and what pages they look at. So there's more to a website than just how long somebody stayed on a page. And so in this example, we want to be able to track everything here, not just the donate now button, but everything, because once you get the hang of event tracking, then it's very easy to set up. Okay. So step one, identify what you want to track. Okay. So there's a lot we want to track. We're just going to use one example to start off with. And that's gonna be this donate now button. Okay, so 
this donate now button we want to track now we have a newsletter sign up we have facebook and and that's fine you could track all that but for the sake of going through a step-by-step -step process today let's just focus on the donate now button let's focus on the donate now button then we'll come back and start tracking these other things but this is what we want to track to start out with okay so step one identify what you want to track now when it comes to tracking events on a website you want to identify those events so we did that by choosing this donate now button now once we identify what we want to track we need to assign two parameters for that event so with event tracking you have three parameters but one is actually optional so you have two manda mandatory parameters that you have to assign to everything you want to track on your website and that's the category and then the action so event label or label is the third parameter but again that's optional okay so basically when we identify an event on our website we want to assign it a category and an action okay so why do we want to assign it a category and an action because when we are in analytics under behavior under events top events we could see we have different categories here and we have different actions we have different labels so if i click on any one of these dimensions i'm going to be able to see some of the parameters i've entered in for previous events i'm tracking okay so the whole idea is you want to be able to group different events together into a category and assign an action and assign a label to it that's really what you're doing you're just grouping and identifying the events you're trying to track and so in this case i have this donate now button sitting in the header okay in fact i have a lot of things sitting in the header so if i wanted to and i want to track all these buttons i can create a category called header and then if i track all these buttons all these buttons can sit in that same category if i wanted to or i can create a separate category for each of these buttons it's up to you how you organize your categories because basically all you're doing is giving a name to what you're trying to track and the name is equivalent to a category so in this case the donate now button is very important i'm just going to call it category header donate now i need to give an action to each category and so in this case i'm just going to say click because that's what the action is doing it's it's somebody's taking the action of clicking now if it's a video and it's a play button i can assign an action of play it's up to you whatever you name these parameters you just need to be organized and methodical about what you name it that's all and so in this case header donate and then click okay and so that's our category in action and so that's clearly step two so step one identify what you want to track step two assign a category action and or label but remember label is optional so if i go back in analytics here i could see some categories and if i click on action i could see some actions that i've named now step three so we've identified in step one what we want to track we've assigned a category and action so step three is going into google tag manager to set up the event okay so if you're not familiar with google tag manager then you can easily just you know do a google search for google tag manager and basically you'll have all sorts of information on it there's a good video overview of tag manager here that you can watch so tag manager basically is what we want to use to set up event tracking now tag managers used for a lot of different things but the main thing we're doing here is setting up an event for our website and so i'm logged in to the same email address i'm using for analytics okay so now i'm in tag manager and i want to set up my event for this donate now button so what do i need to do well for every event i want to set up i need to set up a tag okay so if i go to tags i can see i already have some tags set up and some of these are events and so when you actually set up a tag i recommend having a naming convention so here you can see any event we set up we start out by calling it ga dash event dash whatever it is we're trying to set up and so in this case we want to set up a new tag for the donate now button on our website so we're in google tag manager because tag manager is what's going to fire that event 
So if I click on new, okay, and I click on tag configuration, I'm gonna choose Google Analytics. And then I'm going to choose event as my track type. So we want the data to show up in Google Analytics and we're tracking an event. We're not tracking a page view, we're tracking an event. And so now remember in step two, you identified what you wanna call that category, you identify what you wanna call that action, and you have some optional parameters like label. So first things first, header donates the name of our category and our action is click. And if you wanna add in a label and a value, so if you want to assign a value, you can. If you want to add in a label, you can. Okay, those are optional. So you just need to focus on category and action. And then the last setting here that's probably worth mentioning is a non-interaction hit. Okay, so this is automatically set to false. And why is it set to false? Because it's a non-interaction. No, that's false. We want this event, if somebody clicks on the header donate, to be an interaction. So for example, if I land on this page here and I click on that donate now button that I'm tracking as an event and I actually leave the site, because I have my settings set to false, I want that click to be an interaction, then analytics is not gonna count a bounce. If I change it to true, so from false to true, then that means it is going to be a non-interaction if somebody lands on the page and if somebody clicks on the button. So I don't want it to be a bounce. I want it to be an interaction. So my advice is leave it set to false. We're going to choose Google Analytics as our setting here. This is our variable for Google Analytics. So in other words, that variable is set to our analytics property ID. And more or less, that's what you need to do to set up the tag, okay? You need to, in step two, identify the category and action and or label and or value. Now value can be anything you want. You're assigning a numerical value. So if you just assign one, anytime that event fires in analytics, it's gonna have a value of one, okay? And so we have our non-interaction set to false. So anytime the event fires, it's going to count as an interaction and therefore not count as a bounce if somebody landed on that page. So that's more or less all you need to do to set up the tag in Google Tag Manager. Now, if somebody else is setting up the tag for you, then again, you wanna to revert to step two. You wanna be able to give that person the appropriate category action and or label and or value. Why? Because you're the one that's gonna be going into Google Analytics and you're the one that's gonna have to go to behavior, events, top events, and look for the particular at category and action and or label. So you need to be able to communicate that information to whomever is setting up the tag. Now, if it's you, great. You already know what it is because you're entering that information into Tag Manager. So in this case, I'm gonna go ahead and choose a variable for my label parameter. And why do I wanna do that? Because in Tag Manager, I have something at my disposal called variables. And variables allow you to see specifically things that are being tracked. So in this case, I chose page path. Okay, so page path is a URL. And why did I choose page path as my variable for the parameter label? Because if somebody does click on the header donate button, and the header donate button on our website is on every page. So if I go to the children's page, I'm still gonna see that header donate button. And so for me, I wanna be able to see what page somebody clicked on that header donate button. And so this allows me to actually see in Google Analytics what page somebody clicked on the header donate down button. And so now if I go back to GTM, Google Tag Manager, I have a category, I have an action, and I have a label, which is a variable. Okay, so note that in Google Tag Manager, you have a lot of different variables at your disposal. And variables are there to help you identify specifically what is being tracked. So take a look at all the variables at your disposal in Tag Manager. In this example, I'm using page path. So now, once you set up your tag, pretty straightforward again, tag types, Google Analytics, track type is event. You are assigning the category, action, and or label, and or value. 
you're changing or leaving the default in place for non-interaction hit. And then you're choosing the variable for Google Analytics, which is your property ID. So once you've done that, you have a tag. The second part of setting up a tag is to assign a trigger to that tag. So Tag Manager needs to be able to know when to fire that event. And so here I'm going to look at a trigger I've already set up for this particular event. And so if I click on it, I'll be able to see that what it is is a click on some links, not all links, but some links. I'm actually saying, hey, Google Tag Manager, fire this event when the click ID equals header donate button. Now, it just so happens that if somebody did click on this Donate Now button, they're going to go to another website, in this case, networkforgood.com. So in Tag Manager, I could have set the trigger to equal, URL equal, instead of click ID, I could have said URL equal networkforgood.com. So that could have been my logic for my trigger. In this case, I decided to go with the click ID. And so in this case, that button has an ID associated with it called header donate button. So if you wanted to use click ID for your event, for your button, you could simply just go to the website. You can right click on that button and click inspect element. And so when I actually inspect the element, I can see now the button here. You can see it's highlighted in the upper pane and in the lower pane. I can see where it's linking to. It's linking to networkforgood.com. But here you can see if I hone in a little, I can see ID equals header dash donate dash button. So that's the click ID. Notice there's also a class. I could have set the trigger to equal this class. Or again, I could have set the trigger to equal the URL or the page that this button is pointing to. I could have chosen any one of those, but I decided to go with the ID. So this is the ID I chose, and that's the ID I have in my trigger. Okay, so that is what's going to fire that event. So if somebody clicks on a button that equals header dash donate dash button, it's going to fire that event, which is going to equal category header donate action click and then the label is going to be page path so now that we've set up our event we want to test to see if it actually works so there's two ways to go about testing an event and the first way is through google analytics so if we go to google analytics and then we go to real time okay we can go to events and here you can see one is already fired so let's go ahead and go to and test this and go to the website. So if I go here, for example, and I click on Amagar alumni. Okay, so if I click on that, you can see I'm under our family. And if I click on that button, then go back to analytics and look at real time, I should be able to see this event fire. So if I click on it, I'm going to go to network for good. Now if I go back to analytics here in real time, under real time, under events, Per second, I can see that event firing. Category equals header donate. The action equals click. Now, if I click on the category, here I can see the label. The label, remember, was page path. And here you could see this event fired on the Our Family page, which was the page I was just on. So that's one way to test to see if your event works. And in this case, analytics recognized the event, so it works it fired and so therefore it's going to show up under behavior under events you can go under overview or top events okay and what am i going to look for in this case i'm going to look for header donate okay if i click on header donate as my category i'm going to be able to see my action and if i click on action i'll be able to see my label in this case home page and then later on when the data propagates in analytics i'll be able to see under label the page that I clicked on that header donate button, which is slash our family. Okay, the second way in which you can test to see if an event fires is if you preview. So if I click on preview in Tag Manager, okay, I'm gonna go into preview mode, okay? And preview mode allows you to see 
in analytics and tag manager and on the website what tags are firing so here I could see I'm in preview mode now so I'm gonna go to the website and I'm gonna refresh and in my browser same browser I'm using for tag manager I can see the tags that are being fired on this page already okay cuz I'm in preview mode so here I could see remarketing I could see page views I could see Google optimize I could see some tags that are already firing on this page now if I click on this button here by holding down my shift command and then click on that button I'll be able to see that the tag fired in preview mode there's my event header donate and I could see it fired so now I could see it fired in the preview mode so in addition to Google Analytics in preview mode I could see that that tag is fired and I know that it's working so there you have it. you have two ways to test to see if the event fires again you have real time and analytics okay so in real time if you just go up to real time all you need to do is go down to events go to your website click on the button if you see it firing in real time then you know it works the second version or second way to test your event is through the preview mode okay if you see it firing in preview mode then you know it's also working okay so let's rehash our steps first step is we want to be able to identify what we want to track okay so it could be this newsletter sign up it could be click on a Facebook it could be anything we want to be able to track an image a click on a CTA button whatever we want to track identify it second step identify the category action and label because that's what's going to show up in Google Analytics remember label is optional variable or excuse me value is optional third step go into tag manager actually set up your tag and your trigger so if you set up a tag and it's an event name it GA dash event so that way you can see in your list of tags in tag manager what event tracking you have already set up so when you set up your tag you set up your trigger your trigger is based on logic that can be a URL it can be a click ID it can be a class ID whatever you want to use to fire that event and then once you do that you want to test it you could test it in GTM or you could test it in Google Analytics if it doesn't fire you want to tweak your trigger if it does fire then great and then one thing I would recommend is if you're setting up various events for your website as a best practice what I would recommend is set up a spreadsheet and in that spreadsheet you know you want to put a note what's firing what are you doing to fire it could be in this case when somebody clicks on the donate now button in the header you want to put the tag name in here the type Okay, then you want to record your category action and label and then the great thing about events is you could turn those events into goals and that's as simple as going back into analytics okay so if I go in analytics and I go to admin and I go to goals if you set up a new goal okay all you need to do is choose custom click continue you're going to choose event as your goal name and then from a naming perspective in Google Analytics for your goal I would definitely put event first and then click on header donate okay so if I click now continue what is my category it's equal to header donate my action is click and so I can verify to see if this is working and here I can see in analytics that the goal would have a 0.22 percent conversion rate so that tells me that the goal is working and I can turn this event into a goal and when you turn something into a goal in analytics then you can measure it across all dimensions that's what I would recommend if the event is equal to a KPI or business goal or it's of importance it's something you really want to measure okay if it's just a click say on a Facebook button I wouldn't recommend setting that up as a goal okay so once you've set up your event you recorded it in your spreadsheet it's firing you want to be able to then go back into behavior back into events okay you can go to top events okay so top events tell you by category as a default what events are firing or what category is firing the most 
Okay, so if I choose my date range, here I can just go to year to date. So here I can see my enter donate button, fortunately for me, has the most total events. Now notice in analytics, you also see unique events. And so the difference between unique events and total events is that unique events are equivalent to one per session, where total events means that somebody can come to your website initiate a session and click on that button multiple times in the same session. So if I go to the Alma Foundation website, okay, I can click on that donate now button three or four or five different times in the same session. So what analytics is going to do is actually in that session count it once, but accumulate the number of clicks as a total event for that session. So you're always gonna have more total events than unique events because in some cases, users may click on the button more than once in the same session. And so here I can see total events, unique events, and if I added a value to that event, I should be able to see it here. So if I added a dollar as an example to this particular event, because it had 164 unique events, I should be able to see 164 as my value. But since I see zero, that means that I did not assign value. And so average value basically is just giving me how much average I have per event. So it's taking into account the number of, or the value, the total value divided by the total number of unique page views or sessions. And so because I don't have value, I'm not gonna have average value. But here you could see, because value is optional, here I can at least see how many events or how many clicks I receive for a particular button. Again, it could be a video. If I clicked on this video as an example, I can see how many people actually started it. I can see the unique and the total events. And if I click on label, if I have a label assigned, then I'll be able to see what page triggered that event. So if we go back again to our header donate button, back to category, if we click on label as our primary dimension. Here we can see the home page had the most unique events, then followed by the children's page, the contact form, et cetera. So what you can do in analytics, you can also look at the pages that have driven events. So here I could see the home page has accumulated the most total events, followed by the contact us. So that's how you would look at the data in Google Analytics under behavior, under events, and then under top events or overview is where you can start analyzing your event tracking. So first you need to do, identify it, assign a category, action, and or label, set up that tag and trigger. Once you do that, once you test that it's working, this is where you're gonna go to analyze the data. Let's start out with YGTM. So let's just say you're Sam and you have your own e-commerce website and you want to understand how people are interacting with your website. Well, Sam, today's world of websites contain a lot of interactivity, everything from videos to PDF downloads to commenting to form submissions uh, to all sorts of chat functionality, interactivity going on throughout the website. So there's just a lot that you need to track outside of just page views. And so really what GTM does is they help you track all these things I just mentioned. Everything from somebody clicking on the play button of a PDF to somebody clicking on the submit button of a form to somebody entering in something on a chat function. So that's what GTM is. So why GTM? Because it helps us track all that interactivity. So all GTM is, is really allows you to really place a piece of Java code, which is just script, and the script that's added to a web page to collect information. So that's really what a tag is. It's just some script that gets put on a web page in order for you to collect information, like page views, clicks, etc. And they send it to third-party tools. Okay, so that's what GTM does. It, it basically allows you to take all these tags that collect information and you can use them in GTM. So if you want to, for example, collect how many people, you know, enter a chat functionality and start chatting. Well, you're gonna take that script 
and you're gonna put it in GTM, and GTM will then allow you to start tracking that information. So that's really what GTM is. It just allows you to put tags into a container, or think of it as a toy box. You have all these toys and you wanna track, well, you can put all those those toys or tags in a toy box or container. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that. But before we get into GTM, let's just say you know, you're communicating with your developer and there's a new user request on your web page, and you wanna update the tag. Well, your developer, considering it's probably a small update to your website, is probably gonna not um, hesitate and is gonna go ahead and turn around and do it normally. And so normally what happens is the developer is gonna go to the website and update the tag. Well, what if you have a few things that you wanna track? All these things I mentioned before, from downloads to clicks to you know somebody checking out to watching a video. Well, your webmaster, your web developer is gonna go, well, hold on a second. Now, all these requests are gonna take time. I need to put them into the work queue, so to speak. Well. What happens is when they go into work queue, usually it's gonna take some time. And in some cases, you as a marketer need to launch a campaign. And you wanna get that tracking uh, added to the website in time for the campaign launch. So you wanna go ahead and quickly turn around the tracking for that particular campaign. Let's just say you're launching a campaign and you're sending people to a landing page that has a form submission. And you wanna be able to track how many people click on the submit button of that form submission. Well, if you need to turn that around, your developer's like, well, I need to put that in a work queue. The timing isn't going to always work out between you and your developer is my point. And so that's where GTM comes in because there is a solution to update your tags faster. And that's Google Tag Manager. So when we say GTM, that's what GTM stands for, Google Tag Manager. It's a place for you to add tags quickly and easily. So tags, remember, are just snippets of code that allow you to track things on your website interactively. Interactive, actively. And basically, when you have GTM, you can bypass the webmaster and do it quickly and easily. So that's what GTM is all about. So why GTM? Because we just identified two benefits. One, you could track all the interactivity on your website. And two, you can bypass your web developer or webmaster. And so that's the benefit of GTM. So the benefit, you get those tags updated very quickly via Google Tag Manager. Okay, so that's what Tag Manager is. So what we're gonna talk about today is specifically what Tag Manager is and what it does. We're gonna list some of the benefits of Tag Manager. We're gonna show you how it works. And then we're gonna show you how to get started with Tag Manager. Tag Manager, if you're not familiar with working with webmasters and dealing with JavaScript and tags and all this jargon is just new to you today, okay, well, don't fret, sit back. We're gonna take it slow. This is an introduction into Google Tag Manager. Again, let's start out with what is Tag Manager. So we've already introduced it to some degree because we already introduced it as a tool where you can put all your tags into a toolbox, toy box, or container, so to speak, right? And we already already mentioned that, hey, you can bypass your webmaster. So you're probably thinking, well, if, I'm, if you're not familiar with Tag Manager, how can I bypass my webmaster? Well, first of all, it's a free tool, and it's a Google tool, hence the name Google Tag Manager. And it helps you really, that's the main point, is deploy and track tags on your website, bypassing your webmaster. So that's Tag Manager. And so examples of tags that can be deployed via Google Tag Manager are numerous. These are just some examples like Google Analytics, Facebook pixel tracking, or Google Ads. There's no limit into the number of tags you can track in Tag Manager. There is no limit. You can add any number of tracking tags in Tag Manager. Okay, so some of the benefits, well again, I, we just listed two. You can put any tag into Tag Manager and track that onto your website. And we know you can bypass your web developer or webmaster. And what it also does is it also allows you to test and deploy your JavaScript codes quicker. So remember, these JavaScript codes or snippets of codes are just 
there to track certain things on your website, whether that be a page view or somebody clicking on a play button or tracking somebody who converts or even just goes to your website. So the biggest benefit is you can take that snippet of code, let's just say Facebook. Let's just say you're doing Facebook marketing and you wanna put that Facebook pixel on your website so that you could track people who come from Facebook and convert. Well, you don't need to put that Facebook pixel on your website. You can go right to Tag Manager and you can put that snippet of code right in Tag Manager really quickly. And the other benefit here is all tags are managed in one place. And that's that to me is really a good benefit because when you start adding tags on your website and you have some tags in Tag Manager, it just gets very confusing. So ideally, all the tracking code you have on your website needs to be in Tag Manager. Think about that, all the tracking. So if you're doing Bing, or you're doing Facebook, or you're doing Twitter, or you're doing LinkedIn, and you're doing Google, you're doing all this type of marketing on all these different platforms, you're gonna have tracking code for all these different platforms. And instead of putting all that code on your website, return gonna slow down the slow, low time of your web page and website. You wanna put them all in Tag Manager so they can be organized, and you know exactly what you're trying to track. And the other great benefit of Tag Manager is there's a versioning control so let's just say you have added tags to your website via GTM for the last six months well and let's just say you add another tag yesterday if you added that tag yesterday and something doesn't work well you can just roll back to a previous version it's that simple so you have versioning and that's that's a good thing when you have versioning you can control what gets published and if something doesn't work after it gets published then you can roll back to a previous version so it's a a peace of mind so to speak just because you've added code to your site there's no guarantee it's going to work and so you can always control what version you're dealing with in tag manager and and we'll talk a little bit more about that. So the biggest benefit here to me with Tag Manager is you have event tracking. And so we talked about some of the things you could track on your website from videos, from play buttons to somebody clicking on the stop on the video or pausing it all the way to somebody again chatting or let's just say somebody clicking on that purchase button on your website. Okay, and you wanna track all these different things, these different interactivities and buttons. Well, event tracking is what you're going to use to track all those buttons. And to me, this is the biggest benefit of Tag Manager. And I'll show you some examples as we go along. And if we didn't mention it already, I'll mention it again, it is free. Tag Manager is free, there's no limit. So once you have Tag Manager going, you can add as many tracking codes as you want. There's no limit on the number of tracking codes you can add to Tag Manager, okay? So it's free and you can use it to its fullest advantage. Okay, so it's also high security, meaning that it has different levels of permissions. Okay, so you can have uh, somebody just go in and look at the different tags and tracking codes you have in GTM. Or you can ask somebody who is very familiar with Tag Manager and can go in and add the tracking code to Tag Manager and then publish that tracking code when it gets added. So those are all the benefits. Let's talk about how it works now. Specifically, how does Tag Manager work? Because you're like, Rob, okay, again, a lot of jargon. You know, you, you, you got tags and JavaScript and, and versioning and publishing and all this other stuff. Well, I know I'm throwing a lot at you at once, but just bear with me here, okay? So let's start talking about how it actually works. So you have a website, okay? Whatever that domain is, you have a website and there's chances are on your website, you have some form of interactivity, whether that be a video, whether that be a blog, whether it be a form submission. You have a website with some interactivity. And let's just say you're even thinking about getting ready to launch some type of campaign on maybe Google or Facebook and you wanna drive traffic to your website. Fair enough. You're joining the millions of other websites that are out there that have interactivity that also drive traffic to the website. So in comes Google Tag Manager. And so Tag Manager is important because again, we know we wanna track people coming from that Facebook campaign or that Google campaign interacting with our site. So if you are running Facebook and you are running Google Analytics, well, guess what? You wanna put that tracking code in Tag Manager. So Google Analytics being a Google product works very nicely with Tag Manager. Facebook 
has its own tracking code, and, but you still want to be able to track people who come from the Facebook campaign to your website. So you're going to get that tracking code from Facebook and put it in Tag Manager. That's generally how it works. So here, information from your website is shared with another data source through Tag Manager. So think about that. If I add Facebook tracking code to Tag Manager, or let's just say I add Google Analytics tracking code to Tag Manager, Tag Manager is the one that's pushing out and doing all the heavy lifting. They're the ones that are controlling what code gets fired and what code doesn't. So if you're putting the code in Tag Manager, Tag Manager's controlling the code. Think about it that way. And let's show you an example of what that looks like. So here I am, I'm in Tag Manager. I just went to tagmanager.google.com and here I could see a list of tags. So in our conversation, we're talking about tracking Facebook and we're talking about tracking Google Analytics. Well, Google Analytics is easy because it's a Google product. So here, if I look at all the different tracking code I have on my website through Tag Manager, let's just take a look at Google Analytics. So if you're gonna use Tag Manager, you might as well put the Google Analytics code in here. So here I can see I have Google Analytics as a tag in Tag Manager. Now, for Facebook, if I'm running a Facebook campaign, well, I can take that pixel tracking and put it in GTM as well. And here I could see Facebook pixel. That is, that code is added to GTM. I just basically took what Facebook gave me and put it into Google Tag Manager. So you can see I can add Facebook and Google Analytics. And again, I can't stress it enough, any tracking code from any platform, I can add to Google Tag Manager in order to track the behavior from those sources. So let's take a little bit deeper dive into how Tag Manager works. So I just showed you an example of how you could take Facebook and Google Analytics code and put it into Tag Manager. But if you're not familiar with Tag Manager, then how do I do that? Well, let's talk about the structure and how Tag Manager works. So when you have a Tag Manager account, you have a container, remember? I mentioned toy box earlier. You have a bunch of toys if they're their code and you're tracking different bits of code from different platforms like Facebook. Think of those as toys and you have a toy box. Okay, well that's what this code is and that's what a container is. The code is the code and that's gonna go into the toy box or container. And so the way Tag Manager works is you have tags, triggers, and variables. So if I take my Facebook tracking code and put it into a container, I need to set up a tag and a trigger. Okay, so let's take a look at what that is. So first, if I go back to Tag Manager, I'm gonna have an account and if I have an account, I'm going to have a container. So here I'm just gonna click on an account with a container and a container is nothing more than what website you're adding the tracking code to. Okay, that's all the container is. We're just letting Tag Manager know this is the website we're adding all this code to. So you have tags, triggers, and variables. That's the structure of Tag Manager. So tags are just what it says, tags. What are we trying to quote unquote tag? Well, if it's Google Analytics, that's easy. Here I could see I have Google Analytics added. So if I click on Google Analytics, here's my tag. And if I take a little bit of a deeper dive there, since Google, Analytics is a Google product. It integrates already with Tag Managers. It's pretty easy. I can just choose Google Analytics. Then I'm gonna check page view and that's my tag. Now, every tag needs a trigger, okay? So I need to tell Tag Manager how or when to fire the Google Analytics tracking code. So in this case, I'm gonna tell Tag Manager to fire on all pages. So if I get somebody, a visitor to my website, Analytics is firing on all pages. So whatever page that visitor lands on, Google Analytics is gonna fire. So that's really what it comes down to is I have a tag and I need to tell Tag Manager when to trigger that tag. That's really what the structure of Tag Manager is. It's tags, triggers, and variables. And variables, what we're gonna talk about here in a couple minutes. But you have a piece of code, you're gonna go ahead and put that into Tag Manager, you're gonna tag it, and then you're going to fire that trigger. So let's take a look at another example here. If I go back here, you can see Facebook. Well, here's my Facebook pixel, okay? That's my tag. 
So when is it gonna fire? Well, it's gonna fire on a specific domain or subdomain. That's basically what we're doing. We're trying to tell GTM when to fire that particular tag. So those are the three main components, a tag, okay, which is going to contain the JavaScript code that you get from say Facebook, the trigger. So you're going to go into Tag Manager and tell Tag Manager when to fire that code, that's the trigger. And then you have variables. And so variables are basically just additional information that Tag Manager may need for your tag and trigger to work. So that's what a variable is. It's there to get the tag and trigger to fire. So variables are divided into built-in and user-defined variables. So common user variables include say page path or page URL or host name or click class again they're there and these examples I just gave you are there to get your tag and trigger to work think about it that way they're just that's a component and if I go into tag manager here and here on the left side I can see variables so remember I have built-in and user defined so built-in means that tag manager already built these for me so in case I need to get my trigger to work with my tag I can use a variable so those are built in and then I have user defined. So these are what I define. These are what I created. And again, the variables are there to get the tag and trigger to work. Okay. So that's the job of the variable. The job of the tag is to host that JavaScript code. Okay. In the case of Facebook or analytics, that's where we're putting our code. So here, if I click on AdWords remarketing, again, it's a Google product. So I don't really need to even deal with code. I'm just going to select Google AdWords remarketing. Okay. So you could see GTM integrates nicely with some of the other Google products, but let's just say you have a Facebook pixel tracking code. You're going to choose custom and you're going to put the code here. So that's part of the tag. And then the trigger again is there to get the tag to fire. So you're telling GTM when to fire the tag and the variable is there to help you make sure that that trigger and that tag work together. So that's how all three kind of work together. You need the tag to put the code. You need the trigger to tell GTM when to fire the tag and code and the variables there to help you define when that tag and trigger should work or how it should work. So again, review tags are, they're just small codes of JavaScript or tracking pixels on your website. And so tags are allowed to manage events like scroll tracking, remarketing, clicks, downloads, files, play buttons, you name it, even clicks on external links. For example, let's just say you have a click uh, or a Facebook uh, icon on your site. And when somebody clicks on it, they go to Facebook. You want to maybe track that. You're going to create a tag. Okay? The trigger is there because you need to tell GTM when to fire that tag. So it's a certain condition, whether it's, you know, fire the tag if the URL equals facebook.com or some other condition. So the tag cannot be created until the creation of the corresponding trigger. So tags and triggers go together. You can't just create a tag and not have a trigger. Otherwise your tag will never fire. And then the variable is there again. It stores the information when defining a trigger or transferring data to tag. So a variable has a variety of data. Okay. So you pick and choose the variable you want to use with that trigger. Okay. So you're making sure that by defining a variable, you're making sure that you're telling GTM how that trigger should be fired. So let's take a look at another example here of how all three play together. If I'm in this account, I'm in this container. If I look down here, I could see Google Optimize. That's another Google product. So what I'm doing here is I just chose Google Optimize as my tag. It's already integrated. So what does that mean? I don't even need to deal with any code. I'm just going to select optimize. Well, we have the tag Google optimize, but we need to tell GTM how to fire that. And so here we're going to tell GTM to fire it on all pages. So that's basically a very simple example because we're firing it on all pages. So if I want to look at something specific again, Facebook, Here's my tag, here's my code. What's my trigger? Well, my trigger is it's gonna fire on specific pages. How do I know that? Well, if I look at the trigger, here I could see the trigger is a page view, but I'm telling it to fire on this particular host name. 
So the tag and trigger go hand in hand. So how to get started with Tag Manager. So first things first, you have to create that account. So you're gonna go to tagmanager.google.com or you can do a search for Google Tag Manager and you're going to create your account. And then when you create your account, what's gonna happen is you're going to set up a container. And when you set up a container, you have choices. So you could set it up for your website, for an app on iOS, or maybe Android, or you can even set it up for AMP, an accelerated mobile page. So most people by default are probably gonna set up Tag Manager for their website. And so when you do that, when you actually select website, what's gonna happen is you're going to get some Google Tag Manager code in return. And so the whole idea here is you're going to do a swap. What you're doing is basically you're saying, okay, Google, I'm gonna take this Google Tag Manager code and I'm gonna put it on my website. I'm gonna put it on every page of my website. So notice Tag Manager has two scripts. One goes in the head as high as possible. The other goes into the body tag as high as possible. And so what you're doing is you're making a deal. You're putting this tag manager code on your website and in return, every code you deal with, whether that be Facebook or analytics or optimize or remarketing or whatever it is, is gonna go in GTM. Okay, it's gonna go into the container you created. So you need the tag manager code on your website in order for tag manager to work. Okay, so when you add this code to your website, then you're free to start adding all sorts of tags to your container. But if you don't have this tracking code on your website, then none of the tags you add to your container are gonna work. So that's the idea behind the container. And then one thing I wanted to mention on the account is it's a Google account. So when you create your account, then make sure it's the same account you use with say Google Analytics or some other Google product. That's a good best practice is always use the same email address when you set up your account so that it integrates nicely across all the different platforms. Meaning you can go from say Google Analytics right to Google Tag Manager in one browser without having to log out or log in. Okay, so when you create the account, you're gonna create your container. If you choose web, then you're gonna be asked to place code on your website. And when you place that code on your website, then you are free to start using Tag Manager. And that means you're free to start adding tags. Okay, so if you wanna know more information about installing Google Tag Manager, then what I would recommend is visit the Quick Start Guide website of GTM. So again, if you're curious as to where that code is located in Google Tag Manager, well, when you create an account and you create a container, that container is gonna have a specific ID. So if I click on that specific ID, here's where I can get my code, okay? So again, when I'm logged in to Tag Manager, I'm gonna click on Workspace, but in the top navigation, I'm gonna see my unique GTM ID. If I click on that, that's where my code is gonna be located. And so again, your code needs to go in the header, and there's another script that needs to go in the body. And if you're not sure how to add the code to your website, well, you can always click on the quick start guide here, okay? And that'll take you to a quick start guide page, a reference page related to Google Tag Manager. So let's talk about creating a tag. So once you get Tag Manager installed, I'm sure you're excited to get going and create that first tag. So let's talk about how to create a tag in Tag Manager. So when you're in Tag Manager, all you need to do is Basically, you're looking at all your tags. If you click on tag in the left side navigation, you'll see all your tags and there's a new button there. So you just click new. And so basically what you're gonna do is you're going to create your first tag. And so what I would recommend, once you get Tag Manager installed on your website, I would recommend setting the first tag up as Google Analytics. So that will get you going with tracking page views on your website when some when somebody visits your website, okay? So ideally, that's what you wanna do. You wanna get Google Analytics as your first tag and tag manager. 
So what I'm gonna do is because Analytics is a Google product, it's already integrated nicely with Tag Manager. So I'm just gonna click on Google Analytics. It's going to be a page view, that's what I'm tracking. And now I have to set up a variable. And so what it's going to do, it's gonna ask me to set a, select a variable. And so what you're gonna do is you're gonna select new variable. And what you're going to do is you're actually gonna go and add your tracking ID here. That's gonna be your variable. So where do I get my tracking ID in analytics? Well, if I'm in analytics, I'm gonna to go to admin and then under property settings, I'm gonna see my tracking ID. And all you need to do then is go to tag manager and paste copy first you got to copy over that tracking id then you're going to go to tag manager and paste it and then that's going to create a variable for you and then when you create that variable you're going to see it in the drop down here so i've already created it and basically that's your tag with a variable then what are you going to do you're going to set up a trigger so see i have some triggers already set up you're going to see a default trigger already set up for you and that's going to be all pages. So ideally what you want to do is you want to select all pages in order for analytics to fire on all pages. So that's what we're doing. We're setting up a trigger. We're basically telling Tag Manager, hey, if I get a visitor to any page on my website, then I want you to fire Google Analytics. So that's basically, in summary, how to set up your first tag. And my recommendation is your first tag should be Google Analytics. And when you set up analytics, you're gonna have to set up a variable for the tracking ID. And so you get the tracking ID again from admin, property settings, copy and paste that tracking ID over, save it, you have your variable, that variable is gonna be included in with the tag, then your trigger is gonna be all pages. And there you go, you have your first tag, you have your first variable, you have your first trigger. So that's basically what you wanna do. And once you've added that tag, once you've added that trigger, then the only thing you need to do now is basically publish the tag. And so anytime you save a tag, you're going to go ahead and submit it. So that way it gets published. So again, what you're gonna do is let's take a step back here. You're going to choose new tag. You're gonna choose analytics from the drop down menu. You're gonna choose page view. Then basically you're going to add your tracking ID so you could set up the variable. And then basically that's what you need to do. Okay, you're gonna add that tracking ID and then voila, that's your tag with a variable. And then once you've done that, then you're going to click submit. So when you click submit, you're basically saying, hey, I want this tag to go live now, this tag and trigger. And once you've done that, then analytics is ready to go. And anytime somebody goes to your website on any page, Tag Manager is gonna fire Google Analytics. So the great thing here is you have something called Google Tag Assistant, and that's a, an extension that works with Chrome. And so when you've actually added Tag Manager to your site, or you have analytics running in Tag Manager, you can confirm if those tags are firing properly. So let's take a look at how Google Tag Assistant works. Okay, so if you just do a search for Google Tag Assistant, you're gonna see here that it's basically just an extension that works in Chrome, and it unfortunately it only works in Chrome browser. It doesn't work in any other browser. So go ahead and install that extension into Chrome. And when you do that, you're gonna see this nice icon here in your browser. And now, if you go to any website and I click on Google Tag Assistant, and I click on Enable, okay, so basically I'm loading Google Tag Assistant, and now once I refresh the page, I can see that this particular site has Google Tag Manager installed. And not only does it have Tag Manager installed, I can see that it also has Google Analytics running, I have also Google Optimize running, and I have Google Ads Remarketing Tag running in Tag Manager. So that's what Tag Assistant does, it allows you to see if one tag manager is on the site, and if it is, great, what other tags are firing on this particular site? So Tag Assistant's telling me I have these particular tags firing on that site, and they're firing within Tag Manager. So Tag Assistant is a great way to confirm if one, tag manager's on the site, and two, what other tags are firing on the site. Now. Another way you could confirm if Tag Manager is firing on the site is you can go into preview mode. So 
even before you submit and publish your tag and trigger, you can click on the preview mode. So if I click preview in tag manager, so basically that's going to put me in preview mode. And so what does that mean? Well, that means that now I'm free to go to my website and see if those tags are firing. And so let's take a look at what that looks like. So if I go to the website and just click refresh, then what's gonna happen is Tag Manager is gonna load in preview mode, just as you see here. Okay, so that's gonna take a second, couple seconds to load up. And now what can I see in preview mode? I could see that I have GTM firing, but I also have some other tags firing on this page. Remarketing, I have Google Analytics, I have Google Optimize. I have some other tags firing as well. And so the preview mode shows me what tags are firing on any given page. And I can also see what tags did not fire. Okay, so here I have a number of tags already in GTM, but they didn't fire on this particular page. So let's just say I clicked on the donate now button. I'm still in preview mode. So I'm gonna be able to see what tags fired. Now I could see I have a couple of tags that have fired on this particular page. And then I could see what tags did not fire on this page, okay? So that's the preview mode. You can use the preview mode before you even submit a tag and trigger to see if it fires. And that's the great benefit of Tag Manager. So if you're not sure if something's going to fire or not, then you can always go into preview mode. Um, and if you are sure it's gonna fire, then you can go ahead and submit it. So you can leave preview mode and just go ahead and submit that particular tag and trigger. So here I'm gonna leave preview mode. And now once I'm done and I'm sure the tag is gonna fire and go ahead and submit all my changes that I've worked on in terms of setting up tags and triggers. So that's really GTM in a nutshell. So I have my tags, okay, my tags are just snippets of code that I'm going to put in, whether that be Facebook or vet tracking or any other Google product like Optimize or PageView. Then I have my triggers. My triggers are there to tell GTM when to fire that tag. And the variables are there to help those tags and triggers work together. So remember that particular variable we set up for Google Analytics, okay, so here it is right here because we want to tell GTM what property to specifically fire in Google Analytics. So that's why we set up that variable. But there are all sorts of variables. Google Tag Manager has built in or variables already created for you or you can specifically define a variable. So variables are there to help the tags and triggers work together. So when you set up a tag, you set up a trigger, you use a variable, you can always go into preview mode, preview it by going to the website, seeing if it fires. If it fires, then voila, you can go ahead and click submit and that will publish the tag and trigger and you're good to go. That's pretty much how Tag Manager works. And again, I can't stress that there is an unlimited number of tags you can add to Tag Manager. There's no limit. So you got everything from anything from Google to non-Google to event tracking, okay? To Facebook, to anything that you wanna track, you wanna be able to put into Tag Manager. And again, there's versioning. That's one of the great benefits of Tag Manager. So if I wanna go back to an older version, I can simply do that. So here you can see I'm on version 32. That's how Tag Manager works. And I can't stress that, you know, Tag Manager is there to help you track interactivity on the site. Because if you have a site that's interactive, that has a video, that has a download button, let's just say, you know, you have all sorts of newsletter signups, Facebook, YouTube buttons on your website, just like this website does, and you want to be able to track how many people click on that particular button, well, you're going to need Tag Manager. And when you have Tag Manager, you're going to be able to track all of these button clicks and interactivity on your website. Without Tag Manager, it's going to be hard to do that. So that's an introduction to Tag Manager. Google Analytics is a web analytics service offered by Google. It was launched back in 2005. It tracks and reports website traffic. From the information through Wikipedia, Google Analytics is the most used web analytics service. As per the sources, in April 2022, Google Analytics was used by 73%
of the 10,000 most popular websites across the globe. However, as per the reports from Beltway.com, 2 crore 81 lakh 52,477 live websites use Google Analytics. So now is the time to understand what has been changed in Google Analytics over the years. If you are new to Google Analytics, it's even better. Before moving forward, do subscribe to Simply Learn and hit the bell icon to never miss any updates from Simply Learn. So, what makes Google Analytics so important? Google Analytics generates various types of reports and helps to track bounce rates, identify the best content of your website, record user behavior flow on your site, and many other metrics, thereby allowing you to understand and build your business strategies thereby growing your business now that you have understood why google analytics is essential let's check what we have for you in this video first we will understand what is google analytics for then we will move forward with identifying google analytics version for your website next we will have a detailed look at Universal Analytics and Google Analytics 4. We will continue by understanding success stories from Google Analytics 4 users. And finally, we will end this session by understanding the future of Google Analytics 4. So allow me to introduce the next generation of Google Analytics, Google Analytics 4, also known as GA4. Initially, Google Analytics 4 was known as App Plus Web. Google Analytics 4 is the latest analytics property with several advantages over the old Google Analytics, also known as Universal Analytics. Understanding more clearly, Google Analytics 4 can measure and keep track of website traffic as well as app usage. So now you can imagine that Google Analytics 4 is the one-stop solution for all your analytics needs. If you are still using Universal Analytics, we recommend you to get familiar with Google Analytics 4 as well. As this is the new future of analytics, we will understand creating and setting up Google Analytics 4 account in detail in the upcoming videos. Let's first identify which Google Analytics property is associated with your website. In order to identify which Google Analytics property you have, log into your Google Analytics account. Now, go to Analytics account and then open Properties and Apps. Here, you can see properties for your website. Now, below the Properties and Apps, Several properties are listed where you can see different IDs. If the ID starts with UA and ends with a number, then you have a universal analytics property. However, if ID only has numbers like here, then you have Google Analytics 4 property. We will learn how to switch the Universal Analytics account to Google Analytics 4 in the upcoming videos. Now that you have understood how to identify Google Analytics property, let's take a detailed look at the comparison of Universal Analytics data and Google Analytics 4 data. The major difference between Universal Analytics and Google Analytics 4 is the measurement model. Universal Analytics uses sessions and page views as the measurement model, whereas Google Analytics 4 uses events and parameters as the measurement model. Therefore, any hit type from Universal Analytics property, say a page view, user timing, etc., are captured as event in Google Analytics 4 property. Let's see the detailed comparison of every aspect of Universal Analytics and Google Analytics 4. First, we go with events. In Analytics, every measurable action, for example, page load, form completion, scrolls, 
app installs etc is measured as event an event has category label and action in universal analytics moreover it has its own hit type in case of google analytics 4 there is no categorization all the hit types from universal analytics are considered as events now let's find the comparison of universal analytics and google analytics 4 in terms of page views page views is a metric defined that calculates total number of pages viewed on your website now let's get a better understanding of page views for instance when user lands on a web page of your site the page loads this is considered to be a page view now suppose if user reloads the page google analytics tracks it as another page view if the user navigates to another page of your website and returns to the same page this adds another page view to your site now that you have understood page views let's see how page views differs in universal analytics and google analytics 4 from universal analytics page view are translated to google analytics 4 property as page view event this page view event automatically gets triggered in google tag manager the next metric we have is sessions session is the time duration for which user is active on your website a universal analytics session may consist of multiple page views, events, e-commerce transactions, etc. The session is considered to be ended if the user has 30 minutes of inactivity or any other event for which session end is triggered. In Google Analytics 4, session metrics are tracked from session start event, which automatically gets triggered with the basic interaction on your website. However, the session duration depends on the period between the first and the last event. Now, let's check our next metric, which is custom dimension. In Universal Analytics, custom dimension adds the information to the collected data. Whereas, in Google Analytics 4, information is added through the event parameters. Moving ahead, the next metric we have is content grouping. Content grouping in Universal Analytics allows to group content into a logical structure, after which one can view and compare metrics by the group name. Now, talking about Google Analytics 4, it has predefined event parameter for content group. This parameter fills the data into content group. Moving ahead, the next metric we have is client id client id is a unique string generated randomly and acts as a pseudonymous identifier client id identifies the browser instance and then it gets stored in the browser cookies and therefore subsequent visits to the same site are associated with that user in both universal analytics and google analytics 4 client id serves the same purpose that is the client id is responsible for providing the identifier now let's move ahead with our next metric parameters parameters are associated with google analytics 4 properties understanding in detail about parameters parameters are the chunk of information that specifies the user action for example, parameters can be passed to describe the value of the purchase. Next we have is user property. User properties provide information like preferred language or geographical location of the users that interact with your website or app. Now that we have seen difference between Universal Analytics and Google Analytics 4 properties, the question definitely arises. Can Google Analytics really bring success to your business? Well, if you have a good understanding of your audience 
and have extraordinary strategies to work on. The Google Analytics is your best companion. Here are some success stories by Google Analytics for users. We all know about McDonald's, the leading fast food corporation with a huge number of outlets across the globe. Recently, a case study has been shared by McDonald's Hong Kong, which suggests that the company has experienced growth in conversions by 550% through the in app orders. And what made them achieve such a great growth? Yes, you guessed it right. It's Google Analytics 4. Let's have a look on their success story. The major goal for the company was to redesign the strategy to increase in app food orders, predict the behavior of in app audiences, and reach the right customers with McDonald's mobile order campaigns. To achieve the goals, McDonald's used a simple yet smart approach and implemented Google Analytics 4 properties. With the help of predictive audiences in Google Analytics 4 properties, they tried converting audiences into customers. Moreover, with the help of Google Ads, they were able to manage the campaigns. As a result of the smart efforts, McDonald was able to gain increase in conversions by 550% for the users who are likely to purchase in next 7 days. Isn't it amazing? Moreover, for the same audience, McDonald's had noticed a visible decrease in cost per action by 63% and an increase in revenue by 560%. Some other companies that have seen growth in their business through Google Analytics 4 includes PepsiCo, ClaroShop, etc. With the proven success of top brands in the world, let us know what the future of Google Analytics 4 holds. As per the reports on BuiltWit.com, there are 2 crore 81,52,477 live websites that are using Google Analytics. Out of which there are 1 crore 21,73,439 live websites from USA and 4,68,538 live websites from India who are using Google Analytics. If we look in detail, we have a list of big names like Bank of America, Blogger.com, Cisco, Netflix, Coursera. Flipkart, ICICI Bank, Tesla India, IRCTC, Mintra, etc. that are using Google Analytics for their growth. However, we are all well aware of the success stories of all the biggies on the list. Thus, Google Analytics will continue to be an important part of new business strategies. So let's start with the keyword research. So with keyword research tools, you can do your job a lot more efficiently finding the right relevant keywords. I mean, that's really key to SEO is finding keywords that are relevant to your business, product or service that you wanna rank for. So you wanna be able to choose keywords with high search volume and low competition. So where do you get those numbers? You get those from certain tools. You also wanna get forecasts for certain targeted keywords. You wanna be able to generate a list of latent semantic indexing type keywords or keywords close to the keyword you're trying to target you want to be able to select primary and secondary keywords wisely so having a list of keywords or certain data points will help you do that and you want to be able to identify the keywords that your competitors are also ranking for so good keyword research tool will help you do all of those things so what are some of the, the tools out there well look no further than some of the free ones that Google offers like Google Trends so Google Trends is a good tool that you can lean on. So if we look at Google Trends, all you need to do is trends.google.com. You could type in a keyword. I can look at the volume or interest of that keyword over time here. I'm looking at football versus American football and I could see how it's trending. Then I could see you know, how it trends in specific regions of say the United States as my market. I can also look at other related queries similar to football or 
American football. And so Google Trends is a good tool, helps you look at the volume, helps you look at what specific regions, helps you look at other keywords. You know, if you want, you can simply just do a keyword search or you can actually just see what's trending just by looking at the latest stories and insights. So we could see International Women's Day, you know, started to pick up steam, it's picking up more steam, etc. So it's certain keywords that tend to trend well and you could pick up on what those keywords are using Google Trends. Now, you could also use another Google tool called Google Keyword Planner. The only difference is this one's paid. You need a Google Ads account. So if we go into Google Ads, hey, you'll need to go to Tools and you'll need to go to Keyword Planner. But when you're in Keyword Planner, you can find new keywords. So if I type in, for example, you know, online marketing and click get started, what the keyword tool is going to do is give me the data that I need to do appropriate keyword research. It's going to give me my keyword and similar keywords. It's going to give me the average monthly volume. And the great thing here is I can actually see the trend for that keyword over time just by clicking on this little bar graph. So for digital marketing, I could see what the trend is over time. I could see what the competition is. I could see, you you know, if I'm going to bid on this keyword, I could see what the bidding range is. So more important, I could see the volume and I could see the competition. Here's my volume for this keyword over the last 12 months on average, and here's my competition. So Google's Keyword Planner gives you the necessary information you need to choose relevant keywords wisely. Now there are other tools out there that are paid that help you look for relevant keywords like SEMrush or Keyword Finder, that's a freemium tool Tool. So there are plenty of tools available to you. You know, another tool I use that's not listed here is Moz. So if you just type a keyword, let's just type in the same keyword like online marketing, for example. Okay, so what Moz is going to do is going to give me some volume. It's going to give me some other keyword suggestions. Okay, it's going to tell me how difficult that keyword is. And it's going to tell me who else is ranking for that keyword. So it gives me, again, all the relative information I need, including competitive information. So you can use these these keyword tools, Moz is freemium, some are paid, some are free. There's plenty of tools out there, but these are the ones I would recommend for keyword research. Now let's turn our attention to technical SEO. So for technical SEO, you're gonna need to use some tools. There's no getting around that because you wanna be able to monitor how your website is performing. I mean, is it loading slow, for example? Does it have a lot of uh, issues with the website in terms of uh, server-side rendering, for example? Or or server response time. What about 404s and redirects? So you wanna be able to gather a lot of the technical information that could aid or prohibit your site from ranking. So you wanna be able to also, you know, look at what the bots are seeing and how they're viewing your website. So if Google goes to crawl your site, are they experiencing, you know, a slow server response time? Or are they experiencing pages not found? You also wanna see if you have a sitemap. You know, what's the sitemap? Are these bots crawling your site or getting the pages from a sitemap. And again, you wanna be able to lean on some of these tools to help you fix errors that you may encounter like meta tags or 404s or canonicals. So you need a good tool to help you manage all that. And so I'm gonna go back to Moz starting out. So if we go back to Moz, Moz is a good tool. It's an all-in-one, it's a great SEO platform. So if I go to Moz and I log into an account, I can just go to site crawl. And so what Moz is gonna do, it's it's gonna give me a lot of information about how Moz's bot is seeing my site. Okay, so if I go to the site crawl, I can look at all the particular critical uh, issues that I've experienced. So I could see four four errors, okay, redirects related to that. I could see meta descriptions, missing meta descriptions, duplicate content. So there's a lot of different issues that Moz is detecting for this particular site. And the great thing about Moz, and this is why I use Moz as my SEO platform, Platform. I don't work for Moz, I've just used them a long time, is if you do have issues, then they give you ways to fix it, the how to fix it section. So if I see missing description here, if I just click on review, I can get a more in-depth analysis as to what the issues are here. But 
I can also click on the why and how to fix, okay? And they're gonna give you some information about how this is impacting SEO and what you could do to fix the issue. They lay out the issues pretty prominently here. You can see for all the metadata issues I have, I have, you know, 142 total metadata issues. I have 10 title tag too longs. I have 122 missing meta descriptions. So they lay it out nicely here up the top so you can kind of get a sense of what to work on. And again, they prioritize it based on the severity of the issue. And then they break it down into several categories. For example, I just looked at metadata issues. You could see if I click on content issues, I have some duplicate content that Moz is recognizing or missing or valid H tags. So Moz does a really, really great job laying all, all the issues out for you to recognize. Okay, there's another tool that I like to use called Screaming Frog. It's a pay tool. So if we go look here, great thing I like about uh, a Screaming Frog, it will crawl your site and it will give you some a list of issues just like Moz does of, you know, what it sees in your site. Is it experiencing 404s, broken links? Are there any redirects it's picking up? Duplicate content, sitemaps, you know, there JavaScript issues, how does it see the site architecture? So it really does take a deep look at everything that could impact your website from ranking. Okay, there are other tools out there like, you know, Deep Crawl or WooRank. They're both paid. And so pay tools are really great as well. It just depends on, you know, your pricing structure, what your budget is. But really, when it comes to all these tools, they all more or less overlap and do the same thing. You just need to rely on one of them to make sure that you're able to see what the issues are. Now, there's nothing wrong with using two of them just as a second reference point to see if both are picking up the same issue. And of course, I like to use Search Console. I always like to lean on Google Search Console because that is the source. So Search Console will also you know, give you some feedback on how Google's bot is crawling your site. So that's under the crawl error section here. So you can also you know, use Search Console to upload a sitemap. So that's a key to SEO, you want Google to be able to find your web pages quickly so you can simply just uh, signify to Google where your sitemap is located. So the Search Console does a lot more, gives you some HTML improvements, gives you some backlinking, uh, and then the process of updating the Search Console user interface. So there's a new user interface that you can use with Google Search Console. The great thing is it's free and it has everything you need to know about your website and how it's affected by SEO, organic search. The only thing you have to do with Search Console is verify the site. But once you verify it, it has all the relevant information you need. So let's talk about backlink monitoring and analysis. Okay, so this is related to off-page SEO. So you're gonna need a good tool to help you monitor your website backlinks. And backlinks are simply just links from external sites pointing to your site. And you need to keep an eye on what sites are linking to yours. Are they spammy related sites? Are they good or relevant sites or anything in between? So you need to really be able to analyze what the good links are and what the bad links are pointing to your website. And you can also, you know, given the tool, also perform some competitor analysis. So you should be able to use a tool to be able to compare how your site's ranking against your competitor. Okay, you want to measure the ratio of referring domains to backlinks. So how many pure domains are linking to your site? So you want a tool that's going to be able to tell you that. You want to identify and disavow poor backlinks. Okay, so you want to be able to recognize which sites are linking to yours that's actually hurting you from an SEO standpoint. And you want to be able to do something about that. Okay, you want to measure citation flow and trust flow. You want to check the ratio of link distribution in terms of is it internal or external or you know what kind of sites are linking to my site are they you know social related are they pure content related and then you want to be able to track the number of do follow and no follow links you know how many links pointing to our site are actually telling Google and other bots not to follow the link or how many are actually allowing the bots to follow that link if a bot follows a link it's going to pass what we call link juice so you're gonna get credit for the backlink. If it's a nofollow, you're not gonna get credit for the backlink. And 
we want to be able to measure that. And so we want to have tools that will help us do that. So what are some of those tools? Well, Hrefs is a good tool. It's a pain tool. Majestic is a freemium tool. Moz, again, Moz is the tool I use. SEMrush, and then again, I got to mention Google Search Console. So let's take a look at some of these tools in terms of backlink monitoring and analysis. So let's start with Google Search Console. Again, it's free. You just have to verify your site. And so if I go to Google Search Console, I can look at links and I could see what external links I have pointing to my site. Okay, so I could see I have 17,000 in this example pointing to the homepage of this particular site. Okay, so if I click on that, I could see all the, the top sites pointing to my homepage. Now, from an off-page SEO perspective, do you want every backlink or external link pointing to your homepage? No. So you want links pointing to internal pages. So you want to be able to measure that. So I could see what the top linking sites are, and I could also see what the anchor text is. So do I want my anchor text always to be my brand name? No. I want it to be, you know, keyword we're trying to target. Search Console also gives you some internal links. Okay, what are the top link pages for internal links? So from an SEO perspective, you always want to have a nice balance of internal linking. So this report helps you understand what pages are getting links and are the links evenly spread. So this is Google Search Console. This is the links report. This is totally free. This is provided by Google. All you have to do is verify your site. Now, if we go over to Moz, we type in a domain, any domain. So I just typed in Simply Learn. Okay, Moz has some metrics that are important to off-page SEO, including domain authority. So the higher your domain authority, the better off you are. And so what helps a domain authority grow is how many quality links are pointing to that domain. And so here we could see over 7,500 linking domains to Simply Learn. So what's important is we just don't want any site. We want quality relevant sites pointing. Okay, so we could see how many total inbound links and then how many ranking keywords we have. Okay, so here, Moz is going to give me kind of an idea of what my domain authority has been over time. They're going to tell me the top followed links to the site. So they're going to tell me, you know, what are those links pointing to my site and what's the page authority of those sites? Okay, here I can get a nice graphical breakdown of the linking domains by domain authority. So you want pages with high domain authority pointing to your site. So here I could see 69 linking domains between 91 and 100. So that's really good. We want high relevant domains linking to our site. So just like Search Console, I could see the top anchor text being used. Okay, and I can see the top pages that have you know good page authority on the site. I could see following versus no follow on internal and external links. So this is just the overview. So Moz really, really does break down for you, you know, what those pages and linking domains are. So if I just click on linking domains. Now I could get a detailed look for my homepage, what domains are pointing to our domain. So I could see Microsoft.com has a domain authority of 100, YouTube 99. And so not only does Moz provide you with the domains, it also provides you with their domain authority score and spam score. So you want to keep an eye on any particular site that has a high spam score. So having a site with a high spam score and a low domain authority will hurt your domain and page authority for that page. So Moz does a great job of breaking it out and this is for any page. It doesn't necessarily have to be the home page. Okay, if I take a look at another example here, Majestic. So Majestic, again, I can use a free version of the tool. They have their own metrics, citation flow, trust flow. So when they say trust flow, what's the link quality all about? Okay, citation flow, what's the link volume? And okay, they can get an idea of how many external backlinks are pointing to the site and and what's the trend on that, referring domains. So Majestic does a really good job. Again, some of the same metrics that we could see here, except they go into detail about languages as well. So this is Majestic and you got Search Console, you got a lot of other tools. And then I'm gonna just revert back to Moz because you wanna be able to compare link profiles. If you're in a competitive space and you're doing off-page SEO, you know, Moz will help you compare how your site stands against maybe another competitive site or relevant site. So just doing this analysis, I can compare my domain authority, spam score, how many total links, you know, how many external followed links or external no followed links, a breakdown of linking domains. So it does
does a nice job of comparing one site versus another. That's going back to Moz, and that's what you want. You want a good tool that's going to help you do that. I mean, there's other tools out there not listed like Bright Edge that will also help you compare linking profiles. So at the end of the day, if you're doing off-page SEO, you want to get a sense of what sites are linking to yours. Are they quality sites? Are they spammy? What anchor text are they using? Are they no follow? Are they do follow? You know, are they top domains? How do you compare against your competitors? I mean, all these metrics are related to off-page SEO. So you want a good tool that's going to help you measure this. Okay, so let's talk about rank tracking. So when we do keyword research, we're looking for relevant keywords. We find our relevant keywords. We assign primary and secondary keywords to pages. We optimize those pages. We do off-page SEO. And we're doing all this work for SEO. Okay, we want to be able to measure the fruits of our labor. We want to be able to measure how we perform for on and off page SEO for the keywords we covet and the pages they're related to. And so that's where rank tracking comes into play. So we want to be able to track our website's ranking and not just our website, all the pages we've optimized. We want to be able to measure our click through rates and impressions. We want to be able to track the ranking for both desktop and mobile for specific locations. And we want to identify top performing, gaining and losing keywords. So in other words, we want to look at trends. Is a keyword ranking? Is it going up in ranking? Is it going down in ranking? If it's going down in ranking, then you need to take action. So you need a tool, a good tool for rank tracking. So we can look no further than again, Google Search Console. It's free. It's right from the source. So let's take a look at what Google Search Console has to offer in terms of rank tracking. So if I go to Google Search Console and I put in a URL, what it's going to do is it's going to give me and this is the search queries report. It's going to give me what queries people have used to actually type into google.com. And it's going to be able to tell me how many times my pages show pages showed up for that query. It could be more than one page. So that's an impression. And if I did receive an impression, meaning did my page show up in the organic listing, then did I get a click as a result? And so in this case, if I got 68 impressions and 10 clicks for keywords somebody typed in, that's a 14.7% click through rate. And so what Search Console will also do is say, hey, look, for that particular keyword, you appeared on average in position 4.1. So it gives you really good insight as to, you know, what people are typing in and how you're being found for those keywords. It breaks it down by pages. It breaks it down by country, breaks it down by device. So I could see, you know, mobile, I've had 899 impressions over the last three months on mobile. And I received 33 clicks as a result. My average position on mobile was 2.6. So Search Console does a really good job. Again, this is free information of providing you the actual keyword somebody's using on Google search as a query and how many impressions you're receiving for that keyword, how many clicks, click the rate, and then average position. So in theory, the higher you are positioned on Google, the more clicks you're going to receive. So if I'm not positioned properly for keyword, let's just say page two, then I'm probably not going to receive as many clicks as I would like. So that's Search Console. There are other tools out there like Hrefs, again, does a good job of tracking AMZ Tracker. We look at Wincher. So there's some good tools out there. I'm just going to show you another one again. I'm going to go back to Moz, for example. So Moz has a tool called, so if I go back into the account, so Moz has a, a rankings tool that you can look at to see where your keywords are ranking. So if you've already chosen keywords and optimized pages for those keywords, then you want to be able to load those keywords into Moz. And so Moz allows you to do that. And so what Moz does, they do a crawl once a week and they'll be able to tell you where you rank for all your keywords. Are we moving up in the rankings? Or are we moving down? How many keywords do we have ranked between positions one and three, 11 through 20, four through 10, 21 through 50. So we'll be able to see where our keywords rank. And so it gives you a breakdown here of nationally in the United States where this keyword is ranked and if it's moved up or down and for what URL is it ranked for. And so you can label so the keywords and, and this is what you want to look for in a good tool. You want to be able to organize your keywords and label them. So for all our brand keywords, we want to be able to label them branded because ideally you don't want to optimize for your brand keywords. So maybe we want to exclude our brand keywords and look at our non-brand keywords in terms of ranking. And so you can certainly add locations and look at specific
specific locations. The whole idea between a good ranking tool is to be able to measure, you know, if a keyword is trending up or down. Okay, so I can simply look at a particular keyword and I can see the trend of that keyword. And then, you know, if a keyword's not ranking, then we want to wonder why it's not ranking. Well, is it difficult? Is it not ranking because of its difficulty? Or can we do a better job of optimizing for that keyword? And so Moz also has a page optimization tool. So if you're not ranking for a keyword, you can flip over to the page optimization tool, then put in the keyword, put in the URL, and Moz will give you some idea as to what you can further do to, to optimize the page. Okay, so that's Moz. You know, this is Ahrefs. So you can see Ahrefs does the same thing. They provide you some visibility, average position, how much traffic, you know, where you're ranking in terms of positions, one through three, four through 10, 11 through 50. And so you want to be able to get a sense of where my track keywords are trending. Are they trending up? Are they trending down? And the whole idea, again, behind a ranking tool is if you're trending down, you want to be able to address why it's trending down. So you want to start with on-page SEO. Can we do a better job of optimizing or off-page? Does that page need more backlinks? So that's why you need a backlink tool to support your ranking. And Ahrefs does offer up some competitor information as well. So you can see how your competitors are performing. So these are some good examples of ranking tools that you could take advantage of. Now, there are also a few important SEO tools that can be helpful in different ways. For example, if you're doing video. So there are some tools to help you measure how you're performing via video. For example, vidIQ. So let's take a look at vidIQ. So if I load in, say, a video in YouTube, in this example, how to rank YouTube videos, I have a vidIQ extension loaded into my browser in Chrome. And so now I can get a good sense of how many views, the duration, the engagement rate, the like ratio, how many people shared it on Reddit. But further, I can look at how the video was optimized. So they're telling me the title's too long here, maybe shorten it up, but we have tags, we have descriptions, we have cards, we have end screens. It's been shared on Facebook. It hasn't been shared on Twitter. Okay, it is public. We do have pinned comments and we do have hearted comments. And so this gives me an idea of how we did in terms of optimizing this particular video. Okay, so if we wanted to tweak it, we could tweak the title tag, make it a little bit shorter to help it rank better on YouTube. So you want to be able to use a tool like this because if you have videos, then you want those videos to rank. And so you can certainly watch this video on how to rank your YouTube videos. And in that video, we do allude to vidIQ. So you want to be able to use a tool like this because, you know, YouTube, it is a video portal, but it's the second largest search engine behind Google. So if you do have videos, you want to be able to rank for them and you want a tool that's going to help you measure and help you understand if you are ranking if you're not ranking why are you not ranking now for content optimization there are tools you can use like SEO site checkup or site analyzer are some good tools if you already have Moz as an example just going back to Moz as you already know I use Moz a lot so they have a page optimization so you could check the content and how you're optimized your content so it's gonna give me some good feedback on you know is your page title meta description are they in line? Okay, so it's going to give you some good feedback on that. You also have, again, I have to allude to Search Console. You can always look at a particular page in Search Console, see if it has any errors as well. So is it duplicated meta description? Is it a duplicated title tag? Is it any pages missing title tags or meta descriptions? So when it comes to content, you can look at Search Console, you can lean on Moz, or you can lean on some of these other paid versions like Site Analyzer. When it comes to traffic, Traffic and metrics look no further than Google Analytics. There is a free version of Google Analytics as well as a paid version. So if I go into Google Analytics, it's going to tell me all of my website behavior. Okay, who's coming to my site, how they got to my site, how they behaved once they went to my site, and are they achieving the goals I set out for them to achieve via conversions. And so you want to look at first in Google Analytics how much traffic you're getting. So if I go to Google Analytics, if I go to acquisition, all traffic channels, I should be able to see how much traffic organic search is driving over a period of time. So I could see how many users, how many sessions. Then if I click on landing pages, I could see what landing page they went to. So 
I could see the home page over a particular time had over a thousand sessions. I can also see engagement from organic search. Are they bouncing? How many pages are they looking at in this session after they landed on a particular page? Are they staying on the site a long time? What's their duration? Or are they achieving any goals? So analytics will provide me all that information about how organic search as a channel is performing. The other thing about Google Analytics I like, and that goes back to the technical aspect of SEO, and that's site speed. So if you go to behavior and you go to site speed overview, you'll be able to see how my pages are loading. What's the average load time? So they'll break it down for you by browser, by country, and by specific page. So if I look at page timings, I'll be able to see what page is loading slow, what page is loading quick compared to site average. And so the great thing about analytics is if I have a page that's loading slow compared to site average, they'll actually provide me with some suggestions. So if I go to site speed and speed suggestions, what they're going to do is they're going to have a link in the report that's going to allow me to click on it and I'm going to be able to see what suggestions they can provide. So when this report loads, I'll be able to see what the speed suggestions are for my pages. So here I could see the page. I could see what the average load time is of that page. So for example, this particular page is loading at six seconds. Ideally, we want to have you know three seconds or under maximum. So if I just click on this link here, they're giving me six page speed suggestions. So if I click on that, I'm going to go to another Google tool called Page Speed Insights. And then Page Speed Insights is going to run for both mobile and desktop for this particular page. And then this Page Speed Insights report is going to give me feedback as to what I need to do to speed up the load time of that page. So here you can see for desktop and mobile, they're going to give me some suggestions and opportunities. So reduce the server response time, properly size images, serve images in next gen formats. So all these will shave off time off my page load time. And so that's what's going to help me speed up the page load. And that's page speed insights you can get to from the speed suggestions report and analytics. So in theory, the higher your page load time, your chances of ranking on Google organic search diminish. So Google wants pages that have very low page load time that load quickly. So Google Analytics is a great tool for speed suggestions. It's a great tool for finding out what the traffic is doing on your site, how they're engaging, and are they achieving goals. Now there are other tools out there from an organic perspective like Keyword It. That's a good keyword research tool for Reddit. So if you go to Keyword It, you'll be able to see from a Reddit perspective what keywords are driving volume. These are just the results, but you can put any keyword in there and get the results of that keyword. With tough competition to rank on the search engines and app stores, there is a huge demand in industry for SEO experts. There are various types of roles in SEO. Some popular ones are SEO Associate, SEO Analyst, SEO Executive, SEO Manager, and SEO Expert. Let's first talk about SEO Associates. SEO Associate is responsible for performing keyword research and implementing SEO strategies to improve organic ranking. The average base pay of an SEO Associate in US is between $59,000 to $80,000 per annum and in India is rupees per annum. Next is SEO Analyst. SEO Analyst is responsible for keyword research, competitor analysis, tracking organic traffic and conversion rate. The average base pay of an SEO Analyst in the US is between $48,000 to $78,000 per annum and in India is 2,28,000 rupees per annum. Understanding the responsibilities of SEO executives, an SEO executive is responsible for gathering analytics reports, creating SEO friendly content and implementing on-page and off-page techniques. The average base pay of an SEO executive in US is $39,382 per annum and in India is in between $1,92,000 to 
to 3,62,000 rupees per annum. An SEO manager is responsible for analyzing reports of the campaigns, developing content marketing strategies, managing a team of SEO experts, fixing technical SEO issues, and more. The average base pay of SEO manager in US is $72,652 per annum and in India is 8 lakh 79,000 rupees. Moving towards the job responsibilities of SEO expert, SEO expert is responsible for creating keywords and content strategy, link building strategies, competitor analysis and reports, and campaigning. The average base pay of an SEO expert in US is in between $53,000 to $78,000 per annum and in India is rupees per annum. Some companies hiring for significant roles under SEO are Microsoft, Disney, Siemens, Udemy and Deloitte. Those questions for you. Okay, so the first question that you might be asking in an interview is differentiate between do follows and no follows. Okay, so if you take in or listen to my SEO courses on YouTube for SEO, we, we talked a lot about do follows and no follows. And, and simply put, I mean, do follows are just signals to the search engines to follow the link. So there's a link on site A pointing to site B. We're gonna basically tell Google, Bing, and some of these other search engines, hey, go ahead and follow that link. Now, a nofollow is just the opposite. So a nofollow link doesn't allow the search engine crawlers to follow it. So if we have a link on our site, site A pointing to site B, we can put a nofollow tag in there. And what that's gonna do, it's going to signal to the crawlers, hey, don't follow this link. So in the end, if the crawlers don't follow the link, then there's not gonna be any link juice passed. And so Google is not gonna give you credit or give that site credit for having a link pointing to it or pointing to another site or from another site. And so it's all about linking. So we can control if there's links on our site, whether we want the crawlers to recognize those or not simply with no follow tags. So, just a reminder, link juice is the reputation or equity pass from one website to another. So if you have a link on another website and that website is of high quality, meaning their page authority, their domain authority is high, they have a lot of content, you know, they're not spammy, they're really rich and they're relevant, then you may want to make sure that the link pointing from that site to your site is a no follow so that way that google can recognize the link from that site to your site and basically that reputation is going to be passed on to you okay so that's a do follow versus a no follow and why would we do a no follow well it just depends it really depends a lot of social media platforms like facebook have no follows if you have a lot of content you may not want to be pushing out a lot of do follows it could actually look bad from an external linking standpoint and so a lot of sites are really particular about who they want to pass link juice onto and give credit for the link. So it's a business decision at the end of the day. There's really no hard, fast rule here, except from an SEO perspective, if I have a site and I have a lot of external links pointing outward to other sites, I'm going to be particular about who I allow the search engine to follow and what links I allow not to follow. Okay. So here's an example of what they look like. So do follow is simply just the href. Notice the no follow has the, the tag appended to it, the href tag with a no follow. So if the search engine's crawling your site and they see that no follow there, they're not gonna follow that link and vice versa. If there's a link on another site pointing to yours and there's a no follow there, you're not gonna get credit. The search engines aren't gonna pick up that link. Okay, so question two, what is 301 redirect and how is it different from a 302 redirect? So 301 redirects tell users in the search engine specifically that an original page has been moved, and this is the keyword here, permanently. So permanently moved. We're gonna explain that in a minute. So it's just moved from one page to another. And so if we don't have a page anymore, but we have a new page. Let's just say you built a new website with new URLs. You want to make sure the old page is pointing to the new page 
with a 301 redirect. So if a 301 redirect is permanent, then a 302 is temporary. So we want the search engines to recognize that we have 301 permanent redirects in place. Why? Because if we have temporary, then it might alert Google to not keep that page in its search engine rankings because it's temporary. So why would Google want to keep a temporary page or even a page that is pointing to another page on a temporary basis? So they re may remove both pages from its index. Okay, but if we have something permanent in place, Google may say, okay, this page is permanently linking to another page or redirecting to another page. Therefore, it's stable, it's permanent, we're going to keep that new page in the index and eventually remove the old page. So really something permanent is more stable in the eyes of the search engine. Something temporary may not be as stable in the eyes of say Google. And if they don't see it as stable, then they may remove both pages from the index. Okay. So the idea is we want to be found in Google search index and we get it. Sometimes pages go away for a variety of reasons. And if it does go away, just make sure you have a new page for it. And that new page is a 301 permanent redirect. Okay, so question three, why are backlinks important in SEO? Well, we kind of hinted on that a bit with the nofollow, because if we have a link from another website pointing to ours, and that link from that other website is really relevant, and, and it has a high page and domain authority, then it's gonna benefit us. And so backlinks are important because if we have backlinks from high quality sites, it's going to improve the credibility of our site, especially if it's a do follow tag. So the search engines are going to recognize the relationship between the site that has a link pointing to us. Okay. So it's just going to build our credibility. It's going to increase, increase our domain authority. And then the net effect of that is if we're credible and we have high domain authority, then that's going to increase the rankings of our pages. And when the pages increase in ranking, then we're going to get a more of a lion's share of the traffic for certain keywords that our pages are found for. And if our pages are found and getting traffic, then because we have increased rankings, we're likely gonna have increased traffic. And then it's just a snowball effect. So more traffic leads to more engagement and conversions. So the whole idea for SEO is remember, you have an on-page, strategy and an off-page strategy. Building external links is part of an off-page SEO strategy and we want to make sure that you know we are relevant in the form of a link or in the form of content on other high quality sites. Being on a high quality site only benefits us because again increases our domain authority, Google sees us as more relevant, therefore our pages are going to benefit by ranking higher and therefore, when we rank higher, we get more traffic. So it's a snowball effect. So having bat links is important because it snowballs all the way through to conversions. Okay, so what are the best practices to rank your videos on YouTube? This is a great question, really great question. Given the importance of videos, especially with SEO, because videos are found, YouTube in itself is a search engine. So if we have a video, how are we going to get it to rank on YouTube? Well, first things first, you never want to put a video out there and want it to rank if it's not engaging or informative. So make sure you go ahead and follow the best practices of having engaging and informative content in your video. Now, once you have that video in place, you want to optimize it. And then some of the key factors for optimizing the video are you want to choose a title that has high search volume and low difficulty, just as you would keyword, for example, for a web page. You want to choose a title with a keyword in it that has high volume and low difficulty, i.e. low competition. Okay, so you want a nice ratio there. And you know what, you want to choose a title that's going to get people to watch the video too. So it's not all about just choosing a title just for the sake of high volume. You also have to choose something that's relevant that's going to be catchy as well. And then with that title goes the description. So you want a description that's very relevant to your title, okay? Because most people aren't going to click on a video just for the sake of the title. They're going to want to probably get a sneak peek via the description of what it is. So again, you want to optimize that description, but make sure the description is, is just as snazzy as the title. Okay, you also want to use accurate and relevant video tags, just as you would on Twitter or Facebook. Tag these videos. Okay, so make sure your title tag length doesn't exceed 100 characters. 
because it will get chopped off. So again, that goes back to just writing something really short and to the point that's gonna grab somebody's attention. Okay, you also wanna upload a captivating thumbnail, something that's relevant, then that's gonna grab somebody's attention. And then again, we set it similar to the video tags, and we wanna use relevant hashtags. Again, just as you would with Twitter and Facebook, go ahead and throw some hashtags in there that people could see because people search via hashtagging. And then, this goes without saying, you did all the work, created a really great video, it's engaging, it's informative, you optimized it. Feel free to promote your video on other social media platforms, okay? Don't just stick with YouTube per se. So the benefit here is if you post it on Facebook or LinkedIn or whatever platform of your choice and it gets engagement, people click on the link, go to YouTube, they're going to like it. And then other people are going to see that engagement. They're going to see how many people liked it or how many subscribers you have. So promote your videos to help you with the ranking of the video on YouTube. So that does play into it. So go ahead and promote it so other people can watch it, like it, comment, etc. And that's going to engage other people to want to do the same. So what is mobile first indexing? This is a really important and timely question. Mobile first indexing means Google's just using mobile friendly content for indexing and ranking websites. So in other words, Google, for example, has two bots. They have the traditional desktop bot and they have a smartphone bot. And eventually everybody that has a website is gonna be migrated over to the smartphone bot. And so if that smartphone bot goes to your website and starts crawling, what do you think they're looking for? Their smartphone bot, they're looking for mobile friendly content. If it's not mobile friendly, meaning the page isn't designed for a smartphone browser, or let's just say the images are way too large, or you have to expand the text just to read it. You know, a lot of these, these issues that somebody would have just simply trying to read something on a web page on their mobile device. Google's not going to grab that content. So you want to make sure it's mobile friendly so it gets indexed. And so if your website has a responsive design, Google will rank your website based on its performance on mobile devices. Okay, so you want to make sure that your website is mobile friendly. And if you're in an interview and somebody asks you this question, you could even take it a step further and say, look, I'm going to measure how friendly my, my website is for mobile devices in Google Search Console because Google Search Console has a report that will show you what pages on your website are not mobile friendly. And it's not a guarantee, but I could tell you if I'm Google and I'm crawling your site with my smartphone, Bob, and that page or one of my pages is not mobile friendly, I'm probably not going to index it or rank it. So you want to leverage that report in Google Search Console to see what pages are mobile friendly. So that's a little bonus for you to really impress the interviewer who asked you this question. Because how are you going to know if one of your pages is mobile friendly or not if you don't look at a report? So keep an eye on Google Search Console's mobile usability report. Okay, number six, list down the most important local SEO ranking factors. Okay, so organic local ranking is just as important as anything else in organic search. Because if you have a local business, you want to use the likes of, say, Google My Business to show up when somebody types in, you know, looking for a florist or you're looking for a coffee shop. So what you want to do is you want to create a web page for every product and service. Okay? You also want to opt for your business listings on Google My Business. And, and there are plenty of other local business directories out there like Yelp, for example, or Bing even has one. So go ahead and also make sure you have a business listing as well. But since Google in the United States has a huge market share, you want to start with Google first. You want to update your NAP citations on your website, maintain consistency of your NAP. Okay, so NAP is name, address, phone number. So you want to make sure that that's current and consistent. So if you have a number on your website, make sure it's the same number on Google My Business. Okay, you can embed a Google map on your website. You could certainly optimize the meta tags and content, not only on your web pages, but within your Google My Business directory. So you can add your business to other local directories, like I mentioned Yelp, and then also just as important, opt for reviews and ratings. 
Okay, so the more reviews the ha you have, the better off you are. Okay, so I always say this with, the, uh, with local search. Three of the main factors in showing up for local search on, say, Google is obviously the keyword. The second is the proximity of where that person is. And then third is the reviews. So you can't really control the proximity, but you can control the keyword and you can control the reviews to some degree. So work hard at getting reviews for your business, but at the same time, you can certainly work in some keywords, let's just say for your product and service pages on your website, but also you can translate that over to Google My Business. Okay? So working in those keywords, making sure your, your number, your address, your name, they're all consistent and and really just spreading your the the business out on other directories that's really all these are really key factors for local seo okay so question number seven how to avoid duplicate content getting penalized for duplicate content so for example if you have two different versions of a web page you may result in a duplicate content issue so it's just seo 101 you never want to have two two or more pages with the same content so what do we do? Well, we can avoid this in having Google penalize us by, again, setting up a 301 redirect. Remember, 301s are permanent. We can also use what they call a canonical tag. And a canonical tag basically alerts the search engines as to which page is the original. Okay, so if we have an original page, we want to point to that page with our canonical tag. And then the third option is opt for preferred domain in Google Search Console. Okay, so if you have multiple known names, make sure you set up a primary one in Search Console. So those are ways to work around it. Of this three, I would always go with the canonical tags because that's just a tag that's going to sit on the page. It's going to alert Google as to what the original is just in case they get their hands on the duplicate. So all the pages that have the same content are going to have the same canonical tag pointing to one page. So again, three ones are permanent. You could simply just redirect one to the other if you end up having duplication, or you could just tell the search engines, hey, this is the original page, or you can go through Search Console. Okay, number eight, what are the tactics to increase a web page speed? Okay, so what are some of the tactics? Well, when you build a site, especially for mobile, you want to keep it as simple as possible. I mean, what I mean by simple as possible, really, I mean, hey, use a simple website design. Don't get overly creative, if you will. Most websites, all websites have images. You're not going to be able to get around that, but just make sure you optimize your images. In other words, don't have such a large image size. If you don't need something very large, don't have it. Okay, you want to improve server response time. And what do we mean by that? Well, your site's sitting on a server somewhere. You can own that server or you can be renting it out from, say, Amazon Web Services or let's just say GoDaddy as your registrar. They also have web hosting. Well, if you have it on, say, GoDaddy's server, you may be sharing that server with other businesses. And at certain times of the day, other businesses may get a lot of traffic and suck up a lot of bandwidth. What is that going to do? That's going to reduce the server response time for your site. And so you want to make sure you have a, an idea of, you know, what server your web page or website is on. And you want to be able to can have some control over that. Because if your server response is slow, that's going to slow down everything else in terms of loading in the browser, and that's not going to be good for SEO. Okay, optimize your code. We mean by optimize, minimifying. When we say minimifying, we mean get rid of some of the redundant code. If you have CSS, you know, get rid of chop some of the, get rid of the JavaScript you're not using. So that's what we mean by optimizing code. Reduce redirects. Okay, ideally, you just want to have one redirect in place. You don't want to create a, a daisy chain, so to speak, of redirecting and redirecting after that. That's never going to bode well, and it's going to slow things down as well. Enable browser caching. So if you enable browser caching, basically, if somebody comes back to the page they've been on, say, two days ago, they're probably going to see a cached version of that page. And then opt for the content delivery network as well. So these are some of the ways to reduce page speed. Now, if you're curious about the page speed of your website, you can always go to Google's PageSpeed Insights tool. And all you have to do is just Google PageSpeed Insights or even just something generic like Google PageSpeed. And you're going to get this tool, PageSpeed Insights. 
And all you need to do is just plug in a URL. When you plug in the URL, Google is going to analyze the URL for both mobile and desktop. And so here we could see Google gives a score. So we could see the score for mobile and we could see the score for desktop just by clicking on desktop. And so here I could see some of the issues that the site may be having in terms of page load time for their desktop. If I flip over to mobile, you know, here I could see some other issues. For example, they have a server static assets with efficient cache policy. Now, if you're not sure what the heck that means, you can always just click on it and you can see some specifics here and or you can just always Google it as well. Uh, here you got the reduce the impact of third party code. Okay, so that's another thing. Uh, reduce JavaScript execution time. So again, going back to a lot of some of the comments we made about coding. Okay, so sometimes too much code or code not functioning as well as it should will tend to slow down the site. Okay, so you can use PageSpeed Insights. You can always get a glimpse of how pages are loading simply by also going to, for example, Google Analytics. Under behavior, okay, you can go to site speed and if you click on overview, okay, Google, what Google does is they do a sampling of pages over time. And in this case, based on 89 page views, they have an average page load time. And so you can get a sense of how quick specific pages load your site overall simply by looking at the site speed overview report in Google Analytics to get a sense of how quick your pages are loading. Now, there are certain factors that do affect load time. So obviously the way the page is built with the code, the images, etc., but also the browser, each browser loads differently. Okay. So you want to take a look at it by browser, also by country. Every country has a different network. Okay? You can be in the United States and have worse network service than you do say in, you know, coast, uh, Ivory Coast in Africa. Okay. So it really depends on the network you're on. So, and also the page, every page is built differently. So you want to get a sense of what pages are loading quicker and which pages are not. You can simply just go to page timings in Google Analytics and you get a sense of what pages do not load fast and which ones do. And maybe hone in on the pages that aren't loading fast and address those pages first. Okay, so you have two tools at your disposal, one Google Analytics and one PageSpeed Insights. Okay, so let's look at question number nine here. So when should an individual target short tail and long tail keywords? Okay, so remember short tail are usually one to two keywords, very broad in nature. Long tail keywords, are maybe three, four keywords in a query, or maybe an entire sentence. Those are considered long tail keywords. So usually short tail keywords have higher volume, but also higher competition. Longer tail keywords usually have lower uh, volume, but also lower competition. But the great thing about long tail keywords, the conversion rate will tend to be a little bit higher than say a short tail because it's less vague and more specific. So you can use short tail keywords if you're trying to drive a lot of visitors because those keywords are going to be vague or broad in nature. Long tail keywords are used for targeted pages such as product pages and articles. So if you have a specific product with a long name, you can certainly optimize that page for that product name. Again, the product name may have low volume, but if somebody types in exactly that product name, you show up, the chance of you them converting are going to be very high. So you don't have to always be that specific with the product name, but try and be as specific as you possibly can in order to get somebody to click on your link in the search engine results and get them over to your site to, to convert. Okay, so those are really the big differences. Short tail, very broad, very vague, a lot of volume, but also a lot of competition. But hey, if you're ranking for short tail keyword, you're probably going to get a lot of traffic. The conversion rates may not be as high as something, say, long tail, where, hey, maybe you're just honed in on a few set number of products and you're not care, you don't care a lot about the traffic. You just care about getting the relevant traffic to your site to convert. Okay, number 10, what are the port elements to focus while developing a website? So we're talking in terms of SEO. 
Okay, so if somebody asks me this question in an interview, what am I going to focus on when developing a website? Well, the answers are right here. Yes, we talked about mobile. Mobile is so important because a lot of websites are going to be indexed with Google Smartphone Bot. So mobile usability is very important. So we need to make sure our website is responsive for mobile. Just some basic practices when it comes to site architecture and navigation. We want to have a simple URL structure. Okay, no overly cumbersome. The navigation should simply be clean and neat. Okay, if you have five products, okay, maybe you have uh, in your navigation, you have something called products with all five listed or you have all five products in the main navigation. The key is you just wanna make it clean and neat and easy for somebody to find. The, the rule of thumb is if it's good for the end user, it's probably gonna be good for Google. But if complicated for the end user, it's probably gonna be complicated for Google. You always wanna create a sitemap. Now, what is that sitemap? A sitemap is simply just a formatted file with to, that includes all your URLs and assets, your images and your videos. They're gonna be sitting on your server as well. So you want Google or these, these bots to be able to find your pages and assets. And by the way, you wanna take it a step further and make sure you upload that sitemap, which is sitting in the root directory, meaning domain.com slash sitemap.xml okay you want to take that sitemap and make sure you input that sitemap location in google search console that way google search console has a one-way ticket to grab the elements in the sitemap another important element to focus on while developing a website is having a robots text file and all a robots text file is it's like a lock i always say to a house so if you lock a door in your house nobody's going to be able to get in that door so it's all a robots text file is you're telling google and these other bots that are coming across your site what's locked and what's not locked meaning what they have access to and what they don't have access to so you want to be able to make sure you have a robots text file if you're trying to not index specific pages of your website because if you tell Google, don't crawl these pages or this directory, they're not going to get crawled. And if they don't get crawled, they're not going to get indexed. So robots text file is an important element to focus on while you're developing your website. And while you're developing your website, it could be on a, you know, in a directory just called new website. So you probably want to have new website as the directory in the robots text file and just to let Google know, don't go into this directory because it's my new website and I'm not ready to go live yet. So you don't want it indexed. So there are a lot of reasons to have robots text files. That's the main reason. Sitemap, you want Google to get these pages and assets quickly. Okay, you want to make sure that your site architecture navigation is in order. You want to make sure your site is mobile friendly. And you also want to make sure you have content on your website. That's the key, because that's what's gonna keep people on the website and engaged. And when I say content, I don't necessarily just mean words, I also mean videos, I also mean images, you know, something interactive, okay? You wanna keep people engaged. That's the key behind it. Trust me, if, if an end user finds your site engaging, Google is likely going to find your site engaging, okay? So those are good brownie points to bring up if somebody asks you this question in an interview. So just a quick recap here, it's important to have a better site structure so the bots can easily access and index the content. Okay, with a responsive design, helps to make your website mobile friendly and user friendly. Would also increase the amount of time a user spends on your website, which may improve your site's ranking. Sitemap is simply just a file that helps search engine bots to understand the structure of the website. Okay, how many pages are on your website and where are they located, along with the videos and images. Okay, and then the robots text just instructs the search engine crawlers to understand what pages should not be indexed. Okay, this is simply just a text file and it's added to the root directory. Again, think like a door, think of a lock. Okay, you can tell, you can lock whatever doors you want in your house. Then give it that way. I hope this course was helpful for you and you like this SEO full course. Share this with your friend and the ones in need of this full course. Feel free to post your questions in the comment section below and our experts will feel happy to answer you. And don't forget to subscribe to Simply Learn and hit the bell icon to never miss any updates from Simply Learn. Keep watching, keep learning. Hi there, if you like this video, subscribe to the Simply Learn YouTube channel and click here to watch similar videos. To nerd up and get certified, click here.